a comet can be seen traveling in the night starry sky and underneath it is the scene of a congested highway. A red motorcycle can be seen traveling at a very high speed. A young man is riding a motorcycle. His black hair is aggressively thrown in the wind as he is not wearing a helmet or any protective gear for motorcycle riders. He hit all green lights as he was traveling along the congested highway. He seems to be extremely lucky, but he is upset. He's upset that he cannot fight with the superpower he has which is luck. As he was speeding along the highway, he closed his eyes as he recalled the events from this morning. A huge audience is gathered on the grounds of the superhuman school. They are gathered there to watch the school's entrance examination. Up on the stage are the outstanding students who have passed the writing test. The superpowers of these students are going to be tested today. Each student on stage has a magic ball placed in front of them. The young man was among the outstanding students who were eagerly waiting to be tested. In the crowd, a black-haired beautiful girl is cheering on the young man. The host who greeted the students explained the guidelines of the test. There are five tiers of superpowers, white dust, blue spirit, violet soul, red royal, and sacred black. The school will only be recruiting those students whose at least blue spirit tier, and the lowest tier, white dust, will not be recruited. As the young man touched the ball in front of him, it glowed a bright white light signifying that he is a white dust. His eyes widened in disbelief and as he looks at the other student, one has violet soul and the rest have blue spirit. A young man with blonde hair can be seen standing behind the black-haired beauty. He is laughing in the crowd and is mocking the young man, Minghi, saying that he is one of the few people who have white dust talent and how inconspicuous his superpower would be. Minghi was petrified due to shock and humiliation as the crowd joined in laughing and mocking him. The young blonde man then proceeds to add that Minghi has the gall to confess to the school beauty who is a violet soul. The black-haired beauty looked up at the stage with great worry in her eyes. Minghi's flashback ends as he opens his eyes, and a huge truck is about to hit him. He avoided the truck with ease and another car that was heading his way. Although he just had a near-death experience, he is still upset and called his power useless. A few moments later, he can now be seen traveling outside the city. He is going down the road with a huge thoracic spine skeleton, so huge that it is serving as a road arch. Ming he looked up and noticed the comet getting closer to where he was. It looked like one big comet at first glance but as he took a good look at it, there were multiple comets following the biggest one. Ming he thought that even a bullet cannot hit him because of his luck so a comet couldn't hit him when the earth is so big. Just as he finished that thought, a bright light shone from behind him. Ming he looked back and his eyes widened when he saw the comet behind him. It was immediately followed by the rumbling sound. There was no time for Ming he to react. The earth shook, debris was flying everywhere, and a cloud of dust formed where the comet hit. As the dust and debris dispersed, Ming he can be seen lying on the ground. His body was at the center of the crater indicating that he was the center of the impact, but his body was surprisingly intact. Suddenly, a bubble-like matter was floating and entered Minghi's chest. A game-like system suddenly popped up and Minghi's stats could be seen. His luck stats are incredibly high, and a system message shows that this is preventing the system from devouring him like a parasite. A silhouette of a gigantic woman who seems to be one with the system appeared in front of Minghi. Another system message showed a warning that an enemy was approaching, and the best option was to coexist with the host. The system entered Minghi's hippocampus to access his memories and identify him. Once the gigantic silhouette got the information that the host, Minghi, doesn't possess any combat ability, it bestowed him powers. Minghi's talent rating is now raised to Royal Red. The silhouette looked satisfied and thought that Minghi can probably fight now with his current level. Later, at the hospital, Minghi is lying on a bed with monitors and a ventilator attached to him. The doctor was talking to a blonde nurse about Minghi's condition. He said that Minghi's body is in fine condition, but he must have hit his head which made him enter a coma that's last for quite some time. As the blonde nurse responded that she'll take care of Minghi, another nurse came into the room and called the doctor, Dr. Zhao. She said that Tian Wen's group has sent a bottle of the monster's blood and he needs to come and examine it. Dr. Zhao and the nurses departed the room, leaving Minghi alone in it. A few days later, the black-haired beauty visited Minghi and she brought a bouquet of flowers with her. She looked at the unconscious Minghi with a worried look on her face. A month later, the young man with blonde hair, along with his friends, visited Minghi as well but they looked at him with mockery in their eyes. They were talking about how Minghi was upset because he wanted to be superhuman and how he should have still paid attention to his safety even if he was in a bad mood. As they continued to talk, the blonde noticed a pink envelope in the bouquet of flowers placed at Minghi's bedside table. His friends were talking about how expensive Minghi's medical fees were, that his big sister took in a few more jobs, but the blonde paid them no mind. 
He grabbed the pink envelope and opened it to read its contents. His face was filled with rage as he read the message. It was the black-haired beauty, Lu Kian's letter and she replied to Ming He's confession. Jealousy filled his eyes. The thought that Ming He's a disabled superhuman and that they're not even sure if he'll even wake up filled the blonde's mind as he looks at Ming He with contempt. He ripped the letter to shreds right there and then. A year passed and a cockroach-looking monster climbed out of a manhole. The monster was so huge that the concrete around the manhole got destroyed as it made its way out. The hospital's PIA system buzzed, followed by the announcement that a large number of mutant monsters appeared in Nancheng, and all the staff are requested to leave immediately. Dr. Zhao, along with a few hospital staff were startled. Nurses and patients began moving towards the exit but the blonde-haired nurse who was taking care of Ming he ran in the opposite direction. Dr. Zhao saw the nurse and was worried. He was about to follow the nurse when the building shook and the staff around him convinced him to leave the building. The blonde-haired nurse was worried about the unconscious student. As she was running through the hallways, she thought that even if he wouldn't wake up, she couldn't just leave him there. As she proceeds to run towards ming -He's room, a silhouette of a monster with claws and a tongue full of saliva dangling from the ceiling can be seen from behind her. She hurriedly opened the door to ming -He's room and she saw his scowling face like he was in pain. She rushed towards him, immediately grabbed his hand, and tried to get him off the bed when something caught her attention. She saw her reflection from the window, with a massive cockroach standing behind her. She froze in place as the monster held her, started licking her face, and proceeded to admire how delicious she was. The hand she was holding unexpectedly moved and punched the monster behind her. Her eyes widened with surprise. The punch was so powerful that it looked like a shockwave. Ming He, now sitting in his bed, is giving a death glare while having an aura-like mist surrounding his fists. Under the shimmering night sky, outside the hospital building, a swarm of cockroach monsters is crawling on its walls. Suddenly, a portion of a wall from the higher floor exploded and it was like something burst out from it. Inside, you can see a hole pierced through the three layers of walls and the night sky can now be seen from the inside. Ming He can be seen facing the direction of the wall, in a stance with his fist clenched. In front of him is the kneeling blonde nurse covering her head with her hands as if her life depends on it. Behind her was the cockroach monster with the upper half of its body gone. The remaining part of the monster collapsed on the floor with a loud thud. Ming He talked to the blonde nurse and reassured her that the monster is already dead. He reached out his hand to the blonde nurse and asked her if she could stand. Ming He thanked the blonde nurse, Miss Song for taking care of him for such a long time. In return, Miss Song also thanked Ming He for saving her life and asked him when did he wake up. Ming He did not answer and shifted the topic by asking if he was in Nancheng Hospital, and why are there so many monsters there? Nurse Song answered that they were informed by the higher-ups that a polluted fluid went into the sewers of the city, infecting the parasites and causing mutation. Ming He asked about the other staff and the residents nearby. Miss Song answered that they were probably moving to a safe place, but Ming He was unconscious and she was afraid. She couldn't finish her sentence as the thought of Ming He being eaten by a monster vividly crossed her mind. Ming He smiled as he told Miss Song that she didn't leave him behind. Miss Song simply answered that she was just doing her job and proceeds to question how Ming He killed the mutant with just a punch when he was just a student. Ming He thought to himself that he had been practicing his fighting technique for a whole year, but he did not want to answer Miss Song's question. So, he avoided the question again by saying that they should hurry up, leave the place and go to safety with the others. The noise from the earlier fight has attracted more monsters and the hallway is now full of them. Ming He stepped into the hallway using the hole in the wall he created earlier, and told Miss Song to wait inside the room. As soon as he was out of the room, monsters immediately jumped to attack him. Ming He took a punching stance and eliminated all the cockroaches in the vicinity with a quick single punch. The cockroaches at the very end of the hallway were astonished by what they saw and were frozen in place. Ming He ran towards them and pierced through their bodies with punches. As Ming He punched the last cockroach, he heard Miss Song scream. He looked back and saw that a cockroach escaped his attacks by crawling through the ceiling and was now about to attack Miss Song. A bottle of sulfuric acid in a medical cart caught Ming He's attention. He ran and grabbed it and broke the bottle in his hands. Instead of the liquid falling towards the floor, it gathered in his fists. Miss Song has her eyes closed, and one hand covering her head as if she was accepting her faith to be eaten when Ming He punched the cockroach and called the move acid punch. Miss Song opened her eyes filled with tears and she witnessed the monster, that was supposed to eat her, was now melting in front of her. Ming He looked at his hand as he thought of the countless times he practiced the move in his brain. His fists are now glowing with a green color. Miss Song exclaimed in admiration and asked if his superpower had something to do with punching. 
Ming He did not answer Miss Song's question again and just said that he's still a student who failed the examination last year with a humble smile on his face. Miss Song retorted that the teachers must be blind because his powers can't even compare to some of the pyro rank superhumans. His smile turned into a sad expression as he then remembered the embarrassing memory of being ranked as white dust during the examination last year. Ming He asked Miss Song what was that fluid and how did the cockroaches become so scary. Miss Song just answered that not only cockroaches are in the city sewers. Ming He agreed and proceeded to ask Miss Song if there was any more sulfuric acid as it was quite useful. On the mountainside road where the sewers end in a river, a bus can be seen moving across a bridge where a gigantic shadow with huge glowing eyes was moving underneath it. As the bus was crossing the bridge, the concrete in front of them was blasted upward and rubble flew everywhere. The passengers inside the bus, including the driver, screamed and panicked as they saw the horde of cockroach monsters crawling up the bridge toward them. Dr. Zhao, who was inside the bus, was screaming at his phone calling for help. He stated that there were a lot of mutant organisms that appeared at Nancheng Bridge, and they need the assistance of superhumans. A cockroach broke through a window and was about to attack a lady sitting beside it when a loud bang was heard. A man, wearing a cowboy outfit appeared and he was standing on the roof of the bus. He's wearing a badge that looks like it's meant for superhumans and was holding a rifle in each hand. Each rifle has smoke coming out of them, indicating that it was fired and killed the cockroach that is now slumped at the bus's window. He introduced himself as a pyro rank superhuman as he reassured the passengers inside the bus. He fired his rifles continuously as he yelled at the monsters telling them to die. He yelled that it doesn't matter how many monsters come as his superpower is infinite bullets. A cockroach managed to slip from the onslaught of bullets and was about to bite his foot but he jumped and twirled into the air while he continued to fire his rifles. He landed on the bus in a cool stance, with one of his knees bent. He was startled, his expression changed, and his eyes widened as he felt a huge shadow looming above him. When he looked up, he was greeted by a giant rat monster. Its eyes were huge and glimmering and its claws raised and ready to attack. It bared its teeth and screeched causing its saliva to be expelled into the air. A huge blow hit the bus creating a huge hole in its roof. The passengers' faces were distorted with terror as they saw through the hole that the monster rat was munching on the superhuman's body as his badge fell into the bus. They cried for help in unison. In a forest near the hospital building, Miss Song and Ming He can be seen crouching behind a tree. Miss Song asked Ming He if any of those monsters followed them and he told her that for now, nothing is following them. As they were about to leave, something caught Miss Song's attention. It was a burning bus, located at the edge of the broken bridge. She was telling Ming He that it was probably the last bus that left the hospital, and everyone must be in danger when a handheld radio made a buzzing noise nearby, and it caught Ming He's attention. The voice on the other line announced that a large mutant rat appeared at Nancheng Bridge. Pyro rank twin gun had lost all vital signs, and no registered superhuman was nearby. Ming He picked up the radio and asked the person on the other line for all the information about the giant rat. The person answered that it was weak against fire and asked Ming He if he was a superhuman. Ming He answered that he was a high schooler who failed the entrance examination of the superhuman school. The voice on the other line panicked and warned Ming He sternly that he shouldn't be stupid because the giant rat was a general rank monster and all theories he learned about rats were useless. The voice tried to convince Ming He to hurry and seek shelter and not throw away his life. Ming He didn't take heed of the voice's warnings and was already walking towards the bridge, leaving the handheld radio behind. With a determined face, Ming He stated that the staff took care of him for a whole year when he was unconscious so he can't just do nothing. The giant rat monster is now tilting the bus toward the edge of the bridge. The passengers inside are screaming as the huge eyes of the rat peek through the window at the back of the bus. Ming He and Miss Song were hiding in the bushes nearby as they observed the rat playing with its food. As Ming He tried to step out of hiding and told Miss Song to stay hidden, she tried to stop him and said that he might get killed. Ming He smiled and reasoned with her that when a patient is in danger, they, the staff, won't just stand and do nothing. He then jumped out of the bushes and lunged towards the giant rat thinking that he won't know if he can't beat the monster if he won't try. The giant rat who was biting the rear end of the bus was knocked out of place and let go of the bus as Ming He swung his fist towards its face. As he's fighting the giant rat, he's thinking about how these animals got so big and if he were to get hit, his bones would be broken to pieces and he would lose the ability to fight. The giant rat launched a bombardment of attacks, roads, and cars were destroyed and debris was flying everywhere. Ming He kept dodging those while thinking that rats are very agile and he can't let them touch him, not even once. Ming He ran towards the bunch of abandoned cars in the road to lead the giant rat away from the bus. The giant rat tried to bite Ming He but chomped down on a car instead. 
Ming-He saw this as a chance and gave the rat a powerful punch. The impact was so strong that it created a gust it looked like a shockwave. After the dust and rubble settled, the giant rat was revealed lying on the wrecked concrete road. As Ming-He saw the giant rat faint, he walked towards it recklessly, swinging his arms in the air to prepare for the final blow but then he stopped in his tracks when he realized something. Cunning animals like rats tend to act dead. The giant rat opened its eyes in an instant and attacked Ming-He but he was able to dodge and it bit off a car in half instead. Ming-He ran through the cars as the giant rat chased him, plowing through the obstructions in its path causing the cars around them to fly away. He is now in a pinch, the strength of his punches is not enough to kill the rat monster. A toppled over car was leaking gas and it caught Ming-He's attention. He then started running toward cars and opening their gas tanks as he lures the giant rat's attack to hit the cars. This went on for a long time and the giant rat is now tired. It was drooling and panting as it glared at Ming-He who is now holding a lighter from a distance and was about to let the lighter go. Miss Song now went out of hiding in the bushes and rushed towards the bus to check on Dr. Lin Zhao and the others. Dr. Zhao was surprised and relieved that Miss Song was able to escape the hospital. As he was asking Miss Song if what he saw was right, that the superhuman that saved them was wearing the hospital uniform when they heard a loud boom. The cars around the area where Ming-He and the giant rat were fighting exploded. The area was in a blaze and terror is now evident on the giant rat's face. Ming-He's fist was standing in the middle of the fire and his fist is absorbing it. He swung with all his might and punched the giant rat with his burning fist and called that move, Blazing Punch. His punch cleared up a path in front of him but the path was scorching. The staff exclaimed with joy as they saw the giant rat was killed. Soon they realized that the person who saved them was wearing their hospital uniform. One of them even recognized him as a student who had been in a coma for a whole year. Miss Song then told the staff that his name was Ming-He, the student who was not recruited by the superhuman school. At the superhuman command station, a blonde-haired superhuman is talking to Liu Kian through a communication device around her neck. She informed Liu Kian that the general rank mutant monster has been killed. Liu Kian who stopped dashing and stood at a tree branch was glad that the people there were saved. She wanted to know who killed the general rank mutant because she wanted to thank them in person. The blonde superhuman did not know who was the strong superhuman who rushed there but she don't think it was that impolite student that she know. She then asked Liu Kian if she had found the source of the pollution. There was a pause before Liu Kian responded that there will be more mutant monsters in the future and all they can do now is evacuate everyone in Nancheng and seal all the polluted regions. At the rescue station, beside the guard who was watching over the gate, Miss Song is treating the bruises on Ming-He's hands. She praised how incredible Ming-He is and expressed that if it wasn't for him, they would have never made it out alive. As Ming-He looked down to hide his blushing face, a young woman with long black hair was causing a commotion. She was trying to enter the polluted area, but the guard stopped her. The guard reassured her that everyone had already been evacuated but the girl did not listen saying that her younger brother was in there and she must save him. She broke down and was pleading with the guard, telling them that he was pitiful, and that he was only a teenage boy but has been living in the hospital unconscious and hadn't woken up. As she was crying, telling the sob story of her younger brother, Ming-He who was sitting one step away from the commotion, looked at the girl in a very funny way. The girl revealed that the name of her brother was Ming-He. She was sobbing as she told the guard that she couldn't believe that at such a young age, her brother would face such tragedy when he hadn't even held a woman's hand yet. She then composed herself, stared into space, and proclaimed that she'll definitely save him even if it costs her life, and if he was dead, she'll simply join him. Ming-He's mouth gape as he stares at his sister with disbelief and embarrassment. Ming-He stood up while looking at his sister sideways. His sister was dumbfounded for a moment and then jumped into his arms and hugged him when she came to it. She was ecstatic that Ming-He was awake as she was really worried about him while he was shocked by his sister's reaction. As she was sobbing, Ming-He's expression turned sad as he reminisced about what his sister has gone through in the past year. She's been taking care of him and working many jobs to take care of his hospital bills. He hugged her back. He was apologetic that he scared her like that and thanked her for her hard work during the year. Later, in an old building apartment, Ming-He just woke up. He seems to have his hair cut and he's no longer at the hospital wearing hospital clothes. As he was saying it's been so long since he slept at his own house, he noticed the food and a letter from his sister on the table near his bed. The letter says that his sister went to work as the medical bills are not fully paid yet so she won't be able to stay with him all the time and that he must stay home and recuperate. Ming he didn't think that the hospitalization and patient care bills would be that high for just a year, even the fee for his haircut yesterday. He feels guilty that his sister is working three jobs just for him and she even looks paler than him who was the patient. 
he decided that he needed to find a way to make money to improve his sister's life. As Ming-He was having those thoughts as if right on cue, the television made an announcement about a reward being offered to anyone who has clues about the source of the polluted fluid. He immediately grabbed the TV and exclaimed that's it. They were also given rewards for killing the monsters in the area. He was bewildered that the matter hasn't been resolved yet and they were already giving that much money just for intel about the source of the pollution. He imagined that he wouldn't only be able to pay all the medical bills that he owes, but he could even afford a new home for them and could use the leftover money to buy lots of makeup and clothes for his sister. He started to think about where the source of the polluted fluid would be. He came up with the idea that he should be looking at Nancheng Hospital instead of the Nancheng District. He has to go inside to check. Even if he won't find any clues, he'll still be able to get money from killing the mutated monsters. That way, he gets rid of the monsters and gets rid of evil for the sake of the people, and he also gains some experience through actual combat. Ming he came into the bounty hall. A receptionist greeted him and asked if he was there to post a bounty or if he was a superhuman. Ming he responded that he was a superhuman. She continued to ask about his rank so she could give him a bounty mission of a level that fits his rank. Ming he did not answer the question directly and asked the receptionist instead what rank he needs to be to kill some mutated cockroaches to gain some bounty rewards. The receptionist informed him that there won't be many conditions for that. He just needs to show them some basic superpower. They will also give him an intern superhuman badge. But if he really wants to get a rank for himself and become a starlight rank superhuman, he will have to go through a much more complicated examination. Then he accepted the conditions and asked to be taken to the training venue. At the training venue, there are a lot of people individually facing robots. The receptionist asked Ming-He what kind of superpower he has. He told her it was his punch. She then took Ming-He towards one of the robots and explained to him that the robot will be used to test him and it was very sturdy so he can hit it with all his power. She explained that the robot will then give him a value on how strong his punches are. Ming-He looked at the screen placed on the face of the robot the screen displayed that the limit is 0 to 1200 and a massive number below the limit shows 800 kilograms. He was not sure if his punches could meet the 800 kilograms standard, so he just has to give it his all as his muscles are not fully recovered yet from being unconscious for a year. His face glared at the robot seriously, and he proceeded to change into a punching stance. He punched the robot with all his might and his fists were smoking. It startled all the people in the room, including the receptionist, they all looked in Ming-He's direction. The chest part of the robot was dislodged and dropped to the ground with a huge clang. The screen now displays 1000 kilograms. Ming-He looked disappointed about the number as it was barely enough to reach the standard. The other testees shouted with disbelief at what nonsense Ming-He just said because he just broke the test record. The receptionist then explained that 800 kilograms was the score left behind by Iron Fist who debuted not long ago and he was the first one to beat that record. Ming-He coyly scratched the back of his head as he realized how he misunderstood the number that was displayed on the screen earlier. At the reception hall, the receptionist gave Ming-He a 1,000 yuan shopping card as a small prize for breaking the record. She explained that if he breaks some other records during a rank examination, he will receive more rewards. Ming-He asked her what kind of ranks they have here. The receptionist told him that they are currently handling Starlight, Moonglow, Sunblaze, and the Heaven Flare rank and if he has one that is higher, he'll have to go somewhere else. Ning he was thinking hard as he stared at the shopping card he just got. He then proceeded to smile and thought about the rumors he heard that you'll be able to buy a villa and an expensive car if you reach the Heaven Flare rank. Even if he wasn't sure if it was true or not, he was now determined. He just needs to focus on getting stronger and impressing everyone. Later, Ming-He arrived at the gathering place for the bounty. He didn't think that there would be so many people interested in the bounty. He was overwhelmed by the number of superhumans gathered and wondered if those people were waiting for their other members. Luo Kaixuan, Munglo rank, approached Ming-He. He asked him if he was alone and if he wanted to join the Crimson Eagles. He asked him back if they were all gathered there to find more group members. He told him that waiting for more members is their only reason since they're going to a dangerous place and officials don't allow ability users below Sunblaze rank to enter alone. He agreed to join but he asked for his rank and told him to show his badge. Ming he showed his badge and Luo Kaixuan immediately saw he is Starlight rank intern. He told Ming-He that their group doesn't take rookies, it's suicidal for a Starlight intern to enter and advised Ming-He to go back and train some more. Ming-He pondered if no one will team up with him because of his low rank. Lin Yaoyu, a former classmate of Ming-He, noticed him. She asked her group members, who are also former classmates of Ming-He to confirm if the person she saw is really him. 
Her group mates took a look and confirmed it was Ming He. Zhu Zheng smirked as he talked about how the other group shunned Ming He. Lin Yaoyu called Ming He. He noticed it was Lin Yaoyu and moved near her. She asked him when he was discharged and how she heard he was in a coma. He told her that it's been a while. Liu Xinghong asked Ming He why he would come there. He explained that he needs to earn some money quickly to pay for his medical bills so he came to hunt those mutant monsters. Zhu Zheng mocked Ming He's weak physique and told him that he should be worrying about how not to become the mutant's dinner. Lin Yaoyu told Ming He that he should come with them since it's very dangerous inside, and he shouldn't take the risk with his non-combat ability. Zhu Zheng mocked Ming He further, pointing out that Ming He's ability is only luck and its only use is for the lottery. Lin Yaoyu stopped Zhu Zhang and told him that as Ming He's old classmates, they should help him overcome his struggles. Lin Yaoyu asked Ming He to join them and promised that they will protect him. I really don't have a choice since officials prohibit me from going alone. They're the same as ever, still looking down on me. But they've entered the Superhuman Institute for over a year now. They should have gotten a lot stronger. In their eyes, I'm still that poor, rejected person who was paralyzed for a year, Ming He thought to himself. Liu Xinghong expressed that they should just take it as if they were bringing a mascot since Ming He's ability is luck and maybe he'll bring them luck. Wang Xiaodan told everyone to just bring Ming He since they were once classmates. Lin Yaoyu agreed and added that classmates should help each other. She talked to Ming He and explained that the institute requires every student to participate once in an extracurricular activity so they were discussing coming back in the summer to help deal with the pollution incident. Ming He asked Lin Yaoyu where Liu Kian is and why she was not with the group. Zhu Zhen who was walking ahead, turned his head and once again mocked Ming He for still thinking about Liu Kian and told him that she is now a celebrity at the institute and would not work with old classmates of such low rank. Lin Yaoyu told Ming He that Liu Kian is incredibly powerful, they couldn't catch up and she heard that Liu Kian returned to Lanyang City to assist the officials in finding the source of the pollution. She remembered that Ming He had perfect scores in humanities and asked Ming He's idea as to what the source of pollution is. While their group was walking, eyes glowed in the street sewer. Zhu Zheng talked again and stated that perfect scores are meaningless with zero combat ability, hence the reason why Ming He wasn't accepted into the institute. He then pointed out that they're hunting cockroaches and there's no way students like them can handle tasks like finding the source of pollution. Ming He pondered and remembered the report that there have been three forms of mutant monsters, mutant cockroaches, mutant maggots, and large mutant rats. He noticed that those are all parasites that live in sewers and speculated that a pollutant is most likely a form of fluid that accidentally got into the sewer system which caused the area to become a mutant hotspot producing large numbers of mutated organisms. He ranked the mutated and decided that the large mutant rats are more intimidating. Cockroaches aren't difficult to deal with and he's thinking that mutant maggots shouldn't be as strong as mutated cockroaches and should be relatively easier to deal with. He was still lost in his thoughts when suddenly a big hand-like mass appeared. He realized that the mass was composed of mutated maggots. A wave of maggots appeared, along with cars and other things it passed by. Lin Yaoyu shouted that they should run. Ming He realized he overlooked the fact that maggots are underground parasites that live in groups and feed as a collective group. He shouted at every person they came across, telling them to run, that there are mutant maggots behind them. Su Zheng ridiculed Ming He for running and saying that there was nothing to be afraid of and the exact reason why they came there is to defeat mutants. But when he saw the huge wave of mutant maggots, he was shocked and started running fast. They all started to run in the direction of the building with reinforced glass doors. Ming He asked Wang Xiaodan where Lin Yaoyu is. Wang Xiaodan looked guilty before telling Ming He that Lin Yaoyu tripped. Ming He immediately turned around and asked Wang Xiaodan why she didn't help her and asked the group to help Lin Yaoyu. The whole group was confused and afraid at the same time. Ming He ran towards Lin Yaoyu. She was shouting, telling him not to come or he'll die. He told her that she was the one who said that classmates should help each other. He then noticed a fire hydrant near her and immediately reached for it. Water came out of the fire hydrant, the maggots were about to cover him when his fists closed, and the water swirled, blasting the maggots away. Ming He used an explosive wave punch. He couldn't kill the maggots, but he stopped the maggots from having their way. He asked Lin Yaoyu if she was alright while lending a hand. She was thinking about how strong he was and pondering if he is really Ming He while accepting his support. While leaning against Ming He's shoulders, Lin Yaoyu realized that he is actually handsome, and it's a pity that he already has Liu Kian whom he likes. She was thankful that Ming He didn't leave her behind. Lin Yaoyu and Ming He entered the building together, they saw their group mates sitting on the floor. The group immediately got up and asked if Lin Yaoyu was alright. Zhu Zheng told her that they were about to save her but Ming He was a step ahead of them and they didn't even realize she tripped. 
He was saying that he missed a chance to save a damsel in distress. Wang Xiaodan asked Ming He if the mutant maggots went back to the sewer. He told her to tend to Lin Yaoyu's wounds first since the mutant maggots secretion may be corrosive so it'll need some medicated ointment. Lin Yaoyu told them that she only has a small bruise and she doesn't think it'll affect her movement. Ming He was glad to hear her words. He then told the rest of the group to take care of her because he was going to inspect the building and prevent the mutant maggots from entering. Wang Xiaodan scolded Zhu Zhang and Lu Xinghong for not inspecting the building and told them that they were not as cautious as Ming He who was rejected from the Superhuman Institute. Both men could only laugh in an awkward way. Ming He looked at the building's blueprint. He then entered the laboratory room, and the first thing he saw was a vivarium number one, containing yellow butterflies. He continued to pass through different vivariums until he reached vivarium number nine. Its glass was broken and something was leaking from it. He read a text saying that insects from the 9th vivarium have been reported as lost as of December 30, 2030. The scene has been protected and the case is awaiting investigation. He was relieved that the vivarium's contents were missing for half a year already. He wondered if the source of pollution could also cause the domesticated insects to mutate, but he dismissed the thought since mutant organisms are mainly coming from the sewers. He moved forward, but he didn't notice that he stepped on a piece of paper that seemed to introduce the species that was supposed to be inside vivarium number 9. In the paper, there's a picture of a centipede and a text saying, Lion poo pattern centipedes are massive centipedes that originated from southern Peru. They're the largest predatory centipede species in the world and possess huge jaws and extremely long antennas. Ming He confirmed that the back door is locked. He thinks that the mutant maggots shouldn't be able to get in since there aren't any other exits and the sewer system is also closed off. He was shocked to see Dr. Zhao outside the building. He wondered why would Dr. Zhao walk around in that isolated area alone. He noticed that Dr. Zhao was heading towards a broken down building and thought Dr. Zhao lived there. He thinks that it's dangerous for Dr. Zhao to be alone since he's not superhuman. Ming He's phone suddenly rang. An unknown number was calling him. He answered the call and said hello. The person who called him was Nurse Song. She asked where he was and offered to join her for dinner to properly thank him for saving her life. Nurse Song told Ming He not to say no and to call her Big Sis. Her surname is Song and her name is Lan so he can call her Sister Song or Sister Lan. Ming He told Nurse Song that he was in an isolated area right now. Nurse Song was shocked and immediately asked Ming He why he was there and the area should be completely closed off to people. She told Ming He that there are a lot of mutants in that area, not just the ones they'd encountered so far. Ming He explained that he wanted to earn money and lessen his sister's burden. Nurse Song asked if they were blood related. He told her they were not blood related but they grew up together in the orphanage. Nurse Song realized that Ming He and his sister's bond is stronger than family ties. While communicating with Ming He, Nurse Song started to undress and took a shower. She wished she had a little brother like Ming He who's understanding and cute. She told Ming He that since he's working right now, they should just meet next time. She felt disappointed, she even specially dressed up. Ming He told Lan Song that he saw Dr. Zhao walking around the isolated area alone which is extremely dangerous, she exclaimed, asking Ming He if he was sure it was Dr. Zhao and why would Dr. Zhao be there. He explained that Dr. Zhao didn't see him and that perhaps the window is opaque from the outside. She, now done taking a shower and getting dressed, shared with Ming He that Dr. Zhao has been acting pretty weirdly for the past year. He used to be a diligent worker, but now leaves early and sometimes makes mistakes during operations. She further explained that Dr. Zhao seems lethargic like he hasn't been sleeping at all and one day, the headquarters sent a sample of a calamity beast's blood. They wanted Dr. Zhao to purify it, but he accidentally lost the blood. Ming He was shocked hearing about the calamity beast's blood and remembered his previous class lessons. His teacher was telling them that after the blood of special calamity beasts leaves the body and comes into contact with oxygen it causes the air to mutate. The blood of some calamity beasts has an incubation period of up to one year. He wondered if that could be the cause of the mutation. He asked her when did Dr. Zhao lose the calamity beast's blood. She told him the blood was lost about a year ago and suddenly remembered that it was the day Ming he arrived at the hospital. He told her that the calamity beast's blood is most likely what caused the pollution, and the time matches perfectly the incubation period for mutation. Dr. Zhao probably lied and Ming He felt confident in his theories, he thinks he must be right. Dr. Zhao venturing into the isolated area himself made sense to Lan Song now. She thinks Dr. Zhao realized his mistakes and is going back to find the blood, he's probably afraid of being held accountable. 
Ming He told Lan Song that it's dangerous since Dr. Zhao is not a superhuman and he's speculating that there must be highly mutated organisms near the pollution source. He told her that it was not a trivial matter. She should notify the officials about what happened and have them investigate the broken down building immediately. He thinks Dr. Zhao didn't realize the danger and he wants to stop him. She agreed to his plan. He then assured her that he'll only stop Dr. Zhao and won't go to the center of the pollution source. Ming He went back to his groupmates and informed them that the building is safe, all the doors have been sealed shut so the maggots won't be able to come in. He told them they can rest there but he needs to handle something. He will be back soon and immediately went outside. She asked Ming He where he was going and told him it was dangerous outside going alone. But the door was already shut. Ming He saw non-moving maggots all over the street and speculated that the mutated maggots won't be able to do anything for a while. He took a shortcut to stop Dr. Zhao immediately but three cockroaches ambushed him in the alley. He beat the crap out of the cockroaches and immediately moved forward. He then found Dr. Zhao about to enter the building. He decided to hide and observe Dr. Zhao. And when Dr. Zhao entered the building, Ming He followed. Inside the building, he was shocked to see a huge hole in the floor, and Dr. Zhao was nowhere to be seen. He saw a ladder that leads to the depth of the hole. He thinks Dr. Zhao went down. He jumped straight into the hole and wondered what Dr. Zhao came to do. He thinks it was not as simple as it looks. He landed in an area with pipelines around the walls. He saw Dr. Zhao enter the space where the Lenyang water supply tank is located. The tank has a ladder attached to it and Dr. Zhao started climbing. He showed himself and asked Dr. Zhao what he was doing. Dr. Zhao was shocked to see Ming He. Ming He asked Dr. Zhao if he really purified the Calamity Beast's blood from a year ago. Dr. Zhao was shocked that Ming He knew about that incident. Ming He demanded from Dr. Zhao an answer. Dr. Zhao started shaking and admitted he made a grave mistake. At first, he didn't know. He didn't really mean to conceal the truth and told Ming He that it was unintentional. He descended the ladder and came near Ming He. He told Ming He that he's a doctor, one who saves lives. He didn't know that his negligence would cause organisms to mutate and he just came there to check if the water is polluted since the blood was lost around there. He emphasized that he wants to make amends. Ming He told Dr. Zhao that he was not a superhuman and should have reported to the officials instead. Dr. Zhao fell to his knees and begged Ming He to help him since he was superhuman and he saw how strong he was during the attack at the hospital. He explained that he might go to jail if the officials would find out and no one would take care of his family if that happens. Ming He asked Dr. Zhao to calm down and told him that there was a limit to his ability and doing it would be no different from seeking death, allowing the mutation to continue spreading. Dr. Zhao agreed. Ming He offered a hand and suggested that they should leave, report to the officials and have them handle everything. Dr. Zhao felt glad upon hearing Ming He's words. He asked Ming He if he hadn't told anyone yet. Ming He confirmed that he hadn't, and told Dr. Zhao that it was best for him to explain everything to the officials himself. He asked Dr. Zhao if he really lost blood in that area and if it was the source of pollution. Dr. Zhao confirmed but admitted that he didn't lose it and told Ming He that he's just a student, and there are many things that he can't understand. Ming He thought to himself that something is fishy about Dr. Zhao, but he can't leave since he doesn't know what strange things Dr. Zhao will do there. He told Dr. Zhao that he doesn't understand what he was saying. Dr. Zhao started explaining, cockroaches, maggots, and rats live in the shadow of the city, producing germs and transmitting diseases. They make people want to drive them to extinction. Ming He agreed while wondering what Dr. Zhao was trying to say. Dr. Zhao asked him if he ever thought about humans reproducing recklessly, plundering recklessly, while endlessly creating industrial and chemical pollution. He explained further that humans have been continuously destroying the Earth's environment, to the point where trash is now sent to outer space, and what humans have been doing is no different from cockroaches, maggots, and rats. Ming He agreed that the environment should be protected. Dr. Zhao preached that to the universe, the creation of life is actually wrong itself, there shouldn't be life, a universe without life is marvelous and serene, but once life appeared, it became the equivalent of bacteria intrusion in a healthy body. Humans are the king of germs, an existence comparable to cancer cells. The most notable feature of cancer cells is their ability to divide endlessly, and uncontrollably, destroying any healthy cells. Humans reproduce every generation, and they never stop devastating the world. Humans even want to leave Earth to conquer the solar system, they covet the Milky Way. Wherever humans exist there will never be beauty and peace. After preaching, Dr. Zhao asked Ming He if there was any difference between cancer cells and humans. Ming He answered Dr. Zhao's question by saying that he can't grasp the meaning behind his words since he's just a student, and Dr. Zhao's words are anti-human. 
Dr. Zhao explained to Minghe that if a human is sick, the immune system will eliminate the germs. He thinks that the universe is sick, and he's expecting that the universe will create something that will kill humans. He speculates that the calamities, beasts, disasters, and catastrophes are works of the universe's immune system to completely exterminate the human race. Minghe thinks that Dr. Zhao is acting very weird and has gone insane. He told Dr. Zhao that what he was talking about is beyond the scope of the topic. He pointed out that they're discussing how the source of pollution that induced organisms to mutate was caused by his mistake, and how that killed many people. Dr. Zhao took off his glasses, he claimed that he is a doctor. When people are sick, he treats them and the same applies to the universe. He claims to be the doctor of the universe and he will help the universe eradicate humans who have been proliferating and spreading like cancer cells. He rates cockroaches, rats, and maggots not as terrible as humans. Then he was speechless. Dr. Zhao admitted that he created the source of pollution which started as a simple experiment. He decided to kill the people in Lenyang City first, then everyone in other metropolitan areas. He thinks that the earth must be treated and humans should be annihilated. He planned on dealing with Minghe. He thanked him for being dumb and naive. He was happy that he'll be able to continue his plan to pollute the entire city. Minghe told Dr. Zhao that the southern suburb has been isolated and placed under lockdown, so the mutation source won't spread. Dr. Zhao laughed and asked Minghe if they could block the water supply pipes since all the water in the city passes through there. Through the water supply pipes, the mutation source will spread throughout the entire Lingyang city. The city needs tap water to wash groceries, shower, and clean the streets. All of that uses water from there. Then water will end up in the city's sewer, then all the maggots, cockroaches, and rats in the city will mutate. Mingyi thinks that Dr. Zhao is atrocious and decided to go out. Dr. Zhao is not a superhuman and hence wouldn't be able to hold him back. He told Dr. Zhao that he doesn't understand what Dr. Zhao is saying. He then told Dr. Zhao to continue what he was doing before and that he'll be leaving now. Dr. Zhao was shocked that Minghe was not going to stop him. He thought that Minghe saved people at the hospital as an act of justice and wanted to be a hero who saves the city. As he was leaving, Minghe replied saying that he is the type that fears for his life. He's just trash that wasn't accepted into the Superhuman Institute and he's not qualified to be a hero. Dr. Zhao told Minghe that he is smart for not getting in his way and revealed that he just needs to pour the blood into the tank and his plan will be complete. Even if the officials come it will be too late. As Dr. Zhao was about to take the blood from his lab gown's pocket, he realized that the blood was gone. He remembered that Minghe touched his chest when they were talking. Dr. Zhao was enraged and transformed. He demanded Minghe to return the blood. Minghe pondered if Dr. Zhao's transformation is because of his ability, but immediately realized that Dr. Zhao experimented on himself for the mutation experiment as he saw something bulge in the doctor's right shoulder. Dr. Zhao reached for the bulge, ripped it from his shoulder, and threw it at Minghe. The mass from the doctor's shoulder turned into four small four-legged beasts, with razor-sharp legs like a blade on one of their front legs. He was about to hold onto the ladder when one of the beasts cut off the ladder, and the four beasts immediately surrounded him. The beasts jumped to attack, but he stepped on them and used them to exit the hole. When Minghe landed beside the hole, he noticed concrete, he used mystic punch element extraction and blocked the hole. When the beast was about to jump through the hole, it was blocked and hit the hard concrete head first. Dr. Zhao can smell the Calamity Beast's blood since his body is filled with it, and he thinks that Minghe wouldn't be able to escape from him. Minghe was running through an alley while thinking that a large mutant rat is already strong. A mutated grown man is expected to be much stronger. He speculated that he can't handle the mutated Dr. Zhao. He did not go in his group's direction since with his group's current strength, they'll all just be killed if mutated Dr. Zhao catches up. He decided to drag things on until the officials came to reclaim the Calamity Beast's blood. He relied on Nurse Song. A maggot twitched then Moonglow ranked Huang Feng stepped on it and said extermination was complete. On the west of the abandoned building, Moonglow ranked Xiao Ran. Holding a knife, was sitting on a mutated cockroach's headless body, stepping on its separated head while saying that extermination is complete in their area as well. Moonglow ranked Liao Xiao Jiang suggested that they should return since it just so happened that he had exhausted his magic power. Luo Kaixuan decided to summon his puppets back and was happy to obtain a generous amount of reward money. Their healer asked them if there were any stronger monsters when suddenly the metal plate he was standing on glowed. Bam! The metal plate was thrown away along with the healer. Xiao Ran was quick to react and save the healer. Mutated Dr. Zhao appeared from the hole. Wang Feng thinks that the newcomer healer jinxed them. Liao Xiao Zhang suggested eliminating the mutated Dr. Zhao quickly before finding a place to rest. 
Luo Kaixuan was excited to see a large monster. He immediately calculated that they could probably get a hundred thousand for killing it. He even calculated how much each person can get and thought that it is so much easier than killing maggots. Huang Feng told Dr. Zhao that he was a disgusting monster and he was unlucky to have encountered a group of Munglo ranked superhumans. Dr. Zhao muttered to himself that the best treatment is to eradicate them all and immediately grabbed Huang Feng using his right hand. He used his ability to step back and evade faster. He mocked Dr. Zhao for his slow speed, but when Dr. Zhao's arm extended, he immediately had cold sweats on his face. Mutated Dr. Zhao grabbed Huang Feng's neck and lifted him. He lifted his left arm, and spikes grew from it and pierced Huang Feng. Mutated Dr. Zhao counted one. Xiao Ran was enraged, and slashed at Mutated Dr. Zhao and demanded to drop Huang Feng. She saw Mutated Dr. Zhao's wound close, but she attacked again while calling him an ugly and disgusting monster. When Xiao Ran came close to Mutated Dr. Zhao, Mutated Dr. Zhao simply slashed at her chest using his left hand. Xiao Ran laid flat on the floor then Mutated Dr. Zhao threw Huang Feng beside her body and counted two. Mutated Dr. Zhao asked the rest of the group if they were happy that their teammates died since they can take their share of the reward money now. The rest of the group looked terrified, they were sweating intensely. Mutated Dr. Zhao licked his lips. The four mutated beasts from Mutated Dr. Zhao's body came out of the hole. Mutated Dr. Zhao told them that it was a pity that he was in a rush, or else he would have spent some more time playing with them. The small beasts smelled something and immediately ran in a specific direction. Mutated Dr. Zhao followed the four small mutated beasts. He felt excited knowing Minghi's location and planned to shred him to pieces. The group of four mutated beasts, accompanied by mutated Dr. Zhao, began sprinting towards the location of Minghi. Mutated Dr. Zhao felt thrilled at the prospect of tearing Minghi apart. Simultaneously, Liao Xiao Zhang promptly held onto the lifeless body of Xiao Ran, and they were both left quivering and weeping. The encounter left them both deeply shaken and emotional. After witnessing the monstrous entity, Liu Kaixuan inquired with Liao Xiao Zhang regarding the identity of the creature they had just faced. Liao Xiao Zhang deduced that the creature was most likely a lord rank monster. Both of them felt incredibly fortunate to have made it out alive from the terrifying encounter they had just experienced. Meanwhile, Minghui was fleeing down the streets when he became aware of the four mutated beasts pursuing him from behind. Despite his confusion, having been certain that he had shaken them off, the beasts were still able to track him through the intricate web of streets. Ming he speculated that the beasts had been following his scent to pursue him. Grateful that mutated Dr. Zhao wasn't as fast as the four beasts, Ming he referred to the group of mutated beasts that had separated from mutated Dr. Zhao's body as lymphoma beasts. Ming he was now determined to prevent mutated Dr. Zhao from obtaining his blood. While on the run, he noticed a deserted gas station nearby and used gasoline to partially mask his scent, hoping it would buy him enough time to evade the beasts until help arrived. Upon entering the gasoline station's grocery store, Ming-Hi saw that three of the beasts didn't stop at the station and continued moving, while the fourth one was heading in his direction. Ming-Hi observed the fourth beast as it entered the grocery store. He hid behind a potato chip rack, ready to attack the beast as it approached. But he was surprised when he realized the footsteps had stopped, and upon turning, he saw his reflection and the fourth beast poised to strike in the mirror. Ming-Hi swiftly moved to evade the attack, causing the potato chip rack to fall towards the beast. He then ran towards the door but stopped to think, considering that the fourth beast likely had a heightened sense of smell, and could easily find him again. Recognizing that the fourth beast was separated from the other three, Ming-Hi decided to take the chance and kill it, rather than continually running away. The fourth beast managed to escape from the trap of the potato chip rack. In order to activate his special punch spiritual skill, Ming-Hi's fist needs to make contact with a corresponding medium of the same attribute. He noticed that there were no effective mediums in the market and going outside was risky, as he could be discovered by the other beasts. The fourth beast leaped towards Ming-Hi, using its sharp claws to attack. Unable to find an effective medium, Ming-Hi decided to fight the fourth beast using his own body. He dodged the beast's attack and delivered a blow to its stomach with his left fist, causing the beast to be thrown into a sack of flour. The sack of flour burst, causing the area to fill with flour and impeding Ming-Hi's visibility. The fourth beast seized the opportunity to attack, pouncing on Ming-Hi. Ming-Hi was caught off guard as the beast grabbed his shoulders, with one leg stepping on his right arm and causing him to fall backward with the beast on top of him. The beast attempted to bite Ming-Hi's head, but he managed to evade the attack, causing the beast to lose its balance slightly and loosen its grip on Ming-Hi's shoulders. With a swift motion, Ming-Hi struck the beast's jaws with his right fist, following up with a flurry of blows to keep it off balance. Once Ming-Hi knew the beast couldn't dodge, he delivered a powerful punch. The force of the blow left a visible impact on the market's exterior. Calmly, Ming-Hi turned and walked away from the scene. 
A hole in the market's wall revealed the beast's headless body leaning against it. Meanwhile, in the street, dark-tinged blood sprayed from Dr. Zhao's shoulders. Fuming with anger, Dr. Zhao cursed Minghe before heading to the gasoline station, where he entered the supermarket and found the dead beast. To deal with Minghe, Dr. Zhao concluded that the remaining three beasts needed to evolve. He commanded the beasts to feed on the dead creature, causing them to grow larger and develop sharp bone needles on their spines. Now with enhanced olfactory senses, the beasts were more dangerous than ever. Dr. Zhao ordered them to capture Mingyi alive and without hesitation, the beasts took off in a particular direction. Mingyi sprinted through the street until he spotted the three beasts charging towards him. Puzzled, he questioned how the remaining beasts could locate him despite killing the one with a heightened sense of smell. The beasts were barking ferociously and leaping over the parked cars. Then he detected a change in the beasts' barks, which now sounded more daunting. Their barks grew increasingly more menacing. Ahead, Mingyi glimpsed an amusement park. He believed the site was ideal, filled with intricate machinery that he could utilize when the beasts caught up with him. Mingyi felt confident that he would become stronger as long as he had a unique medium. To avoid catching fire while using the blazing punch, he decided to wash off the gasoline. Despite the beast's ability to track him, Mingyi believed it was better to keep moving than to hide. Mingyi formulated a plan to create a gap between himself and the beasts, killing as many as possible, knowing he was powerless against Dr. Zhao. As the sun began to set, Mingyi walked through the amusement park. Footsteps on the rooftop caught his attention, and he pivoted to see the evolved beast. He was astounded by the creature's significant growth. The beast leaped from the building with an axe in its left hand, striking the ground with the blade. Mingyi avoided the attack in time, but he noticed the beast's increased power. The beast attacked again, jumping towards him with an axe in its right hand. Despite its relentless attacks, Minghe managed to dodge every blow. Minghe retreated and observed that the beast's speed had slowed down. He decided to confront the beast and fight back. Suddenly, the other two beasts appeared, each flanking Minghe. In order to retreat, Minghe ran towards the roller coaster ride's tracks. He planned to fight the beasts one by one using the narrow tracks to his advantage. Climbing up the track, he used Mystic Punch Element Extraction on his fists as soon as he reached the top. When a beast jumped to attack him, he immediately punched with metal-covered fists to cancel the attack and release a shockwave. Minghe disrupted the balance of the beast with his left hand and punched through its chest with his right, causing it to fall from the track. The Mystic Punch, after absorbing metal, can pierce through monsters on the level of Evolved Beasts which is at least Warlord rank. Feeling confident facing the Evolved Beasts one by one, Minghe continued on. The front beast continued to move forward while the other tried to crawl to the lower side of the track to get behind him. The front beast attacked with sharp axe hands, but Minghe blocked and parried with his right arm, leaving its chest defenseless. Minghe took the opportunity to swing his left hand and punch the beast's chest, but ribcage-like bone armor grew from its chest before the impact. The beast was thrown away, but Minghe's punch was not able to pierce through its chest due to the bone armor. Minghe was shocked at how quickly the beasts were able to evolve. The beast below him tried to bite him but he was quick on his feet and evaded the attack. Minghe counter-attacked and kicked the beast's neck. The beast grinned and bone needles formed on its neck. He thinks that the composition of the beast is ridiculous. The beast started to crawl up to the upper side of the track and the beast that was thrown away climbed back already and was now behind him. Minghe was surrounded by the two beasts. The two beasts simultaneously attacked Minghe. He blocked, punched, and evaded ever so barely. The beast in front of him came too close and Minghe used this opportunity to punch it in the jaw with his right fist while simultaneously elbowing the beast behind him with his left elbow. The beast behind Minghe got knocked out. While the beast in front of him was still conscious and started attacking again, Minghe fought back and punched the beast non-stop. The battle between Minghe and the beast continued, he is the one pushing the beast back. Eventually, the beast lost its advantage after the other got knocked out. Minghe threw a powerful left punch. The beast crossed its arms and blocked his punch. It then slid downward as his punch was blocked again. After receiving the punch, the beast grinned at Minghe, as if to mock Minghe for lacking firepower. However, Minghe was indifferent to the beast's taunt. The beast was moving towards him when the roller coaster vehicle suddenly moved. Consequently, the beast didn't notice the movement and was run over by the roller coaster vehicle. Minghe was hanging on a bar between the rails as the roller coaster vehicle moved past him. Before his encounter with the evolved beasts, he went to the control room. He had confirmed that the electricity is still connected and decided to use the roller coaster ride to eliminate the rest of the beasts. 
Minghi, still hanging on the bar, looked down and calculated that if he falls from there, he will either break his legs or die immediately. The knocked out beast regained consciousness and is now hanging on a bar between the rails near Minghi. The beast used its tail to hang into the bar and attacked Minghi with its two axe hands. He was forced to let go of the bar he was hanging on and block the attack of the beast. Minghi then held the axe hands of the beast. He determined that since the beasts are parasites living off of Dr. Zhao, Dr. Zhao will lose a part of himself if the beast dies. He pulled the beast as he was falling. The beast lets go of its hold on the bar, thinking that killing Minghi with it is still its victory. However, he pulled the beast below him and stepped on it. Minghi plans to use the beast as a cushion for the impact. The beast wailed and cried as it was about to face its doom. It was then smashed to the ground, dust swirled and Minghi appeared from the smoke, dusting his shirt. He thinks that the beast just got what it deserved for being arrogant. The sky was already dark, and night came. Minghi went to the nearest faucet, and he was on the phone with Nurse Song. She asked Minghi why he didn't answer any of her calls and if he is alright. He told Nurse Song that his phone was muted. Nurse Song informed him that the officials have arrived at the building he mentioned and the area is under their control now. She also informed him that the officials are currently eradicating the monsters they discovered inside but didn't see him or Dr. Zhao. Minghi explained everything to her. The fact that Dr. Zhao planned the entire pollution incident and that he is at an amusement park. He also told Nurse Song about Dr. Zhao's plan on pouring the polluted blood serum into the city's water supply to completely contaminate Lenyang City's sewage system. Nurse Song was shocked to know that Dr. Zhao could do such an atrocious thing. Minghi informed Nurse Song that he was able to steal the blood serum from Dr. Zhao and he thinks that the serum is what caused the mutation. Nurse Song explained to Minghi that both antibodies and the mutation source should be present in the organism's blood serum. After experts extract the antibodies from the blood serum, the polluted southern suburb will be able to return to normal. She told Minghi that the blood serum he has is extremely important. She instructed Minghi to stay where he is because she will tell the officials to send people over to the amusement park to pick him up. Minghi disagreed and instructed Nurse Song to tell the officials to meet him at the Southern Tower instead since Dr. Zhao is still chasing him and he can't stay in the same place. He then asked Nurse Song to tell the officials that Dr. Zhao mutated and they need the help of experts otherwise Dr. Zhao will simply kill everyone. After Nurse Song agreed, Minghi started running. When Minghi arrived at the Southern Tower, Dr. Zhao was already there, expecting his arrival. Dr. Zhao returned to his human form. Minghi was shocked to see Dr. Zhao. Dr. Zhao greeted Minghi and asked him to look up. When Minghi looked up, he saw his former classmates, Lin Yaoyu, Zhu Zheng, Lu Xinghong, Wang Xion and riding the drop tower. Dr. Zhao explained that he bumped into them on his way there. He initially wanted to kill them but kept them alive after learning that they knew Minghi. Everyone begged Minghi to save them. They were pleading innocence and pointing out that the monster's target is Minghi and not them. They were crying and screaming how they didn't want to die yet. Lin Yaoyu was crying while asking Minghi to run and told him he is not strong enough to face Dr. Zhao. She informed Minghi that Dr. Zhao is a general-ranked monster. Minghi doesn't know what to do. He is sure that he can't defeat the mutated Dr. Zhao. He is willing to forget about Su Zhen, Lu Xinghong, Wang Xiaodan but he can't abandon Lin Yaoyu. Minghi decided to stall for time until the officials arrive. That's the only solution he has so everyone can survive. While Minghi was thinking, Dr. Zhao was slowly and confidently approaching him. When Dr. Zhao was close enough, he asked Minghi if there was someone he especially cares about among his four classmates. He wondered if it could be Minghi's girlfriend and speculated that the person who Minghi especially cares about is definitely the one who told Minghi to run. Lin Yaoyu blushed and explained to Dr. Zhao that they were just classmates looking after one another. Dr. Zhao laughed and asked Minghi if they were just classmates and if is it worth it for Minghi to risk his life just for Lin Yaoyu. Minghi told Dr. Zhao that he would never understand because there's a difference between people and bastards. Dr. Zhao's face darkened and asked Minghi if he was trying to call him a bastard. Minghi smirked while saying that he was reminded of all the rubbish Dr. Zhao said back in the underground. He found everything Dr. Zhao said funny. For Dr. Zhao, life and humanity are cancer cells that have been invading the universe and causing it to be sick. But to Minghi, it's the existence of life, the appearance of humanity, that gave life to the lonely universe. The evolution of the universe led to the rise of life. Dr. Zhao questioned how evolution led to the rise of life and how humanity is evolving. Minghi thinks that both thought and civilizations are constantly evolving that includes humanity, which led to the existence of superhumans. Dr. Zhao rejected the idea and told Minghi that superhumans are simply stubborn viruses that can defend themselves. He admitted that some viruses are more difficult to eradicate than others since they have the ability to become stronger through evolution. Dr. Zhao said those words while glaring at Minghi. Minghi looked guilty and evaded Dr. Zhao's glare. He proposed that since both of them insist on their own opinions and can't prove which one is right, they should simply resolve it. Whoever is stronger is right. He claimed that he represents humanity. 
He then asked Dr. Zhao what he represents. Dr. Zhao told Minghe that he represents the universe's supreme power, the supreme power that will annihilate humanity. Minghe took out the blood plasma and told Dr. Zhao that if he defeats him, he will give the blood plasma to Dr. Zhao. Dr. Zhao smirked and told Minghe that he doesn't know his place. Minghe provoked Dr. Zhao that if he can't even defeat a student like him who could not enter the superhuman institute, then he should just stop with his ridiculous belief. He mocked Dr. Zhao further, even telling him that he is a loser, bastard, and trash, but Dr. Zhao did not take the bait and remained calm. Dr. Zhao thinks that it is not necessary to make things so troublesome for him. If Minghe will not give the blood plasma, he will simply kill Minghe's four former classmates. Minghe dared Dr. Zhao to kill his former classmates. He told Dr. Zhao that they're all students of the Superhuman Institute. To begin with anyway, upon induction, students of the Superhuman Institute will vow with their life to protect the nation, its cities, and its citizens at all costs. Ming He told Dr. Zhao that it is worth exchanging his former classmates' lives for the safety of everyone in Lenyang City. Lin Yaoyu had a dignified look while Zhu Zhen, Lu Xinghong, Wang Xiaodan were crying listening to Ming He's words. Dr. Zhao accepted Ming He's daring and bone needles started to grow out of his left arm. He told Mingyi that he will now kill his former classmates. Dr. Zhao then grabbed one of the bone needles and broke it. He now has a knife-like weapon. He threw the bone needle into the drop tower and hit Zhu Zheng's right leg. Zhu Zheng and Wang Xiaodan's eyes widened, while Zhu Zheng cried and screamed at the top of his lungs. Mingyi started running away. Dr. Zhao warned Mingyi that he is going to aim for Mingyi's former classmate's pretty face and threw another bone needle into the drop tower again. Afterward, the bone needle pierced through Lin Yaoyu's right shoulder. Dr. Zhao claimed that he missed again. Minghe started to run faster. Dr. Zhao was shocked and got furious. He further threatened Minghe that if he does not stop running, he will pierce holes all over Minghe's former classmates. However, Minghe totally turned his back on his former classmates and kept on running. Dr. Zhao could not afford to let Minghe run away again. Catching Minghe would be difficult for Dr. Zhao once Minghe puts his mind to running away. Dr. Zhao is thinking that although it would be a waste of time, he can at least take the opportunity to destroy Ming He and get his revenge. He grinned and accepted Ming He's offer. Ming He stopped running and released a sigh of relief. Bone needles grew around Ming He. Dr. Zhao suddenly mutated and attacked the ground. Dust and debris were blown away. When the dust settled, an area surrounded by bone needles was revealed. Dr. Zhao told Ming He that it would be meaningless if he would just run around in circles. So, the area surrounded by bone needles would be their arena. He then threatened to kill one of Minghe's previous classmates every time Minghe gets out of bounds. Minghe agreed without hesitation. Dr. Zhao told Minghe that he can save his previous classmates and become a hero who saved the entire city of Lanyang if he beats him. He broke a red-colored bone needle that grew from his left arm while telling Minghe that he is too weak to actually achieve those things. He told him that he heard that Minghe ended up in the hospital because he did not pass the Superhuman Institute's entrance exam and chose to attempt suicide. Dr. Zhao could not believe that he happened to be the one who did Minghe's surgery. He told Minghe that he is just a nameless failure who couldn't even pass the superhuman exam. No one expects anything out of him, and the only thing his classmates felt for him was a pity. Dr. Zhao expressed his classmates spent more time laughing at his stupidity. Nobody cared about him aside from when his teacher forced everyone to give him flowers at the beginning. And after that, barely anyone visited him for an entire year. At this moment, Dr. Zhao was attacking Minghe physically and mentally. Minghe just dodged Dr. Zhao's physical attacks and remained silent. Dr. Zhao despised Minghe for living a menial and depressing life, and now he's trying to act almighty and be a hero. At the same time, Minghe is having difficulties dodging all of Dr. Zhao's attacks and he is getting pushed back. Lin Yaoyu asked Minghe to run away. Dr. Zhao saw an opening. His right hand turned into a sickle and he immediately slashed. Minghe stepped back but his chest is now bleeding. Lin Yaoyu cried and begged Minghe to just go. However, Minghe remained silent and slowly stood up while holding his bleeding chest with his left hand. Dr. Zhao asked Minghe why he even bothered to wake up and told him that he should have just died on the operating table a year ago. He then licked his hand and told Minghe that he is awake now but can't change a thing. Minghe was about to step outside the arena of bone needles but remembered that Dr. Zhao threatened to kill one of his former classmates if he steps out of bounds. Dr. Zhao moved close to Minghe and told him that he is just an insignificant bug in the world. Dr. Zhao slashed to finish him off but Minghe flicked blood to Dr. Zhao's eyes and immediately moved to his back. Minghe's hands glowed red and he punched Dr. Zhao's head while telling him that he disgusts him and that the one who's living a filthy and depressing life is him. Dr. Zhao lay flat on the floor. It turns out that one of the strongest mediums of the mystic punch is Minghe's own blood. Minghe called the technique Blood Fiend Fist. Minghe's former classmates started cheering for Minghe from the drop tower. They asked Minghe to kill Dr. Zhao. Zhu Zheng cried and begged Minghe to save them first. He was afraid he'll run out of blood and die. 
Wang Xion told Zhu Zhang that Ming He is bleeding more than him. She called Zhu Zhang and Lu Xinghong pusses. Lin Yaoyu was crying while begging Ming He to take care of his wound first. At this moment, Ming He was bleeding too much. Suddenly, a bone needle was thrown to the ground. Dr. Zhao started talking. He told Ming He and his former classmates they are too noisy. He threatened Ming He's previous classmates that he will rip them to shreds after dealing with him. Dr. Zhao removed the arena bone needles that punctured him when he fell on his back. Right after that, Ming He's previous classmates immediately got silent. Dr. Zhao got up while removing the last bone needle which pierced his shoulder. He told Ming He that he noticed that Ming He's superpower is his fist. At this moment, Ming He's arms are not glowing red anymore. Before Dr. Zhao could remove the last bone needle, Ming He took the opportunity to land a punch in Dr. Zhao's face. The punch turned Dr. Zhao's head. Although Dr. Zhao admired Ming He's punch, he claimed that it was useless against him. He then remembered that Ming He killed a mutated giant demon rat with a blazing punch near the bridge by the hospital. Ming He's arms glowed red once again and Ming He immediately rained Dr. Zhao's head and body with punches. Dr. Zhao could not defend himself against Ming He's punches. Afterward, he finished the combination of punches with a strong left punch. Dr. Zhao was pushed back but remained standing. At the same time, he talked again and told Ming He that he noticed that Ming He can absorb different mediums and exert corresponding effects with his punches. Dr. Zhao found Ming He's superpowers interesting but he is confident that it won't be enough to defeat someone as strong as him. At this moment, Lu Xinghong remembered that Ming He's superpower is a white dust rank and conspicuous type which has something to do with being lucky and could not be used for combat. Wang Xiaodan was confused too, but right now, the only thing she knows is that Ming He is stronger than any of them. So she cheered for Ming He and asked him to kill Dr. Zhao. Meanwhile, Dr. Zhao took a step which caused the ground to crack. He came close to Ming He and told him that he currently has the strength of a lord rank and he's not like those cockroaches and maggots Ming He killed. He mocked Ming He that with his blue spirit superpower, he won't be able to beat him even if he punched him until his fists are destroyed. He sarcastically asked how it feels to be completely under the control of someone else and played with. Even after giving it his all, he laughed and proclaimed that the weak will stay weak, even if they become superhuman. Ming He can never compare to his perfect body and he is not the only one with fists. Dr. Zhao, while talking, prepared to punch Ming He. However, Ming He reacted fast and countered Dr. Zhao's fist with his own. Nevertheless, he was pushed back. His attack seemed pointless since Dr. Zhao just heals back with his regeneration ability. Dr. Zhao then chased him and continued punching. Ming He can only evade and block Dr. Zhao's attacks. He didn't have the chance to counterattack. And worse, he noticed that Dr. Zhao's attacks have become much faster after he shaped his hand into a fist. Right then, Dr. Zhao saw an opening. He immediately punched Ming He's stomach with his left fist. Ming He was not fast enough to dodge or block Dr. Zhao's attack. As a result, he was thrown away by the punch. Bone needles then grew from Dr. Zhao's body. He fired the bone needles toward Ming He who is still in midair. There's nothing Ming He can do but block the bone needles with his arms. However, Dr. Zhao was puzzled that not even one of the bone needles he shot at a close distance hit Ming He. At the same time, Ming He landed safely and was surprised too. Dr. Zhao then suddenly remembered that Ming He has an inconspicuous type of superpower, luck. He admired Ming He's luck and its usefulness. If a single needle had landed, Ming He would have died or at least been crippled. Afterward, he took a large bone needle that grew from his arm and aimed at the drop tower like wielding a spear. He then told Ming He it is unfortunate his former classmates are not as lucky as Ming He. Ming He was puzzled, he reinstated to Dr. Zhao that they had a deal. However, Dr. Zhao laughed and told Ming He that he is not breaking his promise, and then he advised Ming He to look where he is standing. Ming He realized that he got pushed out of the boundary. Dr. Zhao then said that because of his incompetence, one of his former classmates will die. Su Zhen, Lu Xinghong, and Wang Xiaodan screamed and begged Dr. Zhao to spare them. Lin Yaoyu's eyes reflected the bone spear, and moments later, the bone spear pierced through her chest. Her eyes widened and her head fell limply right after. Ming He stared at Lin Yaoyu with wide eyes. Shock, disbelief, and sadness can be seen on Ming He's face. He bit his lower lip and rage took over him. Dr. Zhao told Ming He that he should not be so uptight. From Dr. Zhao's professional medical standpoint, as long as Lin Yaoyu doesn't pull the bone spear out, she will not die immediately, but she won't have any chance of survival if she does not receive treatment within five minutes. Ming He, still filled with rage, came closer to the bone needles that surrounded him and purposely pierced his own hands. Afterward, he closed his fists and the tip of the bone needle broke. His hands broke free from being pierced. Right then, his fists glowed red once again. At the same time, he declared to Dr. Zhao that before five minutes are up, he will be killed. They both ran toward each other. Right now, Ming He's arms are no longer glowing. 
He punched Dr. Zhao's chest but it seems that the punch did not affect him. Dr. Zhao counter-attacked and punched Minghi's face while telling him that his superpower is only blue spirit rank after all. He pointed out he is pretty much at his limit and even if Minghi uses up all the blood he has, it still won't be enough. Dr. Zhao was confident that he felt that he doesn't even need to fight back and Minghi will still die due to blood loss soon enough. He kept on talking while easily blocking and attacking Minghi. He wants to humiliate Minghi to the fullest. Dr. Zhao expressed that Minghi is just as pitiful as he looked when he was first sent to the hospital after he tried to kill himself. What doctors like him hate the most are people who survive a suicide attempt. If Minghi could not even succeed in something as easy as killing himself, then he should not live at all. Minghi is the one that wanted to die, yet he just had to end up getting sent to the hospital and make the doctors save him and waste their precious time and efforts. He is just a pitiful worm, and nobody cares about him and expressed that he is so weak and pathetic that even when he finally decided to kill himself, he still failed. Dr. Zhao kept the mental attack going. He brought up what Minghi caused to his family how his sister gave up all her dignity when his medical expenses were in arrears. His sister kneeled and begged him to not remove Minghi from the hospital. He and his sister have always lived in the bottommost part of the city, working with their bodies for those with power and riches. He then asked why he is fooling himself and trying to pretend that he is someone so great. When Dr. Zhao finished the question, he landed a heavy punch on Minghi and pushed him away. Dr. Zhao squatted down and jumped. While in midair, Dr. Zhao offered Minghi to let him end his miserable life so that he won't be able to burden anyone else ever again. He then joined both of his hands together and bone spikes protruded from his hands. Dr. Zhao looked below and saw Minghi's small figure. He screamed and told him that he is really insignificant. He was falling after the jump and prepared to wallop Minghi at the same time. Dr. Zhao used Colossus Hammer Smash. When Dr. Zhao landed, dust gathered around him and nothing could be seen. Once the smoke dissipated, Dr. Zhao got up and when he looked in front of him, his face looked surprised. He commended Minghi for evading his Colossus Hammer Smash attack but it is unfortunate he is out of bounds again. Huge bone spikes formed around Dr. Zhao and it can be seen that Minghi is definitely out of bounds. If he did not leave the arena, the huge bone spikes would have surely pierced Minghi. Dr. Zhao then said that someone else will have to die instead because he evaded his attack. Afterward, he grabbed one of the huge bone spikes. But this time, Minghi finally talked back. He told Dr. Zhao that he has never tried to kill himself and he values his life more than anyone else. Dr. Zhao dismissed Minghi and expressed that it doesn't matter and that what matters is he just caused the death of another one of his previous classmates. But Minghi replied that Dr. Zhao is the one who nobody cares about. His sister gave up all her dignity and begged Dr. Zhao because she cares about him, her only family. He remembered his sister's words when he was still in the hospital. It was alright if he never woke up again. She will still come to visit him even when she was so old that she'll need to walk to the hospital with a cane. He told Dr. Zhao that even Nurse Song did not abandon him. When the animal mutations happened and everyone was busy running for their lives, she did not leave him. Who has not woken up in a year? This time, he will never abandon his former classmates because Lin Yaoyu took the lead and helped collect donations from his whole class for him. At this moment, Lin Yaoyu was crying, eyes closed while listening to Ming He's words. Dr. Zhao retorted that his words are meaningless since the girl who collected the donations is about to die in front of him. Ming He's left eye was bleeding but he looked serious and determined. He told Dr. Zhao that although he has the ability to self-heal and regenerate body parts, every single punch he landed still left a mark on his body. The next second, Ming He's fist suddenly glowed red. He then revealed that he landed a total of 49 punches. At this moment, Dr. Zhao exclaimed, he started sweating and got cautious. Right then, huge blue fists formed above Ming He. His stance looked as if he was about to punch. He pounced at Dr. Zhao while shouting the name of his ultimate move. Star Mark Galactic Fists. Ming He screamed at the top of his lungs. Dr. Zhao was confused after knowing that Ming He is using an ultimate move, a violet soul rank superpower. He could not believe that someone like him who is a part of Heaven's sovereign organization would lose to a lowlife who could not even get into the Superhuman Institute. The fists were reflected in Dr. Zhao's eyes. Shortly after, the fists rained down like an avalanche. When the impact reached Minghi's former classmates, their eyes widened and they were utterly shocked. A pit formed from where Dr. Zhao was standing, and Dr. Zhao lay flat in the middle of the pit. Meanwhile, Minghi was kneeling beside the pit. He stood up while telling Dr. Zhao that his current power is indeed insignificant, but it is still a thousand times greater than a disgusting evil bastard like him. 
He then immediately went to the control room of the drop tower and used the mechanisms to lower his former classmates. Afterward, he ran towards the drop tower and confirmed that they were starting to descend. At this moment, his former classmates excluding Lin Yaoyu were still talking to each other about Ming He having a Violet Soul rank. They did not think that Ming He's superpower was Violet Soul rank all along. They were amazed that Ming He can already use an ultimate move. They realized how strong he is. Wang Xiaodan still had tears flowing from her eyes when she thanked Ming He. He is so strong and the Superhuman Institute must be blind for not accepting him. Lu Xinghong and Wang Xiaodan believe there has to be something wrong with the testing system of the Superhuman Institute since they did not accept him even though he is so powerful. They even speculated that the examiner must have not done their job properly. Afterward, Lu Xinghong stopped talking when he saw Ming He holding Lin Yaoyu. She forced herself to speak and asked Ming He if she was going to die. Ming He replies she will not die since the officials will be there soon. At the same time, Wang Xiaodan was shocked as she seemed to have seen something. Meanwhile, Lin Yaoyu then told Ming He that none of them knew that he was so strong. On the other hand, Su Zheng could only laugh awkwardly beside her. Soon, Lu Xinghong and Wang Xiaodan saw the officials and started shouting and waving their hands to attract the officials' attention. Simultaneously, the officials saw Ming He and his former classmates. They were led by a woman with cat ears named Liu Lin. Commander Luo Lin immediately instructed her subordinate to eliminate the threat, and that she will take care of the wounded. The medical personnel following behind her noticed that Ming He's group is just a bunch of students, so she asked Lu Xinghong to step away and let the medical personnel take care of everything. One of the medical personnel said that Lin Yaoyu's situation should not be life-threatening if they can start the procedure fast enough since the spear wasn't pulled out. Meanwhile, Ming He was standing beside Commander Luo Lin when she noticed his heavy wounds. She quickly requested the medical personnel to patch up Ming He first. On Lin Yaoyu's side, emergency personnel prepared for a blood transfusion and started the emergency treatment. On the other hand, Commander Luo Lin told Ming He that on their way they detected a Lord Rank mutant organism. She deemed Ming He and his former classmates lucky to be alive. She then asked Ming He where the Lord Rank mutant organism escaped to. Lin Qingyu, Sunblaze Rank, the one that Commander Luo Lin instructed to illuminate the threat approached them. He reported the threat has been resolved, but she reminded him not to be careless on a mission. She thinks that the Lord Rank mutant organism could still be lurking nearby and looking for an opening to attack. Lin Qingyu then revealed the Lord Rank mutant organism is already dead and the corpse is still in the hole. He saw a human mutant that probably used the pollution source to conduct a mutation alteration to its own body. She was shocked after knowing that the Lord Rank mutant organism is already dead. She immediately turned around and asked who killed the Lord Rank mutant organism. Everyone then pointed to Ming He. Commander Luo Lin asked if he really killed the Lord Rank mutant organism. Ming He, who was getting bandaged by medical personnel, answered yes and informed her that he is the person who reported to them. Afterward, he took the opportunity to introduce himself. The medical person who's bandaging Ming He asked him to stop moving. But he did not mind and took out the blood bottle and gave it to Commander Liu Lin while telling her that it is the source of pollution that he stole from Dr. Zhao. He then explained that Dr. Zhao was planning on releasing the blood in the water pipes. She accepted the blood and observed it. After a moment, she suddenly exclaimed and asked how he did it. Ming He misunderstood her question and told her that he took the blood when Dr. Zhao was talking and not paying attention. She then rephrased the question. She asked how he managed to kill a Lord Rank mutant. He reveals that he killed Dr. Zhao with his fists. The medical person was irritated since Ming He won't stop moving. But Ming He did not care and explained to Commander Luo Lin that his superpower is his fists. She asked what his rank was in the department he belongs to. Ming He then answered he is an apprentice starlight rank. She thinks that it is ridiculous that a monster who killed two Munglo rank superhumans was killed by an apprentice starlight rank. Wang Xiaodan respectfully chimed in that Ming He really did become a superhuman just a few days ago and that he did not even get into the Superhuman Institute. Eventually, Ming He's emergency treatment was done and he thanked the medical personnel. At this moment, Commander Luo Lin seemed to have remembered something. She recognized Ming He as the arrogant and disobedient student on the other side of the walkie-talkie a few days ago. One of the medical personnel also remembered Ming He as the little hero who saved a bus full of people in Nanjiao Hospital. The medical person explained he couldn't recognize Ming He before when he had all the blood on his face. Lin Qingyu held Ming He's shoulder and told him that this time he is a big hero who saved the entire city of Lanyang, and he made the high-ranking superhumans look like statues that are just for show. Ming He replied he was just simply giving everything he had to buy time and protect his former classmates. Commander Luo Lin then asked if he was interested in joining
joining the official superhuman organization. The job is well paid, has various benefits, and all of his to-be colleagues are just as pretty as her. Lin Kingu muttered to himself that she was being shameless, but she was irritated and asked Lin Kingu to repeat what he said. So Lin Kingu hurriedly flattered her by telling that all those female colleagues are far inferior compared to her. After hearing the words, a medical person laughed behind them. Commander Luo Lin then told Ming He to think about it since his family lives in Nanjiao, and the Superhuman Institute does not want him. The official superhuman organization will welcome him with open arms. Ming He replied he will think about it, but when he was about to finish his sentence, he suddenly fainted. Commander Luo Lin and Lin Qinghu immediately acted to catch Ming He. A medical person immediately checked Ming He's condition. It was determined he probably fainted from the blood loss that came from his injuries. In short, he overexerted himself. Commander Luo Lin decided to immediately bring Ming He to a hospital and instructed someone to prepare a press statement. On December 27, Wednesday, Takiwa News covered Lanyang City's most recent victory. The news reporter talked about how the city of Lanyang has been cleansed of all mutant creatures through the tireless efforts of the Superhuman Institute, the Hunters Association, and the official superhuman organization. The news reporter also talked about how a certain person who searched for the contaminated site and promptly halted the spread of the contamination made a great contribution during that time. The hero of Lanyang is currently in a hospital receiving treatment, and they plan on having an exclusive interview with the hero once he wakes up. In Lanyang Hospital, Ming He was still unconscious in his hospital bed. Nurse Song was sitting beside his hospital bed, she looked worried. After a moment, he suddenly opened his eyes. Nurse Song was so happy seeing him wake up. She told Ming He that he slept for two whole days and they were worried that he would never wake up. Ming He asked why she was there. She revealed she was transferred there and she made a special request to the hospital to specifically take care of him. She then said that he became Lan Yang's young hero and a lot of reporters are waiting to interview him outside. She kept smiling all throughout the conversation. Ming He suddenly asked Nurse Song about Lin Yao Yu's condition and what happened to her. She answered she is still in the intensive care unit. But she already asked the doctor and the doctor said that Lin Yao Yu's condition is not life-threatening anymore. Nurse Song then assured him that as long as Lin Yao Yu stays in the hospital, slowly recovering from her injuries, she would be fine. Ming He is now sitting and Nurse Song is fixing his pillow for him. He was relieved after hearing the good news from Nurse Song. The door of the room suddenly opened, and a young woman and an old man in military uniform entered the room. Commander Luo Lin with General Lai of the official superhuman organization immediately asked for Ming He's condition. He replied, saying he was feeling great, nothing too serious. On the side, Nurse Song praised Ming He's physique. Ming He's injuries recovered exceptionally fast. Commander Luo Lin was pleased and said that Ming He is more than fit for their official superhuman organization. They just so happened to need a superhuman with a monstrous body. General Lai stood respectfully and called Ming He's name to get his attention. He revealed that he did not only discover Zhao Xuhua's scheme but also prevented the disaster from spreading throughout the city. He expressed his sincere gratitude for Ming He's service on behalf of the city of Lanyang's official superhuman organization. Together, General Lai and Commander Luo Lin bowed to Ming He. Nurse Song was shocked but Ming He simply told them that he just did what he had to do. After a moment, General Lai and Ming He looked at each other, and the room's atmosphere suddenly changed. Commander Luo Lin then told Nurse Song that she happens to have her day off and asked her if they could go outside and discuss where they would eat. Nurse Song agreed, saying that it has been a while since they hung out together. She demanded milk tea, a meal, and dessert. Commander Luo Lin agreed and promised that it's her treat. And as soon as they went out of the room, General Lai sat down. Ming He talked first. He asked General Lai what's the important matter that he wants to speak with him alone. General Lai wondered how he knew that he had something important to tell. Ming He answered that he noticed Commander Luo Lin lied about having a day off and just used it as an excuse to make Nurse Song leave. General Lai praised Ming He's ability to perceive things. He said that he heard about his fight against Zhao Xuhua from Nurse Song and his former classmates. In terms of real strength, he is no match for Zhao Xuhua, but despite the difference in strength, he was still able to defeat Dr. Zhao which is an extraordinary feat. Many superhumans are under the false misconception that higher ranked superhumans are automatically stronger. In reality, that isn't the case. Not only do superhumans need to know how to make good use of their abilities, but they also need to know how to use ingenuity. And because of that, General Lai praised Ming He's skills. Ming He then said he thinks it is because his hidden superpower is luck. He is a little luckier than ordinary people. General Lai replied that there is no need to be so humble and good luck can only temporarily protect him. 
He then pointed out how Ming He matched wits with Dr. Zhao for so long, which can't be chalked up as good luck. Ming He told General Lai that he is too kind. After a moment, General Lai seriously asked Ming He what he heard from Dr. Zhao. Ming He answered that what Dr. Zhao told him was just a lot of ravings, things about humanity being the cancer of the universe. Afterward, he revealed everything Dr. Zhao had told him. General Lai reacted upon hearing about the heavenly sovereignty. He revealed that what Dr. Zhao said was not exactly ravings. Ming He was confused by General Lai's words. So General Lai disclosed that according to their research, all the calamity demons originated from meteors. Every meteor harbors a creature that poses a threat to humanity. All creatures have instincts and the first instinct is that life in their world was to survive. He then asked if he knows what is the first instinct that those meteor calamity demons had. Ming He guessed that the first instinct of the calamity demons is to kill. General Lai said that he is correct. Calamity demons' first instinct was to kill, to slaughter. They would kill until humanity itself would cease to exist. Ming He asked General Lai if they are really the cancer cells of the universe. General Lai explained survival was their first instinct and their second instinct was exploration and curiosity. So, he couldn't answer Ming He's questions since humanity is still in the period of exploring the universe. The top superhumans and cosmologists are unable to answer what reality nor truth is. Ming He said if the universe truly didn't need humans and wanted them to be extinct, it would have never gifted them with superpowers since humanity's superhumans have the power to compete with the calamity demons. General Lai replied he makes a good point and the birth of superhumans is the most telling evidence that refutes the theory that humans are the universe's cancer cells. He speculates that perhaps they are just the newborns of the universe, and the invading calamity demons are the germs of the universe. He then expressed that before the ultimate truth is discovered, they never plan on getting overwhelmed by the invading calamity creatures. With his right fist on his chest, General Lai told Ming He that superhumans will shield humanity's voyage of exploration, keeping the flames of civilization burning bright. Ming He replied he is also a superhuman now, and although he is not at the level of protecting all of humanity, he promised to at least safeguard everyone close to him. General Lai then said that to conclude their conversation, there are two things he must confirm with Ming He. He hoped that Ming He would not withhold anything from him. Ming He agreed without hesitation. General Lai stated the first matter, a year ago, their astronomy team detected a meteor dubbed as the goddess. Once the meteor entered the Earth's atmosphere, it suddenly changed its trajectory and exploded above Earth, and Ming He just so happened to be in the vicinity of one of the meteorites and went unconscious for a whole year because of it. Afterward, General Lai asked Ming He what he saw. Ming He revealed that he only saw a dazzling light engulf the sky and lost consciousness soon after. General Lai was skeptical and asked if he was sure that he did not see a thing, such as anything running out of the meteorite. Ming He replied that he really didn't see anything. He asked if there had been one of those terrifying calamity demons inside the meteor. General Lai stood up, came close to the window, and opened the curtain. He told Ming He that they classify calamities on a scale of 1 to 12. A grade 1 calamity is no less destructive than a natural disaster such as a tornado, and the mutant demon matter in Nanjiao was classified as a grade 3 calamity. He explained that Dr. Zhao had originally wanted to take advantage of the water supply advancing to grade 6 calamity which Ming He stopped just in time. Ming He was shocked to know that a serious matter such as the mutant incident was only classified as a grade 3 calamity. General Lai disclosed that the initial assessment of the calamity they were monitoring, the goddess, has already established it to be a grade 9 calamity. Ming He was startled after hearing that it was a grade 9 calamity. General Lai revealed that the goddess' destructive capabilities extend over provinces which could threaten the entirety of South China. Ming He realized how terrifying the goddess' calamity is. General Lai then explained that the meteor itself is not scary. What's scary is the thing it carries inside. Five years ago, there appeared a grade 8 calamity in South China. The thing that was responsible for the grade 8 calamity was an emperor-class calamity beast. The source of pollution was actually the emperor-class calamity beast's blood. And back then, there were underground merchants who secretly held on to the calamity beast's blood. Ming He was disturbed knowing that just a small amount of blood could already cause so much, but there were actually people holding large quantities of such blood. General Lai informed the thing that's inside the Calamity Meteor, the goddess, is equally as terrifying and may even threaten the existence of humanity. The official superhuman organization has been searching for the meteorite for a long time without any success. Ming He is not only their closest witness, but he also personally experienced the shockwaves of the meteor. The official superhuman organization would like to obtain some clues about the matter from him.
Minghe apologized for not being able to give any valuable clues regarding the goddess. General Lai replied that he should not apologize since they were just asking for confirmation. He speculates that maybe the thing inside the meteor could have been staying in the other meteor fragments. It could have fallen to a different place or maybe a different country. Minghe then changed the topic and asked what is the second thing that General Lai wanted to ask. General Lai came closer to him. He revealed that Commander Luo Lin has been constantly asking to recommend Minghe, and she hopes that he could join the official superhuman organization. Minghe's superpower luck seemed to have brought him good luck. General Lai could not believe that after being in a coma for a year, Minghe actually woke up with a violet soul fist type superpower. He thinks that what happened to Minghe appears to be a blessing in disguise. General Lai then asked what he thought about joining the official superhuman organization. Minghe replied that he still has to discuss with his older sister if he could join the official superhuman organization. General Lai expressed that the doors of the official superhuman organization will always be open for him. He then moved towards the door and told Minghe that he would no longer disturb his rest. Before he could open the door, Minghe asked General Lai to wait. General Lai turned and asked if he remembered something important or any clues about the goddess. But Minghe scratched his head and instead asked if he could get the 200,000 yuan reward since he was the one who found the contaminated site. General Lai laughed hard and told Minghe to relax since there won't be a single penny missing from his reward. Minghe was relieved and expressed his thanks. General Lai then opened the door and went outside. After hearing the door close, Minghe decided to start meditating. After Minghe closed his eyes, he entered his spiritual world. Inside, Minghe is on a platform, facing a statue of a woman with long hair. Minghe stared at the statue and surmised it had heard General Lai's words. Afterward, the statue started to crack and its eyes suddenly moved and looked at Minghe. It produced a blinding light that illuminated Minghe's spiritual world. As the light dissipated, a giant dark-skinned woman with some sort of third eye on her forehead was revealed. Minghe then proceeded to ask the giant woman if she was a grade 9 calamity. The goddess shrank to match Minghe's size and told him that he was looking down on her, and proudly said that she was at least grade 11. While still floating in midair, he asked her if she really came to destroy humanity, and she said that the doctor was telling the truth, as the universe was already starting to feel distressed because humanity has been too greedy. Minghe sat down on the stairs and told her that he now had all the more reason not to let her go. The goddess was furious, she called him despicable and reminded him that she granted him a strength type superpower. She also reminded him that she permitted him to train in her meditation dimension when he was in a coma for a whole year, so he was able to defeat the mutant doctor. But Minghe just refuted by saying that they have the same body so if he dies, she will die too. She could not deny the truth that she encountered an unexpected accident, so she needed to reside on his body, so she just criticized Minghe's weak body and called it unworthy. Looking up, Minghe recalled General Lai's words that their first instinct was to kill and pointed out the fact that hers was to live because she chose to share a body with a weak host in order to live. The goddess was offended and told him not to compare her with those lowly calamity demons as she's a goddess. She leaned into his face and said that a suitable host is not easy to find, and the body takes an extremely long time to adjust when merging bodies and Minghe took a whole year to adjust, but Minghe was unfazed and just told her that granting him superpowers would be treated compensation for putting him in a coma. The goddess gave up on the argument and just waved Minghe off, telling him that they would live in peace from now on and Minghe told her that her instinct was identical to the first instinct of humanity to live on Earth. The goddess asked him what was he trying to say, so he told her that she don't actually know the truth about the universe and she was just following some kind of will. Minghe offered to take her around the world to show her its overall pretty side, then maybe he could change her mind, and he told her that they would get along well, all the while extending his hand to the goddess who was considering the offer. The goddess slapped his hand and told him that they would get along well under the premise of him training harder for her, as he almost died to a pseudo-lord being and she doesn't want to die with him. The goddess was excitedly looking at her system screen and said she would make strong opponents to train him for a bit. But he lied down on the ground and yawned as he refused the training and told her he was really tired and in need of some rest. He closed his eyes and said that he couldn't even practice meditation. And then he woke up in reality. He held his hand close to his chest while thinking about the nuclear bomb inside his body and how impossible it would be to guess what the consequences would be if he told anyone about her. He looked out the window and thought that he may be able to reform her and resolve a grade 9 calamity, but it would be better to get along with her first. A lot of reporters flocked to the entrance of the hospital where Minghe was getting discharged. They all wanted to witness the young hero who has resolved the mutant matter and to get an interview with him. 
Ming He stepped out of the hospital wearing a mask, and as soon as the reporters saw him, they swarmed towards him and urged him to remove the mask and say something so the audience would get to know him. They were pushing him to say something altogether which overwhelmed him greatly. He closed his eyes to compose himself and told the reporters that he was just trying to protect the people close to him. It was the officials and institutions who were the main forces in eliminating the mutant creatures. Lin Yaoyu and the rest of his old classmates who were watching his interview were glad and they all agreed in unison when Ming He said that everyone who stepped in to help at Nanjiao was a hero, and they were all the heroes of the city of Lenyang. One of them was Liu Kaixuan who was kneeling in front of his friend's graves, Huang Feng and Xiao Lan, saying that their squad was the heroes of the city. At the park, Ming He was saying goodbye to his youth and realized that it was best if he doesn't go out in public as he would probably get thrown in a laboratory and get dissected. But he was cheerfully looking at his bank account because he was now rich, and his sister could finally relax a bit. He approached her sister who was working at an ice cream stand and was surprised to see him, thinking that he was glad that he told Nurse Song not to tell his big sister about his hospitalization, so he avoided making his sister worry. He proudly told his sister that the official gave him a large sum of money as a reward for his bravery, so he wants her to relax and take her out to eat. But she refused because she have to sell all the ice cream today and she also wants to save the money for the future. Ming He stood next to her in the ice cream stand with a big grin on his face as he offered to help sell the ice cream so they could eat out together. And his sister playfully asked him why was he wasting his time instead of working hard to study for next year's test. She then told him that he should look up to the hero who resolved the mutant matter in Nanjiao, and think of him as a role model and that she believes that he could definitely pass the Superhuman Institute's test next year if he keeps working hard. He awkwardly scratched the back of his head and just told her an excuse that the doctor said that he needed to walk around and get some fresh air, so he came to help her. He then yelled that they are selling all flavors of ice cream to attract more customers as his sister entertained the customers that approached the ice cream stand. Meanwhile, Commander Lu Lin was watching Ming He from a distance and thought what an idiot he was for rejecting all the media's advances and being in the whole city's spotlight to run and help his old sister work. But she also thought that he was being a sensible big boy. Still watching him, she called him to talk about the offer of joining their official superhuman organization and asked if he had thought about it. He said he did, and his older sister worked for so many years just so he could study. He said that her sister has always wanted him to enter the Superhuman Institute so he plans to study and join the Superhuman Institute's special recruitment program but he said that he'll for sure apply to them once he graduates, which Lu Lin responded that she understands as he was still young. She mentioned that their organization has a special distinguished department called Dragon Tooth which are independent entities that don't have fixed hours for protecting the city and they are free to join any other superhuman organization. She said that they only need to appear in especially dangerous situations to assist, but they get the authority of an officer and receive a stipend each year and reminded him that he lacks the money as superhuman institute's fees aren't cheap. Ning He was awestruck by the offer and Lu Lin told him not to worry as they won't restrict his freedom and he can select his mission. As long as he assists them twice a year, then he would get his stipend. He calmly said that they could actually contact him whenever they like as serving one's country is every superhuman's duty. She called him a talker and took his answer as a yes. She said that he would be a distinguished dragon tooth agent from now onwards and she was looking forward to working with him to which Ming He smiled and replied that he was too. As the call ended, Ming He looked toward the tree Lu Lin was leaning against earlier, but no one was there. His sister approached her while stretching. She told him that they were done selling and asked who called him. He told her that it was an official organization giving him a part-time job and the pay was really high, so there was no need for her to work so hard, and they could even get a new house, which his sister could not believe. She told him that they should celebrate and eat out, so they decided to eat seafood for dinner. They ate happily to their heart's content. He made his sister try on new clothes. And lastly, they moved into a new house. As they were talking on the balcony, Ming He told her sister that he was happy even though they are still renting the place and he was looking forward to buying it, in which his sister responded their life was already good, but he told her that it would get better. As they were talking, his sister brought up the topic of the mysterious hero of Lanyang City and told him to thank the hero on her behalf. It was so sudden that Ming He was startled. With a solemn expression, she told him that thanking others was important as she heard that the hero fought a monster that was way stronger than him to protect the city, and he had put his life on the line and stayed there instead of running away. 
she said that the children at the part being able to eat ice cream, their new comfortable house, and everyone's peaceful life in the city was only possible because of the superhumans so she told him to make sure to thank the hero when he gets the chance while tapping his shoulders, in which he told her that he would keep that in mind. In the shower, Ming-He said that there was no need to thank him as he would risk every fiber of his being and every drop of his blood to protect her. From then on, Ming-He began training vigorously. He trained his core, strength, endurance, technique, and knowledge, as well as hands-on training. The goddess built a simulation of the mutant Dr. Zhao for his combat training, and Ming-He was pleased as he hasn't forgiven him for what he did. The goddess told him that his main priority would be enhancing his physique as his combat ability wasn't weak but his body could not keep up with his brain. She also told him that his current combat ranking should be in the Moonglow rank and he needs to reach the Sunblaze rank so he would no longer die easily. While battling the Dr. Zhao simulation, they were discussing and he asked the goddess if he would be able to release the Xuan Fist's absolute domain if he reached the Sunblaze rank. And she said yes and that his Xuan Fist would become a Red Sovereign talent. She told him that once he was able to release his absolute domain, he would realize that Dr. Zhao was just an ant. He remembered his teacher telling them that talents grant humans the ability to break through their limits, and he thought that he was having exceptional fists. He recalled that he asked the teacher about Red Sovereign's talents but the teacher told him that he must wait until he was at the Superhuman Institute before he could learn about those talents. The goddess told him that a Red Sovereign talent would grant the user an absolute domain, where their superpowers will drastically increase, and their opponent would be restricted, similar to a game in which the user decides the rules. Ming he told the goddess that he wanted to experience it and asked if there was any way she could simulate it, but she said no. She lectured him that he should continue practicing his ultimate soul art and not even think about using a red sovereign talent without being familiar with his violent soul talent. Bing he told her that his ultimate soul art needed a sufficient number of marks to work and he was lucky he managed to leave 49 fist marks on Dr. Zhao or he would have died. And then he asked if the star mark galactic fist would be stronger if he leaves more marks. All the while, the goddess was midair, projecting his ultimate soul art. She confirmed his theory and told him that 49 marks were the minimum requirement for activation, so his punches should be more precise. He needs to take advantage of his surroundings, and also use his explosive fists to stack on more fist marks. Ming he stared intently at the projection as the goddess told him that he should be able to use his Xuan fists ultimate soul art much earlier if he do those things she suggested. A month later, at the train station, Ming He and his sister were waving goodbyes to each other, and as he dragged his luggage towards the train, Ming He told her sister not to be sad as he was just going to take a test and not to a battlefield. At Nandu Zishan Industrial Zone, the area was covered with a red aura and intense fog. Two guards who were patrolling the area decided not to check the rest of the area as the fog was too big that they couldn't see anything. One of them, Old Wang, complained about the coldness when it was not September yet. As they were walking back, Old Wang found it weird that they have not reached the factory, so the other guard asked him if they took the wrong path, to which he intensely replied that it would be impossible as he walked that path for 10 years. He wouldn't take the wrong path even with his eyes closed. As they get to the factory, they heard a sound and Old Wang immediately looked back and pointed his flashlight to where the sound was coming from. To his surprise, a gigantic spider was feasting on his colleague who was asking for help. Old Wang ran away, his face filled with horror as he bolted while screaming. In the control room, he was breathing heavily as Old Wang closed the door behind him. He was shakingly trying to make a call on his phone when he noticed a human figure outside the window. He immediately went out to warn the person about the danger, but to his surprise, a female-looking monster with sharp teeth, glowing eyes, and tentacle-like hair greeted him as he opened the door. One of its hairs pierced through Old Wang's stomach, suspending him mid-air while one penetrated his mouth and the others slithered through his body. Old Wang was already a dried-up corpse when the monster let go of his body and it fell into the ground. Around the area for the factory chimneys, a huge monster seemed to be patrolling the area while a female worker was kneeling inside one of those chimneys, covering her mouth while she was crying in order to hide her presence from the monster that was lurking. Meanwhile, ming was now traveling on a train, and he was on the phone with his sister who was worried for him. He comforted her that he had enough money, and he already asked a classmate to find a good house for him. A middle-aged lady called for the train attendant that was making her rounds for a glass of water, and asked her how much longer it would take for them to arrive at Nandu. The attendant named Tianzin told her that there would be around an hour left, and as it was the start of the school year, she asked her if she was bringing her daughter to Nandu to attend school. 
The daughter, Fang Nianrong, who was sitting in the aisle seat beside her mother, politely smiled as her mother bragged to the train attendant that she was attending the Superhuman Institute in Nandu and that she got the highest score in Lanyang City on the test. The passenger who overheard the conversation gave her praises on how beautiful, amazing, and outstanding she was. A kid who was sitting in front of her mother leaned over the back of his chair and handed her a notebook and pen. He asked her to write him something for good luck in the future when he takes the Superhuman Institute test. Ming he thought that Fang Nianrong was impressive that she got admitted by relying on her own strength and got one of the top scores as he looked over to her, handing her writing back to the kid, telling him to study hard. The train abruptly stopped when the lady beside Ming he had to let go of the phone she was holding to stop herself from colliding with the seat in front of her. But it was not enough to protect the baby she was holding from hitting the seat as well. Good thing Ming he reacted fast and protected the baby's head with his hands, and Fang Nianrong saw that, acknowledging his fast reaction. The passengers of the train are now complaining about the situation as there was a strange fog outside when the skies were clear just a moment ago and there was no signal either. Ming-He stood up from his seat and raised his phone up to try and find some signal. The kid from earlier looked out the window and saw a strange figure outside, so he told her mom that he saw something huge and strange outside, but his mother did not believe it and told him to stop saying nonsense. Ming-He looked out his window as well but he was not able to see anything aside from the fog outside. The PIA system announced that the train has encountered an unforeseen accident and they asked all passengers to remain seated for everyone's safety as they inspect the train. Ming-He wondered what the unforeseen accident was, so he stood up to check on the train attendant and what was going on. She asked the attendant what was going on but she told him to get back to his seat so he wouldn't cause unnecessary trouble. Ming-He pulled out his badge and said that he was a superhuman so it would be best to tell him if something strange happened, to which the train attendant complained and told him to follow her to the front of the train to discuss the matter. Fang Nianrong who was now standing behind Ming he chimed in that she's technically half a superhuman so she could help out during critical times. The train operators are discussing the passengers information and how unfortunate they were that there wasn't a single superhuman aboard the train, so the situation was not looking good. The train attendant proudly announced that she found two of them as they entered the operator's room, and perhaps they could help solve the problem. The operators were ecstatic about the news and asked them what grade they were, and they were disappointed when Ming-He pulled out his trainee badge and Fang Nianrong, her enrollment papers. Kai Ming, the safety officer, told them that they couldn't handle the situation as they didn't know how dangerous the outside was. Ming-He refuted that it would be better than just stopping the train in the middle of nowhere and it would be more dangerous the longer they stay so at the very least, they need to find a place with a signal so they could call for backup. The conductor agreed with Ming-He's words and he asked Kai Ming to follow them and told them to be extra careful when they go out. Ming-He told Fang Nianrong to stay on the train as she hadn't entered school yet so she was just putting herself in danger, but she rebutted that he was just a trainee so if he could go then she could go too. Ming-He did not argue further and just told her to stick close to him as there was something off with the fog. Ming-He then instructed the train attendant by the door to lock it when they leave and remember to only open the door for them. The train attendant immediately locked the door as soon as Ming-He, Fang Nianrong, and Kai Ming walked away. Kai Ming questioned Ming-He why he had to instruct the train attendant when they are professionally trained so they don't need anyone to tell them what to do. Ming-He simply responded that he was just being careful and asked him if a big fog could stop the train from operating. And Kai Ming responded that as long as there are no problems with the track, the train won't stop. Ming-He then probed further by asking if the system detected something on the tracks which triggered the train to automatically stop, and Kai Ming nonchalantly answered that from his experience, it would probably be just some wild animal who gets through their fences. Meanwhile, the train attendant from before was nervously guarding the door while hoping everything was going well. As she looked out the window, she noticed a figure of a girl and immediately approached the door to let her in as it was dangerous out there. She was holding onto the door's lock and was about to open the door when she remembered Ming-He's instruction, so she let go of it. The girl was now knocking on the train, and the attendant was just looking at the girl from the inside when a fat, middle-aged, balding man noticed the girl outside and told the train attendant to let her in quickly as she probably came from a different part of a train. The train attendant ignored him and just stared out the window to see clearly. The man who was disgustingly picking at his teeth told the train attendant that they should naturally let someone who was knocking in and the little girl outside must be alone and scared outside. As the man approached the door, the attendant told him that the superhuman gave the orders not to open the door for anyone but them, and the doors were locked when the train stopped so it would not be possible for someone to get off the train. 
The man was now furious and creating a scene and said that she could be a person living around the area who got lost and asking for help. He criticized how cold the train attendant was when the person was now crying. The train attendant was adamant that they need to wait for the superhumans to come back as she blocked the door. The man pushed her to the side and told her she was too selfish to not let a crying person let in. So since she was not going to open the door, he will. The attendant grabbed his shoulders to try and stop him, but he pushed her away and yelled at her to back off, so the train attendant fell to the floor. He shamelessly said that the train attendant was asking for it and called her heartless. With a smile, he opened the door and reached out his hand to the girl, and told her to come inside quickly. As soon as his fingers touched the girl's hair, terror filled his eyes, but it was already too late. The tentacles slithered through his entire body and dragged him out of the train. He tried to resist by holding onto the doors, but his hand slipped. The train attendant who was shaken by the scene she witnessed, mustered all her strength to get up and run away but she stopped and turned towards the door when she remembered all the passengers on the train. She was closing the door halfway through when the tentacles grabbed onto her legs, and she was now being dragged outside the train. She was on the verge of crying and was scared but her expression turned to determination as she decided to close the door from the outside, sacrificing herself. She was crying and her eyes were filled with terror as the tentacles dragged her away from the train, into the darkness. Three young passengers who were playing cards asked another train attendant that was passing by how much longer the inspection would take as they were on a tight schedule, and the attendant just told her to wait for a while. The attendant then saw that the attendant guarding the door, Tan Zin, was missing. She approached the door and called Tan Zin sloppy as the door wasn't even locked. Just as she locked the door, the tentacles grabbed the knob to open it, but immediately retreated when it realized that the door was now locked. Ming he saw huge tracks on the ground and immediately recognized it as a calamity beast. He knelt on the ground to examine the tracks and he imagined it would be a massive beast that made the mark and knocked down the rocks to the track when they descended. He was surprised that he had a signal when he received a call from Liu Lin. Liu Lin was glad that Ming he finally picked up and she confirmed his location as around Nandu's Xiaopai town when he said that something occurred on his end. He said that he was on the train to Nandu but it stopped midway due to an emergency, and told her that it was extremely foggy, and the signal was weak around the area so the train crew couldn't get into contact with the headquarters, and she immediately asked if the train could still run. Ming he confirmed that there was nothing wrong with the train so it should be able to run normally after clearing the obstacles that are blocking the path. But the train crew was hesitant to start the train as it was foggy, and there was no signal. Lu Lin was relieved and told Ming He to leave the area as soon as possible. And when Ming He asked what happened and if there was anything he could do to help, she told him that they were still near the boundary of the fog so it was not too late to leave now as it would be troublesome if they don't. Ming He asked her what is the fog and she got annoyed that he was asking too many questions so she said that it would be difficult for him to survive in the fog with his current rank. So he must ensure the safety of those on the train and leave the area quickly. So Ming he immediately skidded down the slope as soon as he realized how serious the situation was. When he landed where Kai Ming and Fang Nianrong were, Kai Ming started complaining that he left all the grunt work to them and called him a sneaky bastard. Ming he did not pay any attention to what Kai Ming was saying and told them that they must leave immediately. As he received a call from the official command center, and was given the order to retreat immediately. Fang Nianrong asked him how did he have a signal, and he told her that there was a bit of signal high up in the mountains where he found the tracks of a massive calamity beast who must have knocked the rocks down when they descended, so she couldn't believe what he just said. Ming he told her that he had no reason to lie so they must leave quickly to ensure the safety of everyone on the train. This suddenly reminded her of her mother on the train. Ming he gave them instructions that they needed to tell the conductor to start the train as soon as they get there when Kai Ming tripped on something and he fell down. He was mad and was complaining that he almost knocked out one of his front teeth as he was lying on the ground. He looked back to see what tripped him and he was horrified to see a dried corpse of a man. As Ming he and Fang Nianrong looked toward where the scream was coming from, tentacles were launching a surprise attack on them from behind. Ming he was able to notice the attack, and he immediately grabbed Fang Nianrong's arms and dragged her out of the tentacle's reach. The green-haired female-looking monster now revealed itself out of the fog. Kai Ming was startled when he saw the monster, and he did not realize that he was already hugging the corpse beside him. Ming he instructed them to go find a place to hide, to which Kai Ming nodded vigorously, while Fang Nianrong shifted into a fighting stance and offered to help Ming he. The monster launched her hair at both of them. 
Ming He was able to dodge the attack, but Fang Nianrong didn't and her gut took the hit. Ming He got alarmed and yelled at her to hide as he could handle her. He was distracted so he did not notice the tentacle approach him, and now it was wrapped around his waist. Fang Nianrong was lying on the ground, writhing in pain, but she still had the strength to argue with Ming He that he was just a starlight rank trainee so he was not much stronger than she was. So Ming He did not pay any more attention to Fang Nianrong and asked the monster what was the use of binding his body. The monster grinned and pulled Ming He towards her, but instead of resisting, Ming He jumped into the air and used the speed of the monster's pull. He told the monster that the speed was perfect as he landed his rapid flying punch, which knocked the monster back. A strong gust of wind flowed in the area, and Fang Nianrong, who was struggling to protect herself from the wind, was surprised by the powerful punch and said that it wasn't the strength of a starlight rank. The monster was in pain, and it held into its stomach. The monster's face turned into a sinister smile as its green tentacle-looking hair had now transformed into a black one. The monster simultaneously launched its hair to attack ming -Hi. His eyes gleamed and produced a blue aura as he countered each of the monster's hair with his punches. Fang Nianrong was awestruck by his speed as she couldn't see the number of punches at all. He jumped and launched himself toward the monster, and delivered another strong punch to its stomach. The glow in Ming He's eyes dissipated as he was surprised to see a person inside the monster's now torn down body. He recognized her as the train attendant and immediately pulled her out of the monster's body, and Ming He wondered if she was still alive. Fang Nianrong notified Ming He that the monster was running away, as he gently placed Tan Zin on the ground. He told her not to worry about the monster and that they needed to save the attendant instead as she was still breathing. Fang Nianrong looked at Tan Zin repulsively and called her disgusting and dirty. Ming He ignored her and started performing CPR on the attendant himself. The fog started dispersing and the passengers on the train were now able to see what was happening outside and Kai Ming quickly ran towards Ming He while being wary of the monster. Tan Zin coughed up purplish liquid and when one of the train attendants saw Ming He carrying her, she hurriedly opened the door for them to get on the train and asked her what happened to her. She weakly replied that she did not let the monster in, and they told her to talk later and get on first. Kai Ming closed the door in a hurry and told everyone that there was something in the fog. The train departed immediately, leaving the monster with the dried up corpse. They were lucky they only passed a part of the fog. Afterward, in Saioshi, Lin Kingu was on the phone with Lu Lin, and she was giving him information about the calamity meteor detected a month ago in the forest of Nandu's western suburbs. She said that according to the investigation, there were no abnormalities aside from the large amounts of steam near the crater, so the astronomy team speculates that this was a calamity they have never experienced before, and the higher-ups named it, the mist. As Lin Kingu wandered through a village, he confirmed that he understood the situation, and said that the fog's movement varies and mysterious calamity beasts appear in the area it surrounds, and when the fog disappears, every calamity beast will also mysteriously disappear. Lu Lin told him that there are massive calamity beasts within the fog according to those who accidentally entered it, so the situation he was tracing right now was quite unusual. She also told him that it passed by the train tracks just moments before so he was heading in the right direction. Lin king knelt on the ground to inspect it and told her that it definitely passed by and he was afraid that it was starving as it ate all the livestock in town. He picked up something on the ground and thought that looked like the shell of an insect after molting while listening to Lu Lin on the other line who was relieved that they were able to notify Zayoshi's people to leave in advance and the people on the train were also able to depart safely. As he stood up, he asked her if there were any survivors from the Zishan Industrial Park and she said none. He puts away the shell he just picked up. He told her that no one will survive the fog if it appears again, so they need to investigate what it was exactly and what was in it. While looking at her report, she told him that there was an incident that gave them a breakthrough to know something about the fog. He asked her what the incident was, and she sent a picture of a centipede. She told him that it was a lion poo pattern centipede which the entomology research team lost half a year ago, and they were able to track it by tracking the GPS chip implanted in it, and they discovered that it hid in a cave near Zishan. Lin king was surprised at how big the insect was, but she ignored his comments and proceeded to say that the entomology research team was not able to recapture it as it hid in the cave, so they left it alone in Zishan which was very close to the Zishan Industrial Park. 
Lin Kingu understood what Lu Lin was trying to tell him. The lion poo was not an inhabitant of the fog. It was the only living organism that left the fog, so it was a witness and a survivor. So they needed to capture it alive for analysis. Lu Lin confirmed that his understanding was correct and told him that they only had information on what was outside the fog and nothing on the inside so this small centipede may provide them with important clues. Lin Kingu unsheathed his sword as he prepared to enter the centipede's location and told her not to worry as he would definitely bring it back. He was staring at something above him, while Lu Lin remembered to inform him that it might have undergone some changes in the fog, and his face looked taken aback. A centipede tossed a pig in midair and gobbled it in a single bite. It produced a loud crunch which Lu Lin was able to hear over the phone and it worried her. Lin Kingu questioned Lu Lin calling it a small centipede as what was standing in front of him was a gigantic one. Its scales were shining and it looked like it was wearing armor. At the train station, while they were transferring Tan Zin and Kai Ming, the conductor thanked Ming He for defeating the monster and getting them out of danger. They also praised him, but he humbly said that all he did was chase the monster away. The person who protected everyone was Tan Zin who was not a superhuman, but she outdid all of them, since if the monster had entered the train, it would have been disastrous. They agreed that what she did was really brave, and she was their hero. As Ming He walked out of the hospital, thinking that he has an enduring bond with it, his phone vibrated in his pocket. He was surprised to see an unknown number calling him. He then answered and the person on the other line asked if he was Ming He, and he confirmed while asking the other person on the line who they were. Ming He blushed when the person asked him if he couldn't tell from their voice as he recognized it was Lu Kayan. Lu Kayan was talking through her earpiece, and she was dazzling as she walked, which caught the male's attention around her. Ming He's face lit up as he asked her how she got his number. She answered that Lin Yaoyu told her and she also informed her that he was coming to Nandu today, and asked him why she couldn't reach him earlier, while completely unaware of a drooling guy with heart eyes walking beside her. He told her that something happened on his way, which Lu Kayan immediately recognized as the mist, and he was surprised that she knew about it and told her that they traveled along the boundary of it. She asked him where he was so she could come and find him, still unaware of the guy walking beside her who now hit a wall. Ming He asked her if they were meeting up as he flagged down the taxi. He said he was planning on going to Nandu's Superhuman Institute at the moment so they could meet outside the school, in which she agreed. As he was riding the taxi, he reminisced about the times he spent with Lu Kayan, and the time he confessed his feelings for her with a bouquet of flowers in his hand by the river, and she asked him if she could think about it for a few days. He thought that it had been over a year, and she hadn't responded so the answer was probably a no. On the school benches, Lu Kayan was talking with a friend about Ming He and the letter she left him, which says that she would agree to date him if he woke up, and her friend told her that she might have left that letter because she pitied him, so she should just tell him the truth if that was the case. Her friend waved her hand around and told her that the number of people chasing her was enough to form a line to the school entrance, so how could a normal high school graduate from Lanyang City compare to the elites at Nandu? Lu Kayan sat down and explained that back then, she really liked him, but her friend reminded her that it was back then, when she was still a naive high schooler a year ago and now she was the school goddess with both the looks and smarts so there was no need for her to be someone's girlfriend just because of a promise. Lu Kayan tried to reason with her that he was a nice person, and since he came to find her after waking up, she should face and try dating him, but if they were really not compatible, she would tell him up front. Her friend was certain that they wouldn't be compatible, and she said that she was going to break so many hearts by making the dumb decision of choosing someone who couldn't even get into their school. But Lu Kayan defended her decision, so her friend did not pursue the argument much longer and just warned her to not let him take advantage of her and don't actually get herself involved when it was only a trial. And Lu Kayan said she knows. After that, she stood up as it was almost time and told her friend that he was actually a good person and she should get to know him. But her friend passed up saying that she was only interested in extremely talented and good-looking guys and normal guys are no different from toads. At Nandu Superhuman Institute, Ming He stood at the entrance, thinking that the institute was cooler than he thought it would be. He solidified his resolve that he must get in this year no matter what, as it must feel great attending a school like that. While two girls passed by him thinking he was a haughty looking at them, and they criticized his dirty clothes, saying that he was probably a country bumpkin touring their institute. Lu Kayan soon arrived, with sparkles following her, and the people around immediately noticed her. Even the two girls earlier thought she was pretty, and that girls would even fall for her. Lu Kayan paid them no mind as they continued to gossip about the goddess of their institute who coldly rejected Sir Hee Bin. 
who bought an entire sea of flowers when he confessed. They thought that she was just playing hard to get as no one would actually reject the handsome son of one of the three great corporations of their school. They were startled when Liu Kyan waved her hands and called out for Minghee. They greeted and told each other that it has been a while, and they almost couldn't recognize each other. Minghee asked if he was more handsome now, and she replied that he was now more charismatic. Minghee wondered if that was how girls compliment nowadays. When Liu Kyan invited him to some coffee as her treat, to which he agreed, the two girls earlier overheard their conversation and wondered if Liu Kyan was going on a date with such a guy. But the other girl thought that they were probably just friends. As they were walking, Minghee was contemplating if he should bring up the confession, and quickly decided against it as it has been over a year. He just thought that she was treating him to a drink so that he wouldn't get upset about the friend zone letter she left. While on the other hand, Liu Kyan wondered why Minghee was not taking the initiative to hold her hands, which people who date normally do. As Minghee turned to look at her with a smile, she thought that he was about to kiss her and panicked as there were so many people. On the other hand, Minghee was just thinking that if they couldn't be a couple then he's just happy being normal friends, and it was like they have returned to high school. As they sat down in a cafe, Minghee brought up that Lin Yaoyu told him that she was now famous at the Superhuman Institute and that everyone seems to know her. She humbly said that they only remembered her because she was commended a few times, and directly asked him if he came to Nandu to find her, but he said that he came to participate in the special enrollment exam of the institute. Minghee told her that he came to give it a try and he also wanted to visit the largest city in the south, and Liu Kyan was blushing when she asked him where was he living at the moment because she was thinking that it was not appropriate to live together on their first day. She was contemplating what to do as it was her first time dating someone. Minghee looked worried as he told her that he haven't found a place but he was planning on renting one nearby as he heard that the process was complicated. He wanted to take it slow. Then he proceeded to ask if Liu Kyan was feeling well as her face was so red, but she told him it was nothing. Liu Kyan's voice started shaking as she told him that if he gets accepted, they would be classmates again and it would be easier for them to be together, which puzzled Minghe if he heard it wrong. He then interpreted it as her wanting to study together as they did in high school, as he assumed that she probably has a boyfriend at the moment and he envied him. Liu Kyan remembered the mist and brought up the encounter. He told her that they encountered a female pale skin that had tentacles all over its head. He told her that it was aggressive and was good at disguising itself as it looks just like a woman with long hair from a distance. She was surprised and asked how they managed to escape as the monster seemed dangerous. Then he told her that he was a superhuman now, while showing her his badge, when a blonde-haired guy saw them from outside the window. He told her that he had been training his ability as a hunter after waking up with the hopes that he could get into Nandu Superhuman Institute this year as they promised to attend together. Liu Kyan was touched knowing that Minghe didn't come to find her after waking up because he was trying in his own way, and he still remembered their promise, while oblivious to the fact that the blonde guy from the window was now approaching their table. The blonde guy grabbed the badge on the table without warning and told Minghe that he have gotten funnier. He waved the badge as he told Minghe that the lowest rank of a student at the institute after a year was Munglo rank. Fan Kai, the blonde guy, told him to not take out his Starlight rank trainee badge as people would laugh at him, and he would be embarrassed to say that he was his old classmate, as people behind him were snickering. Fan Kai turned to Liu Kyan and asked her why she didn't say anything about Minghe coming along. He leaned in and told her that it would be better if he organized a get-together for all their high school classmates. But she refused and said that she just wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with Minghee. Minghee drank his coffee as he waved him off, saying that they still have things to talk about, so he shouldn't bother them anymore. Fan Kai was offended and glared at Minghee. He looked like he was about to start a fight, but he heard a notification sound. And when he looked over to Liu Kyan, she gave him a hard stare, telling him to be quiet as she have a call. When Liu Kyan told the person on the line to go ahead and speak, Fan Kai was now extremely pissed off that he was ignored that he slammed Minghee's badge on their table and walked away. He was infuriated when he went out of the cafe. His fist was enveloped with aura as he cursed Minghee who dared look down on him, and called him a lowly egotistical bustard for chasing Liu Kyan all the way to the Nandu Superhuman Institute, and said that he was the perfect man for her. Meanwhile, in the cafe, Liu Kyan told the person on the line to come and pick her up at the cafe. She quickly stood up and apologized to Minghe as she have an emergency that she need to take care of so she couldn't stay any longer. But Minghe told her that it was no problem at all as they could chat another time. She waved him goodbye and told him that she would cheer him on at the exam. And Minghe agreed as he waved her off goodbye as well. Her brother picked her up in a car and she immediately asked him what happened. While picking up the leaf that was stuck to her hair, 
He said it was urgent and her electricity controlling power was needed, so he would explain the details once they were in the car, to which she agreed. Inside the cafe, Ming He saw them and thought that it was Lu Kian's boyfriend, and took a note for himself that he shouldn't bother her anymore from now on. Later, two guys were standing outside the special admissions exam venue, and one asked the other why was there still an admission exam when enrollment ended a few months ago. As Ming He passed by them, the other guy responded that it was a special admissions exam that was always held after normal enrollment ended and that it was basically just a backdoor for those that did not pass the normal enrollments. Ming He was looking up to the venue when a brunette guy approached him and asked if he was there for the special admissions too. When he confirmed, the guy offered that they head in together. Peng Linghui, the brunette guy, told Ming He that he was pretty down low as his get up from head to toe looked like it did not total to 300, which Ming He confirmed. Peng Linghui told Ming He that he respected that and proceeded to ask how much his parents donated to the school, which got Ming He confused, but Peng Linghui thought that he was acting and told him that the exam was just a glorified backdoor. With a grin on his face, Peng Linghui told Ming He that he will say it first, and told him that his family donated 7 million to the school for his entrance qualification, and he was just there for the formal procedure, and Ming He was surprised that it was a thing. Ming He told Peng Linghui that he only heard about the special admissions so he came to see it, to which Peng Linghui laughed and called him naive as the institute does not lack talented people but they lack the funds to pay for the scholarships of the less financially fortunate students. Ming He immediately understood that the special admissions thing was just a front to open a backdoor for students who can pay for those scholarships, and Peng Linghui commended him for not being dumb, adding that exchanging 7 million for entrance qualification was not a bad deal for someone like him. Ming He asked Peng Linghui if that meant that he had no hope of getting it, and Peng Linghui told him that he could still test out the waters but he shouldn't be too down if he doesn't pass and just work hard next year. The special admissions teacher, Yan Jin came into the room and called everyone's attention as he introduced his two companions, Professor Guzhu and Professor Shizhu, then he started the roll call. Everyone else in the room was called except for Ming He and Professor Yan Jin were about to proceed with the instructions, but Peng Linghui called his attention to the fact that he had missed one more person. Professor Yan Jin looked again at the list and was surprised that there was one more page, with only Ming He's name listed on it. He has that demeaning look as he called Ming He's name. Professor Guzhu started with the instructions that there are a total of five parts to the exam and four of which were to test their physical and combat abilities. They introduced a strength test dummy and said that they have set different passing standards for each of the examinees based on the superpower they have listed. Professor Yan Jin called for Ming He first and said that he'll need to hit 1,500 kilograms as his talent was of the explosive power type. He said that he could leave right away if he couldn't hit it while Peng Linghui was making side comments to Ming He that they have started to try to get him to quit. Ming He took a step forward and thought that the instrument being used was the same as the Hunters Association. He remembered that he hit 1000 kilograms last time. He extended his arm in a punching position and Aura gathered to his right fist. He punched the instrument with all his might and it was thrown away from the table it was placed on. Everyone's face in the room was filled with multiple emotions, surprise, admiration and fear, and what they all had in common was all their mouths were wide open. The dummy's screen showed 2,200 kilograms as his score and everyone exclaimed that Ming He broke the dummy's limit and he maxed out. With sweat running down his face, and his initial demeaning look turned to fear, he told Ming He that he surpassed the maximum and he had passed the basic part of the exam. The teachers also announced that because the testing instrument has been broken, everyone else would be counted as passing and will proceed to the next part of the exam. Now Ming He was the one having a surprised reaction, as he realized the capability of the teachers to make such kind of announcement. Peng Linghui smiled proudly at Ming He, along with the other examinees about their instant passability. Professor Shizhu asked Professor Yu Jin if they could consider accepting Ming He as he has exceptional performance but he sarcastically asked her if she wanted him to accept all the students they have rejected every year who have scored full marks. Professor Guzhu also added that their institute has plenty of exceptional students, and if they lack the brains, they would just die during battle to which Professor Shizhu agreed and said that if the officials didn't recommend Minghi, he wouldn't even be qualified to register. Professor Yujin said that they can just increase the difficulty of the other rounds to send him away. They are now standing in an arena as Professor Yujin announced that the second round would test speed, saying that they selected the spacious venue so there would be plenty of room for all of them to run and dodge. A man with a huge blazing cheetah beside him asked Professor Yujin if these were the examinees this year as he introduced a general rank crimson cheetah that would chase them, and anyone who got pounced on will be disqualified. 
The two other professors started heading outside as Professor Yujin instructed them to start the timer. With a sinister gleam of his eyeglasses, Professor Yujin instructed the man with the cheetah to disqualify Minghe first. Then go easy on the other students as none of them will pass if he takes them seriously. So the man agreed. Professor Yujin signaled the start of testing and all the examinees started running away from the cheetah. Peng Linghui was running vigorously, thinking about what was going on as the cheetah was chasing him. Professor Guzhu immediately raised a paper to his chest with the number 700 on it and called for the man's attention. The man with the cheetah was amused that the examinee donated that much amount and started to whistle, signaling the cheetah that the one it was chasing was a no-go. The cheetah heard it while it was about to pounce on Peng Linghui, and so with a bored face, it faked to have lost balance and fallen to the ground. Seeing this, Minghe thought that the general rank Crimson Cheetah doesn't seem very strong so he should be able to pass this round. With a tearful eye, the cheetah just looked at Minghe while he was running away, but the man whistled again signaling that that one is fine. The cheetah perked up when it heard the signal, so it bared its fangs and claws and started crouching on the ground, ready to pounce on its prey. While Minghe was running, his back suddenly felt cold so he looked back, and just in time, he was able to duck and avoid the cheetah's pounce. The cheetah immediately dug its claws into the ground and maneuvered itself to face Minghe, who was surprised as the cheetah was sick moments ago. The cheetah growled and started chasing him, and he was amazed at how insane the breaking and speeding the cheetah was. Minghe ran towards the other students so the cheetah wouldn't chase him anymore, but as they passed by a guy who was taking a selfie, the other cheetah just ignored the other students and proceeded to chase him. He wondered if he was tasty or something, as it was just chasing him even if there were so many examinees. Minghe looked serious and said that if the cheetah wanted to do this, then he would show it his true speed. Thus covered the cheetah's vision as Minghe accelerated in front of him, saying that he didn't undergo physical training for anything. The other students were taken aback at how fast he was, they even questioned if he was still human. Both of them were surprised, and Professor Shizhu commented that Minghe's speed already surpassed many Moonglow ranked superhumans. But Professor Yujin said that speed doesn't imply endurance and there are still 15 more minutes. Ten minutes later, everyone was bewildered to see the cheetah breathing heavily, trying to catch its breath, while Ming, despite sweating profusely, was still composed, and he even mocked the cheetah for being tired already when he just finished warming up. With a menacing glint in his eyes, he cracked his knuckles telling the cheetah that it was his turn to chase it now, and if he catches it, he will punch all of its teeth out. The cheetah was startled, its mouth agape, and started to run away from Minghe as he chased it around the arena. Professor Yujin was dumbfounded by what he just witnessed. His mouth was wide open and about to fall off his face, along with his eyeglasses. Fifteen minutes later, the cheetah was lying on the ground and could no longer stand due to exhaustion. Its owner was protecting it, begging Minghe to spare his poor beast, while Minghe told the cheetah that he wanted to play for a little longer as he just learned the second level of speeding. Professor Yujin hurriedly announced that everyone passed as the beast pounced on no one. Minghe wiped his sweat with his forearm, and as he heard the announcement, he had a skeptical look on his face, saying that he knew that was going to happen. The professors then announced that the third round would be reaction time. Before the start of the third round, Professor Guzhu suggested to Yan Jin and Professor Shizhu that they should consider accepting Minghe. Professor Guzhu believed that talented individuals like Minghe, who contribute to society, should also have a spot in special admissions. Although most special admissions require a donation, Professor Guzhu believed that it was important to consider individuals like Minghe who contribute to society. Yan Jin expressed that he already mentioned that excelling in the basic rounds doesn't mean much. Professor Shizhu agreed with Yan Jin's statement, but he was unaware of the reason behind Yan Jin's hatred towards Minghe. Prior to the special admission, someone approached Yan Jin and offered a case full of money, promising to donate another 6 million to the school if Yan Jin agreed to kick Minghe out. The man claimed that his child was exceptionally talented but missed the enrollment deadline due to returning from overseas. Yan Jin was determined to follow through with the plan to exclude Minghe from the admission. The examinees gathered in front of instructor Guzhu while he explained the test to them. Meanwhile, Yan Jin and Professor Shizhu prepared for the examination behind him. The demon tree, a withered tree species contaminated by a calamity substance, was trimmed to ensure that examinees would only be hurt instead of losing their lives. Fresh blood was required to bring the demon tree to life, causing it to attack any living beings around it hysterically. Professor Shizhu used a small knife to lightly cut his finger and then touched the demon tree with the same finger. Suddenly, a magic circle appeared and the demon tree's eyes lit up, causing it to start wiggling. 
The instructors had previously instructed the examinees that their names would be called and they would have to step into the yellow zone after taking the test, and then step behind them into the blue zone. First up was a guy named Zai Zi who, after stepping into the yellow zone, immediately executed a fighting stance. However, the demon tree responded quickly by using its branch to whip him. Fortunately, Zai Zi was able to dodge the attack with ease. After only 5 minutes, Zai Zi's trial was over and he passed quite easily. It was impressive to see his instant passing ability. Next, Professor Shizu opened another small wound and awakened the demon tree, allowing examinees to pass the supposedly difficult examination one after the other. Despite the obvious display of favoritism, Ming He couldn't help showing his disappointment. When it was finally Ming He's turn, Yan Jin threw a hint at Professor Shizu who agreed with a nod. Professor Shizu then cut a deep wound on his palm and offered his blood to the demon tree. The more blood the demon tree absorbed, the stronger it became. It was clear that they intended to let Ming He experience a good beating from the demon tree. As expected, the demon tree attacked Ming He the moment he stepped on the yellow zone. However, the attacks towards Ming He were way stronger and faster than those towards the examinees before him. It seemed that Ming He had expected things to turn out this way. Although the demon tree had been strengthened, Ming He, who couldn't be hit by bullets due to his passive ability, dodged the attacks as if he were doing warm-up exercises. Professor Shizu couldn't believe what he was seeing and Yan Jin accused Professor Shizhu, using it as a way to hint that the demon tree needed further strengthening. In response, Professor Shizhu closed his left eye and cut a crossed wound on his palm, intending to go all out. As he offered his blood to the demon tree, its eyes glowed ferociously, and new leafless branches grew from it, making it look more aggressive and intimidating. Ming He saw his situation as a perfect opportunity to practice his hearing. He closed his eyes, sidestepped, and jumped to dodge the demon tree's attacks, relying only on his hearing. Yan Jin became so angry that he couldn't stop shaking. The professors and examinees watched with wide eyes and open mouths as Ming He dodged the attacks. One of the examinees expressed doubt about why the attacks were always landing beside Ming He. Yan Jin aggressively asked the examinee if he wanted to try dodging the attacks himself, but the examinee didn't dare to do so. Meanwhile, Ming He used rapid sidesteps to dodge the demon tree's consecutive attacks. Five minutes later, Yan Jin struggled to suppress his anger. The examinees were amazed by Ming He's reaction speed and wondered if he was still human. Finally, the once intimidating demon tree looked wilted and exhausted. Ming He stretched his arms out to express his contentment with his training with the demon tree. As a result, the round ended, and he automatically passed the test, since Professor Shizu fainted and his mouth was foaming. In the aftermath of the round, Professor Guzhu told Yan Jin that they should accept Ming He since his reaction speed surpassed most of the students at the institute and excelled in all three rounds. However, Yan Jin reasoned that they should not go easy on him because he thinks that students are spoiled, lack judgment, strategy, and battle experience. He pointed out that many of the past students who had done well in the exams did not fare well in actual battles. Therefore, they needed to consider all aspects of special admissions, and an actual battle would be the best test. As a result, he instructed everyone to proceed to the next round. Meanwhile, Professor Shizu, who was struggling to walk, was assisted by a personnel towards the infirmary. In the infirmary, the doctor told Professor Shizu that even though his girlfriend cheated on him with his uncle, what he was doing to himself was not necessary. Professor Shizu cried as he explained that he was just proctoring the special admission exam and got anemic after feeding the demon tree too much blood. He then reminded the doctor that they had already agreed not to talk about his girlfriend. However, the doctor did not believe him and placed a green plant on a ledge above Professor Shizu's head, telling him that he needed it to survive. Despite this, Professor Shizu kept telling the doctor not to bring up his girlfriend. The doctor promised not to bring it up again as long as he did not do anything stupid like that again. Professor Shizu wanted to explain himself again, but he just stopped trying and released a sigh of defeat. Yan Jin, Professor Guzhu, and the examinees walked towards an orb on top of a stand. As they approached the orb, Yan Jin began explaining the last test, which was a test of superpowers talent. He explained that, according to their information, Ming He was a white dust talent. However, Ming He interrupted his talk by asking why they were taking the test of superpowers talent after the other three tests. He argued that if they were to pass the other three but fail the last one, it would mean that the other three tests were for nothing. Yan Jin reasoned that rules are rules and that they had to follow them. However, Ming He mocked him and said that he forgot that Yan Jin was the rule. Yan Jin became aggressive and asked Ming He what he had just said. Ming He feigned ignorance and asked if he could go and take the test first. Yan Jin replied that he would be the last one to take the test. 
he stated that it didn't really matter who went first and instructed Assistant Ji to record the results. Assistant Ji acknowledged the instruction. Peng Linghui volunteered to go first and immediately walked up towards the orb. As he touched the orb, violet particles started to swirl inside it. Ming He gave Peng Linghui a thumbs up and told him that he didn't expect him to have a violet soul tier talent. The test proceeded smoothly, and one by one, the examinees touched the orb. Interestingly, every single one of them possessed a violet soul tier talent. Ming He couldn't help but wonder how such a coincidence happened. Yan Jin, who had been silently observing, approached Ming He and informed him that he had looked through his general information. To Ming He's surprise, Yan Jin found out that he had participated in the Nandu Institute's examination test. Although Ming He had scored full marks in all the other tests, his talent's tier was only white dust, which, although a hidden superpower, had no combat value. Ming He had learned everything there was to know about superpowers at the high school level, except for one crucial fact. The first thing one would learn in college is that superpower ranks were changeable. This was made possible by a material called Life Bead, which could be obtained from a special calamity beast. With the help of the Life Bead, superhumans could replace their original superpower with a new one, provided they had enough money, white dust, blue spirit, and violet soul. In fact, with enough money, one superpower tier could be elevated even higher. Yan Jin's revelation shocked Ming He, who had been unaware of this information. Yan Jin then asked Ming He how he planned to surpass the other examinees, considering the minimum standard for recruitment was having at least a violet soul rank. He challenged Ming He by asking if relying solely on his strong fists, lightning speed, and perfect reflexes would be enough to take on the ultimate soul art possessed only by superhumans ranked violet soul. Yan Jin also emphasized the destructive power that ultimate soul art could bring, which could threaten much stronger beings. Ming He simply replied that he knew about the immense destructive power of ultimate soul art, which greatly surpassed the limits of the body. Yan Jin informed Ming He that no matter how perfect his basics were, they would be useless against any examinee possessing ultimate soul art. In response, Ming He sarcastically thanked Yan Jin for the reminder. As he walked towards the orb, he expressed his belief that strong basics could produce ultimate soul art with more destructive power. Just as Ming He was about to touch the orb, memories of his superpowers talent test flashed in his mind. Yan Jin observed Ming He's actions and wondered if he was trying to make a fool of himself. The orb then resonated a blue color, leading Professor Guzhu to explain that this was Ming He's visible superpowers talent which resembled a fist. Suddenly, Professor Shizhu appeared and commented that it was only a blue spirit talent. This caused Professor Guzhu to wonder why Professor Shizhu was not resting in the infirmary. Despite this distraction, Yan Jin refused to take his eyes off of Ming He. Soon, the orb started to resonate a violet light, causing Yan Jin and the professors to widen their eyes in shock. Yan Jin thought it was impossible since the information stated that Ming He was only white dust. However, Peng Linghui cheekily informed Yan Jin that superpowers are changeable, and that Ming He's rank as white dust last year didn't mean it would always stay the same. Peng Linghui then gave Ming He a thumbs up and praised him for being awesome. Ming He noticed that the orb had suddenly started to resonate red light, and immediately took his hands away from it. The goddess commended him for hiding his strength, and said that there was no need for him to show those foolish humans his red sovereign. Ming He then walked towards Yan Jin and asked him if he had passed the test. Yan Jin confirmed that he had passed the test. Sarcastically, Ming He thanked Yan Jin for the recognition he had given him and mentioned that since everyone was a violet soul, his total score on the test would probably be the highest. Professor Guzhu said that it was a given, based on the outstanding performance he had shown. Yan Jin told Ming He not to be arrogant and walked away along with Professor Shizhu. Professor Guzhu asked Ming He why he hadn't taken that year's entrance examination, which he could have definitely passed with flying colors with his skills. Ming He just scratched his head, instructing the examinees to rest in the resting room on the side first. Professor Shizhu mentioned that the live combat would start in a little while. A notice was posted outside Yan Jin's office saying that they were holding the special admissions exam and that they needed students to help them out with the actual combat test. Inside the office, Yan Jin cursed as he wondered if Ming He was purposely trying to make trouble. Professor Shizhu speculated that Ming He might be an elite student from another institute purposely trying to mess with their Nandu Institute. No one was knocking on the door, but Yan Jin gave instructions for someone to enter. Shortly after, Fan Kai walked in and introduced himself. He mentioned that he heard about their need for volunteers to help with the live combat test and asked if he could be of assistance. Professor Guzhu responded to Fan Kai's request, expressing concern that it wouldn't be fair to the examinees if he were to participate. 
He had come in third place among students in the city of Lanyang and had already been studying at the institute for a year. Professor Shizhu chimed in, stating that since it was a special admission exam, they had to adhere to strict regulations. Furthermore, Professor Shizhu added that Fan Kai was among the top 10 students in live combat among the second year's batch at Nandu Institute. Upon hearing this, Yan Jin smiled and decided to make Fan Kai the opponent for the examinees. The last test of the special admission exam was held in the combat arena. As Peng Linghui glanced around, he noticed that many students had come to witness the combat section of the exam. Meanwhile, Minghui was among the crowd, scanning for Liu Kian. However, he couldn't seem to locate her and quickly dismissed the thought, assuming she already had a boyfriend. To commence the combat section, Professor Guzhu announced that it was open to all, and students were welcome to observe the matches. Yan Jin assured the audience that the fights would be conducted in an unbiased and fair manner, preventing any allegations of misusing his authority. Furthermore, Professor Shizhu announced the pairings of the live combat test, where Minghui would face off against Fan Kai, Peng Linghui against Jiang Xing, and Zhu Dongsu against Wang Binlong. As the audience discussed the matchups, they began praising Fan Kai's impressive combat skills, noting that he was among the top 10. Upon seeing Fan Kai enter the arena, the crowd erupted in cheers, offering their support and compliments. When Fan Kai and Minghui met, Minghui remarked on the mysterious coincidence of their pairing. Fan Kai jokingly responded that it was arranged by the institute, leaving him no choice, but he reassured Minghui that he would not hold back. Minghi confidently replied that he didn't plan on relying on Fan Kai's mercy. Fan Kai was convinced that the upcoming day would be the day he would finally defeat Minghi to a pulp. On the other hand, Minghi had been thinking to himself that it had been a while since he had seen Fan Kai's hypocritical face. As soon as the fight was announced, Win gathered around Fan Kai's hands. He smugly informed Minghi that he had no idea about his wind controlling abilities. Without any further delay, Fan Kai lunged towards Minghi with his Gale Force Ram technique. Ming he responded quickly, swinging his left arm and clenching his fist. When Fan Kai was close enough, he threw a punch towards him, but his whole body was surrounded by wind. The collision between the fist and wind caused dust to fly everywhere. As a result, Fan Kai was pushed back, and when he regained his balance, he looked bewildered. Ming he then declared that he had just finished warming up and was now ready to play seriously with Fan Kai. He insulted Fan Kai, calling him a two-faced bastard and admitting that he had hated him since high school. This comment infuriated Fan Kai, and he started to hurl insults at Ming He. He even went as far as to call him a trash who had failed the Superhuman Institute's entrance examination. Ming He revealed that every time he got close to Liu Kian, Fan Kai would cause trouble for him and laugh behind his back. In addition, Zhu Zhang and Liu Xinghong told him that Fan Kai was teaming up with other students to ostracize him. In response, Fan Kai dismissed the accusations and claimed that he didn't even need to ostracize Minghi, whom he called a jobless hobo. He went on to mock Minghi, saying that his training probably consists of moving bricks in a construction site, and he could never dream of attending the institute. However, Minghi then asked him why he bothered to show up in the special admission exam if that was the case. Fan Kai reluctantly reasoned that the institute requested him to do so. Minghi sought confirmation from the teacher assistant and Professors Guzhu verified that Fan Kai volunteered himself and specifically requested to be Ming He's opponent. This revelation angered Fan Kai, who gritted his teeth. Fan Kai then declared that as Ming He's combat examiner, if he deems Ming He unworthy, then he's unworthy. Furthermore, he claimed that Ming He doesn't even deserve to attend the Superhuman Institute, let alone Liu Kian. Ming He mentioned that no matter where he and Liu Kian went, Fan Kai would always show up and ruin the atmosphere. This had happened just a couple of days ago. Ming He then advised Fan Kai to pursue Liu Kian with decency if he truly likes her. Ming He believed that the success of courting Liu Kian was entirely up to Fan Kai and there was no reason for Fan Kai to hate him. Ming He went on to speculate that Fan Kai might have confessed his feelings to Liu Kian before and was brutally rejected. To stroke his damaged ego, Fan Kai decided to bully Ming He to show his superiority. Fan Kai indirectly admitted to everything and told Ming He that looking at him made him angry. Fan Kai claimed that the Superhuman Institute was a sacred place that couldn't be entered by people like Ming He. Anger took over Fan Kai's mouth and he couldn't stop himself from spouting insults towards Ming He. Fan Kai called Ming He a joke, scum, and claimed that he deserved to carry cement at a construction site, deliver takeout to smelly neighborhoods, and wash dishes in a rundown restaurant. Fan Kai believed that being a superhuman was a job that Ming He simply could not do. 
Then he told Fan Kai that compared to his two-faced self, the real Fan Kai made him feel better. Nevertheless, Ming He admitted that he still wanted to beat Fan Kai's ass. Fan Kai reminded Ming He that he was the examiner and suggested that Ming He should start to get on his knees and beg him so he could pass the exam. Ming He threw his jacket towards Peng Linghui and exclaimed that he had wanted to beat up Fan Kai for a long time. However, he refrained from doing so because he was too poor to pay for Fan Kai's medical bills. Peng Linghui caught the jacket and became excited, anticipating the start of the fight. Ming He flexed his biceps and stated that the combat exam was the perfect reason for him to legitimately beat up Fan Kai. He added that he wouldn't need to pay for Fan Kai's medical bills since it's a combat exam. Fan Kai laughed and replied that he was ranked among the top 10 in combat for his grade. However, Ming He suddenly appeared in front of him, preparing to throw a right hand punch. Fan Kai quickly blocked the punch with his elbow, but he was still thrown away by the force. With Ming He's second stage explosive speed activated, he dashed towards Fan Kai, who was still pushed back and struggling to regain his balance. Ming He aimed to follow up with a punch while Fan Kai was off guard. The sudden increase in speed caught Fan Kai by surprise, and Ming He swung a punch aimed at Fan Kai's face. As a result, blood spurted out of Fan Kai's face when Ming He landed an uppercut punch that sent him flying. Fan Kai's sunglasses flew off, and one of his front teeth was extracted. Fan Kai used his wind manipulation to regain his balance and stop himself from flying away. His eyes widened in anger as he covered his mouth, realizing the extent of his injuries. He stopped spouting nonsense and started gathering wind in both of his arms while using the wind to maintain himself afloat above Ming He. He used his spirit art, Gale Force Whip to attack Ming He. The wind extended, grew wider, and multiplied, ravaging the area where Ming He stood. Sand splashed wildly due to the Gale Force Whip's wild attacks. Fan Kai laughed and taunted Ming He that he wouldn't be able to fight since he couldn't even get close to him. He claimed that his superpower was invincible, and Ming He's powerful fists were useless. He grinned and used his intermediate spirit art, Wind Python. The wind seemingly formed into a python, opening its mouth to attack Ming He. Ming He noticed that Fan Kai was using a spirit art, and his expression turned serious. As he touched the sand, it started fusing into his hand, and he curled his left hand into a fist, using the mystic fist technique. Fan Kai's excitement was palpable as the wind python solidified, and his face showed extreme anticipation. However, his expression quickly turned to shock when he noticed something shining inside the whirling sand. Almost immediately, a sand pillar fist formed below Fan Kai, knocking him away. Ming He stood at the base of the sand pillar fist, posing as if he had punched someone. The crowd was starting to wonder if Fan Kai was really ranked in the top 10 among the second years, as they watched an examinee who hadn't even matriculated beat him up. One member of the audience, who was dating Liu Kian, said that she had expected Ming He to be that strong. Fan Kai sluggishly stood up, admitting that he had forgotten to tell Ming He that his superhuman ability came with a passive ability. The angrier he became, the stronger the gale force he could command. Fan Kai's aura increased so dramatically that it disturbed the sand surrounding him. While preparing to release a technique, he thanked Ming He for making him enter his strongest state. Fan Kai used his soul art, Rampant Tornado, which only those of the Violet Soul rank could use. Despite their distance from the Rampant Tornado, the audience was frightened. However, they soon realized that Fan Kai was taking things seriously. Worriedly, Professor Guzhu told Yan Jin that she thought an examiner was prohibited from using ultimate soul art. Yan Jin didn't say a word and remained silent. Meanwhile, Fan Kai bragged to Ming He that everything was over, believing that Ming He's brute force had no use, and he wanted Ming He to experience despair. However, the sand pillar fist crumbled upon contact with the rampant tornado. Ming He curiously observed Fan Kai's soul art and smiled as he found Fan Kai's soul art lacking compared to his own soul art. As the people saw Ming He wanting to counterattack, Professor Shizhu commented that there were tears within the violet soul rank, and Fan Kai's gale force combat power was considered rather strong. He thought Ming He was overestimating himself. Despite Professor Guzhu urging Yan Jin to do something, he remained silent, and Peng Linghui desperately advised Ming He to run away. Unfortunately, the rampant tornado swallowed Ming He, causing Yan Jin and the rest of the audience to tense up. Yan Jin couldn't keep himself from swallowing saliva, and Professor Guzhu continued urging him to take action. Inside the rampant tornado, Ming He advised Fan Kai that if he truly wanted to defeat someone, he should unleash his soul art without restraint. He added that babbling like that would only make him seem angry and powerless. As a result, Fan Kai became triggered and even more furious. He claimed that he had initially wanted to let Ming He keep his dignity, but he changed his mind and decided to send him back to his crippled state in the hospital. 
With the use of the rampant tornado complete explosion, Fan Kai attempted to finish Ming He off. In the midst of the tornado, Ming He stood his ground and prepared to strike. Wind swirled towards his right fist as he bent his knees, accumulating power to punch upwards. Then, he employed his signature technique, the Hurricane Fist, and aimed it at Fan Kai, who was floating above him. Upon seeing the Hurricane Fist rapidly approaching him, Fan Kai struggled to decide what to do. As his eyes widened in horror, he could only use his arms to block the incoming attack. The Hurricane Fist dissolved Fan Kai's rampant tornado, causing dust particles to cover the arena. After the dust settled, Ming He was seen standing with his right fist curled, while Fan Kai was lifelessly stuck to a wall with a dent on his chest, his eyes and mouth agape. The wind that had gathered on Ming He's right fist began to dissipate. The audience, professors, and Yan Jin were astonished by what they had just witnessed, their eyes and mouths wide open in disbelief. Only Pang Linghui was celebrating Ming He's victory. Fan Kai fell on his knees before collapsing face down on the ground. His body shook as he struggled to move. After a moment, he was finally able to sluggishly ask Ming He about the technique he had just used. Ming He replied that he had used the Mystic Fist, which had the ability to convert the surrounding medium into power. And in this case, the medium he had used was Fan Kai's Gale Force. As Fan Kai still struggled to get up, he expressed his disbelief that Ming He had overpowered his soul art with a spirit art. Ming He explained that if he had used his soul art, Fan Kai would have been reduced to nothing. He added that, as former classmates, he wanted to leave Fan Kai with some face. Fan Kai asked Ming He how he could use a soul art. Peng Linghui returned Ming He's jacket and called Fan Kai an idiot before informing him that Ming He had passed the superpower talent test and also possessed a violet soul superpower talent. He emphasized that Ming He had defeated Fan Kai without even using his soul art. Fan Kai couldn't believe that Ming He's talent had become violet soul. Medical personnel asked Fan Kai to stop talking and get on the stretcher. Ming He told Fan Kai that people improve and that he should enjoy his stay at the hospital, as he was expected to stay there for a long time considering his injuries. In the end, Peng Linghui and Ming He left Fan Kai and walked away. Peng Linghui confidently stated that gaining momentum in Nandu wouldn't be difficult since someone ranked in the top 10 had such weak combat power. Ming He responded by pointing out that Nandu's superhuman institute still had many geniuses, and it was impossible for all of them to be as weak as Fan Kai. Upon hearing their conversation, Fan Kai's mouth spurted blood, and the crowd demanded that the professors accept Ming He. Professor Guzhu advised Yan Jin that they should accept Ming He or else they might face criticism. Yan Jin cautioned Ming He not to get ahead of himself since Nandu's superhuman institute always had exceptional combat power geniuses. Ming He retorted that Yan Jin should be stricter with admissions. If students like Fan Kai were accepted, people might assume that everyone ranked in the top 10 got in through the back door, which could harm the institute's reputation. Ming He then suggested that Yan Jin ask him if there was any student he didn't want to accept, promising that they wouldn't be accepted. Yan Jin reluctantly congratulated Ming He on becoming a student of Nandu's Superhuman Institute, reminding him to be modest, open-minded, and respectful. Ming He added that it depended on who the instructor was, and Yan Jin reminded him not to take things too far. Someone in the crowd asked if they would reimburse Fan Kai's medical bills, but Yan Jin firmly stated that using soul art during student combat was forbidden, and Fan Kai had broken the rules and asked for trouble, so they wouldn't reimburse him. Even on the stretcher, Fan Kai insisted that money was not a problem for him. Peng Linghui commented that he had seen stubborn people, but he had never seen anyone be so stubborn over medical bills. Simultaneously, while Fan Kai was spitting out blood, the medical personnel carrying him were puzzled as to why he was doing so once again. Nonetheless, the remaining matches proceeded successfully. After the matches, Peng Linghui bid farewell to Ming He and headed back to celebrate his admission with his father. As Peng Linghui left, a female student approached Ming He, addressing him as a junior. She asked Ming He to add her on WeChat, offering to be his guide as he was still unfamiliar with the surroundings. Ming He expressed gratitude and inquired about the route to the wrong courtyard. The female student suggested going together since she was also heading in that direction. However, before Ming He could respond, Liu Kian appeared out of nowhere and informed the female student that she would be guiding Ming He as they were high school classmates. Liu Kian then thanked the female student for her eagerness, causing her to feel embarrassed. Despite that, the female student still requested Ming He to add her on WeChat. Liu Kian explained that Ming He's phone was currently under repair, which led the female student to persist and ask for Ming He's phone number instead. Liu Kian revealed that Ming He's SIM card was also broken making it necessary for him to get a new one. 
This left the female student with no choice but to abandon her request. After the female student had left, Ming He inquired about how Lu Kian knew that he needed a new phone as his old one was getting sluggish. However, Lu Kian did not address Ming He's question and instead commented on how eager the female student was to know him. She suggested that Ming He might have aced the admission exam given the girl's keen interest in him. Ming He responded by stating that he did not do very well and that he did not expect to face Fan Kai as his opponent. He then revealed that Fan Kai had gone easy on him. Lu Kian looked at Ming He in disbelief. She knew that Fan Kai had always been targeting Ming He. Meanwhile, in the hospital, Fan Kai sneezed as Ming He explained to Lu Kian that some people may seem despicable. But in reality, they are just pretty face that lacks intelligence. After hearing this, Lu Kian and Ming He laughed together. Lu Kian then congratulated Ming He, expressing how thrilled she was that they were classmates once again. Ming He was finally able to live the campus life he had wanted. Upon entering the Nandu Superhuman Institute, he gained free access to various facilities such as the great poetic path of the banyan trees. There were also the vast practice field of grass, the lively street for students, the library of the old school building, and more. During the introduction to the basics of superhuman combat class, Professor Zhang explained to his students that amongst the combat superpowers, every superhuman will possess a few basic abilities. He began by mentioning that superpowers are divided into five ranks. Then, he asked the class about the basic abilities of the white dust rank. Fang Nianrong was chosen to answer his question and she explained that people with the powers of the white dust rank will have a physique different from ordinary people. She also mentioned that they have the potential to exceed some athletes if they train diligently. Professor Zhang acknowledged Fang Nianrong's response, stating that she was correct. He further explained that in the past, strength, speed, and precision were considered to be the human body's limits. However, in the superhuman era, the vast majority of superhumans can surpass them. This is the basic ability of the white dust superhumans, which they call super physique. It is worth noting that different white dust superhumans will have different characteristics, with some having faster speed while others having greater strength. Professor Zhang explained that at Nandu Institute, the standards that are normally required include strength, speed, reaction, and actual combat. He added that as long as a student can pass at least one of those four standards, it is considered good. However, one student had a question for Professor Zhang. The student asked why his friend, who had reached the standards for both strength and reaction and had a white dust rank, did not receive a higher rank. Professor Zhang replied that they would discuss this in the next topic, the Blue Spirit Rank. He expected that everyone already knew about the abilities of Blue Spirit superhumans, but he still wanted to explain everything in detail. Professor Zhang asked for a volunteer to demonstrate the abilities of a Blue Spirit superhuman. A female student volunteered and said that her superpower was glaring light, and her spirit art was blindness, which everyone in the room should be able to feel. The professor asked her to demonstrate without damaging any equipment in the classroom. The female student affirmed that she could control the intensity of the glaring light and proceeded to create a ball of light on her palm. When she released the ball of light, it diffused a bright light that blinded everyone in the room who looked at it. Ming He closed his eyes to protect himself from the bright light, and the female student instructed everyone not to panic and to close their eyes first. She assured everyone that their sight would completely recover in a minute or two. While Ming He's vision was still blurry, Professor Zhang explained that what they had just witnessed was an explosive spirit art. Blue spirit superhumans not only have a super physique but also possess some kind of spirit art that can inflict serious damage on enemies, as well as unexpected effects. Therefore, it needs to be used skillfully and nimbly by every blue spirit superhuman. The use of spirit arts consumes a lot of physical and mental power. Therefore, even though blue spirit superhumans are inherently superior to white dust ones, the cultivation of a super physique is still essential. When someone asked about how the violet soul rank is different from the first two, Professor Zhang explained that violet soul superhumans have more than just a super physique in spirit arts. The student then remarked that there shouldn't be many people with a violet rank in the institute. Professor Zhang acknowledged that explaining soul arts in a few words is a daunting task. He further explained that some soul arts have prerequisites, while others are connected to their superhuman spirit art. This connection is said to make spirit art ten times more powerful. During the lecture, Professor Zhang shared that he received a recording of a soul arts appearance during a special admission combat. He urged everyone to pay close attention but also reminded them that he's not showing the recording to showcase the power of soul art. 
To ensure that the recording was viewed with optimal conditions, Professor Zhang asked the student near the wall to lower the blinds and turn off the lights. Soon after, the recording of the fight between Ming He and Fan Kai started to play. Professor Zhang warned that the person's face would be blurred since they didn't have permission to share it. Ming He was relieved to hear this as he didn't want to become famous early. In the recording, when Fan Kai unleashed his ultimate soul art, the rampant tornado, the students were left in shock. They described Fan Kai's violet rank soul art as a mini version of a natural disaster and were terrified by its power. During the playback, Fang Nianrong noticed that the person in the footage looked strikingly similar to Minghe. Professor Zhang explained that Fan Kai's superpower is the battle wind. The gale whip and wind python that Fan Kai used previously are basically used to accumulate the wind element in his surroundings. This is a prerequisite to displaying his soul art, as the wind must reach a certain intensity. However, Ming-He realized that when he used his fist to disperse those pythons, Fan Kai actually wasn't able to display his soul art. In the recording, when the rampant tornado swallowed Ming-He, the students thought that he would be torn apart. They exclaimed and wondered who would be able to withstand that kind of soul art. However, when Ming-He used his mystic fist, the hurricane fist, the students were even more shocked. Their mouths hung open as they wondered if Ming-He was even human. To disperse the soul art that his opponent gathered with one punch, they thought that it was a great mini version of a natural disaster. Fang Nianrong looked at Minghe suspiciously. Professor Zhang pointed out that the student in the recording only used his spirit art. He explained that they can assume that the spirit art can absorb any medium in his surroundings, and the stronger the medium is, the stronger the displayed spirit art will be. Since it is expected that the violet soul soul art is at least 10 times stronger than the blue spirit spirit art, a student couldn't help but ask Professor Zhang how the student in the recording did it. Professor Zhang explained that there are two factors. The first one is that the white dust foundation of that student is very solid since he got the highest marks in three of the four standards. He then informed everyone that they will strengthen their white dust super physique during their training, which will start two days later. Furthermore, he said that the more stable the super physique is, the stronger spirit art and soul art they could display. According to Professor Zhang, the superhuman's actual capabilities aren't just measured by the standards such as white dust. Blue Spirit, Violet Soul, Red Sovereign, and Black Saint. Theoretically, a white dust superhuman who trained their super physique to the extreme can even beat a Black Saint superhuman. The students were left wondering who the person in the recording was. They discussed how powerful he is and a student even thinks that the student alone can fight against everyone in their classroom. This is because, with that person's spirit art alone, he was able to display tremendous power. The students speculated that the person's soul art might be able to destroy a small mountain. After explaining and showing the recording to everyone, Professor Zhang believed that the students understood that a person's upper limit isn't determined by their inherent talent. Whether it's white dust or blue spirit, actual combat requires every ounce of power to be applied perfectly, or else, the highest ranks of talents will be easily destroyed. After saying what he wanted to say, Professor Zhang ended the class. After the class ended, the students dispersed and left the classroom. Fang Nianrong was walking behind Minghe when she suddenly called out to him. Minghe turned around and recognized Fang Nianrong. She then asked him if he was the person in the recording. Curious, Minghe asked her how she could tell it was him despite the video being so blurry. She explained that Minghe must have passed the special admission exam since he wasn't a student of Nandu Institute when he was on the train but now they're classmates. However, Minghe reasoned that there were quite a few who went through the special admission. Fang Nianrong replied, saying that she remembered that Minghe was using his fists when he attacked the Calamity Demon in Fog. Minghe then told her that a lot of people use their fists, just like Teacher Yu. Their conversation was abruptly interrupted by a sudden announcement about the astronomy team noticing a small meteor passing through the atmosphere. The meteor's trajectory was estimated to be set towards Shaoling, Nandu. The announcement instructed the villagers of Shaoling to evacuate immediately. They also asked the frontline commanders to prepare for battle, and the rear coordinators to set up the police cordons and organize a backup team. Both Fang Nianrong and Minghe's phones rang at the same time. Fang Nianrong answered the call and was reminded that she was selected as a member of the backup team when she entered the institute. The caller asked her if she heard about the warning. Fang Nianrong confirmed that she heard about it and asked for instructions. Ninghe received a call from Liu Lin, who informed him that the calamity in Xiaoling had been determined to be caused by a group of demons, with an estimated number of more than a thousand. 
Immediately after answering the call, Luo Lin told him that Dragon Tooth required him to be on standby at all times to handle unpredictable emergencies. Curious about his role, Ming He asked Luo Lin where he should go. In response, Luo Lin informed him that he was a member of Dragon Tooth and was only responsible for emergency plans. She also mentioned that as long as he didn't get injured in combat, leave Nandu without permission, and not accept other missions for the next few days, he would be fine. Acknowledging Liu Lin's instructions, Ming He started walking towards his dormitory. Upon arriving, he found his roommate Zhang Yun complaining about Lai Jin's haughtiness, despite just being a member of the rear rescue team. Wang Jia, the other roommate, sighed and told Zhang Yuan to forget about it, as the institute made it clear that preparing students would be given preferential treatment. Zhang Yuan then noticed Ming He's return and asked about preparing students, as Ming He had arrived a few days late and missed out on a few things. Wang Jia explained that the astronomy team announced it every time a calamity occurred. The government, hunters, institutes, and villagers would take action. And when a calamity above grade 5 appeared, all four parties would send out a group to conduct an investigation and combat preparation. Ming He sat down and explained that he came from a small city where there were not many calamity occurrences. Wang Jia then told him that since they were in Nandu, all of Nandu's calamities were managed by the Nandu Superhuman Institute, which was the head of the institutes. Becoming a preparing student was considered a very glorious achievement. Zhang Yuan expressed his irritation by stating that being a member of the rear combat preparation team is nothing special. He even went further to say that they might not even catch a glimpse of the demon's shadows. In contrast, he bragged about his brother, who is a main combat personnel, and can see the meteor crater and fight with demons head on. He laughed as he pointed out that Lai Jin is merely a member of the rear combat preparation team, responsible for doing odd jobs for the frontline main combat personnel. Wang Jia was amazed by Zhang Yuan's revelation. He said that he had heard that frontline personnel were given luxurious treatment and were provided with one bedroom and one living room at the institute. Additionally, they were assigned a butler who helps with cleaning and laundry. Zhang Yuan pointed outside the window and explained that the luxury apartment complex with a lake view was where the frontline personnel lived. Wang Jia added that when he was wandering around in the afternoon, he saw Nandu's famous goddess heading towards the luxury apartment complex. Ning He asked who the so-called Nandu goddess was, to which Wang Jia expressed his surprise. He wondered how Ming He didn't know that there were three goddesses in Nandu. The three goddesses are Ice Princess Tang Ning, Martial Arts Saintess Feng Ling, and Dancing Thunder Girl Liu Kian. Ming He asked why the titles were so bold and exaggerated. Wang Jia explained that the titles were given to them by the people of the institute based on their superpowers. It was said that anyone who had seen them demonstrate their powers would not think there was anything wrong with their titles. Ming He realized that he had been riding on Liu Kian's coattails as she was his high school classmate. Wang Jia expressed his disapproval and suggested that Ming He should just say Liu Kian was his girlfriend since he was so shameless. Zhang Yuan teased Ming He by saying that all boys in the institute addressed them as wifeys. However, Ming He reasoned that Liu Kian was really his classmate. Despite this, Zhang Yuan told Ming He not to deceive the room facing the girls' dormitory building. Later, Wang Jia asked Ming He why he couldn't even win against the entire girls' dormitory. Feeling frustrated, Ming He stopped explaining, stood up, and told his roommates that he was returning to his room. Once Ming He was alone, he sat on his bed, closed his eyes, and meditated. Moments later, he entered his spiritual realm where the goddess was floating in front of him. He asked the goddess who his opponent would be that day. The goddess opened her eyes, stretched her arms, and told Ming He that the mutated Dr. Zhao was no longer suitable to be his simulated opponent. She explained that because Ming He's contact range of opponents was too narrow, she couldn't obtain a lot of data. Furthermore, the goddess told Ming He that for her to be able to create more suitable opponents, he needs to come in contact with other kinds of demons. Ming He then informed the goddess that there had been a recent demon invasion, and it happened to be a group of demons located at Shaoling. The goddess advised Ming He to consider taking a look but he mentioned that he couldn't because he was currently in the standby phase. In response, the goddess recommended that he should take a break and walk around as there was no point in practicing without new data and opponents. Ming He, however, believed that he needed to join the preparation team to interact with demons. The goddess suggested that, as a hunter, Ming He could take on private work and increase his experience instead. After considering the advice, Ming He agreed to wait for the standby phase for the dragon tooth to end. It was at this point that the goddess informed Ming He that his second dominant power had been opened, and encouraged him to obtain the life drop, 
which would enable him to possess his second type of superpower. Ming he was stunned to hear the word second dominant power slot and life drop, and he wanted to confirm if the life drop that the goddess referred to was the one that would grant a person superpowers. The goddess clarified that the life drop could be obtained from the leader of the demon lair, and also informed Ming he that it could be purchased if he had enough money. Ming he mentioned that he didn't have any money. The goddess smiled and replied that technology is what the wealthy depend on, while mutation is what the poor depend on. She added that it was his luck that brought him to meet her. Ming he commented that some people had gained the ability to fly and overlook the universe by being bitten by a spider or struck by lightning. However, he had been hit by a huge meteorite, and he still had to improve his rank gradually. He then asked if the goddess could provide him with a complete rank gift card. The goddess explained to Minghe that such things only happened in movies. Minghe then requested that she create some opponents for him to fight since he would be idle otherwise. The goddess asked Minghe if he was obsessed with cultivation and advised him to go on dates or enjoy his time at the university since he was still unfamiliar with the Nandu Institute area. Minghe agreed and said that he had wanted to visit Nandu Institute's campus for a long time. He put on a face mask and headed to the free training grounds at Nandu, where he could find opponents to spar with. The goddess sighed and remarked that Minghe was truly a cultivation maniac. In Field 1, Minghe hung his jacket on a sign that reads spirit arts are prohibited and reminded everyone to take care of the grass. Minghe's opponent warned him to be careful because of his dangerous fists, but Minghe simply told him to go ahead. The opponent gritted his teeth and began attacking Minghe with one punch after another, but Minghe effortlessly dodged each one. He thought to himself that his current opponent was incomparable to his simulated opponents. Despite this, he decided to take it as a warm-up since he had free time anyway. Meanwhile, in Field 3, a student was pushing back her opponent with a strong combination of kicks and punches. The opponent, who appeared to be a white tiger, could only block as the female student barraged him with attacks. Finally, the student's opponent lost balance after a kick, and she took advantage of the situation by jumping and fainting a punch. When she got the chance, she stepped on her opponent's foot, sending them crashing to the ground. The man who resembled a tiger cried out as he thought that his opponent was being too ruthless during their sparring match. To everyone's surprise, the skilled fighter was none other than Feng Lin, also known as the famous martial arts phoenix girl, in disguise. Confident in her abilities, Feng Lin asked for another opponent to challenge. However, when she called someone over, they ran away in fear. She attempted to call over another opponent, but everyone started fleeing in all directions, intimidated by her reputation. As a result, the disguised Feng Lin was left awkwardly alone in field number three. Feng Lin walked over to a man in a black suit and hat who was sitting on the side. The man kindly offered her a towel, but she declined, saying that she hadn't even broken a sweat. The man then warned her that with her strength, she was just toying with weaker opponents in that field. He also mentioned that people were already giving her the nickname of the martial arts Phoenix girl. Feng Lin replied by saying that she didn't care about what people called her. She felt dissatisfied, reminiscing about the days when she used to warm up by coming to that field. The man told her that she was progressing too fast and mentioned that he had seen a powerful guy on field one. He then asked Feng Lin if she wanted to try facing him. However, Feng Lin walked away and declared that she had lost her interest. Nevertheless, as she walked past field one, she witnessed Ming He flawlessly dodging his opponent's kick. Not only did he effortlessly grab his opponent's arm, but he also kicked his left foot causing his opponent to lose balance and fall to the ground in front of Feng Lin. As Feng Lin observed the fight, she changed her mind. She removed her jacket and commented that Ming He's martial arts skills were impressive and could likely last for two to three minutes. The man in the black suit and hat took her jacket while telling her that, in his observation, Ming He could last even longer. Feeling challenged, Feng Lin proposed a bet with the man. She promised to adopt his method of harsh training if she could not handle Ming He in three minutes. The man agreed, and she proceeded forward. Feng Lin strode confidently towards Ming He, determined to challenge him to a fight. Despite his previous opponent's warning to decline the challenge, Ming He remained unfazed and accepted Feng Lin's challenge. In a flash, Feng Lin lunged towards Ming He with a flying kick aimed at his head. Ming He was taken aback by his opponent's lightning fast speed, but he managed to dodge both the initial and follow up kicks. As they regained their balance, they took a moment to complement each other's skill. Then, Ming He delivered a punch which Feng Lin blocked with her right arm pushing her back. Despite being knocked off balance, Feng Lin expressed her satisfaction at having found a worthy opponent. She quickly regained her composure and leaped into the air, aiming a downward kick at Minghi. 
Ming He anticipated the attack and prepared a punch to counter it. Feng Lin executed her signature descending moon technique while Ming He utilized his ascending dragon technique to block the kick. The impact of their collision sent shockwaves rippling across the field, leaving the audience wondering if they were still mere mortals or had become maniacs. The stalemate between Feng Lin's feet and Ming He's punch lasted for a while before Feng Lin backflipped and landed away from Ming He. After landing, Feng Lin's right leg was shaking. The man in the black suit and hat told her that more than three minutes had already passed. Feng Lin admitted to Ming He that he was strong and that she had underestimated him. Ming He shook his right hand while responding that he had also underestimated her. Suddenly, Ming He dashed towards Feng Lin and used his wind punch technique. However, Feng Ling used her swift shadow to dodge Ming He's punches. Realizing that she needed to take control of the fight, she decided to distance herself from Ming He. Despite her efforts, Ming He used his second round of explosive speed to prevent Feng Lin from gaining the distance she wanted. The two fighters continued to engage each other in a ridiculous speed that was difficult for a normal person to keep up with. A student on the sideline commended the two fighters for their speed, strength, and reflexes, acknowledging their ability to comprehend each other's moves despite moving at such a rapid pace. The man in the black suit and hat rang. His face looked serious as he answered the phone. He called Feng Lin and informed her of an emergency mission. Feng Lin and Ming He stopped fighting, and the audience was shocked to realize that the person they were watching fight was actually the martial arts phoenix girl, Feng Lin. Feng Lin told Ming He that she had something to do and asked him to go there every Wednesday morning. Ming He agreed. Feng Lin received the phone and said that she would be there soon. She called the man in the black suit and had Uncle Yuan and asked him to find out the name of the student she had just fought, as she was in a hurry to go to the front line. Uncle Yuan agreed. However, the students were puzzled when they realized that Ming He had already left. Ming He was walking somewhere, praising Nandu Institute for its reputation, as even a random girl could be so fierce. He decided to work harder and struggled to remember his opponent's name because the field was so noisy that he couldn't hear clearly. He just thought it sounded like Feng Lai. In the television news report, the reporter informed the viewers that the red-eyed demon had been eliminated thanks to the efforts of the four parties. As a result, the villagers of Xiaoling were allowed to return to their homes. The reporter expressed gratitude towards the 13 students of Nandu Institute for making a world-breaking contribution. Zhang Yuan then pointed to the person being interviewed and proudly declared that it was his brother, Zhang Tu, who was receiving the commendation. Meanwhile, Wang Jia watched the television with excitement, longing to be famous and appear on television himself someday. However, Zhang Yuan sarcastically asked Lai Jin if he had the qualifications to be on the front line, given his current situation of doing odd jobs in the back. Lai Jin responded by telling Zhang Yuan to stop acting so arrogantly since it was his brother who was receiving the commendation and had nothing to do with him. Despite Zhang Yuan's anger and desire to talk back, he was at a loss for words. Attempting to defuse the tension, Wang Jia asked his roommates not to fight and reminded them that they all lived together. He then inquired whether they had finished packing their belongings. Confused, Zhang Yuan asked why they needed to pack their things. Wang Jia explained that they were going on a wilderness training excursion, similar to military training in college, which was mandatory for all freshmen. Zhang Yuan admitted that he had forgotten and went to his room to prepare some necessities. Meanwhile, Wang Jia looked at Ming He and asked him how he was doing. Ming He responded that he was already all set. As they watched the news, Liu Kian's face appeared on the television, and the reporter thanked them once again for their cooperation. Later in the classroom, Professor Zhang informed everyone that the training plan had been decided after negotiating with the government association. Specifically, they had chosen Xiaoling as their wilderness training grounds. However, one female student expressed her unwillingness, saying that she couldn't bear the mosquitoes, bugs, and living conditions in farmhouses. Another female student also voiced her concern, as a battle had just ended there. Professor Zhang reassured them not to treat the training as an autumn outing, emphasizing the importance of the task. He also informed everyone that, according to the news from the Hunter Association, the red demons from Xiaoling had spawning abilities and fast incubation and growth speeds. Despite eliminating all the fully grown red demons, the demon eggs at Xiaoling posed an enormous hidden danger to the local residents. Therefore, the students were tasked with cleaning them up. However, the students felt dissatisfied and suggested that the criminals should do it instead. Professor Zhang advised them not to underestimate the importance of work related to protecting the people. Additionally, he reminded them that if they come across any remaining red demons in Shaoling, 
They should report it to both the institute and the government. Zhang Yuan informed Wang Jia that even killing one of the remaining red demons would count as a merit. Wang Jia agreed and mentioned that, typically, freshmen like them without experience would start from odd jobs. Furthermore, Professor Zhang mentioned that he had heard about Fang Nianrong's excellent performance in the rear combat team which had earned her praise from the higher-ups. He then decided to appoint her as the class leader and asked if anyone had any objections. He also stated that he would select the rest of the committee members based on their performance. After concluding the weekly meeting, he instructed the students to prepare for the upcoming trip to Xiaoling. Upon checking his phone, Ming he noticed that he had missed a call from Lu Kayan. He quickly returned the call and explained that his class had just ended. Lu Kayan invited him to the cafe where they had previously met. Ming He agreed to come over and ended the call. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan exchanged smiles as they noticed that the voice on the other end of the call was a girl's. Wang Jia said that he couldn't tell that Ming He already had a girlfriend, to which Ming He explained that the girl was just his classmate. However, Zhang Yuan commented that their relationship shouldn't be normal since the girl was talking to him so gently. Ming He assured him that there was no romantic relationship between them and that he had been given the good person card already. Furious about Ming He's previous rejection, Wang Jia asked why the girl would agree to meet him in a cafe. Ming He plainly replied that they could still be friends. But, his friends called him a simp and teased him, saying that the girl must be his imaginary classmate Lu Kayan. Ming He gave his notebook to them and confirmed that he was, indeed, meeting Lu Kayan. Ming He walked away, asking his friends to bring back his book to the dormitory for him before thanking them. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan decided to stalk Ming He since they had nothing else to do. Wang Jia asked Lai Jin if he wanted to come with them. But Lai Jin walked away, telling Wang Jia that he was going back to reading. He added that he didn't want to live with all of them in that trashy dormitory next school semester. Zhang Yuan was offended and asked Lai Jin if he was a burlap sack because he was full of pretenses. Wang Jia held Zhang Yuan's arm and told him to forget about it since they couldn't lose track of Ming He. He did his best to calm Zhang Yuan as they followed Ming He. In the cafe, Ming He asked Lu Kayan if she had received the commendation, and she confirmed that she had. Lu Kayan added that her seniors were the powerful ones and that she was just there to make up the number of people. Ming He then asked her if she got hurt, but Lu Kayan plainly replied that she didn't get hurt. Ming He remembered to ask Lu Kayan if she was looking for him urgently. When Lu Kayan blushed and told him that she called him for no special reason, she admitted that she was wondering if they were really in a relationship since Ming He was talking so weirdly, and he didn't call her after entering the institute. She then revealed that she agreed to the institute's request for her to be a teaching assistant for them in their training, and she would be going with them to Xiaoling. While using the menu to hide their faces, Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan confirmed that Lu Kayan was indeed Ming He's classmate. Ming He was pleased to hear this since that meant he could see Lu Kayan more often. Lu Kayan then asked Ming He if they should watch a movie. She explained that after staying on the front line for 10 days, her roommate suggested watching a movie to help her relax. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan couldn't help but crumple the menu upon seeing their goddess take the initiative to suggest watching a movie. Ming He agreed that there should be a balance between work and rest and recommended a comedy movie that he heard had excellent reviews. Lu Kayan asked if he had other things to do, and Ming He replied that he was only training and had nothing else to do. When Lu Kayan asked if he wasn't planning to watch the movie with her, Ming He said that worked for him as well. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan were shocked to see their goddess acting so humble when facing a man. Ming He then revealed that a friend had told him he was becoming a cultivation maniac, and he reckoned it was time for him to watch a movie. He stood up and suggested that they leave. They walked out of the cafe together, leaving Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan shaking and crying out of frustration. They tore the menu and fell on their knees, unable to accept what they had just witnessed. In Xiaoling, the Nandu Institute students and instructors walked on a narrow road. As they passed by the village, the villagers offered them fruits as thanks for helping them get rid of the Calamity Demons. However, the students didn't accept the fruits because they couldn't add more to their luggage. Fang Nianrong told Ming He that the teacher wanted to see him. Ming He acknowledged and ran towards the front of the march. When he saw the head of the combat course, Director Zhu, Professor Zhang, and the vice president of Rong Courtyard, Dean Meng. Ming He stopped and greeted Dean Meng. Dean Meng informed Ming He that one of the military instructors was looking for him. Ming He ran once again further in front. From the group of military instructors, instructor Liu Lin turned around, waved at Ming He, and called him. Ming He was delighted to see that Liu Lin was with them. Luo Lin told him that she comes to Nandu Institute every year as a training instructor to guide freshmen. 
It's like her vacation after commanding exhausting battles. Ming Yi asked her if there were any special instructions. Liu Lin said there weren't, apart from coaching for wilderness combat and wilderness survival. Keeping the freshmen safe is the most important thing for her and her team. Ming Yi thanked her for her hard work. Liu Lin said it was nothing and added that it's not like she doesn't know the extent of Ming He's abilities. As a member of Dragon Tooth, Ming He is more than qualified to be an instructor for those freshmen. Liu Lin promised that she wouldn't expose Ming He's identity so he could enjoy his college life. She told Ming He that she had to explain the situation to him. Ming He wondered what situation she meant. Liu Lin mentioned the Dragon Tooth situation. Although members of Dragon Tooth are independent, she had to tell Ming He the extent of his authority. Liu Lin informed Ming He that the team he joined is not a small and random one. She bragged that many super soldiers out there would kill to join Dragon Tooth, yet Ming He doesn't even know where to fill out the application. Luo Lin told Ming He that the extent of his authority is over Group B. He has the commanding power of his executing district, and reserve personnel from the institute and government have to follow his dispatches. If frontline members are in his commanding district, they will need to follow his arrangements first. An executing district is the district where the mission is being carried out. Luo Lin informed Ming He that Xiaoling is currently his executing district. Ming He's not carrying out any orders, so he wondered why. Luo Lin informed him that he'll have two missions during the training. One is for him to assist the government in keeping the students' safety in the wilderness. It's perfect for him since he is a member of Dragon Tooth and could naturally blend in with the group of freshmen. Ming He accepted the mission, saying that even if he's not a member of Dragon Tooth, he'd still do it. He then asked Luo Lin what his second mission was. Luo Lin told him that he doesn't need to know what his second mission is yet. She said that she'll tell him when the time comes. Ming He agreed and asked Luo Lin if he should get back to the team line. Luo Lin said that he should since his identity as a member of Dragon Tooth needs to be kept a secret. Ming He was delighted that he could keep being low profiled. Later that day, the team arrived at an open area. Students put up their tents and started to set up their camp there. One of the female students complained about living in the middle of nowhere and sleeping in lousy tents. Another female student agreed and added that even the signal was weak. Professor Zhang said that camping is a basic skill in wilderness operations and instructed the students to learn from their instructors seriously. The guys went crazy the moment they saw Lu Kayan. They stopped helping to set up the camp and ignored the other girls so they could move closer to Lu Kayan, take some pictures with her, and appreciate her beauty. When Ming He finished setting up his tent, he sprinkled some bug repellent powder around the area. Instructor Zhu Kai used ashes to draw a wild animal line. He pointed out to the students that most wild animals have a keen sense of smell and are afraid of forest fires, so they won't get close if they smell something charred. The ashes must be completely burnt so it won't catch on fire easily. A student wondered why they should make precautions against mere wild animals. Professor Zhu Kai clarified that wild animals have the possibility of going through evolutionary mutations if they eat the dead calamity demon's meat. He added that they have seen a 10 meter tall calamity mutated beast bear before. Professor Zhu Kai pointed out that if a lone or in a small team went on a mission, those details must be carried out well because they can save lives when it's crucial. Night came. The students decided to collect some ashes after hearing Professor Zhu Kai's explanation. Each group sat around a campfire beside their tent. Students joined Luo Lin's campfire. A student asked her if she had any real frightening experiences. Luo Lin said that her most frightening experience would definitely be the Calamity Emperor Beast. She was still a student at that time. She trembled as she watched the Calamity Demon walk towards their direction. More than 10 kilometers away from her, the Calamity Demon stood, as tall as the mountains. Everyone in that city thought that the mountains were moving towards them. That city became abandoned and turned into a nest for Calamity Demons. Fortunately, most of the citizens evacuated safely. The female student on her left wondered if humans were really able to defeat an Emperor-class Calamity Beast. Luo Lin clarified that a few super leaders were sacrificed because of that battle, including a dean from Nandu Institute. Professor Zhang stood up and told the students to rest early since they'd start cleaning up the battlefield the moment the sun rises. At dawn, instructor Maya Olan woke the students up and instructed them to divide themselves into ten small groups based on their class. She told them that she'd take them on a morning run in the mountains to warm up. Afterward, they'd come back to their camp for breakfast. She assumed responsibility for Ming He's group. Some looked serious while others fell for instructor Maya Olan's beauty. She instructed the group to keep up with her, and the people who would fall behind would only eat steamed buns for breakfast. The group looked confident because they were superhumans and thought their physiques were not bad. 
Instructor Mayo Lan told the group that their teacher or teaching assistant would be at the back of the team. She instructed them to follow the back team if they fell behind and finish the course. After Instructor Mayo Lan's orientation to the students, she started running. The students were caught off guard. She ran up a hill, and the students behind her desperately tried to catch up. Ming He followed just behind Instructor Mayo Lan and slid down the cliff as Instructor Mayo Lan landed after jumping down. Instructor Mayo Lan looked behind her when someone screamed and fell off the cliff, but she didn't mind what she saw and kept running. She ran towards a river and used the stones protruding on the water's surface as stepping stones to cross the river. Ming He, Fang Nianrong, Lai Jin, and Liang Dong were able to keep up with her pace and cross the river without falling. A student who followed behind them slipped and fell into the river. Five people were running on top of a mountain as the sun started to dominate the sky. Moments later, Instructor Mayo Lan stopped. While sweating and panting heavily, Lai Jin asked her to continue running and said that they could still keep up with her. Instructor Mayo Lan said that the four of them could, but the majority of students couldn't. She instructed them to rest while they waited for the other students. Liang Dong, Lai Jin, Fang Nianrong struggled to catch their breath, wipe their sweat, and sought wind to cool themselves. Meanwhile, Ming He didn't even break a sweat. Moments later, Zhang Yuan and Wang Ji arrived. The rest of the students followed further behind them. They looked like they were about to collapse as they desperately tried to catch up. Liang Dong laughed and told them that they had been waiting for nearly five minutes already. Jiang Yuan and Wang Jia stopped walking and tried to catch their breath as they expressed how they couldn't run anymore. Students arrived one after the other. When most of the students arrived, Instructor Maya Olan continued running. To no avail, the students asked her to wait a little longer. When Ming He's group got back to their camp, the other students had already started cooking. Since breakfast wasn't ready yet, Instructor Maya Olan decided to let them take a break first. Seeing other students easily adapt to the intense morning run, Fang Nianrong concluded that every class has a couple of exceptional students. Wai Jin said that it was within his expectations because those students were the best in their respective cities. Liang Dong pointed out that those who attend Nandu's Superhuman Institute are expected to be the best. He informed the group that he was from Lu City before asking them where they were from. Wai Jin said that he grew up in Nandu. Ning He and Fang Nianrong told Liang Dong that they both came from the city of Lenyang. Their conversation was interrupted when Liang Dong smelled the food that the students were cooking. He immediately stood up, touched his belly, and invited the group to have breakfast together because he was about to starve to death. After breakfast, Liu Lin told the students that their next task was to conduct a detailed one-kilometer search around the area of the path they took during their morning run. She pointed out to the students that they should check every nook and cranny and leave no stone unturned, since their job was to clean up the demon eggs. And if they discovered a hiding red-eyed demon, they should first go to a designated location and fire a signal flare to notify the teachers and instructors. She warned them not to act alone. The students acknowledged the instruction. Dean Meng informed the students that their grade on that training would be counted towards their credits. He told the students to do their best. The students were upbeat, they looked excited. After the briefing, the students grouped up. Liang Dong told his group that they should decide on a plan first. Lai Jin said that during their morning run, he noticed numerous shrubs downstream. He had read a book that said red-eyed demons liked wet areas with numerous shrubs and that their habitat was similar to that of snakes. A female student complimented Lai Jin for being able to make detailed observations even though everyone was exhausted. Liang Dong suggested following Lai Jin's advice since searching aimlessly would get them nowhere. The rest of the group agreed to the plan. In the shrubs, Ming He's group walked through dense and tall grass. A student wanted to use his spirit art to cut down the grass. Ming He told him that it wasn't necessary and that he shouldn't waste his spirit arts. Ming He's words were cut off when Lai Jin butted in. Lai Jin told his group mate that he could use his spirit art since the rest of them could deal with the danger that might appear. The student immediately used his spirit art and had fun cutting the grass. Fang Nianrong asked Ming He what words he was about to say. Ming He told her that he was about to remind the group that there was still a possibility of red-eyed demons hiding there, and cutting the grass would expose their location and scare the demons away. But Ming He said that it didn't matter, he thought that the chances of them appearing were minimal. He speculated that the instructors must have done a preliminary sweep of the area before letting them come. Fang Nianrong asked him how he could say so. Ming He explained to her that it was their instructor's first time there too. However, they somehow led them down a set path during their morning run and didn't make detours when they brought them back. Ming He said that the instructors obviously explored the path during the night and investigated while everyone was asleep and that the eggs were too small. 
They could only try to find the eggs through instruments or by having plenty of people searching. Demon eggs were similar to snake eggs, instruments probably wouldn't be able to detect them. Ning He suddenly stopped, looked at a specific area, and told Fang Nianrong that the teachers might not have investigated the area they were currently in. Fang Nianrong wondered what Ming He was talking about. When she noticed that Ming He was looking somewhere, she followed his gaze. What she saw was a red-eyed demon. The red-eyed demon was alerted. It was on top of a branch, just above Fang Nianrong. It wanted to attack Fang Nianrong. Fang Nianrong was shocked. Ming He slowly prepared to attack the red-eyed demon. But before he could attack, the red-eyed demon slithered away. Ming He wanted to give chase, but he stopped when he heard someone scream. Ming He rejoined his group and asked what happened. His group mates explained that they were just shocked when they saw countless demon eggs. The eggs were all around them, some even attached to a tree's trunk. Fang Nianrong informed the group that not long ago, a red-eyed demon ambushed her and Ming He. Lai Jin asked her where the red-eyed demon was. Fang Nianrong told Lai Jin that it had already slithered away. Lai Jin excitedly asked her in which direction the red-eyed demon went. He thought it was a great opportunity to gain recognition. Ming He told Lai Jin that finding the red-eyed demon was difficult since it used the shrubs to hide. He said that they needed to notify the instructors first since it was safer if the assistant instructors and instructors conducted a concentrated search around that area. Lai Jin and another group mate tried to reason with Ming He that they would get a better grade if they killed it, and that it was just a leftover demon, so there was nothing to be scared of. Ming He insisted that they should call for more people to be safe. He said that demons were very dangerous, and it wasn't convenient for them to move around in that environment because the demon could hide anywhere it wanted. Lai Jin asked Ming He why he was being such a coward, and how he could dream of being on the front lines in the future. Fang Nianrong intervened and said that they should listen to Ming He. Lai Jin stopped insisting on killing the red-eyed demon and told Ming He that he should be the one to inform the instructors since he was pretty fast. Ming He immediately ran towards an open area and fired the signal flare. An instructor immediately arrived at Ming He's location. Ming He informed the instructor that they found a red-eyed demon hiding in the shrubs. When the instructor asked about Ming He's classmates, they heard a scream, asking for help. Ming He immediately jumped down the cliff and asked the instructor to quickly call for reinforcements. The instructor told Ming He to stop because he was a student and should be the one calling for help. But Ming He didn't stop. The instructor took out a communication device, called for reinforcements, and told them that a red-eyed demon was found and that students were getting hurt. When Ming He was about to land, a red-eyed demon ambushed him. He exclaimed when he noticed the demon and immediately swung his right arm. Ming He punched the red-eyed demon, sending it flying, while another red-eyed demon sneaked an attack behind him. He grabbed the sneaky red-eyed demon. Ming He miscalculated. He didn't expect that there was more than one red-eyed demon. The red-eyed demon wriggled, wanting to break free, but its futile resistance stopped when Ming He smashed it to the ground. Ming He speculated that the instructors who went first might have missed a hidden demon nest. He heard the scream, calling for help once again. He determined that the source of the sound was nearby. The call for help continued, and Ming He tracked the source of the sound. When he found the source of the sound, he was shocked when he discovered that an evolved red-eyed demon was actually mimicking a human's cry for help. He guessed that his classmates were probably tricked by the sound too. He decided to kill the red-eyed demons that surrounded him quickly. Ming He was confused when he saw a red-eyed demon bite a vine. He realized that the area he was standing on was a pitfall, constructed by the red-eyed demon using vines. Ming He fell into the pit, but he didn't lose his balance and was able to land without receiving any damage. In the pit, Ming He found himself surrounded by eggs. The red-eyed demons might have hidden there during the preliminary sweep. Lightning struck from the sky and it started raining. Shaoling began to get misty. Liu Lin observed her surroundings while her subordinate informed her about the student's discovery of a hidden nest. Her subordinate explained that the mountains were humid due to the rain, and it was normal for fog to appear. However, Liu Lin thought that this was no ordinary mist. Suddenly, she noticed something while looking at the mist. She used her communication device to order her subordinates to evacuate the students immediately. Her subordinates acknowledged her command. Liu Kian, Professor Zhang, and instructor Mayo Lan ran towards the red-eyed demon's location. When they arrived, the instructor who had come before them informed them that Ming He, Fang Nianrong, and Lai Jin were inside. Locating them would be difficult, so she instructed Liu Kian, Professor Zhang, and instructor Mayo Lan to be on standby. Instructor Mayo Lan suggested prioritizing the student's evacuation, as others would soon catch up. Maya Olan then received Liu Lin's order. She tried to reason that students were still trapped in the bushes and that there had been a sighting of a red-eyed demon. However, Liu Lin insisted that it was an order and must be followed. 
Professor Zhang urged Mai Lan to head in and save the students. Mai Lan informed Professor Zhang that an unknown calamity was approaching Shaoling, and the command post had ordered an immediate retreat. She said they must evacuate immediately because the calamity was estimated to be above grade 6. If they stayed, it would lead to an even greater tragedy. Liu Kian volunteered to head in and asked her instructor and professor to gather the group members and evacuate with them. They agreed and immediately initiated the plan. Liu Kian headed in and started calling Ming He's name. In the pit, Ming He was surrounded by both dead and alive average red-eyed demons. When he heard someone calling his name, he recognized Liu Kian's voice. He called her name in return. Liu Kian informed Ming He that it was getting foggy and she couldn't find his position. She asked if he was all right. Ming He asked her to stay back and be careful not to fall into the pitfall. Liu Kian told Ming He that Liu Lin had ordered everyone to evacuate because the fog in Shaoling was likely the same as the one behind the people's disappearance in the Zishan Industrial Park. Ming He assured Liu Kian that he was doing fine and would leave after taking care of something. He asked her to help other students who might have been lured by the red-eyed demons into their nests. Liu Kian thought for a moment before agreeing to Ming He's suggestion. She told Ming He to be careful before she left. Ming He faced the evolved red-eyed demon. The way it mimicked human voices and set up traps to lure its enemies, Ming He could easily tell it was the leader. The small red-eyed demon surrounded Ming He. The evolved red-eyed demon planned to exhaust Ming He's energy using the smaller red-eyed demons. Ming He ran towards the evolved red-eyed demon while dodging the small red-eyed demons that leaped towards him. When Ming He got close enough, he swung a punch at the evolved red-eyed demon. The evolved red-eyed demon crossed its arms to block Ming He's punch, but it was pushed away, smashing into a wall covered in eggs. As the eggs broke, yolk poured out. The evolved red-eyed demon screamed, as if expressing anger or calling for help. More small red-eyed demons appeared and surrounded Ming He. Ming He ridiculed the evolved red-eyed demon for using the same trick again. He grabbed a vine below him and used spirit art burst. The vine's aura gathered towards Ming He's hand. He let go of the vine, curled his right hand, swung his right arm, and punched the ground. Ming He used vine-wrapped mystic punch. Vines crawled out from Ming He's position, binding the small red-eyed demons. He raised his hand and said that he had purposely made himself look weak so he could take out all the small red-eyed demons in one fell swoop. Ming He twisted his fist, and the vines tightened their grip on the red-eyed demons, crushing them to death. The evolved red-eyed demon seemed to be in disbelief or fear. It shook slightly, then pounced straight at Ming He with its mouth wide open. As Ming He punched the red-eyed demon in the guts, he called it a bastard. The evolved red-eyed demon coughed blood as it smashed into the wall behind it. Before it could recover, Ming He showered the evolved red-eyed demon with punches. The sound of the beating could be heard outside the pitfall. When Ming He turned his back, the evolved red-eyed demon was already dead, its upper body squashed, and remained stuck to the wall. Ming He washed his hands with water leaking from a vine. Afterward, he summoned a vine and connected it to the vines on the surface outside the pitfall. He used it to escape. While escaping, Ming He realized that the eggs weren't meant to be raised but to be used as salt for cloud seeding, causing a reaction with rainwater to generate the mist. There were still a huge number of eggs in Shaoling, and the mist would form once it rained. The real purpose of the red-eyed demons was to bear those eggs, wait for it to rain, and create the much more terrifying white calamitous mist. Ming He thought that once Shaoling was fully covered by the calamitous mist, no one could hope to escape alive. As the mountain started fogging up, Zhang Yuan, Wang Jia, and some other students ran desperately through the rain. They wanted to cross the safety barricades that were already within their sight. Zhang Yuan was confused about why they were still so far away after running 200 meters. Wang Jia encouraged him to continue, saying that just a bit more and they would reach the safety barricades. When they got closer, giant trees appeared in front of them. Zhang Yuan realized that they had taken a wrong turn. Wang Jia speculated that the fog was making them see things. Zhang Yuan looked hopeless. He told Wang Jia that they would never be able to escape based on what he had heard from his brother. Wang Jia grew scared. Zhang Yuan shared with his classmates that once inside the mist, it was like being isolated in another dimension. One of his classmates said that he had heard about it too, and that during the industrial park incident, the residents had mysteriously vanished after the mist dissipated with no one knowing what happened inside the mist. Someone cried, saying that they were still too young to die. The students desperately called for help. On the other side of the barricade, Zio who wondered why the group of students he saw running towards the barricade hadn't gotten in touch with them yet. 
The woman beside him said it shouldn't be possible for the students not to see them when they were that close. A man with short hair called out to the students, asking them to get behind the barricades quickly if they could hear him. Zio, who volunteered to enter the mist and look for the students. The woman beside him agreed and said they would tie a rope around his waist, so they wouldn't lose track of him. She had a bad feeling about the mist. Zio, who praised the woman for the bright idea. When Zio, who was tied up, the man with short hair told him that if anything happened, he should pull the rope or scream loudly. The man nodded and walked towards the mist. The people behind the barricade reminded Zio who to be careful. Zio who waved his hand and assured his teammates. The woman slacked the rope as Zio who walked further. The man with short hair asked her the distance of Zio who from them. The woman told him that Zio who was about 200 meters away from them. The man with short hair tried calling Zio who, wanting to check if Zio who could hear him. The group behind the barricade waited intently for a response. Zio who didn't respond. The man with short hair looked worried, saying it was impossible for Zio who not to hear him. He felt that something was definitely wrong and immediately ordered the woman to pull the rope quickly. The woman pulled the rope. The group was shocked to see the end of the rope, but not a single trace of Zio who. They were speechless, staring at the mist with horror in their eyes. Ming He was wandering in the forest when he saw his classmates and Liu Kian. They were happy to see Ming He. Ming He asked them why they didn't leave the mist without him. Liang Dong explained that they could have easily gotten lost with the mist being so thick. Fang Nianrong apologized, explaining to Ming He that they heard a female voice calling out and thought someone was calling for help. Ming He told her that the pack leader of the Red Eyed Demons could mimic or attempt to recreate human voices. He asked his classmates if one of them had called for help. His female classmate admitted that she did call for help after tripping over a hollowed out vine spot. Ming He warned his classmates to be cautious if they heard a call like that. Lai Jin questioned the things Ming He just said. He said that information like that should be written in textbooks, and that the frontline combatants should have discovered it already. Liu Kian said that she heard a rumor about it from the front lines, but they had yet to gather evidence. Liang Dong wanted to contact their professors and instructors, but he was saddened when he realized there was no signal on his phone. Ming he was wondering if there was signal interference in the mist when something vibrated in his jacket pocket. He grabbed something from his pocket and took out a black earbud. Lai Jin recognized the black earbud as the special communicator issued by the officials. The instructors had one, but he wondered why Ming He had one as well. Ming He equipped the special communicator. He heard Luo Lin's voice, asking him if he could hear her. Ming He confirmed that he could and told Luo Lin to say what she wanted to say. Luo Lin told him that they failed to contact the outside. Ming He asked her why she was still inside the mist and how everyone else was. Luo Lin updated him that she had managed to evacuate most of the students, but a few students and faculty remained trapped among the mist. Ming He asked her if she had voluntarily stayed behind since she could have easily gotten out, with her station being right outside the camping grounds. Luo Lin confirmed that she did and asked Ming He to trust her, saying she could find a way to leave the mist. Ming He wanted to confirm if the other instructors could also get in contact with them using the officially issued communicators. Luo Lin confirmed that they could, but only within the mist-covered grounds. Ming He wanted to share his discovery, but he was hesitant, thinking that it wouldn't be much use in their current situation. Luo Lin told him that he should tell her what he discovered because they needed all the help they could get. Ming He explained to Luo Lin that the White Calamitous Mist was formed by the Red-Eyed Demonic Eggs. Once they made contact with rainwater, they would release a special type of gas. As soon as the gas reached a height high enough to make contact with moist air, it would generate a huge amount of Calamitous Mist. From the information Ming He provided, Luo Lin realized something. She told Ming He that what he shared was a vital piece of intel, and because of it, there was hope of getting out of the mist. Ming He asked her to tell him how to get out of the mist. Luo Lin informed Ming He that there was a giant pattern centipede on the run from the Entomology Research Center. So far, it was the only creature capable of traversing through the mist. She revealed that they had been tracking it for a while, but it had managed to slip away. According to the researchers, insect eggs appeared to be the centipede's preferred diet. Luo Lin guessed that the giant pattern centipede had been feeding off huge amounts of demonic eggs, and through it, developed the ability to safely traverse the mist. Ming He asked Luo Lin if they would have to start eating the eggs too. Luo Lin told him they couldn't. The eggs were poisonous, and the centipede's organs helped neutralize the venom to help digest it. Picking up clues from where they last saw it. They determined that the centipede was heading towards Shaoling and was likely hiding in the mist. Ming He asked Luo Lin if their plan was to look for the giant pattern centipede and hope they could follow its tracks to escape. Luo Lin confirmed that his understanding of the plan was correct. 
Ming he was about to start the operation when someone somewhere in the mist called his name. From the voice and the figure of the person, he guessed that it was Professor Zhang. Liang Dong opened his eyes, overjoyed to see Professor Zhang and the other students. He asked Professor Zhang what their next step would be. Professor Zhang frankly told him that he didn't think they could get out of the calamitous mist. Even the weather stations couldn't find an explanation for the calamitous mist's devious dimensional separation properties. Liang Dong was worried that they might not be able to get out of the terrifying calamitous mist. Professor Zhang told them not to get their hopes high on outside reinforcements because the people outside the mist had no way of knowing about the situation of the people within. Ming he informed everyone that he had received Luo Lin's plan and said that they could get out if they put their minds together. Liu Kian confirmed the legitimacy of Ming He's words. Ming He said that they should collect as many eggs as they could before anything showed up from the mist. Lai Jin aggressively asked Ming He what good collecting eggs would do in their current situation. A female student added that extra credit was nothing if they couldn't get out alive. Ming He clarified that the eggs would be used as bait to lure a specific creature, which was the only thing that could get them all out. Ming He proceeded to outline his operation. Professor Zhang agreed that Ming He's plan made sense. It was their only way of survival. They might be scared, but they couldn't just give up like that. Everyone became hopeful. Despite their grim situation, they could see some hope. Ming He ordered the team to split up. He instructed Liu Kian and instructor Zhang to group up the students trapped in the midst of the mist and gather them at the borders of the camping grounds. Ming He asked Lai Jin to go with Fang Nianrong and search for demonic eggs since he had the best understanding of the demonic nest's distribution. Ming He pointed out that the more eggs they could get, the higher their chance of attracting the giant centipede. Professor Zhang asked Ming He about his task. Ming He told him that he would take care of something lurking in the mist. Liang Dong immediately looked around him, begging Ming He not to scare people when they were already trembling. Fang Nianrong agreed with Ming He's words. She remembered that the train she took to get to school happened to stop around the borders of the mist, and the moment they ran into a monster, someone got killed. Fang Nianrong warned everyone to be cautious at all times, and the moment they saw something in the mist, they should start running. Everyone agreed and became serious. Liu Kian and Professor Zhang began searching for students. They ran around areas they hadn't searched yet, hoping to find lost students. Fang Nianrong and Lai Jin led a group of students in finding demonic eggs. They stayed in a group to lessen their chances of getting lost. Lai Jin pointed out the areas where it was more likely to find demonic eggs. Everyone was focused on their respective tasks. Ming He ran through the mist. He looked focused, as if facing a formidable enemy. Luo Lin said she had opened the communication channels. She requested a response from all combat units. Squad instructors Zhu Kai, King He, Mao Lan, Jing Xing, Fang Qin, Guo Min, and Dragon Tooth Ming He responded, waiting for Luo Lin's orders. Ming He slid down a hill while responding to Luo Lin's call. Squad instructor Mao Lan was jumping on a tree branch when she heard Ming He's response. She paused for a moment and wondered why the name Ming He sounded familiar. She recalled that during the morning stroll, a student named Ming He had completed the walk without breaking a sweat. Meanwhile, Luo Lin was granted permission to use the mutant distribution map. She informed the combat units that she would report mutant activities within a 3-kilometer radius inside the mist. When she opened the mutant distribution map, she was shocked to see that there were no signs of mutants in the mist. Ming He sensed something was wrong and asked Luo Lin what had happened. Suddenly, on the map, yellow dots indicating mistborn mutants appeared in the lower valley, the upper stream, and the peak. Luo Lin was confused, she was positive that earlier, there were no signals within the 3 kilometer radius, and she was sure that a creature capable of moving that fast didn't exist. Ming He asked her from which direction the mistborn mutants had come. Luo Lin told Ming He that they hadn't come from anywhere but had just appeared out of nowhere. She was alarmed by what she saw on the map. She immediately instructed Fang Qin to hold her position and informed her that a massive calamity beast was near her. Luo Lin ordered Fang Qin to leave the area immediately. Fang Qin was running when she noticed a huge spider figure beside her. She gritted her teeth as she looked back and saw a spider with a body resembling a human skull. She immediately threw shurikens towards the giant spider. The shurikens looked sharp as they flew towards the spider calamity beast. But to Fang Qin's disappointment, the spider calamity beast easily blocked the shurikens with its legs. She realized that fighting the spider calamity beast alone was futile. The spider calamity beast opened its mouth and charged towards Fang Qin. Fang Qin quickly leaped away and told Luo Lin that her analysis was accurate, that the mist-born mutants had appeared out of thin air. While running, she speculated that there might be some sort of portal hidden within the mist. 
Luo Lin instructed Fang Kin to continue running around the forest outskirts, and that she had called Zhu Kai for backup. Outside the forest lay the campsite. The name of the mutant chasing her was listed as Spider Formation, a Lord Rank Calamity Beast. She knew the spider was out of her league. Liu Lin repeatedly told her to run around the forest outskirts. After realizing Fang Kin was running in the wrong direction, Fang Kin sadly bid farewell to everyone in the combat unit. Liu Lin broke into a cold sweat while calling Fang Kin's name. She watched on the map as the big red circle got closer to the blue circle until the blue circle vanished. Liu Lin's tears dropped on the map as she cried, mourning for Fang Kin. She trembled as she tried to hold back her grief. She did her best to regain her composure, informing the combat unit that instructor Fang Kin had led the Calamity Beast away and fulfilled her duty. She ordered all units to immediately head to the marked location and begin observing the mist's activities. She instructed everyone that once there were signs of mutants approaching, they should team up immediately and to leave none of them alive. In the valley area, Minghee sat on a rock, deep in thought. Their current understanding of the mistborn beasts was limited. They had seen Calamity Beasts capable of disguising as civilian women, a Calamity Beast that could mimic a human's cry for help, and the Spider Formation Lord Rank Beast. Ming he believed that his instructor Fang Kin had sacrificed herself to lead such a powerful Calamity Beast away from the grounds. The Calamity Beasts were born for the sole purpose of killing. Their most terrifying asset was their ability to think. Ming he thought that the Calamity Beasts were starting to learn from their experiences. Ming he was brought out of his train of thought when Liu Lin called him and told him that a mutated beast was approaching him from the west. Ming he started to see a figure through the mist. He waited until a mutated scorpion fly appeared in front of him. Ming he said it wasn't threatening since it was just a servant rank. On the map, Liu Lin saw multiple red dots appear around Ming He's location. She immediately informed Ming He that the mutated scorpion flies were materializing in droves, that they were everywhere, and that some were behind him. Ming He was confused about how, he was sure that nothing was behind him when he checked. When he turned around, he saw multiple mutated scorpions preparing to attack him. Ming He was scornful after being surrounded by a group of servant ranked mutated scorpion flies. He cut the mutated scorpion flies in half with his fist. Ming He thought that no matter how many of them came, he would be able to kill them all. He killed one mutated scorpion fly after another. After killing a group of mutated scorpion flies, another group appeared and attacked Ming He. He didn't stop killing them. His swift fists eliminated any mutated scorpion fly that came too close. Ming He used a swift shadow fist to break through the mutant scorpion fly's encirclement. The mutated scorpion flies exclaimed and immediately chased after Ming He. He looked back, curled his left hand into a fist, and punched the ground with all his might. Sand blades splashed towards the mutated scorpion flies, piercing through them and taking their lives. When the barrage of sand blades stopped, Ming He stood tall. Seeing that many mutated scorpion flies were starting to gather again, he wondered if he had poked a fly nest. Luo Lin told Ming He that he wouldn't be able to kill every single mutated scorpion fly. Ming He asked her what to do, as he thought he couldn't escape because the mutated scorpion flies seemed to be able to sniff the scent on his body. The mutated scorpion flies kept chasing him. A swarm of them still appeared, and their numbers multiplied dramatically. Luo Lin told Ming He that she had been observing how the mutated scorpion flies appeared and noticed that they were flying from a certain place. She informed him that they came from the south. She guessed that there was an insect den in that area. There were already a dozen mutated scorpion flies in Ming He's location. He wondered if there were hundreds of insects in the den. Liu Lin told him there weren't, and that there were only a few dozen shown on the mutant distribution map. She said it was like an insect factory where scorpion flies were constantly being produced. As Ming He killed the mutated scorpion flies near his area, the insect factory produced another batch. Ming He couldn't believe the speed of production. He had been killing mutated scorpion flies non-stop, but more were already coming his way. If he wasn't there, it would only be a matter of time before the mutated scorpion flies filled the entire valley. If an army of calamity flies formed, everyone would die, and their bodies would be eaten and destroyed. Ming He admitted that he had underestimated the mutated scorpion flies. He now understood that they weren't as simple as they seemed, and their rank was irrelevant if there were many of them. Behind the valley was their gathering point. Luo Lin left the task of protecting the valley to Ming He and said she needed to guide the instructors who were facing similar dangers. Ming He assured Luo Lin that he could protect the valley. She became emotional, telling him that although he was a member of Dragon Tooth, he was still technically a student. She apologized for giving him a heavy responsibility, but she saw him as exceptionally outstanding. Ming He expressed gratitude towards Luo Lin and the instructors for staying back for them. 
After expressing his gratitude, he immediately punched his way through the dozens of mutated scorpion flies that blocked his path. They were torn apart by Ming He's consecutive punches. Moments later, something appeared in front of him. It looked like a dimensional crack from his position. Ming He guessed it must be the insect factory Liu Lin had mentioned. When he got closer, he saw it was actually round and resembled a mirror. A group of mutated scorpion flies emerged from it and immediately surrounded Ming He. He stifled the wind, a move he had learned from an old classmate. He took a step forward and punched forward, using a wind fist. The mutated scorpion flies were swallowed by the wind fist. Some were spit out and smashed to the ground, while others were torn apart by the wind current. Ming He walked calmly towards the strange round insect factory as the corpses of mutated scorpion flies fell from above. When he got close enough to the insect factory, he walked around it and studied it, wondering if it was a passage to another dimension. As he focused his attention on the unknown insect factory, something fast emerged from it. The thing turned out to be a lone mutant scorpion fly. It flew behind Ming He and attacked, but he casually killed it without even looking, remaining focused on observing the insect factory. Ming He realized something when the fly came out of the portal. He determined that it wasn't an insect factory, but an unknown portal that led the Calamity Beasts to the mist. He speculated that the monsters that appeared in the mist probably used the portal in front of him. Ming He moved even closer to the portal, wondering what was on the other side of that wormhole. He poked his hand into the portal but was shocked when it swallowed his whole body. Ming He disappeared from the valley. Ming He emerged on the other side of the unknown portal and found himself inside a cave. At the end of the cave, he saw a bright orange light. As he stepped out of the cave, his eyes and mouth opened wide in shock as he took in his surroundings. Ming He broke out in a cold sweat as he observed the floating rock formations with spider webs in between. Multiple spider formations inhabiting the rocks, demon eggs scattered everywhere and the area filled with bright orange and yellow light. In the corner of Ming He's vision, a spider formation screeched as a dragon bit it whole. The dragon had flaming eyes and a forehead that ran through its spine. Ming He watched as the dragon flew arrogantly in an open space. Suddenly, its expression changed from arrogance to fear when a giant flying creature flew above it. The dragon's size was comparable to the giant flying creature's tooth. Ming He looked up in awe as green particles slipped off the giant flying creature's skin and fell near him. From afar, it looked like a small particle, but when it fell, it was actually a huge mass of green. From where it crashed, mutated scorpion flies appeared and noticed Ming He standing still near the cave's entrance. They immediately flew towards him. Inside Ming He, the goddess panicked when she realized he had entered that place. She asked Ming He how he ended up there, but he was lost in thought and did not respond. Full of questions, with his eyes wide open, he just stood still, murmuring to himself. The goddess screamed at him to wake up and bring him back to reality. As soon as Ming He came back to his senses, he immediately entered the cave and ran desperately towards the portal. The mutated scorpion flies chased after him. The goddess urged Ming He to leave quickly, and she would use her powers to destroy the wormhole. As soon as Ming He was about to pass through the portal, the goddess used her starlight burst technique to destroy the wormhole. Meanwhile, somewhere else, the Medusa-looking mutated Calamity Beast used its tentacles to pick up Fan Kin's corpse. It moved the corpse closer and combined with it. Moments later, the mutated Medusa-looking Calamity Beast successfully combined with Fan Kin's corpse. Blood was still flowing from its mouth as it sluggishly walked away. A group of lost students wondered where they were supposed to go. A man in the group exclaimed when he noticed a figure behind the mist. As the figure got closer, the man rejoiced after seeing his instructor Fang Kin. The group thought they were saved after encountering many scary monsters and running all the way there to escape. A man with a band-aid on his cheek moved closer in front of instructor Fang Kin and asked why she was so quiet. Fang Kin's mouth opened wide as she bit the man's neck. The man tried to pull Fang Kin away, but his struggle was futile. When Fang Kin let go of him, blood poured out of the wound on his neck. The man fell to the ground, trying to cover the wound to stop the bleeding. The students finally realized that it was not their instructor. They screamed and called for help but were caught by Fang Kin's tentacles. Two female students who were not caught desperately ran away, but the blonde-haired female student stumbled, and her leg was punctured by a tree branch. Her black-haired classmate helped her stand up and assisted her as they walked away, leaving blood trails behind them. Tentacles slithered behind them and quickly bound the two students. Fang Kin pulled them closer to her and gave them a scary smile. The black-haired female student had tears in her eyes as she could not move or say a word because her mouth was covered. The mist slowly covered Fang Kin's figure, along with the students she caught. Simultaneously, on a tent, Luo Lin was shocked when she saw Fang Kin's signal appear on the map. She tried to contact Fang Kin. 
pleading for a response, asking if she was injured and telling her to continue moving forward to meet with Minghee so she could ask for help. Luo Lin's subordinate wondered if the device malfunctioned since they saw Fang Kin's signal disappear, indicating her vital signs disappeared. She was skeptical if it was really Fang Kin. Luo Lin told her that Fang Kin was part of their team, and they could not abandon her if she was still alive. Luo Lin thought for a moment and said that she thought something was fishy, and the chances of the device malfunctioning were low. Based on her experience, she could only come up with one explanation. When her subordinate realized what she was thinking, her subordinate said that it should not be in the fog. Luo Lin told her that it was better to be safe and wanted to tell Minghe to move cautiously. However, she exclaimed when she saw Minghe's signal disappear from the map. Her face darkened, and they thought that Minghe might have died. Almost immediately, Luo Lin's face lit up when she noticed Minghe's signal reappear on the map. She immediately tried to contact Minghe and asked him to respond. Her subordinate noticed that communication was blocked in Minghe's location, thinking that something was interfering with the communication channels. Luo Lin couldn't help but curse. In the meantime, a student, together with Professor Zhang, entered the tent. While crying, the student informed Luo Lin about Fang Kin killing his classmates. Luo Lin's eyes widened, and she desperately called Minghe. Despite not receiving Minghe's response, she informed him that Fang Kin, who was being controlled by something, was heading towards him. She pointed out that it was not Fang Kin, and that the thing approaching him was extremely dangerous. Minghe sat on the ground, shaking and trying to catch his breath. The goddess had told him he was lucky she woke him up in time or his soul would have been lost. She warned him that the world is full of unknown dangers and that humans should not see them. Minghe agreed, saying that he felt like he had glimpsed into a literal hell. The goddess tried to cheer him up, telling him that once he was strong enough, those places would be nothing for him. Minghe closed his eyes and exhaled his worries, determined not to let his fear stop him from moving forward. From the communication device, Minghe heard inaudible sounds. He realized that his rash decision had caused it to break. He tried tweaking it a little, but to no avail. Suddenly, he heard a footstep behind him. When he turned around, he saw Fang Kin, who still had blood on the corners of her mouth. Minghe thanked God that Fang Kin hadn't died. She claimed to be injured and asked Minghe to help her. He noticed that her eyes were dripping blood and asked about it. But Fang Kin just wiped her eyes and told Minghe it was nothing but an injury. She asked him to carry her, claiming she had no strength left. Minghe noticed that her shoes weren't wet, even though she would have had to cross a river to get to him. With Fang Kin's condition, it would have been difficult for her to cross without getting wet. Suddenly, Fang Kin's hands transformed into a monster's and attacked Minghe. Minghe dodged the attack and confirmed that something was wrong with Fang Kin. She slowly transformed into a Medusa-looking mutant calamity beast. And when Minghe saw her face, he immediately remembered the monster on the train. He realized that the Medusa-looking Calamity Beast might have wanted to swallow the train attendant to combine with her body, blend in with the people on the train, and continue its destruction. Ming he guessed that his instructor Fang Kin had already died and the Medusa-looking Calamity Beast had swallowed her corpse, turning into Fang Kin's appearance. He realized how sinister the monster was. If he hadn't seen its blood-red eyes, he wouldn't have been so on guard. The Medusa-looking Calamity Beast smiled at Minghe, using Fang Kin's voice to tell him that his instructor tasted sweet. Minghe couldn't forgive the monster for disrespecting his instructor Fang Kin. The monster swung its arms towards Minghe, expressing its hatred and dread towards humans. Minghe bent backward to evade the monster's attacks. He noticed that its attack patterns were very similar to those of the demon trees in their school's training room. Minghe was glad that he had kept up with his training. He knew he just needed to find a gap between its attacks and counterattack. Minghe jumped onto a branch and looked for the right medium for his mystic fist. He understood that an ordinary fist technique wouldn't be able to kill the Medusa-looking Calamity Beast. The Medusa-looking mutant Calamity Beast chased after Minghe and continued its barrage of destructive attacks. It used its hair and arms to attack him, and rocks and trees were cut and broken into pieces. The monster thanked Fang Kin, saying that after absorbing her, it had become stronger and was planning to absorb Minghe to become even stronger. The surrounding area was devastated. The forest was now an open space, and the monster continued to talk about getting stronger. Minghe grabbed some dirt below him and threw it towards the monster when it leaped towards him, using his flying rubble technique to force it away. His mystic fist's medium wasn't thick enough to kill the monster, but he knew he couldn't give up. The monster mocked him, asking if that was all he could do. It sprinted towards Minghe and told him, as his instructor, she was disappointed. 
Ming He put both of his hands to the ground and absorbed the dirt to enhance the durability of his arms. He used his arms to block the monster's consecutive attacks. The monster mentioned that the way humans fight is so predictable, as if to prove its point. It predicted that Ming He would retreat after it used Fang Kin's vertical slash. Ming He did retreat to dodge the slash. As he stepped back, he noticed a tentacle emerging from the ground behind him. It was too late for him to dodge, and his left foot slipped, causing him to fall forward. The sharp tentacle wounded Ming He's back, and he could have died immediately without his luck. The monster retracted its tentacle, admiring Ming He's luck after dodging all of her attacks. It licked the blood on the tentacle that wounded Ming He, commenting that his blood was robust and that it thought he would be tastier than Fang Kin. Ming He expressed his disgust towards the monster, knowing he was still far from using his ultimate soul art. The monster was able to predict his movements, and Ming He decided to keep a distance away from it. He desperately looked for a medium that could kill the monster, but ordinary dirt wouldn't do. While Ming He was busy looking around him, the monster's tentacle slithered below the ground surface, aiming to pierce through Ming He's forehead. Ming He bent backwards to dodge the sharp tentacle. The monster grinned, there were actually three of its tentacles slithering underground. Ming He did a handstand to evade the two tentacles protruding behind him, but one of the tentacles wounded his back. He pushed himself away from the tentacles, but they chased after him. As they chased after Ming He, underground minerals were thrown in the air by them. Ming He noticed a small amount of obsidian among the minerals, which is 10 times tougher than the average mineral. During the morning training session with the instructor, he remembered that back in the valley, by a wall, there was an obsidian mine. Although the fog was too thick for him to properly see the entrance, he remembered that there was a withering tree around that area. While Ming He was dodging the three tentacles, three more tentacles came out below him. He jumped over a branch and then again to gain distance from the tentacles and to have a wider view of the area. Ming He felt great when he saw the withering tree. The monster appeared behind Ming He and he ran while the monster chased. The monster really wanted to devour Ming He. Ming He stood on the withering tree's branch and looked for the obsidian mine. When he saw the mine, he immediately jumped over and touched a gigantic piece of obsidian. His fist absorbed the obsidian and the monster confidently walked towards Ming He. Ming He looked intimidating when he looked over his shoulder. The monster saw Ming He's fist, but it wasn't afraid. It told Ming He that his fist wouldn't be able to hurt her. Ming He challenged the monster to try taking his attack head on. He punched the ground below him with his right fist, and a crack on the ground crawled from Ming He to the monster. Something came out below the monster, splashing the surrounding dirt. When the dust slowly settled, huge obsidian spikes could be seen. The monster was hanging as its stomach was pierced by a huge obsidian spike. Ming He slowly walked towards the monster and expressed his anger towards it. The monster was confused as to how Ming He did that to her, and Ming He told the monster that regardless of what they are, and no matter how strong of a force they've gathered in their monster kingdom, if they dared to invade where humans dwell, he promised to destroy every last one of them. The monster told Ming He that he'd never be able to escape the calamitous mist alive. It wanted to at least scare Ming He, as it knew that she was about to die. It kept saying that Ming He wouldn't be able to leave the mist until it took its last breath. Its lifeless corpse remained hanging on the obsidian spike, and Ming He sighed. The obsidian spike slowly crumbled, and the monster's corpse fell hard on the ground. Something green floated above the corpse, and Ming He wondered what it was. The goddess was shocked, and she told Ming He that it was a life drop, the same one that is said to be able to grant and alter another superpower. The Azure Moon Demonic Mother is quite the high-level calamity beast, although it was still in its growing stages when Ming He killed it. It wasn't that threatening the first time Ming He ran into it, but it became stronger the second time they met, and he almost lost his life. The goddess told him that it's the scariest part about intelligent growing types, that if given ample time to develop, it might grow into an Azure Moon Demonic Matriarch. Ming He now understands why such a precious life drop was found. The goddess instructed Ming He to hand it over, so she could purify it since he couldn't use it directly because there was still a lingering scent of calamity beasts. Ming He was about to give the life drop when he suddenly asked the goddess if she'd be relying on his personal growth. He felt that the goddess was much more impressive than the Azure Moon Demonic Mother. The goddess bragged that the likes of the Azure Moon Demonic Mother are incomparable to her, and she reminded Ming He that she already agreed to help him with his growth. Ming He was the one who said that he'd show her the beauty and meaning of human existence. While they're slowly reaching an agreement, there's still a way to go before Ming He could change the goddess' views. The goddess would back Ming He until he was powerful enough to face the supreme universal will once it descends upon them. 
The goddess was betting on Ming He's growth, and Ming He would be counting on her strength. Ming He looked depressed when he remembered the sight he saw at the end of the portal, and the goddess asked him if he was having a hard time believing in himself. Ming He just said that he had faith in himself. The goddess suggested that he should forget what he saw. She admitted that she wasn't fond of that place as well, and she said that the place is a lot more disgusting and primal than Ming He's world. Ming He gave her the life drop and looked at Fang Kin's corpse and carried it with him. His communication device worked again, and Luo Lin was desperately asking for his response. Ming He responded and asked for her orders. Luo Lin asked if he ran into Fang Kin, and Ming He told her he did, and that he was carrying Fang Kin's corpse, so nothing could have their way with her. Luo Lin asked if he was alright and about the thing that was controlling Fang Kin. Ming He told her it was the Azure Moon Demon Mother, and that he killed it moments ago. Luo Lin was glad upon hearing the news. Ming He asked if the eggs were all gathered and mentioned to Luo Lin that he saw a horrifying sight, and that there would be nothing left of them if the things he saw descended upon them. Luo Lin told him they were getting close and that the path he was heading towards was clear. So Ming He took note. Somewhere inside the calamitous mist, three villagers were walking in an area covered with tall grass. They were carrying a lot of demon eggs on their backs. The bald man walking behind a villager named Zhu complained about why they hadn't arrived at the village yet after walking for so long. Villager Zhu punched the complainer's head. The complainer's eyes bulged, and tears splashed from his eyes as he didn't expect to get punched mercilessly. Villager Zhu blamed the complainer for giving them the idea of going super far out to steal demon eggs for money. The complainer covered his head and cried in pain as he explained to Villager Zhu that they didn't go that far out, and that he didn't think they'd get lost in the fog. They had collected a lot of demon eggs. If they couldn't go back, they'd be in big trouble. The villager who's at the back end of the group asked them if they felt like something was following them. Villager Zhu faced the man and told him to stop being so paranoid. Figures slowly appeared behind Villager Zhu. The bald man pointed at the figures and panicked. He was stuttering when he told Villager Zhu that there was something behind him. When Villager Zhu looked back, the three hugged each other in fear. Professor Zhang appeared in front of them. He was with a female instructor along with the students they were able to find. Professor Zhang asked the three if they were from the village. The female professor wondered how the three villagers ended up in that area. The three were scared to death, thinking that they had run into a demon. The female instructor asked them if they didn't receive the notice, which says that no one is allowed to enter the mountain. The villagers couldn't say anything but admit that they wanted to make a bit of money. Villagers who explained that they heard that demon eggs are worth over a hundred times more than a regular egg. And they thought the demons were all wiped out, so they went out to find some demon eggs. Professor Zhang finally noticed the demon eggs. The villager presented the three bags full of demon eggs. Professor Zhang was delighted. He thinks that it should be enough to lure the centipede. He instructed everyone to hurry back to the camp. Professor Zhang asked the female professor about Lu Kian's situation. The female instructor told Professor Zhang that Lu Kian is looking for the last group that got separated and that she used a mark to tell them that she'll meet up with them at the foot of the mountain in around an hour. It'll take more time for them to get to the foot of the mountain. Professor Zhang decided to meet up with Lu Kian first before going back to the camp together. The female professor started instructing the students to follow them closely. The bald villager asked Professor Zhang if he could check if there's something behind them. Professor Zhang asked him why. The bald villager explained that they have an inkling that something is following them, and it's giving him chills. The female instructor told Professor Zhang that she just conducted a sweep around that area, but didn't find anything, and that she wouldn't have come back if there was anything lurking in that area. Professor Zhang suggested doing another sweep just to make sure. The female instructor agreed. Meanwhile, Lu Kian found a wooden house. She immediately ran towards it to investigate. The area was silent, and nothing abnormal could be seen. When Lu Kian opened the door, a group of students who looked worried and were preparing to attack greeted her. They relaxed when they realized it was Lu Kian. They were so happy, someone even cried. Lu Kian asked the group if they were injured. They told her they weren't. They informed Lu Kian that something terrifying was chasing them moments ago. Lu Kian instructed the group to follow her. She told them that they're going back to the camp and then they'll leave the fog. The group agreed and thanked Lu Kian. Lu Kian and the group entered and went out of a cave, crossed a rocky creek, and a bamboo forest. Lu Kian was following the marks she left. All the students that got separated had been found. They just had to follow those markings and meet up with Professor Zhang and the rest. Lu Kian reminded the group to follow her closely so they could stay together. Lu Kian suddenly stopped walking. She exclaimed when she noticed something on her left side. She immediately used her electric superpower to electrocute a mutated spider. The student closest to the mutated spider screamed and panicked. 
Liu Kian told everyone to look above them. When they looked up, they saw multiple mutated spiders using their web to descend from the bamboo trees. The mutated spiders had three red eyes and a mouth full of big and small fangs. Liu Kian jumped towards the mutated spiders. She looked serious, and her eyes were full of determination. While in midair, she crossed her arms and curled her fists. Electricity started to form around her. And when she spread her arms and opened her hands, a wave of electricity filled the area. Liu Kian landed on her feet. She fixed her hair while burnt mutated demon spiders were falling to the ground. The group was amazed by Liu Kian's skills. Liu Kian wiped out a dozen of those red-eyed demon spiders while the group had a hard time dealing with one. The group wondered if they could reach Liu Kian's level. Liu Kian's presence made the students feel safe. After they left, a giant spider leg squashed a burnt mutated red-eyed demon spider. At the foot of the mountain, Professor Zhang's group and Liu Kian's group were able to group up. Students from Liu Kian's group asked Professor Zhang what the fog exactly is, and how it could have so many scary things inside, and why there are demons even though all the demons in Shaoling are supposed to be wiped out. Professor Zhang explained to them that the things in the mist appeared in another way. He told everyone that they couldn't stay there for long because stronger demons would soon come. Liu Kian informed them that a way out of the mist had already been found, and she convinced everyone to work together. Professor Zhang reminded the students that they're superheroes too. He told them that what they experienced was something every superhuman on the front lines would face. They should pull themselves together and rise up to face the challenges. The scared and confused students felt motivated to fight for their lives. Professor Zhang's speech gave them confidence. Everyone started their journey towards the camp. They were about to reach the camp, they're a stretch away from the plan. While walking towards the camp, a student in front exclaimed as he looked over a tree branch that blocked their way. Ahead of them lay a lot of demon corpses. The students think that if those demons were alive, they would have died. They wondered who killed those demons. A student in a ponytail saw something in front of them. He urged everyone to look. They saw Instructor Mayo Lan. Everyone looked worried when they saw Instructor Mayo Lan. Mayo Lan urged them to hurry up and return to the camp, where the rest were waiting. Despite Mai Olan's obvious injuries, Liu Kian asked her if she was fine. Mai Olan told Liu Kian that she was just a little tired and claimed that a little rest is all she needed. Suddenly, something pointy sneaked behind Mai Olan and punctured her stomach from behind. Mai Olan coughed up blood as she looked at the pointy thing that protruded from her stomach. The pointy object was actually one of the formation spider's legs. The spider lifted Mai Olan and her weapon fell as the formation spider opened its mouth and moved Mayo Lan closer to it. Mayo Lan was shaking, her eyes wide, and there was nothing she could do. As the spear pierced the ground, Mayo Lan's blood followed. Everyone couldn't believe what they just saw. Some of the students cried in fear and ran away. The formation spider released its web to catch those who were trying to escape and to block all of the escape routes. A lot of students were caught in the web. They panicked, thinking that they were trapped and wouldn't be able to escape. The bald villager was crying while pointing at the spider. He said that the formation spider was what he felt had been following them. The female instructor who had been with Professor Zhang looked for an answer as to why the formation spider didn't attack earlier. Professor Zhang told her that the formation spider deliberately waited for them to group up so it could kill them all at once, imitating an anteater. When an anteater finds a group of ants, it doesn't eat them all right away, even if it's hungry. It would hide itself and follow where the ant trail led. The ants would end up leaving the anteater to their colony, after which, the anteater would gladly eat the colony of ants, including the ants that led it. Ants have a special way of communicating. If one of their own gets attacked, it'll alert the others to flee. Liu Kian got irritated after knowing that the formation spider was treating them like ants. Then she realized that the formation spider waited for them to group up so it could kill them all at once. But it didn't let them return to their camp, which means it knows that there are stronger superhumans guarding their camp and that it is afraid and not invincible. Liu Kian walked towards the formation spider. She intended to fight the formation spider head on. Liu Kian asked Professor Zhang and teaching assistant Liu to help her schoolmates break free from the spider webs. Liu Kian was determined to deal with the formation spider. Teaching assistant Liu asked her to be careful. The formation spider raised its two front legs and smashed the ground. Something underground moved towards Liu Kian as she ran towards the formation spider. Two pointed rocks protruded near Liu Kian's left foot. Liu Kian danced her way out of the protruding pointy rocks. The formation spider smashed the ground once again, and another two pointed rocks tried to puncture Liu Kian. Professor Zhang thought that the pride and joy of Nandu's superhuman institute, Liu Kian, deserved to be ranked second in combat. 
facing the formation spider, any other student would have been petrified, unable to react. So Professor Zhang hoped that Liu Kain could buy them enough time. While dodging the pointed rocks, Liu Kain noticed that the formation spider changed its pattern. She wondered what the formation spider was trying to do. The formation spider still raised its two front legs, but there was pink liquid flowing out of one of its fangs. When it smashed the ground, numerous pointed rocks tried to puncture Liu Kain. Liu Kain jumped around to evade the pointed rocks. When she got the chance, she jumped into an open area away from where the pointed rocks were. But when she just regained her balance, she felt danger lurking beneath her. Almost immediately, pointed rocks protruded below her and in the surrounding radius. The rocks were close to each other, making it look impossible for someone to escape unscathed. Teaching assistant Liu covered her mouth, thinking that the formation spider's attack might have killed Liu Kian. Professor Zhang saw Liu Kian's figure jumping around the pointed rocks. He urged the day's teaching assistant Liu that they should quickly do their task. Teaching assistant Liu was confused. Professor Zhang just told her to believe in Liu Kian. Liu Kian landed behind the formation spider's back. The formation spider exclaimed. Liu Kian jumped up to gain momentum for her next attack. As she descended, she used Thunder Hawk. Electricity covered her body as she kicked the formation spider's back. The formation spider screeched. Liu Kian's kick seemed to have hurt it. It raised its front leg to reach Liu Kian. To evade the formation spider's leg, Liu Kian jumped away from it. The formation spider's back, where Liu Kian's kick landed, got charred. Liu Kian used her electricity superpower to pull Mai Lan's spear towards her. She held the spear, covered it with electricity, and threw it to the ground below the formation spider. The electricity traveled from the spear to the formation spider. The formation spider screeched as it got electrocuted. When Liu Kian saw an opening, she dashed in front of the formation spider and punched one of its front legs. The formation spider opened its mouth as Liu Kian's punch cut its leg. It aimed its fangs towards Liu Kian, and violet liquid sprayed out of its fangs tip. Liu Kian was caught off guard. She had a hard time deciding what to do. She looked behind her when she noticed someone running towards her. Professor Zhang told Liu Kian to immediately come to his side. While Liu Kian was running towards him, he used his superpower. A huge golden scroll appeared and hovered above Professor Zhang. Just as the scroll opened, Liu Kian slid under it, and it started raining violet liquids. The violet liquid sizzled as it made contact with anything. It was an acid rain. While maintaining the scroll, Professor Zhang informed Liu Kian that they had freed half of the students. Liu Kian told Professor Zhang that she injured the formation spider, giving them hope of escaping. Professor Zhang apologized for not being of help in fighting the formation spider, and said that all he could do was provide cover. Liu Kian told Professor Zhang that it was fine because it was also her duty to protect her fellow students. The students behind them panicked when they saw multiple mutated red-eyed demon spiders crawl towards them. Instead of retaliating, some ran, and some fell on the ground on their own. They couldn't think straight due to panic. But the spiders ignored them. Instead, they ate the corpses of the demonic creatures killed by Maya Olan. The students were confused and disgusted with the sudden turn of events. Teaching assistant Liu's eyes widened in confusion when the formation spider started eating its brethren. The mutated red-eyed spiders crawled towards the formation spider, seemingly offering themselves to it. The formation spider opened its mouth, and the mutated red-eyed spiders willingly entered. Everyone watched everything wide-eyed. They were confused and couldn't comprehend what was happening. But their questions were answered when the formation spider's missing leg instantly grew back. They finally realized that the formation spider was consuming its brethren to heal its injuries. While they were discussing that Liu Kian's hard work might have been for nothing, the formation spider kept on eating its brethren to heal its charred back. Professor Zhang noticed that the students were starting to fall into the pit of despair. He tried to encourage the students, telling them that they were all superhumans, and as long as they worked together, they would be able to get out of that mess. The students cowered in fear. They had lost all hope of getting out alive, but they couldn't accept that they were about to die. Professor Zhang couldn't help but be angry with the students for letting Liu Kian fight alone, after doing so much for them. Liu Kian asked Professor Zhang not to blame the students. The formation spider was a peak lord rank demon. Its lord rank aura was fearsome and it had embedded seeds of fear into everyone's minds. It was using everyone's fear to nourish the seeds. It had taken root into the students' minds, hampering their mentality. If one's strength hadn't reached the Sun Blaze rank, they wouldn't be able to resist it. Teaching assistant Liu asked Liu Kian what to do. Professor Zhang had a way to break out of the spider web, 
but he couldn't abandon the students who were still trapped. Liu Kian asked them to take the students and leave. Since the formation spider had the ability to recover, Liu Kian deemed it impossible to kill. She decided to stay behind to hold the formation spider back. Professor Zhang was worried that once they left, the formation spider and red-eyed spider demons would surround Liu Kian. He thought that Liu Kian wouldn't be able to escape. Liu Kian told him that she had a way to escape. Professor Zhang still wanted to convince her not to, but Liu Kian told him that it was her choice and duty. She believed that her fellow students would grow up, and someday in the future, when their classmates are in danger, they would also stand up and fight. Liu Kian bravely walked towards the menacing formation spider. Liu Kian faced the formation spider alone. After eating a lot of its brethren, the formation spider wasn't just recovering from all of its injuries, but it was also getting stronger. The teaching assistant kept looking at the formation spider while releasing the students from the spider web. Liu Kian used her superpower to levitate, while Professor Zhang and teaching assistant Liu did their very best to free the students. The freed students also helped in releasing their fellow students. A red beam of light suddenly hit the formation spider. A female student, while still crying, used her superpower to attack the formation spider. Although they were terrified, they were still students of the Superhuman Institute. They refused to cower in fear and wait for their deaths. Teaching assistant Liu exclaimed when she noticed Liu Kian gathering electricity towards her body. Liu Kian positioned her hands above her head, and lightning bolts formed beside her. When she put down her hands, the lightning bolts flew down towards the formation spider. She used her ultimate soul art, Lightning Fury. The lightning bolts rained down towards the formation spider. It wasn't able to react and was hit by every lightning bolt. Dust covered the area. Liu Kian landed on her feet, sweating and panting out of exhaustion. She stood still, facing the dust-covered area. When the dust settled, she saw the eight eyes of the formation spider glow red. It was glaring at her. The eye of the formation spider reflected Liu Kian's image. The formation spider used blood web to imprison Liu Kian. She couldn't react at all and was caught by the blood web. The formation spider crawled towards her while repeatedly saying the word ants. Liu Kian stood above a spider web. Her hands were constrained. She tried to break free, but she couldn't. She realized that she was inside an illusion. When Liu Kian heard the formation spider say delicious ants, she got angry. She screamed at the formation spider, telling it that they're not ants. The formation spider told her that humans are pests. It claimed that they, calamity beasts, only eat pests. Professor Zhang opened a path out of the web prison, and everyone rejoiced. He instructed them to go out one person at a time and to avoid pushing. Professor Zhang called Liu Kian, but she didn't react or respond. She just stood still. Teaching assistant Liu speculated that Liu Kian's soul must have been attacked. Demon spiders suddenly appeared from the side. Professor Zhang still tried calling Liu Kian, hoping she would wake up. When the last student escaped from the web prison, the web showed signs of recovery. It would be too late if they didn't leave immediately. Teaching assistant Liu told Professor Zhang that the students still needed his protection, and they couldn't stay there. Professor Zhang confirmed that Liu Kian's soul was being affected. Liu Kian could only save herself. Professor Zhang hoped Liu Kian's willpower was sufficient. While running out of the web prison, Professor Zhang apologized and wished the best for Liu Kian. As soon as they came out of the web prison, patches of web covered the hole. Meanwhile, Liu Kian argued with the formation spider that they're not the universe's pests. She found it amusing that a cannibal demon who eats its own kind to heal itself is calling humanity pests. In that regard, Liu Kian thinks that humans are a hundred times more virtuous. She could sacrifice herself for her friends, while the formation spider eats its own flesh and blood. Liu Kian was disgusted. The formation spider told Liu Kian that her so-called friends had already abandoned her. Even though it was Liu Kian's choice, her friends had also made a choice, and that was to abandon her. It told Liu Kian that her friends would continue to smile and live at peace, oblivious to the fact that she was trapped there, and her flesh would be gnawed on by its children. Her body would be nothing but bones. Liu Kian's eyes widened. Her soul would be trapped there for eternity. She would endure an endless cycle of being devoured. Liu Kian kept her fighting spirit strong. She demanded the formation spider be done with the charade and claimed that she would never be trapped in there. Her willpower may be strong, but the formation spider believed that isolation is one of humanity's fatal flaws. Humans fear being isolated. Their so-called beliefs and faith are brought upon by other humans. If Liu Kian is isolated in that world and tortured, her so-called belief would be meaningless. The formation spider told Liu Kian that the flow of time there had been slowed down. She had plenty of time to think about things. It told her that she was pitiful to dig through her memory and to think carefully. It seemed she was a genius that had everyone's attention. 
a genius who had never felt sincerity. People praised her, flattered her. They pretended to treat her well but kept their distance. Liu Kayan thought about how the boys made fun of her. The other girls kept a distance from her. Her family smiled while praising her, despite the injuries she had. Her time with Ming He. Liu Kayan was slowly falling into despair. Someone ran towards the hole that was getting repaired. Professor Zhang was checking if someone was still inside when he noticed Ming He running towards the hole. He grabbed Ming He's shoulder and told him that it wasn't easy to escape, and he should not let Liu Kayan's sacrifice be in vain. The other students noticed Ming He's arrival. Professor Zhang tried to convince Ming He not to go. He informed him that the formation spider was a terrifying lord rank, and Ming He hadn't reached Sun Blaze rank yet. Professor Zhang thought that it would be hard for him to move under the spider's pressure, let alone use his superpower. Professor Zhang and teaching assistant Liu anticipated that Ming He would just be frozen in fear and be a burden to Liu Kayan. Ming He screamed at them, telling them that compared to the pain of losing someone, that kind of fear is nothing. After expressing what he felt, Ming He immediately forced his way through the hole. Everyone could do nothing but look at the hole blankly. From teaching assistant Liu's communication device, Luo Lin's voice could be heard asking for a response. Luo Lin said she could hear them and asked Professor Zhang and teaching assistant Liu to respond if they could hear her. Professor Zhang responded, saying they could hear her loud and clear. He explained that assistant Liu had managed to secure the communication device from Mai Lan. He wanted to inform Luo Lin about their situation. But Liu Lin cut him off, saying that she already knew the gist of things because of the communication device. She informed them that she had already sent over a member of Dragon Tooth who should be arriving at any minute. They knew what Dragon Tooth was, but they were confused. They only saw Ming He run past them. They didn't see any Dragon Tooth commandos. Professor Zhang wondered if it was Ming He, but he was just a recently enrolled student. So Professor brushed the thought out of his mind. He thought that there was no way that a recently enrolled student could be a member of that prestigious special force. Luo Lin instructed Professor Zhang to immediately escort the students back to the camping site. Professor Zhang followed the instruction. Inside the web prison, Ming He ran towards Liu Kayan who was standing still, surrounded by demon spiders. Ming He jumped and kicked the spiders. He punched the demon spiders that still dared to attack Liu Kayan. After killing the demon spiders, he redirected his frustration to the formation spider. He punched the formation spider with all his might. The formation spider took the punch directly and was pushed away. Ming He charged after it and used the violent fist of anger. Ming He punched through any debris just to hit the formation spider. The formation spider couldn't do anything but receive Ming He's punches. Dust filled the area where the formation spider fell after receiving Ming He's barrage of punches. Something was happening inside the dust filled area. A thick web suddenly shot out from that area and connected to the web prison. The formation spider roared as it tried to escape. Its whole body was filled with fist marks when it used the web it shot out to quickly leave the area. Ming He did not chase after it. Instead, he raised his left hand, which had been gathering blue aura. When he curled his hand into a fist, images of giant fists hovered above him. Ming He used star-marked galactic fists. The fists rained down on the formation spider. The formation spider didn't have the chance to block, evade, or counterattack. It didn't have a choice but to receive Ming He's star-marked galactic fists directly. After receiving Ming He's soul art, what remained of the formation spider was only its head and a small portion of its body and legs. Ming He came closer to the formation spider to have a look. Demon spiders suddenly showed up, they tried to offer themselves to the formation spider. A demon spider got close to the formation spider. The formation spider opened its mouth, and the demon spider crawled towards it. Ming He stepped on the demon spider, which almost successfully offered itself to the formation spider. Ming He swung his right fist and used the final strike of the star-marked galactic fists, Meteorite Judgment. A beam of light hit the formation spider. A deep pit could be seen in the place where what remained of the formation spider was. Simultaneously, Liu Kayan woke up and collapsed almost immediately. Ming He exclaimed when he saw Liu Kayan falling. He immediately ran towards her, held her hand, and supported her back. In Liu Kayan's perspective, she could only hear someone calling her name. She didn't know what happened to her. She just felt like she was falling. Then a faceless man reached for her hand. She wondered who it was. The man was able to grab her hand. She wanted to find out who saved her, but her head hurt so much. Then she lost consciousness. Ming He carried Liu Kayan on his back and went out of the web prison. Ming He saw Zhu Kai running towards their direction and called the instructor. Zhu Kai stopped and informed Ming He that the students had safely made it back to the camping site. 
He was glad that Minghe was able to deal with the formation spider, or it could have resulted in a greater tragedy. Then he told Zhu Kai that it was Lu Kaian who had mortally wounded the formation spider, and he just finished what she started. Minghe was worried about the mental damage Lu Kaian had taken. Zhu Kai took a closer look at Lu Kaian and said that they could only hope she wouldn't fall into the depths of her mental abyss. There was a chance that Lu Kaian would be left in a vegetative state for the rest of her life. Then he believed in Lu Kaian and told Zhu Kai that he heard her muttering to herself before collapsing. Zhu Kai was glad to hear some good news. The two started heading back to their camp. While walking, Zhu Kai asked Ming He if Liu Lin had already informed him of his second mission. Ming He confirmed that he had been informed by Liu Lin as they were entering the mountain range. Zhu Kai suddenly asked him if there were any witnesses while he saved Liu Kaian. Ming He told him that there shouldn't be any witnesses, and he was only seen entering the web prison. Ming He wondered why Zhu Kai suddenly asked. Zhu Kai said that when Luo Lin recommended Ming He to their team, he had his doubts, but he was now glad to have Ming He around. Ming He couldn't understand what Zhu Kai was talking about. Zhu Kai introduced himself not as an instructor, but as the squad leader of Dragon Tooth Southern Division. He told Ming He that it was fine if he called him instructor Zhu Kai. Ming He's eyes widened upon knowing that Zhu Kai was his squad leader. Members of Dragon Tooth must keep their identities a secret, just like Ming He who was a student at Nandu by day and a Dragon Tooth member by night. Zhu Kai apologized to Minghe for letting him do all the work while he was preserving his strength. He asked Minghe if he was going to hold a grudge against him for preserving his strength. Minghe knew that Zhu Kai had his responsibilities. The giant pattern centipede was their only key to escape from the mist, but it surely wouldn't cooperate quietly. Minghe told Zhu Kai that he placed his faith in Luo Lin's delegations. Zhu Kai praised Minghe for being sharp. If Zhu Kai had exhausted his strength dealing with the formation spider, there would be potential risks once they handled the centipede. The giant centipede had already gone through two stages of mutation, the first time in the sewers of Lanyang and the second time in the mist of Zishan. Its level was reaching that of a lord rank, a calamity beast in every sense. Ming He agreed that they couldn't afford to take any risks. He told his squad leader that he understood that once something went wrong with the plan, their search and rescue efforts would be for naught. So he believed in Lu Lin and Zhu Kai's decision making. Zhu Kai hid half of his face with his hat, then he said he was grateful for Ming He's understanding. Zhu Kai informed Ming He about his second mission. They needed Ming He to continue hiding the fact that he was a member of Dragon Tooth. Ming He got curious, and Zhu Kai explained to him that they had received intel that there were members of Heavenly Sovereignty in their Nandu Institute. Ming He expressed his hatred towards the Heavenly Sovereignty. Dragon Tooth's main duty was to remove the malignant Heavenly Sovereignty, and it was the reason why Ming He was accepted into Dragon Tooth. Dr. Zhao Shuhua, who was killed by Ming He in Lenyang, was merely in Heavenly Sovereignty's outer circle. Dr. Zhao was trying to do his work to enter the faith and gain true recognition from Heavenly Sovereignty. Setting off a disastrous calamity, bringing danger to the city, and causing unrest are the so-called works needed to enter the faith. Heavenly Sovereignty takes pride in such things. Having crossed paths with Zhao Shuhua, Ming He knows how crazy he was. Ming He wanted to confirm if there were really people like Zhao Shuhua in Nandu Institute. Zhu Kai asked about Ming He's thoughts regarding the missed calamity that just happened. Ming He said that there wasn't any trace of it being man-made. Zhu Kai confirmed that the missed calamity was indeed a natural calamity. If the Heavenly Sovereignty could make use of the rookie training, then what should have been an extremely low casualty Shaolin calamity would become a massacre in the cradle of the superhumans. Zhu Kai explained to Ming He that strong superhumans have strong vigilance, so Heavenly Sovereignty would have a hard time killing them. But if the strong superhumans are nipped in the bud while they're still growing, there will be a gap in the resistance forces against Heavenly Sovereignty in 10 years' time. Nandu Institute would send a large number of superhumans into society every year. If Minghe and Liu Kian, who will surely become the pillars of humanity in the future, die in the mist calamity, the Heavenly Sovereignty would achieve the purpose of their plan. Minghe apologized for not thinking deeply about the matter. Zhu Kai pointed out to Minghe that they're in a long war. Humans are driven to fight because of survival instincts, while monsters are driven to fight because of their killing instincts. The monsters are capable of using all sorts of means, which proves that humans are not the only intelligent beings in that war. Ming He promised that if there really is someone manipulating the calamity mist behind the scenes, he'll definitely find out who they are. Zhu Kai said that the enemies are well hidden. They could be teachers or students, and they could also be one of their organization's members. Zhu Kai wanted Ming He to be suspicious of every single person he meets in Nandu Institute. He reminded Ming He that his identity as a member of Dragon Tooth has to be kept a secret. He shouldn't mention it to anyone, including Liu Kian, who Zhu Kai calls Ming He's little girlfriend. Ming He assured Zhu Kai that Liu Kian didn't see him and that she's been unconscious since he came inside the web prison. 
the students and teachers didn't see Ming Hee's battle. Zhu Kai hoped Ming Hee would understand that the credit for killing the Formation Spider and rescuing Liu Kian must be taken by him. Ming Hee said that he would comply with the organization's plans. Zhu Kai promised Ming Hee that they would give him an even greater compensation. Ming Hee's eyes twinkled, thinking that he'll get a cash reward. Zhu Kai couldn't help but laugh. He told Ming Hee that money's just a part of it, while waving back at the person in front of them. They immediately got surrounded by students and instructors the moment they arrived at the camp. Professor Zhang immediately asked Ming Hee if he was the one who rescued Liu Kian. Ming Hee said he didn't, and he just got there and helped stall for some time. He told Professor Zhang that it was Zhu Kai who killed the formation spider. Professor Zhang was skeptical of Ming Hee's answer. Ming Hee explained that he was just being impulsive. Ming Hee paused for a moment before saying that Liu Kian was his high school classmate, as if he was confused about his relationship with her. He pointed out that he didn't have what it takes to defeat the formation spider. Fang Nianrong informed him that there was already a rumor that he was a member of Dragon Tooth. She thought it was impossible and pointed out that it's obviously impossible for someone who just entered the institute to join an organization that consists of the best of the best. Lai Jin told everyone that he was Ming He's roommate and that he thought that Ming He was incompatible with Dragon Tooth. Ming He asked Lai Jin if all the eggs that were untouched by the rainwater had been collected. Lai Jin pointed to a cliff and told Ming He that they had gathered the eggs there and were just waiting for the mutant beast to appear. Professor Zhu Kai walked towards the cliff where the eggs were gathered. Moments later, Lai Jin felt something, and the ground shook as if there was an earthquake. Ming He realized that the mutated centipede was approaching. Other students panicked, and they didn't know what was happening. Ming He was sure that it was the beast that had stopped the train from moving forward when he was on his way to Nandu. The entire mountain trembled, hinting at how tremendous the beast was. Zhu Kai stood confidently on the cliff, anticipating the mutated centipede's arrival. Moments later, something came out of the ground below the cliff. The centipede shot up from the ground. It had two eyes and some sort of gem between them. It was so ginormous that the students still had to look up to see its face even though they were on top of a mountain. Professor Zhu Kai remained standing on the cliff, looking at the centipede's features. The centipede opened its round mouth and roared. The roar sent shockwaves towards the students and instructors. Some students got swept away by the shockwave. Professor Zhang used the scroll to protect himself and the student behind him. Teaching assistant Liu and other students just held on using their own strength. They thought that the centipede was even more terrifying than the formation spider. Ming He stretched his right leg forward as to not get swept away by the shockwave and crossed his arms to cover his face. He cursed, unable to accept that he was unable to move because he was afraid. Ming He personally witnessed what a calamity beast that was near Lord Rank was like. He knew that if it attacked him, he wouldn't even have the courage to defend himself. Professor Zhu Kai took his hat and sunglasses off. They had been waiting for the beast for a long time. Zhu Kai dropped his hat and sunglasses. The centipede noticed his presence and looked at him menacingly. The veins on the side of Zhu Kai's eyes bulged, his pupils glowed golden, and a mark formed on his face. He screamed at the centipede, commanding it to surrender upon his soul. The centipede roared and dove towards Zhu Kai. With all his might, Zhu Kai screamed at the centipede once again. The ground cracked as he screamed, and finally, his superpower overpowered the centipede. The centipede crashed beside Zhu Kai and stopped moving. Ming He realized that Zhu Kai's superhuman ability was mind control. He was amazed that Zhu Kai was able to tame a near lord rank being by force. He immediately leaped towards Zhu Kai to check his condition. Zhu Kai slowly turned his head towards Ming He and told him that they needed to grit their teeth and fight for their own survival. Ming He was confused as to why Zhu Kai was suddenly saying those words. When Ming He saw Zhu Kai's face, his eyes widened. Blood was flowing from Zhu Kai's eyes, nose, and mouth. Zhu Kai said that he was glad that he managed to safeguard the bright lights of the next 10 years with his mediocre self. After saying his last words, he lost his balance, and Ming He tried to reach Zhu Kai when he was about to fall off the cliff. Zhu Kai's eyes slowly closed as he watched Ming He run towards him. Ming He was close to reaching Zhu Kai, but Zhu Kai was already unresponsive and had fallen off the cliff before Ming He could even do something to save him. Ming He was a bit late to stop Zhu Kai from falling, and although he tried to reach out his hand, Zhu Kai was already unconscious. Ming He just watched his instructor fall, and tears started flowing from his eyes. Simultaneously, he felt something wriggling on his head. The giant patterned centipedes and Tenny were wriggling around Ming He's head, as if trying to console him. The color of its gem and eyes noticeably changed from red to gold. It moved closer to Ming He and looked at him with its two golden eyes. Ming He touched the centipede's fang, trying to internalize the path of survival that instructor Zhu Kai had left for them. After all the things he had told Ming He along their way to the camp, Ming He apologized for not realizing the consequence of taming a beast that was almost Lord Rank. He fell on his knees, and the centipede moved away when Liu Lin approached him. She patted Ming He's shoulder and looked at him with a sympathetic face. Ming He vowed that he would definitely catch the evildoer who orchestrated everything. Liu Lin hugged Ming He and told him that she believed in him. T. 
tears started forming on the corner of her eyes as she told Minghee that everyone, including the people who died, believed in him. Minghee wailed that he would definitely catch the evildoer. Later that day, in the camping grounds, students started hopping on the giant patterned centipede's back. Some were scared, and some were amazed. Minghee and Luo Lin stood above the centipede's head. After everything was set, Professor Zhang signaled for departure. Minghee asked the centipede to take everyone out of the fog. The centipede roared and started crawling towards a certain direction. The students held tightly onto its scales to keep themselves from falling. By the foothills, soldiers stayed alert behind a barricade. A man who was holding a radio and not in uniform used his radio to instruct someone to call the CP. He pointed out that they must obtain any intel from within and be wary of their surroundings to make sure no one entered the fog. Suddenly, the soldiers exclaimed when they saw a figure of a giant centipede moving towards them from within the fog. They immediately reported the sighting of a calamity beast and reminded everyone to keep their guard up. When they came out of the fog, the centipede stopped and lowered itself to the ground. Luo Lin quickly waved her hand and identified herself so that the soldiers would not shoot at them. She informed the soldiers that the giant mutated centipede had been tamed. The students and instructors who were able to evacuate before the calamitous mist appeared rejoiced after seeing their fellow Nandu Institute people escape the rumored inescapable calamitous mist. The Nandu chief of security, Chief Peng, couldn't keep himself from smiling as he walked towards the Nandu Institute's calamitous mist survivors. Luo Lin saluted Chief Peng and reported that she had successfully brought back all 346 students. Chief Peng asked about the other instructors. Luo Lin reported that among the squad instructors, King He, Jing Xing, and Gu Min had returned returned safely, while Fang King, Mai Olan, and Zhu Kai had given their lives for the mission. Chief Peng was saddened by the news, while the people behind them were shocked. Chief Peng and the people behind him suddenly saluted. Nandu Institute Vice Chairman Meng made an oath in memory of the fallen ones who gave their lives for the greater good of the country. He said that the Nandu Institute would never forget their sacrifices. In Nandu Institute grounds, the funeral of heroes was held. Portraits of Zhu Kai, Mai Olan, and Fang Kai were carried onto the stage so that the students could see their heroes. Each of them was a hero who deserved to be remembered and looked up to. Mandu Institute Vice Chairman Meng instructed the students to pay attention as they sent their heroes off. A student grinned among the students who mourned. After sending off the heroes, the awarding of the students followed. The first class honors were awarded to an anonymous student, and the students started discussing among themselves who the awardee might be. They speculated that it must be the Dragon Tooth member from the rumors. They couldn't understand why the anonymous person didn't want to take the credit, and some even said that if it were them, they would brag about it in school since it was a first-class combat honor, after all. The second-class combat honors were awarded to Liu Kayan. The admiration students felt towards her increased. They heard about her stepping in to fend off a lord rank Calamity Beast and keeping over a hundred new students safe. The students went head over heels for Liu Kayan. The third class rescue honors were awarded to accompanying teaching assistant Liu Zhu of the 2-1 registry, 2-2 registry new student Lai Jin, Ming He, and Fang Nianrong for their supportive efforts. As their names and awards were being announced, the students looked at them in awe. From that exercise and the disaster that followed, Nandu Institute Vice Chairman Meng said that he was sure that the students had properly understood the horrors and cruelty of the outside. In fact, the ordeal they had experienced was but the everyday lives of every superhuman out there. Their bodies served as vessels for their willpower, and they carved out that safe haven for humans to thrive. The rest of the population could only enjoy such precious moments of peace thanks to the efforts of frontliners. But Vice Chairman Meng believed that every last one of the students would live up to the Institute's expectations. In fact, he could tell from the couple of students who chose to put themselves on the line that an extraordinary future lay ahead. A future that was a shining ray of hope in the midst of crisis. After Vice Chairman Meng's speech, everyone gave him a round of applause, and after the awarding, everyone left. Liu Kayan returned to her apartment carrying white flowers. She took her phone from her pocket and checked her call log, looking kind of disappointed. But her body shook, and her mood suddenly improved when her phone rang. She answered the call and blushed, looking excited as she called Ming He's name over the phone. Ming He shyly informed her that he was downstairs and asked if it was okay for him to visit her in person. Liu Kayan enthusiastically told Ming He that he could, and the door was open for him. Ming He knocked on Liu Kayan's door, and she opened it almost immediately happily greeting him. The two developed a romantic atmosphere, and Minghee blushed while asking Liu Kayan how she was feeling. Liu Kayan told him that she was feeling better, and she invited Minghee to enter the apartment and have a seat. She then took something from the refrigerator and offered Minghee a cup of water. Liu Kayan directly asked Minghee if he was the anonymous student, and Minghee plainly said that he was not after taking a sip of water. Minghee said that he was not thinking straight, charging him like that, and claimed that the formation spider almost killed him. 
He told Lukayan that it was Zhu Kai who saved them. Lukayan wanted to argue that she remembered that the one who saved her from the depths of the abyss was Minghi, but Minghi cut her off and said that the formation spider had gotten a hold of her head, and maybe she was just seeing things. Minghi told her that he was at the bottom barrel back then and that he had spent a lot of blood and sweat just to be accepted into Nandu's special institute, so it would be impossible for him to be capable enough to do that. Lukayan told Minghi that she really didn't care about it and kissed him on the cheek. Minghi's eyes widened, and he was caught off guard. She thanked Minghi for putting himself out on the front lines. Lukayan sat at a distance away from Minghi, and both of them were blushing. Things got awkward between them. Lukayan clarified to Minghi that she just wanted to express her gratitude and asked him not to take what happened the wrong way. Minghi just bowed his head and hummed in agreement. Meanwhile, at Nandu Institute's training ground, Feng Lin and her uncle Yuan waited for Minghi. Feng Lin was agitated because Minghi hadn't shown up for a couple of Wednesdays already, and she wondered what Minghi was doing. Her uncle Yuan teased her, saying that it was the first time he had seen her getting stood up by someone. Feng Lin considered Minghi the worst for not keeping his promise, even though they hadn't decided on a winner yet. Her uncle Yuan told her that the freshmen were currently having an awarding ceremony. And that last week, they had headed to Shaoling to train but encountered something strange there. Feng Lin asked her uncle Yuan if he had insider information. And he explained that he was just wondering if the kid she sparred with was a freshman, which would explain why he hadn't shown up for two weeks. Based on the man's strength, Feng Lin thought that it was impossible for the person he fought to be a freshman. She promised to go to the center of the training grounds and do the seaweed dance if the person he fought was really a freshman. Her uncle Yuan teased her again, saying that she had lost their last bet. Feng Lin stomped the ground and said that she would check the entire school's surveillance system and find the person herself if he didn't show up the next Wednesday. Her uncle Yuan suggested finding another sparring partner, but Feng Lin was not interested. Outside Lu Kian's apartment building, Minghi was blushing while touching the cheek that Lu Kian kissed. Inside Lu Kian's apartment, Lu Kian covered her face with her hands while leaning against the door. She was so embarrassed by what she had done. Then she realized that they were already dating and wondered if she was being too excessive. Minghi blushed while touching his lips, but moments later, he stopped himself from thinking those kinds of things, thinking that Lu Kian already had a boyfriend. He tried to convince himself that Lu Kian was just expressing her gratitude towards him. At Nandu Institute's training ground, Minghi was observing the students do their training when he remembered that he had made a promise to Feng Lin to meet at the training ground on Wednesdays. He had totally forgotten that it was Wednesday. He wore his mask and ran, wondering if it was too late to show up. Feng Lin and her uncle Yuan saw Minghi, and they immediately confronted him and blocked his way. Minghi apologized for not being able to arrive on time and explained that he had attended the awards ceremony. Feng Lin was shocked to know that Minghi was really a freshman. Minghi was confused as to why Feng Lin reacted that way. Uncle Yuan laughed at Feng Lin and teased her for losing yet again, and reminded her that she still needed to dance in the middle of the training ground. Feng Lin walked away while cursing. Minghi innocently asked Feng Lin if they would be having a spar that day. Feng Lin told him they would not and added that she didn't want to see him again. Uncle Yuan told Minghi that Feng Lin didn't expect him to be two years below her and always thought that the reason Minghi was able to fight her on even grounds was that he was older than her. Minghi wanted to clarify if Feng Lin was really his senior, and Uncle Yuan said yes. Almost immediately, he exclaimed when he realized that Minghi didn't really know who Feng Lin was. Uncle Yuan was amazed that there was actually someone in the Superhuman Institute who didn't know the beautiful Feng Lin. He took out a calling card and handed it to Minghi, telling him to call him if he ever needed a training partner, and that Feng Lin would be his sparring partner because she needed a strong opponent like Minghi. Uncle Yuan asked Minghi what his price was, and Minghi was confused about what price Uncle Yuan was talking about. Uncle Yuan explained that he was asking how much it would cost to be Feng Lin's sparring partner and offered Minghi $10 per minute. Minghi got even more confused, and Uncle Yuan misunderstood his reaction, thinking that with Minghi's strength, he deserved a better price. He changed his offer to $1,000 for a spar once a week, and Minghi immediately accepted the offer. Uncle Yuan patted Minghi's back and told him the spar would start next week. Minghi agreed. After Uncle Yuan left, Minghi took out the calling card and grinned childishly while repeatedly thinking about a thousand dollars. Saliva leaked out of Minghi's mouth as he thought about the money. In the school dorm, Minghi sat on the floor of his room, meditating. He was inside his spiritual world, fighting against the formation spider. Minghi blocked a leg of the formation spider with his arms but was thrown away and crashed to the ground. The formation spider immediately fired its poison towards Minghi, but before the poison could reach him, the formation spider and its poison kind of glitched. The goddess stopped the simulation and made it dissipate. She told Minghi that he needed to raise his strength because, based on the human ranking system, Minghi was just at the moon glow rank. Minghi said he knew that he wasn't strong enough and remembered the skeleton dragon. The goddess told him to treat the formation spider like food. 
But above the skeleton dragon was a ghastly monster that blacked out the sky, and the remnants of its skin turned into a scorpion fly nest. Ming he thought that if Liu Kian hadn't heavily injured the formation spider, he wouldn't have been able to defeat it with his current strength. He clenched his fist in frustration and thought that to those terrifying monsters, he wasn't even worthy of being their food. He was desperate to become stronger and didn't want to see someone die in front of him ever again. The goddess looked at Minghe and sighed softly. Although Minghe had been growing stronger through training for half a year, there was a limit to how much a person's body could grow. The goddess told Minghe that if he wanted to break through, he would need the help of a supplement. Minghe didn't know what supplement the goddess meant, and she revealed that she had been studying human technology. She commended humans for being smart and said that they dissected the monsters and demons they had killed and invented things from them. Life drops were the most powerful weapon humanity had ever invented, allowing ordinary humans to gain supernatural powers. But low-quality life drops would be useless to Minghe. The life drop the goddess purified drifted towards Minghe, and after undergoing purification, it was a violet soul-grade life drop. It should be able to grant someone the supernatural power of disguise, which Minghe thought was versatile but not suitable for someone on the front lines like him. The goddess agreed and added that any supernatural power granted by the life drop still needed to be trained and familiarized with, and Ming-He still needed to focus on familiarizing and training his current superpower. He still had to awaken his red sovereign talent. The goddess smiled and said that Ming-He hadn't even mastered his violet soul talent yet but was already thinking about his red sovereign talent. Ming-He still had to train diligently. The goddess told Ming-He that she understood why he was thinking that way, and that his physical strength hadn't reached the Sun Blaze rank yet so being able to perform his ultimate soul art was already pretty good. Minghe asked the goddess how to reach the Sun Blaze rank as quickly as possible. The goddess pointed out that she had just told him how. Humanity had made a lot of things that could increase one's strength, and besides the life drop, humanity had developed some sort of liquid stardust, which seemed to be made up of the blood, bone marrow, and pulp of a monster. Minghe wondered why he didn't know a thing about liquid stardust, and the goddess reminded him that he was just a freshman who was still learning and hadn't been in the institute for long. Ming-He admitted that there were a lot of things he didn't know, especially things that involved spending money. The Liquid Stardust was expensive, and only rich people could purchase and use it. The Liquid Stardust's effectiveness was proportional to how hard the user trained, and the goddess thought that Ming-He was quite the hard worker. Ming-He's body was still unable to take in a large amount of energy, and consuming protein, dairy, and protein shakes to enhance his body would be too slow. The liquid stardust extracted from a monster was perfect for training addicts like Ming-He. Ming-He got excited and wanted to buy one liquid stardust and use it to advance his body to the Sun Blaze rank. The goddess told Ming-He that he could sell the violet soul life drop to gain some funds, and Ming-He agreed and went out of his spiritual world. Ming-He was sitting on his bed when his phone suddenly rang. He took out his phone and discovered that it was Peng Linghui who was calling him. Peng Linghui asked Ming-He how he was doing. Ming-He told Peng Linghui that he was about to call him. Ming-He then asked Peng Linghui where the best place to go was if he wanted to sell something valuable. Peng Linghui told him to go straight to the hunter's hall if he wanted the easiest way possible. The item would be given to the female hunter there, who would help sell it. And if Ming-He wanted to buy something, Peng Linghui still suggested that he go to the hunter's hall. He told Ming-He to hire a private hunter assistant because, once the item goes on sale in the hunter's hall, they would be able to secure it at the right price. Ming-He thought it was convenient. Peng Linghui informed Ming-He that he was inviting all of their classmates who were specially recruited to a drink. He asked Ming-He if he was coming. Ming-He said he would come next time because he was busy. Peng Linghui told Ming-He to give him a call if he ever encountered any problems. Peng Linghui had quite the network in Nandu. Ming-He thanked Peng Linghui and ended the call. Later that day, in the hunter's hall, two female hunters were talking about how bored they were because they hadn't gotten any big customers lately. All they had were small deals, and the commission was so low that it wasn't enough to pay rent. They saw Ming-He enter the building. The female hunter with untied hair asked the female hunter in a bun if she wanted to greet Ming-He. They noticed that Ming-He was carrying a trainee hunter badge. They thought that being Ming-He's assistant was no different from doing charity work, so the two decided to ignore Ming-He and let a female hunter named Jian go. A blonde female hunter noticed Ming-He. She approached Ming-He and asked him if there was anything she could help him with. She introduced herself as hunter assistant Jiang Yu. She asked for Ming-He's hunter code so she could assist him even better. Ming-He said that his hunter code was LY5209. Jiang Yu searched for Ming-He's information on her tablet. When she found Ming-He's information, she informed him that he was already qualified to become a Moon Glow Hunter because he had completed his last bounty. She asked Ming-He if he wanted to rank up so he could take on higher tier commissions and bounties. Ming-He agreed and said that he didn't come there to take on a commission. He took out the Violet Soul Grade Life Drop from his pocket, showed it to Jiang Yu, and said that he would like to sell it. 
Jiang Yu was shocked. She couldn't keep her voice low when she asked Ming Yi if he was sure it was a violet soul grade. The bored female hunters heard her. Jiang Yu took a closer look at the life drop and confirmed that it was really a violet soul grade life drop. The bored female hunter exclaimed. The female hunter with untied hair pushed Jiang Yu to the side. She told Ming Yi that Jiang Yu was still new to that job. The female hunter with untied hair bragged that she was a gold grade hunter assistant and said that a qualified professional like herself was required to sell such a valuable item. She offered Ming Yi her assistance, but Ming Yi declined. Ming Yi gave the life drop to Jiang Yu and told the bored female hunter that he was fine with Jiang Yu. The bored female hunter walked away to hide her irritation. Jiang Yu thanked Ming Yi. Ming Yi stood there for a long time because the bored female hunters ignored him. That's why he chose Jiang Yu. Jiang Yu informed Ming Yi that she would be contacting an appraiser to give a detailed overview of the life drop's capabilities. And after they estimated the base price, they would put the item up for auction at the hunter's hall. Ming Yi agreed and said that he also wanted to buy some liquid stardust. Jiang Yu asked what purity Ming Yi wanted, and Ming Yi was confused about what she was talking about. Jiang Yu invited Ming Yi to the VIP room so she could explain in detail. Ming Yi followed Jiang Yu to the VIP room. In the VIP room, Jiang Yu told Ming Yi that the appraiser had finished appraising the life drop. The base price would be estimated shortly, and if Ming Yi thought the base price was too low, he could adjust it. Ming Yi said he would just go with their estimated price. Jiang Yu moved on to the next transaction. She informed Ming Yi that a couple of batches of liquid stardust had appeared recently, and their price would be around 900,000. Ming Yi was shocked after hearing the price. Jiang Yu explained that the purity was high, so the price was not low. The purity level of liquid stardust affects how long it would take to detoxify it. Liquid stardust is extracted from monsters and calamity beasts. With humans' current technology, no matter how much they detoxify it, there will inevitably be some toxins left. As such, liquid stardust cannot be used in excess. If one overdoses on liquid stardust, irreparable damage will be done to their body. Ming He cried internally because he wouldn't be able to overdose himself even if he wanted to because of how expensive it was. The higher the purity, the fewer the toxins. A high purity liquid stardust takes around half a year for an average person's body to detoxify. In other words, Ming Yi can use that liquid stardust in half-year intervals. But if he undergoes high-intensity training and combat, his metabolic detoxification rate will be faster, which will make the intervals shorter. Ming Yi asked about low-purity liquid stardust. Jiang Yu looked at her tablet and informed Ming Yi that low-purity stardust takes around 3 to 4 years for an average person's body to detoxify. It was last sold for 400,000. She said that even low purity liquid stardust costs around 1 to 200,000 and would take over a decade to detoxify, with a risk of damaging the body. Ming He was thinking that his body was not getting enough nutrients to support his training. To improve his strength in the fastest way possible, he needed to buy the highest purity. Every time he consumed liquid stardust, he would receive a significant increase in his strength. Ming He asked Zhang Yu to keep an eye on the highest quality liquid stardust for him. Jiang Yu took note and gave Ming He her business card. She said that, in the future, she would be Ming He's personal hunter assistant. She told Ming He to contact her if he needed anything. The doors of the VIP room suddenly opened. A butler came in and apologized for the interruption he caused. Before saying that the violet soul grade life drop was top notch, it could grant a person the superpower of disguise. The butler suggested 2 million as the base price of the life drop. Ming He's eyes widened. He couldn't believe he had become rich, and he celebrated internally. Jiang Yu asked Ming He's permission to release the information, and Ming He willingly agreed. Jiang Yu informed Ming He that his transaction would increase his hunter points, and once those two transactions were completed, he would have enough points to rank up again. Once he took the strength assessment, he would become a Sun Blaze rank hunter. Ming He told Jiang Yu that his strength hadn't reached Sun Blaze rank yet, but he thought it wouldn't be too long until it did. Jiang Yu realized why Ming He needed liquid stardust. Ming He asked Jiang Yu to send him any well paying commissions if there happened to be any. Jiang Yu agreed and said she would keep it in mind. Ming He returned to Nandu Institute. He had been through a lot and was glad to finally return to his peaceful school life. Ming He's school routine started with a morning run. He attended classes in the morning to learn from the instructors. In the afternoon, he fought the formation spider to enhance his combat training and self studied at night. Ming He's days at Nandu Institute continued with the same routine. One day, during Ming Yi's class, his professor, Professor Feng, informed the students that most calamity fragments produce radiation. Calamity fragments can change the structure of some materials. Professor Feng took out an ordinary black rock and said that if it undergoes the calamity fragments radiation, it will condense into a rare crystal in a short period of time, and its toughness would surpass that of steel. 
Professor Feng was holding a small box containing a blue crystal and told the students that it was a condensed crystal. While Professor Feng was explaining, Minghi's phone vibrated. He received two text messages saying that the life drop transaction had been sold for 3 million. The commission fee was 5% and his account received a deposit of 2,850,000. Ming Yi had hit the jackpot and became rich overnight. Staring at his phone, he got frozen in shock. Professor Fang asked Fang Nianrong if there was any strength type superhuman in their class who was available to come up and perform a demonstration. Fang Nianrong suggested Ming Yi, who was a fist type superhuman. Professor Fang invited Ming Yi to come up and show the class something. Ming Yi felt awkward when his classmates looked at him in awe while clapping their hands. He had become famous after winning an award. Professor Fang handed the crystal over to Ming Yi and told him to use all his strength and try to crush the mutated crystal. Ming Yi asked Professor Fang if he really meant what he just said. Professor Feng confirmed and advised Ming Yi not to underestimate the small crystal. Ming Yi started to try to crush the small crystal. He held it tightly and increased his strength as Professor Feng told the class that 99% of them wouldn't be able to make a dent on the small crystal. Ming Yi broke the crystal to pieces, and the shock was visible in the students' eyes. They subconsciously stood up with their mouths wide open. Professor Feng explained that a material contaminated by the radiation of calamity fragments would undergo a change in structure after absorbing its surrounding elements to condense. They would transform into a mutated crystal-like material. Professor Feng was about to thank Ming He for demonstrating, but he couldn't help but curse when he turned to look at Ming He and found his demonstration crystal crushed to pieces. Professor Feng looked at the crushed crystal like a mother looking at her fragile child getting hurt. He asked Ming He what he did. Ming He scratched his head and said he just did what he was told, use all his strength. Professor Feng wanted to confirm if Ming He was not a senior student who had snuck into his class. Feng Nianrong told Professor Feng that Ming He was a student in their class. The female students in Ming He's class started singing praises for him. But Lai Jin looked jealous and suspicious that the crystal might be faulty. As Ming He put the dust into the box, Professor Feng said he had made a mistake and should have brought a higher grade crystal. He cleared his throat and proceeded with his lecture, explaining that those crystals are high quality materials and if the students ever see one, they should harvest it because it would be a great help to them. Ming He exclaimed when he noticed that bits of the small mutated crystal were actually absorbed by his mystic fist. He was confused about how the small mutated crystal caused his mystic fist to react. The bell rang, and Professor Feng dismissed the class. As the students walked out of the classroom, they talked about where to go and how awesome Ming Yi was. When most of the students had left, Ming Yi approached Professor Feng. He wanted to ask something about the mutated crystal. Ming Yi showed his right arm to Professor Feng and told him that an absorption reaction occurred when he came in contact with the mutated crystal. Professor Feng asked him what his talent was, and Ming Yi informed him that his talent was Mystic Fist, which can absorb mediums and unleash their corresponding attribute with his Spirit Fist. Professor Feng made sense of things and told Ming He that it was only natural that there was a reaction. Ming He said that it was unlikely because he thought that such a small rock shouldn't have such a strong reaction on his arm. Professor Feng explained once again that a rock that has undergone radiation and absorbed its surrounding elements becomes a crystal with a density many times greater than a normal rock, and the amount of material contained within it is equivalent to a small-scale mine. Ming He asked Professor Feng if his point was that Ming He's mystic fist is connected with the density of the medium and not its volume. Professor Feng invited Ming Yi to his lab to do an experiment. His laboratory had higher grade mutated crystals. Ming Yi asked if he was bothering him since the class had ended. Professor Feng asked Ming Yi if he would still consider him his professor outside of school. Ming Yi said yes, and Professor Feng explained to Ming Yi that he was his professor at all times, and it was his duty to resolve his students' questions. Ming Yi thanked Professor Feng wholeheartedly. Ming Yi and Professor Feng entered the level 2, grade 3 laboratory, where glass containers were everywhere inside the room containing different rare and dangerous materials, test tubes each containing different liquids, and different kinds of rocks. As soon as Ming Yi entered the room, his mystic fist had already absorbed multiple kinds of medium. Ming He didn't know how to remove the absorbed mediums, so he just looked at his arms. Professor Feng gave him a pair of insulated gloves and instructed him to wear them first. While Ming He was wearing the gloves, Professor Feng asked him to confirm if the grade of his talent was Red Sovereign. Ming He was curious how Professor Feng knew, and he said that he had keen eyes, otherwise, he wouldn't be able to teach the superhumans in Nandu Institute. Ming He was amazed, and Professor Feng said that he could also tell that Ming He was still a long way away from mastering his superpowers. He could tell because when Ming He entered, his arm got involuntarily affected by the surrounding mutated crystals. Ming He explained that it hadn't been long since he got his superpower and asked Professor Feng to teach him. Professor Feng fixed the positioning of his eyeglasses and seriously thought about it. 
Professor Feng said that Mingyi had already stated before that his spiritual skill allowed him to absorb a certain substance and burst out a mystic fist with the same effect as that substance. So, when he needed one of the substances, he just touched it. Mingyi thought that he could only absorb mediums if he touched them with his hands. But it was proven by the fact that when Mingyi walked into the lab, it triggered a reaction. His arms responded to everything around him. Mingyi realized that it was possible that the higher the concentration of the medium, the larger the reaction would be. Professor Feng speculated that the more Mingyi absorbed a medium, the purer and stronger the power he could exert. Mingyi recalled the times when he used the mystic fist. Professor Feng told Mingyi that if he wanted his spiritual power to become stronger, he had to learn how to reject medium absorption. Mingyi was confused about what Professor Feng meant by rejecting medium absorption. To help Mingyi understand, Professor Feng instructed Mingyi to take off his insulation gloves. He wanted Mingyi to absorb just the frost crystal and reject other mediums. He reminded Mingyi not to touch the mutated crystal while absorbing. Mingyi took off his gloves and said he would try. He positioned his hand over the frost crystal and tried to absorb it without touching it. Mingyi increased his focus and his hand started absorbing the frost crystal. But other mediums away from Mingyi also got absorbed. Mingyi exclaimed as he looked at his hand absorbing multiple mediums. Professor Feng confirmed that Mingyi had not really mastered his spiritual skill. In that instance, Professor Feng deemed Mingyi's spirit fist useless. He pointed out that Mingyi's fighting style, where he had to rely on touching the medium to absorb it, was very unstable. He could do nothing if he was miles away from a medium, and his enemy who was familiar with his abilities deliberately blocked his path. Mingyi realized that there were indeed plenty of times that he had no medium to use, which was definitely a problem. Professor Feng instructed Mingyi to touch the frost crystal so he could take a look at the level of the reaction when he touched it. Before Mingyi could even touch the frost crystal, his hand already started absorbing. When he touched it, other mediums were removed, and his hand was completely covered with ice. Professor Feng stopped Mingyi from absorbing the crystal. He took a closer look at Mingyi's arms before inviting Mingyi to the testing grounds in the back to throw some punches. The testing ground was a mess. Containers seemed to have been thrown by someone, and there was a lot of debris from the previous tests. But Professor Feng told Mingyi not to worry about it. He instructed Mingyi to send a punch to the arena, using his full force. Mingyi nodded and proceeded with his stance. With his left foot forward, he swung his right arm and gathered the frost crystal's power. Mingyi punched forward and used the roaring ice fist. His fist sent forward a pillar of ice that devastated everything in its path. When the air blew the dust away, they saw that the area from where Mingyi stood up to the arena was destroyed. Even the cement was gone, leaving a hollowed ground. Mingyi's eyes widened in surprise. Professor Feng was shocked by how abnormal Mingyi's skill was. Mingyi excitedly told Professor Feng that that was the first time he used such a powerful spirit fist. Professor Feng said that it was solid proof that Mingyi's power was related to the concentration of the medium. The one from their class was just a small flicker-grade metamorphic crystal, while the frost crystal he touched and absorbed was a dazzling-grade metamorphic crystal. Mingyi was amazed, knowing that such a small crystal was comparable to a mine. With the frost crystal, Mingyi thought he was invincible. Professor Feng laughed before telling Mingyi that the frost crystal was not like a Chinese cabbage that could be picked up anywhere. Mingyi asked Professor Feng if there was anything like that for sale. Professor Feng informed Mingyi that low-level ones were available for sale, but even then, they were scarce. As for high-level ones, they were highly unlikely to be on the market. Most owners kept the crystals for themselves as rare treasures. The amazing frost variation in the Nandu Institute was donated to them by a social organization. Mingyi shared his idea of preparing some isomorphic mediums on his body so that during battles, he could crush the crystal and absorb it. Then he could steadily burst out spirit fists that were several times stronger than regular ones. Professor Feng agreed that with external assistance, Mingyi's combat strength could be greatly improved. But he pointed out that there was just one problem. Mingyi wondered what problem his plan had. He took a heavy hit when Professor Feng reminded him that the isomorphic mediums were expensive. Professor Feng asked Mingyi if he had a lot of money. The dazzling grade frost variation was priceless. Even the flicker grade isomorphs were worth several times more than diamonds. Mingyi cried after waking up and realizing that he was still not rich enough to lavishly buy convenient tools. Professor Feng patted his shoulder and told him that he could still buy one or two of those crystals for emergencies. Mingyi was reminded that poor people could only rely on hard work, and the rich relied on technology. Professor Feng wanted Mingyi to start with his perception first. He appreciated Mingyi's excellent abilities. As long as they were used properly, everything around Mingyi could make him stronger and become powerful weapons. Mingyi asked Professor Feng what perception he was referring to. Professor Feng told Mingyi to listen, smell, and feel his skin mixed with everything in the air. 
He pointed out to Mingyi that he was still at the level of just seeing with his eyes. What he saw was what it was, but what was seen by the human eye was very limited. It was easy for humans to ignore all the mediums and elements that existed. The skin could sense the temperature. The nose could sense all the dust in the wind. The ears could hear the sound of running water. The hands could feel the wind blowing. Professor Feng pointed out to Minghe that he needed to be focused and diligently practice using his five senses. He advised him to pay more attention to the small but special things, to not let his eyes dictate everything. Minghe closed his eyes and asked Professor Feng if he should practice perceiving while closing his eyes first. Professor Feng entered his laboratory and asked Minghe to wait a bit. He wanted to take a few isomorphic crystals. He handed a jar containing mutated crystals over to Minghe. Inside the jar was a mix of dim grade, flicker grade, bright grade, and dazzling grade. He told Minghe that he could start by trying to identify the crystal's grades. Minghe took a closer look at the crystals and said that the mutated crystals looked the same to him. Professor Feng told him that was why he needed to work on his perception and not to rely on his eyes. Practicing it would allow Minghe to be in different environments in the future, and it would also allow him to quickly and accurately identify which mediums were more useful to him. Minghe said he understood. He aimed to make use of everything around him to turn them into powerful weapons. Professor Feng reminded Minghe that perception would be the first thing he would practice, and absorption was the second thing he would practice. Professor Feng clarified that what he meant by absorption was not by touching the medium, but absorption absorption where even if he was separated from mediums by tens of meters, hundreds of meters, or several kilometers, he could still absorb and use them. Ming-He had a hard time believing that it was possible for him to absorb mediums that were several kilometers away from him. Professor Feng asked Ming-He not to look down on himself and to not take his red sovereign grade talent lightly. He said that one day, it was even possible for Ming-He to catch lightning and absorb it. It was time for Ming-He to practice Desheng. Ming-He decided to work even harder. He hated the feeling of being small and insignificant, remembering the times when he couldn't do anything to save the people he cared about, and how powerless he was, he hated it even more. He knew that he wasn't strong enough yet, but he was confident that he would get stronger. In Ming-He's dorm, he sat on the floor of the rooftop with his eyes closed and the mutated crystals in front of him. He still couldn't feel the difference between the mutated crystals and knew he wasn't concentrating enough. Ming-He deepened his focus and started to feel that one crystal was a bit brighter than the other, until he perceived clearly that the mutated crystals differed in brightness. Ming-He opened his eyes, finally learning how to perceive the difference between the mutated crystals. When he looked at them, he could already identify their grades, something he couldn't do before. He stood up, closed his eyes again, and tried to perceive the surrounding mediums. Ming-He noticed that it wasn't too windy and that if he absorbed the air, it would only be equivalent to dim grade, which wouldn't let out much power. He tried to widen his field of perception to look for a stronger medium. Ming-He started to perceive shapes and structures farther away from him and noticed that the wind blowing from a certain direction was humid. He determined that there was a lake in that direction and extended his perception to confirm his speculation. Moments later, Ming-He found the lake and thought that if he absorbed everything there, it would be equivalent to bright grade. However, he was blocked when he tried absorbing the water in the lake. He opened his eyes and looked over the rooftop, feeling good after confirming that what Professor Feng taught him really worked. In the future, he wouldn't have to find a medium to absorb. In front of Ming-He's dormitory, Zhang Yu waved and called him. Ming-He asked her why she came to his dormitory, and Zhang Yu informed him that she brought the stuff he needed. Ming-He jumped from the rooftop and landed in front of Zhang Yu. Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia couldn't take seeing another beautiful girl meeting Ming-He. They were jealous that even though Ming-He already had Liu Kian, he was still hooking up with other beauties. Ming-He's two envious and jealous single roommates couldn't help but cry. Zhang Yu got a really high quality stardust liquid because the seller was in a rush to get money and didn't want to enter an auction to sell it. Zhang Yu bought the Stardust for 850,000 yuan, which was the price set by the seller. Ming-He thanked Zhang Yu, and she said that it was what she should do. She told Ming-He that she didn't expect him to be at a superhuman school. When Ming-He gave her the address, she thought she read it wrong. Ming-He asked her to keep it a secret because he didn't want his classmates to know about him. Zhang Yu agreed and said that keeping their customers' privacy was their top priority. She asked Ming-He if there was something else he needed, and he took the opportunity to tell her that he needed her help in checking if there were any crystals with properties such as fire, ice, rock, copper, and iron for sale because he wanted to buy some. He also reminded Zhang Yu to tell him if there were any quests, bounties, etc. in the Hunter's Hall. Zhang Yu took note and said she would definitely help Ming-He with it. Ming-He was excited to consume the high-quality Stardust Liquid to increase his physical strength and be upgraded to Sun Blaze Grade, which would be a remarkable upgrade for him. He went into the forest and sat on the ground, deciding to drink the Stardust Liquid where no one would be able to see him. Ming-He drank the high-quality Stardust Liquid straight from its container, looking like he was in pain when he swallowed it. 
The pain increased as time passed, and the Stardust liquid started working on Minghee's heart and spreading throughout his whole body. Minghee's aura slowly swelled as the Stardust liquid did wonders to his body. He gritted his teeth to bear with the pain that had been torturing him. When the Stardust liquid was done strengthening his body, Minghee's aura burst out, sending leaves and dirt away from where he sat. The sudden burst of aura in the middle of the woods produced a shockwave disturbing the forest's peace. Minghee released a sigh of relief. The high-quality Stardust liquid had worked, and he stood up to examine his body. He confirmed that the strength of his body had become Sunblaze grade. Minghee wore his jacket and walked away, moments later receiving a call from Uncle Yuan. Uncle Yuan invited Minghee to spar with Feng Lin since it was Wednesday. Minghee agreed, in the mood to fight after becoming a Sunblaze grade. Uncle Yuan suggested an all-out fight where Minghee and Feng Lin wouldn't disable their spiritual magic. Ming had a hard time deciding as fighting without restricting spiritual magic was too dangerous, and anyone could easily get hurt, much worse, lose their lives. But when Uncle Yuan promised to double the price, Ming He immediately agreed and asked where he and Feng Lin would spar. In an open field somewhere in Nandu, Feng Lin and Uncle Yuan waited for Ming He. Feng Lin was doing some stretching when she told Uncle Yuan that Ming He would definitely lose if they were allowed to use spiritual skills. Uncle Yuan reminded Feng Lin that she had already lost twice to Ming He and that she still owed him for a previous bet. She needed to go to the center of the training grounds and do the seaweed dance. Feng Lin had a breakthrough with her skills and thought that Ming He might not be able to evade her. She was confident with her spiritual skills, which were incomparable to most people. Uncle Yuan waved at Ming He when he saw him and told Feng Ling that they would see how things went. Ming He, who was wearing a mask to hide his identity, waved back at Uncle Yuan. Feng Lin declared that she would not show Ming He any mercy, and Ming He challenged Feng Lin. Feng Lin signaled the start of the sparring. Flames started to surround Feng Lin's body. Ming He noticed that Feng Lin was preparing for a big move. Feng Lin reminded Ming He that she wouldn't hold back as she ran towards him. Ming He stepped back to narrowly evade Feng Lin's powerful flame. Ming He fell on his backside and looked at the ground where he stood, which was now burnt. Ming He realized how serious Feng Lin was with her declaration. Feng Lin jumped and stretched her leg to kick Ming He. She said that Ming He didn't seem focused on her. When Ming He noticed Feng Lin, it was too late to evade. He could only cross his arms to block Feng Lin's kick. The force of Feng Lin's kick broke the cement Ming He was standing on. The kick was so powerful that it created shockwaves. Feng Lin backflipped to move away from Ming He so he wouldn't have the chance to counterattack. As Feng Lin landed on her feet, her hair been tore, but she didn't mind and focused on the fight. She taunted Ming He, saying that he looked like he wouldn't be able to last a minute. The audience wondered why Feng Lin was using her spiritual skill. They felt bad for Ming He, her sparring opponent. In their perspective, Ming He had already been completely floored after Feng Lin's two powerful attacks. Some onlookers arrived late, so they didn't see Feng Lin's moves, burst of strength, power, and physique. Ming He shook his hands while commending Feng Lin's formidable superpower. He said that it was easily one of the fiercest superpowers he'd ever seen. Ming He told Feng Lin that if it were back then, he wouldn't be able to last two strikes from her. Unfortunately for Feng Lin, Ming He had just reached the Sun Blaze rank. His body was overflowing with barely contained energy, a heavenly feeling of catharsis. Ming He's aura suddenly increased. Feng Lin couldn't help but cover her face with her hand to protect her eyes from the particles that got blown away by Ming He's sudden burst of strength. She didn't notice Ming He move, he just suddenly appeared in front of her. Ming He warned Feng Lin to be careful as his fist quickly approached her body. Feng Lin quickly ducked and positioned her arms to block Ming He's punch. She pounced away to gain some distance, but Ming He immediately chased after her. When Feng Lin was within Ming He's reach, Ming He used the shearing gale fist. Feng Lin could only block Ming He's consecutive punches. But when she saw an opening, she gathered flame on her palm and hit Ming He's chest with her right palm. Feng Lin's palm sent Ming He away, and his chest was burning, and his arms had burnt marks on them. Ming He was supposed to be on the offensive, but he took a direct scorching blast. If things kept up, his arms would be done for. Feng Lin used the momentary ceasefire to throw some verbal attacks. She told Ming He that he was doing well as her punching back. Feng Lin used her fiery dance of the burning vessel technique, and an image of a phoenix descended towards her. Ming He realized that Feng Lin was right, he wouldn't be able to beat her if nothing changed. Ming He admitted that he underestimated the true power of the phoenix martial arts saintess. Ming He didn't have a choice but to absorb the dim gray dirt below him. He covered his hands with the dirt so he could be protected from the scorching heat. Feng Lin ran towards Ming He, and her flaming aura took the form of a phoenix. Ming He crossed his arms to block Feng Lin's flaming attack. When Ming He's vision was hindered by the flame, Feng Lin immediately took the chance to run around Ming He, so he couldn't predict where she was going to attack next. While looking for an opening, the phoenix slowly merged with Feng Lin until Feng Lin's image turned into a phoenix. She attacked Ming He when she got the chance, causing an explosion that blasted the floor. Dust covered the area. Ming He emerged from the smoke and immediately distanced himself away. He was forced to take off the jacket he was wearing because it caught on fire. 
When the dust settled, the onlookers saw that Minghe was surrounded by flames. The martial arts saintess had overwhelmed Minghe. It was just a spiritual skill, but it was already far more terrifying than the countless soul arts Minghe had seen. Minghe couldn't do a thing but cover himself with his arms to block Feng Lin's barrage of flaming attacks. The onlookers felt how intense the fight was. With that type of unevenly mixed cement in the area, even if Minghe were to absorb them, it wouldn't do him any good against Feng Lin's scorching strikes. If he couldn't find an appropriate medium, his loss was certain. After attacking Minghe one last time in her phoenix form, Feng Lin paused. After which, Feng Lin slowly returned to her original form. She urged Minghe to admit defeat. Minghe, with his arms still crossed, told Feng Lin that he hadn't lost to her yet. Feng Lin explained that it was just a sparring match, and it didn't have to end with Minghe being sent to the infirmary just for her to win. She found no meaning to that. Minghe still wanted to fight, saying he was sure that Feng Lin was exhausted. But Minghe himself was barely standing. Feng Lin told Minghe that he didn't have to act tough. The number of people from Nandu Institute who could last against her in her current state could only be counted on one hand. She basically told Minghe that he had already done well. But Minghe was persistent, he still wanted to try to beat Feng Lin. He closed his eyes and focused on sensing his surroundings, everything around him. Minghe started to notice things that he wouldn't have noticed if he had relied on his eyes only. He noticed the stone beneath his feet and the wind blowing from the south. Minghe's perception became wider and wider as he also noticed the air from the trees. When he noticed the moist air, he found the lake, which is rich in water mediums. If Minghe left the training ground, he would be considered the loser, so he had to use the method that Professor Feng had taught him. He rejected unnecessary mediums and focused on absorbing the water from the lake. He conceptualized that all he needed was water. Meanwhile, Feng Lin took her time observing what Minghe was doing. She couldn't understand what Minghe was trying to do, so she decided not to waste any more time and wanted to end the fight. Feng Lin executed the set position and ran towards Minghe, running around him as if looking for an opening. Minghe's body started to emit a blue aura, and before Feng Lin could attack, Minghe raised his hand. He punched the ground, summoning a giant water dragon on the training ground. The water dragon opened its mouth and dove towards Feng Lin. Feng Lin, who was running towards Minghe, couldn't evade in time. She just stared at the water dragon, which was quickly approaching her. She snapped out of her shock and immediately gathered her flame in front of her to shield herself from the water dragon. But the water dragon was too strong for her flame to handle. The water dragon extinguished Feng Lin's flame, and she was swallowed by the water dragon, slowly drowning on its body. As the water dragon lost its form, water splashed from the training ground towards the onlookers. They ran desperately, afraid that they might drown. It looked like there was a tsunami in Nandu's training grounds. When the water calmed down, the onlooker with eyeglasses expressed his shock. Another onlooker was angry, thinking that Minghe used a soul art, which is forbidden during spars. The onlooker with eyeglasses said that he only saw blue light, not purple, and he thinks that Minghe and Feng Lin were just using spiritual skills. The angry onlooker promised that he would drink the lake water if it was proven that Minghe and Feng Lin were really using spiritual skills. Water droplets started pouring into the training ground, and Minghe was amazed at how strong he was after experiencing the Red Sovereign's extraordinary talent. When the lake water was almost completely drained, Minghe saw Feng Lin lying flat on the floor. She seemed to have drowned and became unconscious. Minghe immediately ran towards Feng Lin to help her. He kneeled on Feng Lin's side, shook her, and checked whether she was responsive or not. Feng Lin remained unresponsive, so Minghe proceeded to give her chest compressions. But still, nothing changed in Feng Lin's condition. Uncle Yuan walked towards Minghe and told him that chest compressions were not enough and that Feng Lin needed CPR. Minghe blushed and said it was not appropriate for him to do it. Uncle Yuan urged Minghe to immediately do the CPR. Minghe stared for a moment at Feng Lin before he lowered his mask. He then raised Feng Lin's chin and pinched her nose. He slowly moved closer to Feng Lin's face. But when his lips were about to make contact with Feng Lin's, a hand covered his mouth. Feng Lin regained consciousness and told Minghe that there was no need for him to do it, and claimed that she was not that delicate. Minghe immediately moved away and covered his face with his mask. He coughed and told Feng Lin that he was glad she was fine. Uncle Yuan smirked, thinking it was a pity that Feng Lin woke up in time. Feng Lin admitted defeat, and Minghe told her that they were just learning from each other, so no one won nor lost. Minghe appreciated Feng Lin's strength. If he hadn't realized the true extent of his abilities, he would have been beaten so hard that he wouldn't be able to fight back. Feng Lin said a win is a win, a loss is a loss, and told Minghe there was no need for him to be humble. Minghe yielded and accepted that it was his win. He extended his right hand and told Feng Lin that he was honored to be her opponent. Feng Lin shook Minghe's hand and said that the next time they spar, they would compete with soul arts. Uncle Yuan told them that it wouldn't work, explaining that with the strength that they had, the soul arts would have lethality. Soul arts should be used on the beasts that invade their cities, not on their people. Minghe agreed with Uncle Yuan's statement. 
He noticed that the onlookers were starting to surround them, and he told Feng Lin and Uncle Yuan that he had other things to do, so he would take his leave. Uncle Yuan and Feng Lin said their goodbyes to Minghe, and the onlookers feasted their eyes on Feng Lin, the martial arts saintess figure. Feng Lin innocently tied her hair without a care for the onlookers. When Uncle Yuan noticed this, he immediately covered Feng Lin with a towel and told her that they should leave as well because she was soaking wet. Inside the black car that Uncle Yuan was driving, Feng Lin dried her hair up with the towel. Uncle Yuan told her that Minghe was a little different, and Feng Lin expressed that she would make sure she wouldn't lose the next time they fought. Mandu Institute was the university where all young talents gathered, and anyone who could fight against Feng Lin would always spread the word. They would become the man of the school because of Feng Lin's fame. Uncle Yuan wondered why Minghe wouldn't do the same even though he pushed Feng Lin to that extent. Feng Lin said that Minghe was always so mysterious, and she didn't know what he was being so careful with. Minghe had been wearing a mask, and Uncle Yuan speculated that Minghe didn't want people to know his identity and strength. But not every young person could resist the temptation of fame. Feng Lin said that it was just a myth, but Uncle Yuan suddenly remembered that the colonel of the Commendation Conference commended a very mysterious person. Because the person made a significant contribution to the Shaoling disaster, but in the end, the person didn't disclose his name. Feng Lin moved closer to Uncle Yuan and asked him if he meant that her opponent could be the special class practitioner. Uncle Yuan explained that her opponent was just a freshman in college, but his strength was far beyond anything his peers had achieved. He told Feng Lin to just forget about it and respect people's privacy. Uncle Yuan planned to do their next spar in a more private area, and Feng Lin agreed. Uncle Yuan asked her if she saw what Ming He looked like, and Feng Lin angrily said she didn't. Uncle Yuan teased Feng Lin, telling her that even if she was a little embarrassed from the fight, she still had to admit that the person she fought was kind of handsome. Feng Lin got angry at Uncle Yuan for encouraging Ming He to give her CPR, although she was in a daze, she still heard them. Uncle Yuan explained that he just wanted to see whether Ming He was handsome or not and if he fits Feng Lin's type. Feng Lin burst out in anger and told Uncle Yuan that he should just sweep the streets because she didn't need him that much in her training sessions. Uncle Yuan called Feng Lin milady and sincerely apologized. Ming He went to Hunter's Hall, where Zhang Yu greeted him and guided him towards the VIP room. In the VIP room, as soon as Ming He sat on the chair, Zhang Yu pushed a black box towards him, saying that it was something Ming He had asked her about before. When Ming He opened the box, Frost Aura immediately escaped from it. It was a Frost Variation Mutated Crystal, and Ming He wanted to confirm whether it was a Dazzling Grade Mutated Crystal. Zhang Yu confirmed that it was and asked Ming He if he was satisfied. Ming He said he was very satisfied and thanked Zhang Yu for providing him assistance. With the Frost Variation Dazzling Grade Mutated Crystal, even if Ming He was faced with an enemy that was a level above him, he would not be too powerless. But Ming He was caught off guard when Zhang Yu informed him that the crystal cost him the million dollars he had stored. He almost jumped out of his seat in shock. Zhang Yu explained that the crystal was very rare and that she had gone to Beidou just to bid for it. Regardless of how much the crystal cost him, Ming He still thanked Zhang Yu and asked her to keep an eye out for other isomorphic crystals for sale. He suddenly remembered that Zhang Yu had texted him about an important matter and asked her what it was. Zhang Yu took out something and congratulated Ming He for becoming a certified Sun Blaze rank hunter. She gave him his Sun Blaze badge, and Ming He received it and thanked her. Zhang Yu explained to him that after becoming a Sun Blaze rank hunter, he had unlocked a lot of new privileges. While Zhang Yu was talking, Ming He noticed someone at the counter of Hunter's Hall. Zhang Yu was still telling Ming He that information collected by the Hunter's Hall would be sent to him in a timely manner. Ming He was also eligible to make a request for assistance and participate in the annual Hunter's Conference. Ming He suddenly stood up and looked out the window. He saw Lai Jin talking aggressively to the woman at the counter. Zhang Yu asked Ming Yi if he knew Lai Jin and informed him that Lai Jin was looking for a bounty before he came, but he was not a very qualified hunter. Not many employers in Nandu were willing to hire him. Ming He admitted that he knew Lai Jin and said that there was one thing he wanted Lai Jin to do for him. He asked Zhang Yu to help him post a task and inquired about how much the commission was for collecting information. Zhang Yu told Ming He that he did not have to give a commission because Lai Jin would be willing to do it for free. Ming He, who was not paying attention when Zhang Yu was explaining his privileges, wondered why Lai Jin would do it for free. Zhang Yu explained again that in order for low-level hunters to be promoted, Generally, it was necessary to have a seal of recommendation from an advanced hunter. The recommendation of advanced hunters was received through points. The points Ming He had at that moment could be exchanged for four seals of recommendation. And customers often looked for the seal of recommendation from advanced hunters when choosing hunters to hire. Ming He finally understood the importance of his privilege. 
Jiang Yu informed Ming Yi that his small tasks and errands could be handed over to low-level hunters. That way, he would have more time to tend to more important matters, and the low-level hunters were willing to do those tasks to obtain the seal from advanced hunters. After all, they were not famous, it was hard for them to get high-paying bounties if they were not famous and did not have recommendations. Ming Yi did not want Lai Jin to know who hired him, so he asked Jiang Yu to hide his name from Lai Jin. Meanwhile, Lai Jin was still trying to convince the woman at the counter. Jiang Yu told Ming Yi it was not a problem and asked him to tell her in detail what he needed Lai Jin to do. She was going to draw up an agreement stating that a seal of recommendation was the reward. When Lai Jin was walking away from the counter it looked like his soul had left him. But when Jiang Yu approached him, he immediately regained his energy. Lai Jin was happy that someone finally recognized his talent and it was actually a Sun Blaze ranked hunter. He respectfully bowed towards Jiang Yu and was determined to do well. He planned on leaving a good impression on the senior hunter that hired him. Lai Jin was hoping he could get good tasks from the senior hunter in the future as well. He immediately walked away so he could start doing the task his senior hunter had given him. Ming Yi felt how good it was to be rich. He had easily become a Sun Blaze ranked hunter and could even make people do things for him. But then he realized that he had just spent a million dollars. A million dollars, a price that could buy him a good living space in Lenyang City. Ming he intended to make more money so he could buy a house in a big city. But he thought that the frost variation mutated crystal was still worth the price. With it, hunting down beasts should be easy for Ming he. What's more, his ability to absorb mediums increased after he reached the Sun Blaze rank. Ming Yi's phone suddenly rang, and he took it out and saw that it was his big sister who was calling him. He answered the call and asked his big sister why she was calling him so early. His big sister asked him to guess where she was currently at. Ming Yi guessed that she was in the park, but his big sister felt offended and reminded Ming Yi that she was self-studying. Ming Yi asked her why she was still self-studying. His big sister explained that it was because she had to take care of him that things had been delayed for more than a year. She wanted to avoid working part-time all her life. Ming Yi told her she did not have to work all her life because he could already help her financially. He asked his big sister if she had received the money he sent. She said that she had heard that the Superhuman Institute was very expensive and told Ming Yi to keep the money for himself. And she said that it was not like she did not have hands or feet, so he did not have to feed her. She informed Ming Yi that the astronomy team in Nandu had agreed to let her come for an interview. Ming Yi was shocked and asked her if the astronomy team was going to hire her. His sister confirmed that they were. Although she would just be a temporary worker, being able to work on the astronomy team was like having an iron rice bowl. Maybe the money she could save in a year could buy some good equipment for Ming He. Ming He was proud of his big sister for entering the astronomy team by herself. His big sister informed him that she was already on the train and reminded Ming He to pick her up. Ming He took note and ended the call. He remembered that his sister had always been smart but gave up on her education for his sake. Ming He felt great, he could finally take his sister to dinner during the weekends. Later that day, Ming He picked up his sister at the train station and they toured around Nandu. They rode a nice car, ate and drank some local food and drinks, had dinner in an expensive restaurant while looking at the beautiful night sky above them, and went to a beach to appreciate the beautiful full moon and enjoy the cool sea breeze. After a tiring and memorable day, Ming He and his sister returned to her accommodation. They lay on the bed and expressed how tired they were after playing the whole day. His big sister fell in love with Nandu and told Ming He that she needed to work hard so she could buy a big house in Nandu. Her eyes widened when Ming He informed her that a big house in Nandu costs around 1 to 2 million. But instead of losing hope, she got motivated to work even harder. She said she would try to marry a man with a big house. Ming He was speechless. On the next day, Ming He picked up her sister from her accommodation. He was taking her to Nandu's astronomy team. Nandu's astronomy team is situated somewhere on top of a mountain. The building's design looks elegant and modern. Ming He and his sister were meticulously checked by security before they entered the building. A female attendant asked Ming He's big sister to come with her. Ming He wished his sister the best of luck. After she left, Ming He took the chance to roam around the building. Although he expected it, Ming He was still amazed that there were surveillance cameras everywhere in the building. The observation of the stars relies on the astronomy team. That way, superhumans from all over the world can predict the arrival of disasters and take corresponding measures. The astronomy team is equivalent to the human eye, they always monitor the changes in outer space. Even though it's a small job, Ming Yi still couldn't believe that his sister was accepted there. A man was descending the stairs, the soldier at the lower end of the stairs saluted the person. The man signaled the soldier to keep quiet and walked away. The man walked in front of Ming He and said that it's much clearer there. As he sat on a chair, he grumbled to himself about how his head grew larger working on those messy algorithms. Ming He was shocked when he recognized the man beside him. It was actually Dr. Wu, a famous guy who appears in textbooks. Dr. Wu casually opened an adult magazine and looked at its contents. 
He noticed Ming-Hi staring at him and asked if it was his first day at work. Ming-Hi immediately explained that he was not working there, he had just accompanied his sister there for an interview. Dr. Wu said he was wondering why they had such a young person on their astronomy team. Everything made sense to him now. Ming-Hi stood up, moved closer to Dr. Wu, and asked him if he was really Dr. Wu. Dr. Wu didn't confirm, he just let Ming-Hi guess. Ming-Hi told Dr. Wu that it had to be him and said that he had read everything about him in his textbook. Dr. Wu asked Ming-Hi how the authors described him in the textbook. Ming-Hi said that it was written in the textbook that it was he who discovered an extraordinary medium called rainbow. Through astronomical observation of the energy emitted by the rainbow medium, the strength of the beasts can be deduced. Dr. Wu said that it sounded like praise to him. Ming-Hi informed him that the book said that he was a remarkable scholar. Without his discovery, their organization would not be able to respond effectively thus far. Dr. Wu asked Ming-Hi if he wanted a photo. Ming-Hi immediately took out his phone and took a selfie with Dr. Wu. Dr. Wu took the magazine from the table and told Ming-Hi that he could show off to his classmates with the picture and asked Ming-Hi not to disturb him next time. He said he came there so he could read a book peacefully. Ming-Hi pointed out that he was reading a female model magazine. Dr. Wu reasoned that magazines are books too. He waved his hand and told Ming-Hi not to bother him throughout his small break. A female employee who looked angry walked towards their direction. Ming-Hi confirmed that Dr. Wu was also a man of culture. He shared with Dr. Wu that he and his roommates love watching similar shows. Dr. Wu ignored Ming-Hi. The female employee appeared on Dr. Wu's side. She asked Dr. Wu not to run out and start being lazy when they're halfway done. Dr. Wu closed his eyes and told her that he was just changing ideas. The female employee glared at Dr. Wu and asked him to finish his work before satisfying his hobbies. Dr. Wu expressed his annoyance to the female employee. He placed the book on his face and reminded the female employee that he had already said that there are no rainbow medium fragments in the Lanyang City disaster. It's impossible that there are catastrophic life forces on Earth that they haven't detected yet. The female employee told him that it's better to examine everything carefully. Dr. Wu finally gave in to the female employee's persistence. He stood up, threw the magazine to Minghee, and said that it's a shame to throw the magazine away, so he'll give it to him. Ming-Hi thanked Dr. Wu. Ming-Hi watched as Dr. Wu and the employee walked towards the stairs. Moments later, his sister came back after the interview. She informed Ming-Hi that the astronomy team told her she can try working there for three months. Ming-Hi congratulated his big sister. His big sister looked at the magazine he was holding and asked him why he was reading it. Ming-Hi tried to tell her that it was left by Dr. Wu Long, but his big sister wouldn't believe him. His big sister thought that a great scholar like Dr. Wu Long would never read that kind of book. She thought Ming-Hi was lying, just like how he used to. To no avail, Ming-Hi tried to convince his big sister that the book was really not his. Later that day, in the bustling city of Nandu, Ming-Hi and his sister entered the room where his sister would be living. His big sister was happy that she finally got her dream job and she got to live in a sunny room rooted in a bustling city. She felt great that everything was going in the right way. Ming-Hi said since she likes to grow flowers, she could use the large patio in her room to plant as many jasmine flowers as she wants. His sister said she'll do it immediately and asked Ming-Hi to accompany her to look around in a flower shop she saw. Ming-Hi agreed. They were about to go out when Ming-Hi's phone rang. An unknown number was calling him, but he answered the call anyway. The person on the call wanted to confirm his identity and asked if there was anyone around him. The caller didn't want anyone else present during their conversation. Ming-Hi told his sister that he was being given a task, so she'll have to look at the flowers by herself. His sister understood Ming-Hi's situation. She didn't force the issue and went out to look at the flowers. Ming-Hi went to the balcony and told the caller to go ahead. The caller asked him if he was the man who was part of the Dragon Tooth group, Ming-Hi. Ming-Hi confirmed it was him. The caller informed Ming-Hi that Zhu Kai is his subordinate and Luo Lin asked him to contact Ming-Hi. The caller told Ming-Hi that he's Instructor Luo. Ming-Hi asked Instructor Luo to continue. Instructor Luo said that Luo Lin had told him about Ming-Hi. Luo Lin highly recommended Ming-Hi for Zhu Kai's position and the Dragon Tooth group recognized Ming-Hi. Instructor Luo called to officially inform Ming-Hi that he had become the Dragon Tooth group wanderer. Ming-Hi didn't know what the wanderer was. Instructor Luo explained to him that the enemy's infiltration is far more terrifying than they thought. Information about the members of the Dragon Tooth group may be spread, so they needed to create a new department which is called Wanderer. The Wanderers are like blood sharks in the filthy sea. They hunt down the subordinates of the universe's heavenly sovereignty. Ming-Hi gripped a bar tightly upon hearing about heavenly sovereignty. He asked Instructor Luo if there was any clue about the man behind all of it. Instructor Luo informed Ming-Hi that recently, they found an important clue. They found out that Zhao Xuyue bought a bunch of medical equipment from the black market in his youth. They think that when he bought those equipments in the black market, he met someone from the universe's heavenly sovereignty. Ming-Hi understood that Dr. Zhao needed those special equipments in order to extract blood from the beasts. 
Instructor Luo said he'll send the address to Minghe later. He thinks that the enemies wouldn't be able to catch a new face like Minghe. He tasked Minghe to look into it and hoped that Minghe would find out the identity of the person who was in contact with Dr. Zhao. Minghe accepted the task and said he'll investigate it. Instructor Luo reminded Minghe to proceed with caution and instructed him to immediately notify Luo Lin if he finds any of the organization's hideouts, so they could immediately send reinforcements for him. Later that day, Minghe stood in front of a tall building. He wondered if the black market is really that big or he just watched too many TV shows. The real black market is hidden in the palace-like buildings. Guarding the entrance of the building are a pair of men and women. Just at first glance, Minghe could already tell that those four people are extraordinary. Then he walked towards the entrance of the building. A masculine woman with scars on her arm and an eye patch blocked his way. The masculine woman asked Minghe if he had an appointment. Minghe told the masculine woman that his girlfriend was a bit ugly, so he suggested that she come there for plastic surgery. But he didn't know what the pricing was like, so he came there to ask about it. The masculine woman observed and stared at Minghe. Moments later, the masculine woman told Minghe to take the elevator to the third floor for consultations. She asked Minghe not to wander around because the floors have the hospital's important surgery rooms. Minghe agreed and immediately used the elevator, clicking the button for the third floor. When Minghe arrived at the third floor, he saw young women talking to the employees, and some were looking at their reflection in the mirror. A man greeted Minghe and asked if there was anything he could help him with, and if he was interested in buying their longevity products, or would like to know about their biological beauty technology. The man who approached Minghe was named Zheng Teng, the sales manager. Minghe wondered what longevity products were. Zheng Teng said he just needed a glance to know that Minghe came to buy longevity products for his parents. Minghe asked him to forget about it. Zheng Teng informed Minghe that anyone who comes into their facility is just like him. Initially skeptical of their products, but once they show the results they can produce, Zheng Teng assured Minghe that his doubts will disappear. Minghe expressed his doubt regarding the longevity products. Zheng Teng proudly told Minghe that they've only ever made revolutionary products. Minghe asked Zheng Teng to show him, and said that if he confirms that it really works, he'd like some for himself. Zheng Teng said that seeing is believing and invited Minghe to the place where their products are made. Minghe agreed and followed Zheng Teng. They walked towards the elevator, and Zheng Teng informed Minghe that they would go up from there. Inside the elevator, Zheng Teng was about to push the button when he turned to look at Minghe. He had an evil look on his face when he said that he almost forgot to ask who recommended that place to Minghe. They didn't have any solo customers there, they were all acquaintances, and old customers recommend more customers. Minghe got surrounded by men in black suits. He explained that he just heard about them having some good stuff. Zheng Teng asked Minghe to give a name, or he wouldn't bring him up. And if he couldn't give a name, Zheng Teng said they'd have to check his identity. The men in black suits slowly moved closer to Minghe. Minghe realized that they waited for him to enter the elevator so they could surround him. It was clear that it was a trap for people like him who came to investigate them. Minghe asked Zheng Teng if all he needed to do was name one of their acquaintances to go up. Zheng Teng confirmed and said that he'd love to be of service to Minghe, but they also had to be on guard in case he was there to steal technology, which would be bad for them. Zheng Teng and the men in black suits pressured Minghe. Minghe remembered someone writing Mrs. Hu was their recommender. He told Zheng Teng that it was Mrs. Hu who recommended him to come. The men in black suit and Zheng Teng were shocked. Zheng Teng returned to his cheerful expression and told Minghe that if it was Mrs. Hu who recommended him, then he was their guest. They led Minghe up to their nurturing base. Minghe and Zheng Teng arrived at the building's 22nd floor. Zheng Teng informed Minghe that people only know that the serum of a beast can mutate some animals from Earth, but they don't know that plants can also mutate. A spacious garden, filled with different mutated plants, greeted Minghe. There were people covered with their personal protective equipment tending to the mutated plants. Minghe noticed an artificial solar lamp that looked like a disco ball, and automatic sprays inside the room. Zheng Teng showed Minghe some cacti and told him that if the cacti were turned into medical powder, they would have a beautifying effect, which all succulents could do. But after their cultivation, its vitality would be a thousand times stronger than a normal cactus. After grinding it into powder, it can be used to achieve a radiant youthful effect. Their cactus pearl powder is every girl's favorite product. Minghe expressed his doubt regarding the source and the legitimacy of the beast serum they used to breed with the plants. Zheng Teng informed Minghe that they have their sources, and pretty much every city has its own unofficial source. Zheng Teng proudly said that not to mention beast serum, 
They could also get the egg of a beast, a beast's heart, a beast's brain. Bing he understood why it's named a black market. No matter how grand it looked on the outside, it couldn't change the characteristics of the black market. He wants to know how those things fell into the hands of those black market businessmen. Zheng Tang urged Ming He to take a look at the mosquitoes inside a glass enclosure. A claw machine dropped a pork belly inside the enclosure. The mosquitoes immediately gathered where the meat fell and stung it. Zheng Tang told Ming He that mosquitoes are hated by humans. But if the mosquitoes would only suck fat and not blood, a lot of obese people would love mosquitoes. The mosquitoes flew away the moment they'd sucked all the meat's fat. Ming He realized that the plastic surgery they offer is not liposuction. They use those mutant mosquitoes to feed on girls who want to be beautiful. Zheng Tang reasoned that it's natural and harmless, while traditional liposuction can cause a great deal of harm to the body. He claimed that their company's longevity products are quite safe and healthy for the body. Zheng Tang moved forward and told Ming He that there are more exciting things he has to show. Ming He followed behind him while thinking to himself how much fortune the black market businessmen are making. He determined that the serum technology that Zhao Xuhua created to mutate sewer creatures definitely started there. Zheng Teng stopped in front of a curtain. He turned around and asked Ming He if he had read Journey to the West, and if he knew that a bite of a monk Tang's flesh will make him immortal. Zheng Teng snapped his fingers, and the curtain slowly opened. Ming He's eyes widened in surprise. Zheng Teng said that human lives aren't as short as most people think. Everyone has a life expectancy of 120 years old. If people could live to be 120 years old, when they're 60 or 70, they would still be considered young. Ming He asked Zheng Teng what's in front of them. Zheng Teng told him that those are eggs, derived from a creature similar to humans. He informed Ming He that when researchers dissected the creature, they found that it's immune to all the diseases on Earth. After various experiments, it was found that their eggs could be absorbed by human bodies. Humans will gain immunity to the diseases that plague them, especially the conditions that shorten their lifespans. He proudly claimed that the so-called longevity capsules were developed by their company. Zheng Teng explained to Ming He that at that stage of evolution in the universe, the longevity capsule, which Zheng Teng calls Xu and Zhang Dan, is the key to human evolution. People will never be affected by any kind of illness, and humans will enter a new stage of life. Ming He was alarmed by the products that the black market is producing. Bug-type calamity beasts have insane vitality, and their ability to reproduce is terrifying. Ming He's university had taught them some typical cases in which the eggs of a bug-type calamity beast showed no signs of life when they were at a temperature of negative 40 degrees. But they were able to revive themselves in warm and humid places, and could even break out of their eggs. Zheng Teng informed Ming He that even the eggs that ultraviolet light had killed could revive under the right circumstances. Zheng Teng put the test tube containing a bug-type calamity beast in one of their specially designed machines. Zheng Teng bragged that it's not even the best thing in their market. Those black-hearted businessmen turned the bug-type beast's eggs to earn more money. But once those eggs enter the human stomach, they essentially provide the perfect environment for the eggs to grow. The eggs have a certain chance of reviving in the human stomach and eventually breaking out of their shells. Even if it's just one in a thousand chance, it's still pretty scary for Ming He. Ming He thinks that it's impossible for those businessmen to be ignorant about it. But they're still selling those things to clueless people as a longevity product. Ming He was frustrated. Zheng Tang opened another room. The room looked empty, there were only two men in black suits inside the room. Ming He was facing yet another curtain. Zheng Teng informed Ming He that what he's about to show him might surprise him. But in order to convince Ming He of the authenticity and reliability of their products, he's making an exception for him to see it. Zheng Teng told Ming He that there are a lot of wealthy businessmen in the city who are willing to pay so they could see a living body. They're all equally interested in seeing what's beyond their world. Zheng Teng ordered the men in black suits to open the curtain. Ming He got curious about what Zheng Tang is about to show him. A figure was slowly revealed as the man in black suits opened the curtain. The figure had spikes on its back. Ming He couldn't speak straight when the thing Zheng Tang wanted to show him was fully revealed. An emperor beast inside a glass container, full of some kind of liquid, was in front of Ming He. The beast had stitches on its left arm and on its tail. It was fully immobilized by some circular restraining tool. Zheng Teng commended Ming He for recognizing the rank of the beast. Zheng Teng confirmed that it really is an emperor beast. He told Ming He that the beast is still alive. Ming He hid his expression and told Zheng Tang that doing things like that should have gotten them judged on a trial. Zheng Tang informed Ming He that they're not the only ones doing that kind of research. And they also report a bunch of data to the astronomy team and the research and development team. Ming He asked Zheng Tang how they're doing it when the government had prohibited private companies from studying the living bodies of beasts. Zheng Tang said there are exceptions to everything. He was about to say that they're being supported by someone when he realized that he's been talking too much. He just told Ming He that all he needs to know is that the products 
they research are real and reliable. Then he asked if there's anything Ming he would like to purchase. Ming he smiled and praised Zheng Teng's products. He said he didn't expect things to be that developed, especially the Xuan Zhang Dam. Zheng Teng corrected Ming he, saying that it's Xuan Zhang Dam, not the longevity capsule. He asked Ming he if he would like to buy Xuan Zhang Dan and offered a 30% discount. Ming he asked Zheng Teng if he could pay using his card. Zheng Teng informed him that they only accept cash as they want to be careful, and it's also their way of protecting their customers' information. Ming he told Zheng Teng that it's not a problem and said that there's one more thing he's worried about. Ming he told Zheng Teng that he's worried that the products are contraband and are being investigated by authorities. Zheng Teng took his time to think about what to say. Because Ming he was referred by Mrs. Hu, Zheng Teng said he'll no longer sell the Emperor Beast to him. He informed Ming Yi that when he mentioned that they're affiliated with a specific department, the department is the research department of the Nandu Superhuman Institute. Ming Yi's eyes widened in shock. Zheng Teng said that many well-known professors are on their side, so Ming Yi doesn't have to worry. Ming Yi's face darkened after knowing that the department behind Zheng Teng is actually the Nandu Superhuman Institute. Ming Yi kept his act and said he's relieved to hear that the Nandu Research Department is backing them up. He asked Zheng Teng if he should go and get the cash already. Zheng Teng agreed and said he'll take him to the third floor. While on the elevator, Ming Yi was certain that he's not imagining things. When they passed between the ninth and 10th floor, the elevator took longer. He's sure that the elevator's speed hadn't changed. He wondered why it took twice as long to pass through the ninth and 10th floor. He felt the same way when they were going up. He speculated that Zheng Teng must be hiding something between the 9th and 10th floor. The things he had seen so far were already very illegal. Ming Yi thinks that the floor between the 9th and 10th floor is hiding even more unspeakable secrets. But he couldn't find the button to get to the floor between 9th and 10th floor. When they arrived at the 3rd floor, Zheng Teng signaled Ming Yi to go ahead. While they're getting out of the elevator, a blonde-haired woman walked towards them to use the elevator. Ming Yi didn't even glance at the blonde-haired woman as they walked past each other. The atmosphere around Ming Yi suddenly became tense. Zheng Teng asked Ming Yi if he saw the blonde-haired woman. Ming Yi didn't get what Zheng Teng just said. Zheng Teng asked again if he saw the blonde-haired woman. Ming Yi said he did and got confused as to why Zheng Teng asked him that. Zheng Teng had an evil look when he informed Ming Yi that the blonde-haired woman is the woman who referred him, Mrs. Hu. Ming Yi realized that he's been exposed and didn't bother to say a word. Zheng Teng asked him if he's not going to explain. He informed Ming Yi that they hate unidentified spies and they never let them leave alive. The men in black suits slowly surrounded Ming Yi. They looked like predators hunting their prey. One of them even opened his mouth to show off his fangs. Ming Yi held the frost variation mutated crystal in his jacket's pocket, as if preparing to use it the moment the men in black suit initiate a fight. The men in black suit eyed Ming Yi menacingly. Zheng Tang and the men in black suits looked puzzled when someone behind Zheng Tang called out Ming Yi's name. It was actually Nurse Song. She asked Zheng Teng why they were surrounding Ming He. She told him that Ming He was there to pick her up after work. Zheng Teng asked Nurse Song if Ming He was her boyfriend, and she said yes. Zheng Teng then informed Nurse Song that when he brought Ming He upstairs, he claimed that Mrs. Hu was the one who recommended him, but he didn't recognize Mrs. Hu when they walked past each other. Nurse Song explained that she had asked Ming He to inquire about longevity beauty products, as that was all she could do since a little nurse like her wouldn't be appreciated upstairs. She then hugged Ming He's arm. Zheng Teng told Ming He that he should have said that he was well acquainted with Song Feng, and they would have treated him the same way regardless. Ming He said he wanted to respect Nurse Song's wishes, as she had no intention of revealing their relationship at the moment. Nurse Song asked Zheng Teng to keep her relationship with Ming He a secret. She said she would rather not let everyone know that she's dating someone younger than her. Zheng Teng assured Nurse Song that their secondary department already knew that she preferred younger guys. Nurse Song immediately moved her head away from Ming He. Zheng Teng said he was just joking, and if a wonderful co-worker from the same enterprise was looking into their department's products, he didn't mind throwing in a discount just for her. Nurse Song thanked Zheng Teng, and Ming He and Nurse Song walked away. Nurse Song turned and waved at Zheng Teng, saying that they would be on their way. Zheng Teng waved back, but when Ming He and Nurse Song were out of his sight, his expression changed and he looked angry. Nurse Song was still hugging Ming He's arm as they walked out of the black market building. The man guarding the entrance was envious of Ming He for having a fine girlfriend. The muscular woman said that women are never satisfied with just looking good for themselves, and the man agreed. Ming He and Nurse Song went to a restaurant. Ming He couldn't keep himself from asking Nurse Song why she was working in a place like that. Nurse Song said she knew it was risky, but she felt she had to do it. 
She informed Minghee that one time Dr. Zhao had her run an errand for him in the Nandu Institute. He seemed to have purchased some sort of equipment in the black market, and ever since then, Dr. Zhao had been visiting Nandu more often, so she suspected that Dr. Zhao had turned out like that from coming into contact with less savory individuals in the black market. Minghee informed her that there was a very high chance that the place was a facility belonging to the Heavenly Sovereignty Group. Nurse Song said she intended to report her discovery to Minghee or Luo Lin. But she ran into Minghee first. Minghee thanked her for covering him, as he thought that he wouldn't be able to escape the security without losing a leg or two. He had nearly used the mutated crystal, which he reckoned would only last for three uses, and his money would be gone just like that. Minghee told Nurse Song that he had found some clues but could use more to get a better picture. Nurse Song said she had a few discoveries of her own and asked Minghee if he was interested. Minghee warned Nurse Song that those people were extremely dangerous, and she was basically entering a tiger's den alone, which was very risky. Nurse Song became emotional and told Minghee that her friend was a victim in the Lenyang incident, and she couldn't live with herself like that. She had been working with Dr. Zhao for many years, and her conscience kept telling her that if she had paid more attention to Dr. Zhao's suspicious behaviors, she could have stopped his madness. Minghee told Nurse Song that she shouldn't blame herself for the Lenyang incident. Nurse Song insisted that maybe there was something she could do, and she said she had to at least bring the truth to light. Minghee respected Nurse Song's decision and asked her what she had discovered. Nurse Song informed Minghee that the black market often came into contact with people from the Nandu Institute's research department, and they received a generous amount of donations from the beauty products department. Additionally, Dr. Zhao would often take sudden leaves of absence and go to Nandu Superhuman Institute to consult a professor. Nurse Song said that she was well connected with Mrs. Hu from the financial department, and it was from her that she learned that the organization responsible for covering up Yuhang Enterprise's activities was Nandu's research department. Yuhang Enterprise would often get in contact with the vice director of the research department, but Nurse Song wasn't able to discover the vice director's identity. Ming he connected the information Nurse Song gave him. He thought deeply about it and realized that the professor was the person they were looking for. Nurse Song told Ming he that there was a secret department inside Yu Heng's building, but she had no idea where it was. Ming he asked Nurse Song to stop putting herself at risk in places like that and wanted her to file a sick leave. He thought that Zheng Tang was a cautious man and expected him to look into Nurse Song's information after what just happened. Nurse Song agreed. Ming he said he would look into that professor back in Nandu's Superhuman Institute. Nurse Song told him to be careful as well. She asked Minghe to promise her not to tell Liu Lin what she had been up to, as she knew that Liu Lin would freak out if she heard about it. Minghe promised he wouldn't tell Liu Lin and told her not to take on such unnecessary risks in the future. Nurse Song was glad to see Minghe and said that it made her last few months of working undercover worth it. Minghe noticed that Nurse Song seemed pretty excited about it, and Nurse Song just said that she was happy to be of help. Minghe decided to relax a bit in the restaurant. During the night, Minghe rode a taxi to Nandu's Superhuman Institute. As soon as he arrived, he called Luo Lin and told her that there was something he needed to tell her. Minghe revealed to Luo Lin that he had run into Nurse Song back in Yu Hang's headquarters. Luo Lin was taking a bath while on the call with Minghe. After hearing Minghe's news, she simply told Minghe that she was already aware of Nurse Song's actions. She explained to Minghe that, from a certain perspective, Nurse Song was one of the perpetrators of the Lenyang incident. Nurse Song was in pain for a long time, and all those people in Lenyang who perished at the hands of the mutated beasts would always be in Nurse Song's mind. If Luo Lin had stopped Nurse Song's plan, Nurse Song would have only continued to wallow in pity and self-blame. Ming he said he was just worried about Nurse Song's safety. Luo Lin told him not to worry because they had been keeping an eye on Nurse Song. She informed Ming Yi that on paper, Mrs. Hu was supposed to be Dragon Tooth's contact, which was just a pretense. Ming Yi asked Luo Lin if what she meant to say was that Nurse Song was the real undercover agent all along. Luo Lin said she didn't say it explicitly, but Mrs. Hu had a less than ideal track record herself. Meanwhile, in Yu Heng Enterprise's building, the elevator ascended and stopped on floor 9.5. Zheng Teng walked out of the elevator, followed by two men in black suits who were dragging the crippled Mrs. Hu. Zheng Teng told Mrs. Hu that he believed they had been treating her well for the past year, even covering up the damages she had caused from selling defective facial cream products. Mrs. Hu explained that she hadn't done anything and pleaded with Zheng Teng to believe her. Zheng Teng lifted Mrs. Hu's chin so that they met face to face. He told her that it couldn't be helped because he was quite the paranoid man. Zheng Teng told Mrs. Hu that she was lucky that their most recent product developed from the cells of Calamity Beasts was designed to repair broken limbs, and they wanted Mrs. Hu to test out their new product's effectiveness. Mrs. Hu wailed as she begged not to be used to test the product. She did her best to convince Zheng Teng that she hadn't done anything but to no avail. 
Zheng Teng assured her that everything would be alright, saying he wasn't suspecting her, he was just breaking her legs. He asked Mrs. Hu to have faith in their enterprise, just like how they had placed their faith in that research. Mrs. Hu promised she would do anything just not to be their lab rat. Zheng Teng signaled the men in black suits to proceed, and Mrs. Hu cried and begged as they threw her into a pool filled with green liquid. At the last moment, she cursed Zheng Teng to go to hell for his deeds. The liquid splashed, and small organisms immediately gathered where Mrs. Hu was. Moments later, the call for help slowly died down. Nothing was left of Mrs. Hu but her tattered clothes. The researchers panicked, but Zheng Teng was grinning as he looked at where Mrs. Hu had been. He suddenly directed his attention to the researchers and told them they had brought Mrs. Hu there to heal her broken legs. He blamed them for failing to develop the product where it was good enough to serve its purpose. Zhang Teng called all the researchers worthless garbage and said he wanted to see improvements. Meanwhile, Mingyi had arrived at Nandu's Superhuman Institute. The bright full moon lit up the whole area. Mingyi stood in front of Nandu Institute's research department. He noticed that an office still had its lights on. Calmly, he entered the building. Inside the research department, Mingyi looked at the list of research staff. Professor Feng was listed as the vice president. Closing his eyes, Mingyi seemed to have a hard time accepting the truth. Moments later, he started moving forward and arrived at the entrance of the bright room he had seen earlier. Professor Feng was working on a glove when Mingyi entered the laboratory. When he noticed Mingyi, he took off his eyeglasses and asked why he was there. Mingyi told Professor Feng that he was just there to see him. He informed Professor Feng that he had mastered how to perceive things. Professor Feng smiled, amazed by Mingyi's progress. He said that after talking to Mingyi that day, he realized that his ability could be developed further. So, he looked for a material that could absorb elements and made a glove for Mingyi. He thought it would suit Minghe. Minghe asked Professor Feng if the only reason he was working so late was to make those gloves for him. Professor Feng told Minghe that he had been having trouble sleeping lately, so he wanted to do something instead. He wanted to give Minghe a gift because he was a very unique boy. The gloves weren't finished yet, so he asked Minghe to come back in a few days. Minghe directly asked Professor Feng if the reason why he was being nice to him was because of the strange events in Lanyang City. Professor Feng paused for a moment, feigned ignorance, and said it was his job to take care of students. Minghe became emotional, telling Professor Feng that he didn't think he was that kind of person. He said he could come back the next day with the Dragon Tooth group, and Professor Feng still wouldn't tell him anything. Professor Feng said he didn't know what Minghe was talking about. He reasoned that he was just making a glove, and he rarely met a student who was as eager to learn as Minghe. Professor Feng saw his younger self in Minghe, Minghe sought knowledge like he did. Minghe held Professor Feng's shoulder, asking him to just say if someone was coercing him. Professor Feng insisted that he didn't know what Minghe was saying. Instead, he talked about his younger days, saying that he was always focused on the things he was interested in. At that time, he wasn't as lucky as Minghe, he had no instructor. There were many bumps in his journey while he was doing his research. He didn't achieve anything. He had no money to buy all the expensive instruments, materials, and laboratories needed. Just like that, Professor Feng became depressed, unmotivated, and unknown all the way until his middle age years. Until one day, he met someone he called Mentor. His mentor was very generous, no matter how many times Professor Feng failed. His mentor kept funding his research and motivated him no matter how frustrated he was. With his mentor's help, Professor Feng won many academic awards. He became a respected Nandu professor who could be in the classrooms that housed the pillars of their country and hear them call him teacher. He liked the feeling of teaching and educating people and watching the students grow. Professor Feng told Mingyi that he always wanted to help students with potential, hoping they didn't have to experience what he did and become just as depressed. Mingyi told Professor Feng that it wasn't too late for him and demanded that Professor Feng tell him who the mentor was. Professor Feng just said that it was clear that he was the mentor. Mingyi said he believed that Professor Feng was not the mentor. Professor Feng apologized to Mingyi for letting his hometown suffer so much. He confessed that ever since he found out that Mingyi was from Lanyang City, he hadn't been able to sleep properly. Professor Feng said the gloves were almost ready and told Mingyi that he must accept them. Mingyi asked Professor Feng if it was he who taught Dr. Zhao how to extract the blood of the beasts. Professor Feng admitted that Dr. Zhao had come to ask for advice, and he knew everything. Mingyi clenched his fist and asked Professor Feng if he knew about the consequences that would arise. Professor Feng apologized again and regretted accepting the money that was offered to him. Mingyi was enraged, thinking that Professor Feng might have supported the studies done by the Heavenly Sovereignty, despite knowing the consequences that may arise. He assured Professor Feng that as long as he confesses who the mentor is, it won't be too late for him. Professor Feng told Mingyi that it might be unbelievable, but he really didn't know who the mentor was. He said all he knew was that everyone called them mentor. Mingyi realized that Professor Feng was just a scapegoat and that he was being manipulated by the Heavenly Sovereignty. 
Professor Feng said that he considered himself excellent in the academic sense, but if he were compared to the mentor, he would be ashamed. Professor Feng told Minghi that with the knowledge the mentor holds, if he knew the mentor's true identity, he wouldn't be alive to speak with Minghi. Professor Feng had never seen the mentor. Minghi gritted his teeth. Professor Feng was not the one who started it all, but he had no way of proving his innocence. Professor Feng said that was the beauty of being a teacher, when all traces show, all the evidence will lead to him. Hence, he was the mentor. Minghi still wanted to find a way to save Professor Feng, but a bright yellow light illuminated them from outside. Professor Feng dropped the gloves to cover his eyes. A helicopter was outside the research department building, illuminating Professor Feng's laboratory. Officials entered the laboratory, ordering Professor Feng not to move. An officer read a note saying that Professor Feng Jing was suspected of developing illegal beast substances, and they were arresting him as his actions posed great harm to society. Professor Feng raised his hands and looked at Ming He. He said he saw the news about what happened in Lenyang City. Seeing the scared little hero who, in order to protect Lenyang City, fought until the bones in his knuckles were exposed, Professor Feng felt grateful towards the little hero for making up for his unforgivable mistake. Professor Feng asked Ming He if he would accept the pair of gloves. The officials started taking Professor Feng away. Professor Feng kept his eyes on Ming He, repeatedly asking him if he would take the pair of gloves he had specially made for him. Professor Feng wriggled around, trying to break free from the official's grip, so he could wait and hear Ming He's answer. But Ming He just stood still. He didn't even have the energy and desire to look at Professor Feng. Even after the officials took him away, Ming He remained standing still in Professor Feng's laboratory, the pair of gloves just below him. Ming He wandered aimlessly through a street full of cheerful people. It was clear that he was depressed by the fact that Professor Feng, the person who taught him how to utilize and improve his superpower, was actually supporting his most hated heavenly sovereignty. Ming He stared blankly at the gloves in his hand while sitting on the floor by the lake. He only lifted his head when he noticed a light swirl in front of him. The light became a figure, which remained just afloat above the lake. The light dissipated, revealing the goddess. The goddess said she didn't understand which side Professor Feng was supporting. Ming He told the goddess that her words sounded like she was asking if Professor Feng is a good or bad person. The goddess said that's what she meant, she wanted to know if Professor Feng is a bad guy or a good guy. Ming He didn't have an answer for the goddess question. He explained that people are so complicated sometimes. Ming He thinks that Professor Feng's confession really came from his heart. That Professor Feng really felt the pain and regret from the mistakes he made. But the goddess believes that the things Professor Feng did are unforgivable. Lenyang City lost so many people because Professor Feng taught Dr. Zhao how to extract the beast's blood. Ming He agrees with the goddess, but he thinks that compared to Professor Feng, the real mentor is more unforgivable. The goddess asked Ming He to explain. Ming He told the goddess that the real mentor exploits people's weaknesses to achieve his own goals. Even if everything gets revealed, the ones who'd bear the consequences would be those that were exploited by him. The real mentor will always be at ease, he can mock the whole world and still commit endless sins that make men and gods resentful. The goddess asked Ming He if he'll catch the real mentor. Ming He was not sure, he lost his confidence. He thinks that the real mentor is extremely mysterious and powerful, not like the Tianquan student who was lurking at the fresh training. The goddess suggested that they could just slowly trace the real mentor. The goddess told Ming He that maybe the Tianquan student could give them clues about the real mentor. With the goddess' sudden change of attitude, Ming He couldn't help but tell the goddess that he feels like she wants to betray him. The goddess explained that she suddenly felt like it's not easy for humans. Humans have to fight against the difficulties from the universe and the traitors of the human race as well. While the Calamity Breasts don't have that much of trouble, they only have one enemy. Ming He said he'll do his best to pull the goddess to humanity's side. The goddess informed Ming He that he's still far from doing it, and that she can't be bought so easily. Ming He stood up and said he'll buy some vanilla ice cream on his way to the dorm. He asked the goddess if she wants some. The goddess' eyes twinkled, and she immediately told Ming He that she wants two servings of vanilla ice cream. Ming He reminded the goddess that if she destroys mankind, she'll never be able to eat ice cream again. The goddess averted her eyes as if she didn't care if humans cease to exist. Ming He started naming some foods, drinks, and soups that the goddess seemed to have liked. The goddess desperately covered her ears so she wouldn't hear Ming He's words. She's starting to think that Ming He is a devil. On the next day, Ming He continued his campus life routine. He attended his class, trained using the formation spider, and read some books. While Ming He was reading a book, Zhang Yun suddenly complained about Lai Jin acting so pretentious. Wang Jia asked him what happened. 
Jang Yun said he doesn't know what Lai Jin has been doing, but he was noticed by a Sun Blaze Great Hunter and even got a seal of recommendation. Wang Jia asked how useful a seal of recommendation is. Jiang Yuan enthusiastically explained to Wang Jia that the school pays a lot of attention to the students' social practices. Like the mysterious dragon tooth, if they come to Nandi University to recruit apprentices, they'll 100% be biased towards students who have obtained a badge from the Hunter's Hall. Lai Jin suddenly entered the room, holding some papers. He told Jiang Yuan to stop thinking about being accepted into the dragon tooth group. Lai Jin said that Jiang Yuan could be his helper if he couldn't find a good job after their graduation. Jiang Yuan was offended by Lai Jin's words, he aggressively asked Lai Jin who he is for him to be his helper. Lai Jin proudly said that he is a second-class merit member who's been commended by the whole school, something that he brags to Jiang Yuan every day. Lai Jin said he isn't really concerned with the other two, he thinks that Ming He is much more reliable than them. Lai Jin asked Ming He if he'd like to be his assistant once he gets the opportunity to join the astronomy group or the dragon tooth group. Ming He smiled and told Lai that he'll think about it. Jiang Yuan threw insults at Lai Jin. Lai Jin ignored Jiang Yuan's insults, he told him to stop shouting because he has important information to sort, and he wants to avoid getting distracted. He warned his roommates that they'll have to bear the consequences if the Sun Blaze Great Hunter's business is delayed. Ming He asked Lai Jin if he's almost done with his work. Lai Jin informed Ming He that he just needs to write a small summary, and he'll be done. Lai Jin wondered why Ming He suddenly asked about it. Ming He explained that he just got curious, then he wished Lai Jin good luck. Later that day, the door of their room suddenly opened. Peng Linghui entered their room, he knew Ming He would be there. Ming He asked Peng Linghui why he came. Peng Linghui reminded Ming He that he promised that they'd go to a party together. Peng Linghui said he'd make sure Ming He wouldn't slip away again. Despite his promise to Peng Linghui, Ming He still declined to join the party. Peng Linghui couldn't understand how Ming He could stay in the dorm all day without seeing the outside world. He grabbed Ming He's arm and told him to just treat it like they're going to meet some new friends. Jiang Yuan asked if there would be girls at the party. Peng Linghui confirmed that girls would come and that there would be a mysterious female guest too. Wang Jia and Jiang Yuan decided to come along. Jiang Yuan and Peng Linghui dragged Ming He with them. Ming He gave in and threw the book he was reading onto their couch. They teased Ming He for being weird, like it would kill him if he came out and played. Ming He realized that Professor Feng's incident has been completely hidden. Other teachers had already taken his place in his classes. And both teachers and students think that Professor Feng went abroad for further research. Jiang Yuan and Wang Jia's jaws dropped. They thought Peng Linghui was the one who rented the high-end bar they were at. Peng Linghui informed them that it's not his treat, but Feng Lin's who's celebrating her birthday. Ming He's roommates were amazed that Peng Linghui knows Feng Lin. Peng Linghui told them that they're not just acquaintances, their families are interconnected. Wang Jia was starting to think that Feng Lin and Peng Linghui are lovers, but Peng Linghui revealed to them that in terms of seniority, Feng Lin is his aunt. Peng Linghui saw something that piqued his interest, so he led the group to a spot he saw. Jiang Yuan couldn't contain his excitement when he saw one of Nandu's university's three goddesses, the Snow Princess Tang Ning. Wang Jia and Jiang Yuan felt so lucky to see the two goddesses Feng Lin and Tang Ning dancing so passionately. If Lu Kayan was there, then the three goddesses would be gathered that day. They could have never imagined that Feng Lin and Tang Ning have such a good relationship. Feng Lin and Tang Ning's dance ended with a pose that would make any man envious. Tang Ning and Feng Lin stepped down from the stage while holding hands. Girls went crazy and surrounded the two. Feng Lin and Tang Ning struggled to pass through. As soon as Feng Lin and Tang Ning sat down, Peng Linghui immediately joined them while dragging Ming He behind him. Feng Lin thanked anyone who greeted her a happy birthday and those who praised their dance. Feng Lin questioned Peng Linghui why he was late. Peng Linghui asked Feng Lin if she was not interested in meeting more new faces at the party. Without waiting for Feng Lin's answer, he introduced Ming He to her as his brother in arms. With such dim lighting, Ming He thought that Feng Lin wouldn't be able to recognize him. Ming He said he was pleased to meet them and told them that he was surprised that even Lady Tang Ning would be there as well. Tang Ning just hummed in response. Feng Lin said that it was always the same every year, a bunch of noisy folks gathered, and she was getting tired of it. Peng Linghui told her that she should expect rowdy crowds at parties. He pointed out to Feng Lin that she was just not interested in anyone, that's why she was feeling tired. Tang Ning agreed with Peng Linghui's words. Feng Lin got mad and didn't understand why Tang Ning agreed with Peng Linghui. Tang Ning asked Feng Lin if she had invited the training opponent she kept mentioning. Feng Lin said she didn't. Tang Ning told her that she should because she was quite curious about what kind of person he was to be powerful enough to beat Feng Lin. Peng Linghui was shocked, knowing that even the martial goddess knew what defeat tasted like. He got curious about who was tough enough to defeat Feng Lin. Feng Lin asked them to forget about it and said that her sparing partner was quite the mysterious type, and she thinks that he'll never show up for that kind of occasion. Tang Ning suggested giving Feng Lin's sparring partner a call. Ming He had a cold sweat. 
He repeatedly wished that Feng Lin wouldn't call him because he forgot to turn his ringtone off. Tang Ming teased Feng Lin, saying that she might be afraid of her sparring partner. Feng Lin became defensive and reasoned that she just lost because she underestimated her opponent. Tang Ming dared Feng Lin to call her sparring partner. Tang Ming said that she had the right to because she was the birthday girl. Feng Lin gave in but had to get Ming He's number from Uncle Yuan first because he was the one who had been contacting Ming He. Ming He exclaimed and immediately excused himself to go to the bathroom. Peng Ling Hui took the liberty to let Ming He leave the table. Ming He ran towards the bathroom, planning to immediately shut off his phone. But then, he realized that he couldn't do that because the commander told him to be on standby, so he needed a method to communicate with her. Ming He suddenly received a call from an unknown caller. He panicked and answered the call. He immediately asked Feng Lin why she called. Feng Lin was puzzled about how her sparring partner knew it was her who was calling. Ming He explained that Uncle Yuan gave him her number. Feng Lin seemed not to mind and proceeded to invite Ming He to her birthday. She told Ming He that after having a few bouts, she hadn't gotten to know him well, so she'd like him to come. Ming He said that it would be hard for him to come because he had been hospitalized. Feng Lin was picking up some noise, and she didn't hear him clearly, so she asked Ming He to repeat what he had just said. But when Ming He was repeating his excuse, Feng Lin suddenly heard a DJ on Ming He's side that matched with the DJ in the bar where Feng Lin was at. Feng Lin stood up, looked around, and asked Ming He if he was in the Wu Yu bar. Ming He told Feng Lin that he had something urgent to do, and he was getting a bad signal, so they'd have to save it for the next time. Ming He hung up and felt like an idiot, regretting answering the call. He was afraid that if they found out that he was the one who beat Feng Lin, it wouldn't be long until they connected the dots and realized that he was the Dragon Tooth member among the students. Ming He's phone rang once again, and he got glad that it was Jiang Yu who was calling him. Jiang Yu informed Ming He that Lai Jin had finished the task he assigned him. As per Ming He's orders, Lai Jin secretly looked into the first few students who managed to escape from the mist. There were 133 students in total, and nine of them were from the student council. In Lai Jin's summary, he said that he believed that they wouldn't be able to cover things up perfectly, that there had to be a clue. If they intended to use that experience as an achievement, the culprit would probably be among the new students. Lai Jin assumed the perspective of the culprit and said if it were him, and he knew that there would be a calamitous mist, he would stay as far away from the danger as possible to not get himself caught. So Lai Jin narrowed down the suspects to those who weren't trapped in the mist and among the first ones to escape. And as instructor Zhu Kai had mentioned, that period of training was extremely crucial. Lai Jin still remembered back when he first enrolled, with him included. The majority of the students had no idea how long the training would take. While the school did make a few adjustments, in accordance with the students' needs, it ended up being a last-minute notice. And so, in order to enact the plan, the culprit had to know the exact time. In order to accomplish that, the culprit would have gotten himself involved in the student council so that the culprit would be notified of any changes to the schedule as soon as possible. Lai Jin narrowed down the suspects to nine students. Ming He decided to investigate all nine of them, but he was afraid that it would take more than that to expose themselves. Jiang Yu informed Ming He that it was also written in Lai Jin's report that since the vice president's birthday was being held, the rest of the members would probably be attending, and the nine suspects would also likely be among the attendees. But Lai Jin wasn't able to provide many more details on their whereabouts. Jiang Yu asked Ming He why it was so loud on his end. Ming He told her that he was in the middle of the said birthday party. Feng Lin tried to call Ming He again, but she couldn't connect. Tang Ning asked her what happened. Feng Lin said that her sparring partner seemed to be somewhere in the bar, and some friends must have brought him. Tang Ning told Feng Lin that it might be the work of fate. Feng Lin speculated that her sparring partner might have seen her but had no intention of showing his face. Peng Ling Hui thought that things were getting interesting. He suggested playing a game to see which one of them could uncover the mysterious individual. When Ming He arrived, he immediately asked if Feng Lin was the vice president of the student council. Peng Ling Hui informed Ming He that Tang Ning, who was sipping on her drink, was the president, while Feng Lin, who was still staring at her phone, was the vice president. They were both part of the student council. Peng Ling Hui told Ming He that he suggested playing a game of truth or dare as a group, and they'd try to see if the mystery man who managed to best Feng Lin was among them. He informed Ming He that it was confirmed that the person was somewhere in the bar, but there were a lot of people, so they weren't able to make sure. Ming He told Peng Ling Hui that he was also interested in knowing who the mysterious individual was. He wanted to take the opportunity to expose the culprit of the Shaoling incident. In the middle of an open field, where tall grass covered the area, Lin Qingyu stood still, seemingly waiting for someone. He turned when he heard footsteps behind him. A man in a green cap and coat approached Lin Qingyu while taking something out of his coat pocket. While receiving some papers from the man, Lin Qingyu asked him if they were able to get anything out of Professor Feng. The man lifted his cap, it was actually Instructor Luo. He informed Lin Qingyu that Professor Feng was only a scapegoat. 
Lin Kingu was glad that they were at least able to uncover one layer of the conspiracy. Lin Kingu asked about Yu Hang as well. Instructor Liu told Lin Kingu that, according to Meng He's intel, they had swept the ninth floor of the Yu Hang building and were able to verify that their messages were right. The presence of the acolyte was confirmed. Lin Kingu didn't know what the acolyte was. Instructor Liu said that the acolyte was a notable member of Heavenly Sovereignty. They had seen his traces from the Mist incident, which made them aware that the acolyte had successfully infiltrated Nandu Superhuman Institute. The acolyte was young, steady, vicious, and just like the mentor, the most noteworthy of all. He cleaned up his trail, leaving no traces behind. He was adept at stirring up all sorts of calamities that would appear to be happening by chance. Lin Kingu said that the calamitous mist was unpredictable, but the acolyte was able to understand the inner workings of the mist. Taking advantage of his position as a student within the institute, he was able to start the Shaoling incident. Instructor Luo said that there was a bit of luck factored in, but with the acolyte's influence, he was able to connect two seemingly unrelated incidents together. Lin Kingu realized how devious the acolyte was. If it weren't for the fact that they had a few lingering traces of his handiwork, they wouldn't have been able to connect the incidents back to heavenly sovereignty. Instructor Liu said that there's still so much that they don't know about the Calamity Stars. Yet, heavenly sovereignty was able to take advantage of their innate understanding and coordinate their movements accordingly while operating without being noticed the entire time. Lin Kingyu couldn't control his anger. He sighed and kicked a rock beside his feet while cursing Heavenly Sovereignty. He was frustrated by the fact that Heavenly Sovereignty could have used their powers and knowledge for greater good. Since they had captured Professor Feng, the false mentor, they had set Heavenly Sovereignty on alert. Instructor Liu was sure that the Acolyte would keep a low profile for a while. He thought that if they failed to capture the Acolyte immediately and let him develop, he might become an existence as horrifying as the mentor. Lin Kingu said that thinking about the mentor sent chills down his spine. He couldn't forget the day the Calamity Beasts arrived. Meanwhile, in Wu Yu Bar, the students were still enjoying the party. A mysterious person who was away from the crowd was conversing with someone through the phone. The caller informed the mysterious person that the scapegoat was caught, and the bio lab was shut down. The mysterious person was warned that he should start running and got reminded that it would be easier for the officials to single him out if he acted out of line. The hunting season had started. If he became that one panicked duck, spreading its wings and flying out of cover, it would be the perfect opportunity for the hunter to put him in their sights. The caller noticed that it was pretty noisy on the mysterious person's end and asked if it was really safe for them to talk. The mysterious person reasoned that there was no better place to hide than in plain sight. He informed the caller that he was in a bar, and his adorable peers were enjoying their youth by playing their childish games. The caller asked the mysterious person if he had found anything about the anonymous Dragon Tooth member. The mysterious person said he had nothing at the moment. The caller told him that if he could take care of the Dragon Tooth member before departing, the mentor would be very pleased. The mysterious person didn't know that the mentor had been paying attention to the Dragon Tooth member. He informed the caller that he had heard a rumor saying that the anonymous Dragon Tooth member was among the new students. The caller pointed out to the mysterious person that he was responsible for Operation Sprout, so everything was up to him. The mysterious person assured the caller that the mentor would be pleased. Peng Linghui stood on top of their table. He said that it wasn't like the usual truth or dare since they had their senior Kai Han there as the judge. Peng Linghui was sure that everyone knew that Kai Han's superpower made her capable of detecting lies, hence nicknamed the walking lie detector. Peng Linghui was confident that no one could lie their way out. Some students didn't want to play because they thought that it was going to take a toll on their feelings, while some thought that it was just a game, and there was nothing to worry about. Peng Linghui had a crazy look on his face while saying that those who didn't want to join could go ahead and weasel out into the coffee shop in the next block because the bar belonged to real men and women. He spread his arms and enjoyed the spotlights as if it were his birthday. The students had gone wild. The caller told the mysterious person that he should avoid playing the game since a student who could detect lies was involved. The mysterious person agreed with the caller. The caller advised the mysterious person to play his role as the ideal student and find an opportunity to get away. The mysterious person assured the caller that he wouldn't leave any traces. The mysterious person went downstairs and mixed among the rest of the students. Those who didn't want to join the game started heading towards Wu Yu Bar's exit. Peng Linghui said he would announce the rules after all those who didn't want to join had left Wu Yu Bar. Ming he realized that Heavenly Sovereignty would probably avoid that kind of activity since it wasn't worth the risk. He grabbed Peng Linghui's hand and told him that if the person they were looking for left the vicinity, they were just wasting their time. Peng Linghui asked Minghi what to do. Minghi suggested that if a student wanted to leave, a question must be answered. They would simply be asked if they were the one who defeated Feng Lin. Peng Linghui immediately jumped down the table to inform Kai Han about it. He stopped the students from going out of the bar. 
Peng Linghui informed the students that before they could go, they would have to answer a question first. He assured the students that the question wouldn't be that difficult to answer. The students agreed, so Peng Linghui immediately started asking them if they were the new student who managed to beat Feng Lin. After hearing Peng Linghui's question, the mysterious person speculated that the newcomer who was able to beat Feng Lin could be the anonymous awardee who was rumored to be a member of the Dragon Tooth group. He clenched his fist, thinking that the Dragon Tooth member who had been getting in his way was just somewhere inside the bar. The mysterious person smiled as the little game became more interesting for him. Meng He and the mysterious person both wanted to use the little game to reveal each other's identity. Peng Linghui stood on top of a table once again and started announcing the rules of the little game. Each student may come up and ask everyone inside the bar a question, and every single student who's present must answer. Those who answer yes would have to stand on the dance floor, for all the students to see. Peng Linghui said there's no way to cheat, so all of them must face their truest selves. Peng Linghui decided to get the ball rolling with his question. He thinks that whether a party is boring or not depends on whether the person you like is present. So his first question to the students present is whether the person they have a secret crush on is in the bar. Peng Linghui started counting, and the majority of the students immediately ran towards the dance floor. Tang Ning looked excited looking at the crazed students run. Behind her, Zhang Yun was looking at her while blushing. Wang Jia held Zhang Yun's shoulder, and they both started heading towards the dance floor. The students who didn't go to the dance floor include Tang Ning, Feng Lin, and Ming He. To know if someone is lying, Kai Han has to listen to whether there's a chaotic heartbeat. She is confident that she wouldn't be fooled. Kai Han closed her eyes and focused on listening to each student's heartbeat. After inspecting each student, she was disappointed because none of them lied. Peng Linghui announced the end of round one. The students on the dance floor dispersed. Jiang Yuan asked the group if they could still remember those who were up on the dance floor. When Peng Linghui announced the start of the second round, Tang Ning put her drink on the table and stood up. She said she wanted to ask the second question. Since it's Feng Lin's birthday, Tang Ning wanted to ask something related to her. She asked everyone if they have a crush on their vice president, Feng Lin. The male students in the bar excitedly raised their hands. Tang Ning's question made Feng Lin curse, and she became bashful. Male students headed towards the dance floor, some even wrote a note on a board and carried it with them. Ming He was patting Wang Jia's back when Kai Han noticed something from Wang Jia. She asked Wang Jia if he's sure that he's not going to the dance floor. Wang Jia was shocked, he wanted to explain, but in the end, he walked towards the dance floor. Ming He realized that there are actually a lot of students who like Feng Lin. Male and female students stood on the dance floor, including Tang Ning. They waved at Feng Lin, trying to get her attention. Tang Ning acted childishly in response to Feng Lin being bashful. Feng Lin smiled and said it's her turn. She asked the students if they have a crush on their president, Tang Ning. Feng Lin looked satisfied looking at students run towards the dance floor. Jiang Yuan looked at Tang Ning while scratching the back of his head. Looking at the male students on the dance floor doing some weird pose, Tang Ning felt awkward. Peng Linghui suddenly added another rule, those who haven't come on stage after three questions must down a bottle of wine. Wang Jia and the rest of the students strongly agreed. Ming He, who hasn't come on stage after three questions, drank a bottle of wine. Peng Linghui said that there must be a type Ming He likes. Among the three goddesses of Nandu Institute, he doesn't like Feng Lin, nor does he have a crush on Tang Ning. Peng Linghui speculated that Ming He is Lu Kian's loyal fan. When Wang Jia heard Peng Linghui, he immediately corrected that Ming He is not Lu Kian's loyal fan, but Lu Kian's boyfriend. Feng Lin and Tang Ning exclaimed, and Ming He became defensive, telling everyone not to listen to Wang Jia's nonsense. He explained that Lu Kian is just his high school classmate, and their relationship is just better than average. Zhang Yuan asked Ming He to stop pretending. He said they saw it with their own eyes that Lu Kian took the initiative to invite Ming He to watch a movie, and after the commendation ceremony, they saw him head to the apartment building where Lu Kian lives. Tang Ning stood up and quickly moved to Ming He's side. She wanted Ming He to confirm if he's dating Lu Kian. Before Ming He could answer, the fourth question was asked. The student asked everyone if they're still virgins. Tang Ning and Peng Linghui were both shocked when Ming He suddenly stood up and walked towards the dance floor. More people stood beside Ming He on the dance floor, and Ming He's group couldn't help but laugh at him. The fifth question was whether someone is not wearing underwear. Zhang Yuan's eyes widened in horror, and Ming He and the group looked confused when Zhang Yuan stood up. Zhang Yuan walked towards the dance floor, explaining that it's just a coincidence, and his underwear got blown away by the wind when the weather turned cool. He wanted everyone to believe that he usually wears underwear. Everyone inside the bar laughed. Moments later, Peng Linghui informed Ming He that everyone is wondering why he hadn't gone up to ask a question yet. Ming He told Peng Linghui that he's still thinking about what to ask. The questions asked in that game can only be answered with yes or no. If the question isn't sharp and precise, the other party can easily escape it. 
there's a high chance that the next question will get Minghee up the dance floor. He decided to go with the flow and ask the critical question to checkmate the Heavenly Sovereignty member. The man wearing a hat got on the dance floor and asked the students if they've won against their vice president, Feng Lin, in a spar. The students discussed among themselves, and they didn't think anyone had won against Feng Lin in a spar. Feng Lin is the best in terms of combat among the Nandu students and they thought it's an impossible feat. Jiang Yuan offered Ming He a bottle of wine because he thought it would be Ming He's third time not going on the dance floor. Peng Ling Hui urged Ming He to drink the wine, but when Ming He slowly stood up, Peng Ling Hui and Jiang Yuan's eyes widened. Other than Peng Ling Hui, who seemed to have expected it, Kai Han, Feng Lin, Tang Ning, Wang Jia, Jiang Yuan, and the rest of the students were shocked. While looking at Ming He's back, Feng Lin could see the image of her sparring partner. Tang Ning reminded Feng Lin that when she called her sparring partner, Ming He had left for a bit that time. Feng Lin couldn't believe that the person she was looking for was just sitting right in front of them. Jiang Yuan and Wang Jia realized how amazing Ming He was. Peng Ling Hui said he knew all along that it was Ming He who defeated Feng Lin. Tang Ning asked him how he knew. Peng Ling Hui informed Tang Ning that he took the special admission exam with Ming He, and he thinks that Ming He performed abnormally that time. Wang Jia was shocked to know that Ming He was specially recruited. As Ming He's roommate, he couldn't believe that he didn't know. Feng Lin stared at Ming He. Ming He's figure reminded her of her sparring partner. She became more certain that it really was Ming He. Tang Ning thinks that Ming He is pretty good looking. She told Feng Lin that it's a pity that the one Ming He likes is Liu Kian. Feng Lin clenched her fist. She was mad that Ming He still hid his identity despite sitting in front of her. The mysterious person smiled, thinking that he found the Dragon Tooth member he was looking for. But his expression changed when another student started walking towards the dance floor, after which more students followed. Ming He was confused. A total of six students stood on the dance floor. The students couldn't believe that there were a lot of people better than Feng Lin. They thought someone on the dance floor was lying. The female student on the dance floor explained that they're from the esports club. Feng Lin blushed. She thought that losing in video games shouldn't count. A man on the dance floor said it counted. He blamed the person who asked for not specifying how they sparred with Feng Lin. Ming He decided to make his question tricky to prevent the same thing from happening. Jiang Yuan was glad to know that they only won in video games, while Wang Jia was kind of envious of the esports club. Tang Ning asked Feng Lin if all the students on the dance floor, including Ming He, are from the esports club. Feng Lin said she wouldn't know because there are a lot of people in the esports club. Feng Lin told Tang Ning to forget about it and end the matter there. Peng Ling Hui asked Feng Lin to let Ming He ask his question first. Ming He remained on the dance floor. He was still thinking about his question. Before he asked his question, he clarified one thing first. He told everyone that he's not from the esports club. He said that he had discussed with Feng Lin about allowing the use of spiritual skills, and Feng Lin has improved a lot compared to their previous encounters. The students were confused. They weren't sure if Ming He just admitted that he's the mysterious freshman who defeated Feng Lin. Wang Jia choked on the water that he was drinking. Peng Ling Hui was sure that it was definitely Ming He, but he wondered why Ming He was admitting it now when he didn't have any intentions of showing himself before. Tang Ning told Peng Ling Hui that it's probably related to the question he's about to ask. Ming He proceeded to ask his question. After revealing who he is, he asked everyone if there's anyone who looked down on him, hated him, or wanted him dead. Ming He exhaled and went down the dance floor. He approached Feng Lin and asked her to identify who among the nine student council members on his list is standing on the dance floor. He told her that it's very important. Feng Lin told him that she doesn't know all the student council members, especially the freshmen. Tang Ning volunteered. She said she never forget the faces she sees. Tang Ning took Ming He's list and did her best to identify if there's a student council member on the dance floor who is on Ming He's list. Ming He anxiously waited. After looking at all the students on the dance floor, Tang Ning told Ming He that none of the nine student council members are on the dance floor. Ming He couldn't believe that out of nine suspects, none of them were on the dance floor. Tang Ning repeated to Ming He that none of them are on the dance floor. Ming He clenched his fist. Peng Ling Hui announced the end of the party. The students greeted Feng Lin once again before heading out. Ming He did his best to look for the heavenly sovereignty among the students who were heading out. The mysterious person laughed at Ming He. He confirmed that Ming He is a member of the Dragon Tooth group. Ming He was depressed. He exposed himself, but the culprit's identity is still in the dark. He's afraid that he'll cause trouble for those people around him. Ming He picked up a bottle of wine and drank from it directly. Feng Lin noticed Ming He's unusual behavior. Ming He repeatedly thought about how he let the person who killed Zhu Kai and the instructors slip away. Ming He was starting to drown in self-blame. Feng Lin told Ming He that if she caused any trouble, she would apologize. Ming He informed Feng Lin that it had nothing to do with her and said that he just didn't get to take care of his own problem. Peng Ling Hui was taking care of the leaving guests when he noticed that Ming He was drinking so much. He told Ming He that if he knew that Ming He could drink so much, he would have invited him to have a drink with their special group. 
He said that those guys are like water buffaloes. Zhang Yuan asked Peng Linghui what special group he's talking about. Peng Linghui explained to Zhang Yuan that he and Minghui aren't freshmen, and the previous five people are those who also participated in the special admissions exam to enter Nandu University. Peng Linghui said that meeting is fate so he called them there. Minghui didn't notice that those people were just at the table next to them. He doesn't have a strong impression of those people. Peng Linghui told Minghui that those guys talked about Minghui's bravery during the special admission exam. Hearing about the special admission exam, Minghui realized something. If the culprit knew him before, then he wouldn't have to stand on top of the dance floor. His question wasn't knit enough. Minghui was thinking that the culprit would only decide to kill him after finding out his identity. But if the culprit had always had a murderous aura and hatred towards him, then his question wouldn't work for him. Minghui immediately asked Peng Linghui if out of the nine student council members on his list, anyone participated in the special admission exam. When Peng Linghui looked at the list, he said there's one, then he pointed to the name. Peng Linghui pointed at the name Zhu Yu, certain that it was him. Tang Ming confirmed that she remembered the name and told Mingyi that Zhu Yu was the last person to join the student council. Mingyi asked Tang Ming to confirm if the freshman training time was decided by the student council and the school. Tang Ming explained that the final decision was up to the school's leaders, but the student council was involved in the discussion, so they knew ahead of time. Minghui became certain that the student council member named Zhu Yu was the member of the Heavenly Sovereignty. He immediately asked Peng Linghui where Zhu Yu went. Peng Linghui informed Minghui that Zhu Yu had just left and should be in the parking lot getting his nice little sports car. Minghui didn't wait for Peng Linghui to finish his words and quickly ran towards the bar's parking lot. Simultaneously, in the parking lot, Zhu Yu entered his car and put down his hat. He was actually the person who helped Peng Linghui ask who had bested Feng Lin in a spar. Now that he knew the identity of the Dragon Tooth member, he was confident that he could kill Minghui. Zhu Yu blamed Minghui, as without him, Zhu Yu's work would have shocked the whole world. Zhu Yu decided to take his time to create a perfect plan to kill Minghui. When Zhu Yu turned on the headlights of his car, he was shocked to see Minghui standing in front of his car. At first, Zhu Yu was confused, but he immediately realized that Minghui had figured out his identity too. He stared at Minghui aggressively. Minghui exclaimed when Zhu Yu suddenly stepped on the gas and quickly moved back to avoid getting run over by Zhu Yu's car. In mere seconds, Zhu Yu was already far from Minghui. As soon as he regained his balance, Minghui immediately ran to chase after Zhu Yu. While driving, Zhu Yu used the side mirror of his car to look at Minghui and saw Minghui's figure slowly getting further and further away. Despite getting left behind, Minghui didn't stop chasing Zhu Yu's car. He fixed his eyes on it. Out of nowhere, Peng Linghui, who was riding a big bike, appeared beside Minghui. He scolded Minghui for not realizing that a human could never catch up to a sports car. Peng Linghui jumped off the bike and told Minghui to use it to chase Zhu Yu. Minghui didn't think twice, quickly rode the bike, and thanked Peng Linghui. He immediately sped up to catch up to Zhu Yu. While driving, Minghui figured something out. The calamitous mist appeared a few days before Minghui came to Nandu Institute to take the special admission exam. In other words, Zhu Yu saw the mist at the right moment and realized he could use the inexperienced freshmen of Nandu Institute to cause trouble. During the special admission exam, the examiner made things difficult for Minghui. Zhu Yu not only donated 6 million to the academy, but also privately bribed the examiner to skip the queue and enter the Nandu Superhuman Institute. When Minghui was at the admission exam, he almost pushed him out of his spot, indicating he had connections with Zhu Yu before. Minghui was determined not to let Zhu Yu get away with everything he had done. Zhu Yu was alarmed when he noticed Minghui catching up to him using the big bike. Wondering if Minghui was in a rush to die, Zhu Yu used his superpower to uproot two big trees and threw them at Minghui who narrowly avoided them by cornering his bike. Seeing that his initial attack failed to kill or impede Minghui, Zhu Yu gritted his teeth. He unlocked his seatbelt, stood up, and used his superpower to uproot more trees. Moments later, a number of uprooted trees hovered in front of Minghui. Minghui knew he couldn't evade them any longer. He closed his eyes, sped up the big bike, and used his mystic fist. He reduced the air resistance of the bike so it could run faster. As soon as he was below the uprooted trees, they came crashing down on him. Minghui just closed his eyes and hoped that his passive ability would save him. Barely able to safely pass through the falling trees, Minghui caught up to Zhu Yu's car and told him he couldn't run away. Zhu Yu mocked Minghui, asking if he was in a rush to meet his instructors in hell. Minghui took advantage of a curve to move closer to the left side of Zhu Yu's car. He stood up on top of the big bike and cursed Zhu Yu. Zhu Yu noticed what Minghui was trying to do and turned his car to the right to create a gap away from Minghui. But despite the gap, Minghui still jumped and landed at the back of Zhu Yu's car. Minghui did his best not to get thrown away and slowly crawled his way towards where Zhu Yu was. Even though he was driving on a curvy road, Zhu Yu sped up his car. 
Ming He was alarmed when he saw Zhu Yu activate his superpowers. Zhu Yu intentionally let his car fall off the cliff while using his superpowers to safely get out of the car. Ming He's eyes widened as he looked at the bottom of the cliff. He fell along with the car and didn't expect Zhu Yu to be that decisive. Zhu Yu's sports car exploded, leaving the surrounding trees on fire. Zhu Yu stood on the edge of the cliff and looked at his car slowly being consumed by fire. While panting, Zhu Yu smiled in contentment. He thought that Ming He was lucky to have an easy death after troubling him. He walked away, entered the woods, and immediately called someone. He informed the person he called that the Dragon Tooth member had been killed. He didn't feel the need to reveal Ming He's identity and even told the person he called that there was no need for them to continue their investigation about him. Zhu Yu said he couldn't stay at Nandu Superhuman Institute anymore and asked the person he called to help him find a more hidden one. Zhu Yu suddenly stopped talking when he saw a figure in front of him. The clouds drifted away, revealing the beautiful full moon that lit up the whole area. Ming Yi, who was full of bruises and wounds all over his body, told Zhu Yu that he would definitely catch him and drag him to his instructor's grave to apologize to them. Zhu Yu couldn't believe that Ming Yi hadn't died. He giggled while saying that he was surprised that Ming Yi was still chasing after him. Zhu Yu activated his superpower and said that Ming Yi's abilities were like those of a child in front of him. He thought that they were not good enough to be a threat to him. Zhu Yu opened his hand and swung his arm, and his movements sent some kind of wind blades towards Ming He. Ming He wasn't able to react, and Zhu Yu's attack directly hit Ming He's bare chest. Ming He got pushed away, and the wind blades left three deep wounds on Ming He's chest. It looked like a bear had clawed him. Despite getting more wounds on his body, Ming He was still indifferent. He stood straight like nothing had happened. Ming He's tenacity shocked Zhu Yu, but he was still confident. He knew about Ming He's abilities, and there was no medium there that Ming He could absorb. Ming He couldn't possibly win against him with brute force only. Zhu Yu activated his ultimate soul art. He wanted to show Ming He what's truly extraordinary and what a real superhuman is. The surrounding trees simultaneously got uprooted. While Zhu Yu was doing his thing, Ming He remained still and held the frost variation mutated crystal in his left hand. Zhu Yu gathered both the dirt and trees. The things he gathered formed a small mountain behind him. Zhu Yu used his ultimate soul art, Mountain Shattering Roar. The small mountain that formed behind him was thrown towards Ming He. Ming He crushed the frost variation mutated crystal. His left hand absorbed the essence of the crystal. He swung his left hand and used his radiant spirit skill, Ice Storm Python Fist. An image of an ice python formed on Ming He's fist. As soon as Ming He punched forward, the python opened its mouth and moved towards Zhu Yu. It swallowed the pile of dirt and trees Zhu Yu threw at Ming He. Seeing that everything the python swallowed gets frozen, Zhu Yu started to panic. Zhu Yu had a cold sweat as the python disappeared just in front of him, leaving him unscathed. But Ming He swung his right arm and punched forward, sending another python towards Zhu Yu. The second python broke the things frozen by the first python to reach Zhu Yu. Zhu Yu tried to leap away, but he was too late. His body started to freeze from his feet to his head. Ming He's radiant spirit skill, Ice Storm Phantom Fist, was as strong as the first one. It froze not just Zhu Yu, but everything in its path. The area became silent. While approaching the frozen Zhu Yu, Ming He ripped the last bit of shirt that remained on his body. Ming He ridiculed Zhu Yu for always thinking that he's high and mighty, for mocking and trampling on things that are important to others, for thinking that he's a superhuman when he's nothing but a piece of trash. Ming He lifted his right arm. Zhu Yu watched Ming He's actions in horror as Ming He chopped Zhu Yu's right arm. The force of Ming He's chop broke the ice and cut Zhu Yu's right arm. Ming He told Zhu Yu that if he hated being human that much, he should just find a corner to rot in and not cause trouble for people who want to live a good life. Later that night, the bright full moon still dominated the sky. Instructor Luo and Commander Luo Lin arrived at Nandu Superhuman Institute's Memorial Hall. Without stating the reason, they were asked by Ming He to go there. Instructor Luo told Luo Lin that Ming He was probably not feeling well because he's so young and had just entered college but had already been through so much. Luo Lin said it's understandable since Ming He witnessed Ju Kai's final moments. They decided to take Ming He out so he could release some of the pressure that had been building up inside him. After all, his teacher Feng was caught, and the official superhuman organization was not always there for him. When they entered the memorial hall, they saw Zhu Yu, who was kneeling on the floor and restrained by ice. Ming He stood beside Zhu Yu while looking at his instructor's portraits. Instructor Luo saluted the deceased heroes, and Ming He turned his head to look at Luo Lin and Instructor Luo. He told them that he caught the heavenly sovereignty member who caused the Xiaoling incident and that he had fulfilled his promise to his instructors. Luo Lin and instructor Luo were shocked and immediately ran towards Zhu Yu to take a look. Zhu Yu was crying, and he begged Luo Lin and instructor Luo to quickly put him in jail. He was convinced that Ming He was a lunatic and didn't want to hang out with Ming He any longer. Luo Lin and instructor Luo just looked at each other and immediately agreed. Luo Lin talked to Ming He while instructor Luo called someone to report the situation. Luo Lin told Ming He that he didn't have to force himself like that and that he did an impressive job. 
Minghe said he just wanted to give his instructors an explanation. Luo Lin got worried about Minghe and reminded him that he could die too. On instructor Luo's end, after receiving an instruction, he ended the call. He told Minghe and Luo Lin that the official superhuman organization was sending someone over. Instructor Luo was still in disbelief that Minghe had done so much for them. On behalf of the Dragon Tooth group, Instructor Luo saluted Minghe and thanked him for all of his efforts. Minghe panicked and made it clear that he just did what he ought to do. Moments later, the official superhuman organization arrived and took Zhu Yu with them. Luo Lin led Minghe to the official superhuman organization's car, hoping that Minghe would get some good treatment when he gets to the hospital. Luo Lin waited for the car to leave before re-entering the memorial hall. She faced the portraits of the deceased instructors. She thinks that they must be happy to see the student they saved with their own lives become so outstanding. She realized that Ju Kai was right, each one of them is small and insignificant. They wouldn't be able to change the whole world. But at the very least, they could hold it together for the next generation. They're in a dark universe where they can't find the light, but the new generation would sail for them. Luo Lin saluted the portraits of the deceased instructors. She told them that everything they did was worth it. Definitely worth it. Ming He was on his way to attend his morning class. He was walking in the hallway when Fang Nianrong caught up to him and greeted him. Fang Nianrong asked him if he had chosen the course that their teacher, Tang Hang, teaches. Ming He told her that he had, and coincidentally, they became classmates again. Fang Nianrong informed Ming He that she had taken some open classes for most of the semester, and what intrigued her the most were Tang Hang's and Professor Fang's courses. She originally had a hard time deciding what to choose between the two, so she felt bad when she heard that Professor Feng had decided to study abroad. Ming He suddenly remembered his final moments with Professor Feng and sympathized with Fang Nianrong, saying that it was a pity. He told Fang Nianrong that Professor Feng was an excellent teacher and there was a lot to learn from him. Fang Nianrong got curious as to what kind of topic their teacher, Tang Hang, would teach them that semester. Ming He told Fang Nianrong to just wait and see. When they entered the classroom, the title of teacher Tang Hang's topic was projected in front, Elective Disasters and Alien Civilization. Tang Hang started his class by apologizing to their once great scholars because his research and projects were done on the basis of denying their claims. Then, teacher Tang Hang bowed in front of everyone. Someone from the class said that he kind of expected teacher Tang Hang's opening sentence to be outrageous since he's a university teacher. Teacher Tang Hang just smiled. Teacher Tang Hang told his class that, regardless of what era they're in, they should always question authority. After all, that is how those great scholars founded the truth of the world for them. The students agreed with Teacher Tang Hang's statement, every scholar broke convention and common sense in their era. Teacher Tang asked the class if they had ever thought that the creator seemed to be a bit biased towards humans. Humans could use their hands to learn how to use tools to create fire and were able to step-by-step step lay out their present civilization. Humans have wisdom and a way of civilization that other species can't touch. Teacher Tang Hang wondered if those were just coincidences or the so-called step-by-step evolution. When humans no longer have the favor of the creator, and another species appears that could learn how to use tools just like humans and learn how to create fire. Teacher Tang Hang asked his class what the world would be like if the new species gradually developed their intellect. The students remained silent and looked at each other, worried, realizing what Teacher Tang Hang meant. Teacher Tang Hang proceeded to his next slide showing a picture of calamitous beasts. He told his class that what they were thinking was right, the situation that he had just described was happening in their world, the era in which they were currently living. Teacher Tang said that humans had been immersed in the belief that humans were the only intelligent creatures for far too long, and that they had taken it for granted. But humans had never questioned why there was such a big difference between humans and the rest of nature, why humans ruled the world and dominated other species. Teacher Tang Hang showed another image, an image of the calamitous beasts that dominated the abandoned city. Suddenly, there was another species that was enlightened like humans. Humans couldn't decide whether they should let go of the arrogance they had as the chosen race and lower themselves to get to know the new species. Teacher Tang Hang informed the students that senior scholars from around the world had come to a consensus that humans were not facing the new species. They were still in the initial stage of developing their civilization, which was equivalent to the Fire Tribe era of human beings. Teacher Tang pointed out that it had only taken the beasts around 10 years to reach the Fire Tribe era. He said that humans might as well imagine where those beasts would be in 30 years' time and predict how many years it would take them to surpass human civilization. In Teacher Tang Hang's opinion, in less than 70 years, humans would be completely reduced to captive animals for those beasts, and their means of survival would be becoming the beasts' freshest ingredients. The classroom became even more silent. 
The students were depressed, they realized that their teacher Tang's words made sense. A male student bluntly asked teacher Tang Hang if he had evidence to back up his words or if he was just like those doctors who make the existing disease worse. Teacher Tang Hang told the student that he didn't have anything, that all his research was based on assumptions, which could also be considered empty talk. Teacher Tang said that even though he was a teacher, he was just like them. It was his first time facing a civilization other than humans. A male student who looked worried wanted Teacher Tang to say if it was possible for humans to get left behind because of the beasts. Teacher Tang Hang held the student's shoulder and told him that it was the reason why he had started that course. Teacher Tang sincerely hoped that his research was wrong. That way, humans could always be in the lead. They would have time to understand the beasts, how to deal with them, and finally realize the continuation of human fire. Fang Nianrong wanted to confirm whether their topic for that semester was to prove that the beast civilization wouldn't evolve. Teacher Tang confirmed that it was and informed the students that they were going to collect some special beast specimens and bring them back for comparison. A student asked if they were going out for that course. Teacher Tang told the students that they would go out often and would face certain risks, which is why the cooperation of the Hunters Association and official personnel was required. Suddenly, Teacher Tang Hang became sad, his course hadn't received much attention. They were only able to apply for a little funding, and it was also difficult for them to get the approval of official personnel. A student tried to comfort Teacher Tang by saying that the subject of their course was very meaningful, and may lead to a major discovery. Just like Dr. Wu Long from the astronomy team. Remembering Dr. Wu Long, Teacher Tang Hang could only sigh. The student kept going, saying that they might make a huge contribution to the progress of humans. Teacher Tang told the students that they didn't have to worry too much because the school would provide them with some assistance, and the seniors in the student council would also join them for that course to ensure that everyone stays safe while they're out collecting samples. Later that day, while Minghe was walking in the woods, the goddess suddenly manifested in front of him. She wanted to talk to Minghe about human scholars discovering that calamity beasts, are intelligent beings. Minghe thinks that his teacher, Tang Hang, is a remarkable scholar. He feels that Tang Hang's research topic is not as simple as it seems, so he wants to learn from him. The goddess said that Tang Hang is one of the people who treat calamity beasts as equals, unlike Minghe's former teachers who compare them to animals. Their ignorance disgusted the goddess. Minghe asked the goddess if it was really possible for the beast civilization to surpass humans in 70 years. The goddess told Minghe that from what she understands, human civilization had also undergone a transition. In just 200 years, humans had achieved cold weapons to hot weapons, and then the era of superhumans and hot weapons. But she thinks that Tang Hang is right, humans are no longer the only species favored by the creator. Minghe told the goddess that he wished all sentient beings would be like him and the goddess, coexisting beautifully and loving each other. The goddess noticed that something was wrong with what Minghe had just said. She got mad when she realized what Minghe had just said and aggressively asked Minghe who was in love with him. Minghe just laughed and ignored her. Minghe said he's still a bit confused about why calamity beasts have to kill humans. The goddess told Minghe that a virus in the system is simply a bunch of innocent programs, but the antivirus software still wouldn't let it go. Minghe accused the goddess of twisting the concept, stating that there's still nothing that can prove that humans are the virus. The goddess asked Minghe if he understood why Tang Hang apologized to the once great scholars. Minghe admitted that he didn't understand the meaning of Tang Hang's apology, so the goddess explained to him that considering the theory of evolution, there's a lot of evidence that humans evolved from monkeys. Dolphins are also very intelligent, but they didn't become the humans of the ocean. Their intelligence isn't inferior to that of monkeys, so is it because humans learned how to use their hands and make use of tools? Who even gave humans the right to do that? Minghe told the goddess that what she said is just an afterthought, just like a meteorite falling on a crater. The goddess said that many things can't be proven, but they can provide new ideas. And if all the signs line up with a certain idea, then it just further reinforces the truth of that idea. Minghe asked the goddess which idea she's referring to. The goddess pointed at Minghe and said that she's referring to the idea that humans used to be the immune system of the universe. After all, dinosaurs were the ones who once ruled the earth. Later that day, Minghe went to his big sister's apartment. When he entered his sister's room, he saw her putting some of his things in a bag. He told his sister that he's still cleaning up, and he's almost done. Minghe's big sister asked him why he kept on going out when he should be studying and practicing his skills. Minghe explained to her that it's for a research topic that he has to do every semester. He informed his sister that he chose a topic that he's pretty interested in, so he has to head out to collect samples and conduct some in-depth research. Minghe's big sister warned him to be careful, not to be arrogant and to run if he feels like something isn't right. Minghe acknowledged his big sister's warnings. Minghe's big sister suddenly shared with him that she thought she would get the inside scoop on state secrets when she joined the astronomy team. 
It turned out all she does there is organize data. Ving he reminded his sister that she's still an intern, and she'll have more core work activities in the future. His sister said that she thinks so too. Someone knocked on the room's door. Ming he's sister ran towards the door, saying that she'll open it because it's probably her colleagues. When she opened the door, her colleagues immediately asked her if she's ready. Her long-haired colleague noticed Ming he and asked if he's her boyfriend. Ming he's sister told her colleague that Ming he is her brother, a student at Nandu Institute. Her long-haired colleague told her that she has a very handsome brother and said they would have come every day if she had told them earlier. Her other colleague, a woman with short black hair, agreed. Ming he greeted his sister's colleagues. His sister's long-haired colleague took the chance to ask him if he'd like to drink together. Ming he's sister interrupted the conversation. She told her long-haired colleague that Ming he had somewhere to be. She urged her colleague that they should go too since their colleagues were waiting for them. Before leaving, ming -Hee's older sister told him that she would be heading out first. She informed ming -Hee that she had already sorted his stuff and asked him to call her so she would know he was safe. ming -Hee acknowledged his sister's words and stood still for a moment. He was amazed by how quickly his sister had made some friends. Moments later, ming -Hee took his bag and left the room. In front of Nandu Superhuman Institute's gate, buses were parked, and students gathered around them. When ming -Hee arrived, he immediately saw Lu Kian, who was being pestered by Fan Kai. Lu Kian felt someone's gaze, and when she realized it was ming -Hee, she immediately called his name and walked towards him. ming -Hee asked Lu Kian where they were going. Fan Kai, who was following behind Lu Kian, bragged to ming -Hee that they were rushing to the battle ruins to fight on the front lines. Lu Kian noticed that ming -Hee was also carrying some luggage and asked him if he was going out for a project. Ming He confirmed that he was going out for a project and then pointed to Lu Kai in the meeting area. Lu Kai got excited knowing that they were going in the same direction. Fan Kai pointed out that first years could only be backups, and the students with excellent strength in the senior year were the ones who could stand on the front lines. Fan Kai was trying to disrupt their conversation, but Ming He and Lu Kai just ignored him. Fan Kai gritted his teeth. He wanted to show his dominance so they would stop ignoring him, but he knew that he wouldn't be able to beat Ming He. Fan Kai didn't have a choice but to silently walk away. Meanwhile, Lu Kian was telling Ming He to stay safe and take care of himself. Lu Kian was blushing while talking to Ming He. She was having a hard time deciding if she should hug him. While Ming He was telling Lu Kian to let him know if she got into trouble, assuring her that he would come no matter how far she was, Liang Dong, who was running while carrying his ever so big green bag, bumped into Ming He's shoulder. Ming He was slightly pushed towards Lu Kian. Lu Kian thought Ming He took the initiative to hug her, so she slightly leaned forward and let Ming He hug her. They hugged each other for a while, ignoring the people around them who were busy preparing for their task. But they got disturbed when someone from Lu Kian's group instructed them to get on the bus. Lu Kian told Ming He that she had to go. Ming snapped back to reality and immediately let go of Lu Kian. Ming He scratched the back of his head and shyly told Lu Kian to stay safe on the road. Lu Kian ran towards their bus while saying her goodbye to Ming He. The bus that Lu Kian and her group took immediately departed. Teacher Tang Hang instructed his students to get on the bus because it was time for them to go too. Fang Nianrong entered the bus first. She was shocked when she saw the student council president, Tang Ming. Tang Ming just looked at the students who boarded the bus. She was busy with her phone. But when Ming He got on the bus, Tang Ning exclaimed. She immediately recognized Ming He. Ming He greeted Tang Ning when he noticed her. Peng Linghui, who was behind Ming He, told Tang Ning that they were really destined to meet again. He thought the trip wouldn't be as dull since Tang Ning was with them. Tang Ning said she was just forced to babysit the freshmen by her uncle. Teacher Tang Hang told Tang Ning that although being on the front lines was crucial, the research they were doing was also a significant contribution, and at some point, she would feel that it was worth it. Tang Ning just told Tang Hang that he was her elder, so he was right. When everyone was ready, the bus immediately departed. Inside the bus, the students were having a discussion. They couldn't believe that the student council president was personally escorting them. Those who were able to join the student council were terrifying students, not to mention being at the level of the president. They noticed four other upperclassmen, and the freshmen speculated that they were probably at the top of Nandu Institute's combat ranking. Liang Dong knew who the upperclassmen were and took the initiative to tell his classmates about them. Liang Dong said that the one on the left in the first row was the eagle sniper Lu Feng, whose extraordinary talent was initially hidden, and who seemed to just have excellent eyesight. But with his improved super sniper rifle, he had become the most ruthless person at school, so no one would dare to offend him. The freshmen were amazed, they had seen Lu Feng's name in the rankings on the school forum. The upperclassman with pigtails on the right was Zhang Wenwen. Liang Dong warned his classmates not to focus on how cutely she dressed because once she got serious, not even a whole class of superhumans could beat her. Zhang Wenwen seemed to have noticed the freshman talking about her, she stood up, waved, and smiled at Liang Dong. Liang Dong could only awkwardly wave back. Liang Dong's blonde female classmate asked him what abilities Zhang Wenwen had. 
Gang Dong just told her that all she had to know was that Jiang Wenwen played with fire. Fang Nianrong joined the conversation and asked who the upperclassman in old traditional clothes was. Gang Dong told her it was Xia Na, a Kabuto archer. He informed Fang Nianrong that Xia Na was quite mysterious, so he didn't know much information about her. His classmates then asked who the gentle-looking young boy who looks like a junior high student was. Liang Dong said the person was Wu Zai Adong. He wasn't sure what abilities Wu Zai Adong had, but Liang Dong knew that Wu Zai Adong's combat power was ranked in the top 10 at their school. The students didn't expect that their topic would be protected by so many amazing upperclassmen. It showed that Nandu Institute still found Tang Hang's topic to be important. When the students finished their conversation, they had already left the bustling city of Nandu. Meanwhile, in the town of Fu Rong, by the Guanyun Reservoir, carrying his fishing equipment, Wang Zhang approached Wang Jun, who was already there fishing. Wang Zhang was amazed by Wang Jun. He told Wang Jun that he had heard him play poker with his wife, yet he could still wake up early in the morning to go fishing. Wang Jun cursed and told Wang Zhang that he had been fishing all night, fighting with the reservoir. He couldn't stop cursing until he realized something. He asked Wang Zhang what he had just said about his wife. Wang Zhang immediately feigned ignorance, scratching his head while telling Wang Jun that he had just been saying that his cat was meowing all night long, so he couldn't sleep. Wang Zhang got worried about Wang Jun because he had stayed up all night, and his eyes were already red and bloodshot. Wang Zhang advised Wang Jun to go home and rest. Wang Zhang then took out his fishing equipment and started fishing. The reservoir became silent as the two focused on catching a fish. Dandelion flowers around the reservoir were blown away by the cool wind. A girl inside a car that passed by the reservoir got excited seeing plenty of dandelions ride through the wind. She opened the window of the car and tried to catch some dandelion. Her mother pulled her back to the car and reminded her not to climb out of the window because it was dangerous. The father, who was driving the car, couldn't help but smile while looking at his wife and child. He didn't notice that a dandelion had landed on his neck. Meanwhile, Wang Zhang's fishing float started to get dragged around. He was proud that he had caught a fish earlier than Wang Jun, even though he had come late. Judging from the bite force, Wang Zhang thought that he might have caught a big fish. He had a hard time reeling in the fish and tried asking Wang Jun to lend him a hand. But Wang Jun didn't respond. Wang Zhang cursed and was forced to do it alone. He pulled the fishing rod with all his might. Moments later, the fish was finally pulled out of the water. With all the force Wang Zhang used, the fish got shot up into the air. Even though the fish was still in midair, Wang Zhang could already tell that it was a big fish. Something wriggled in the fish's mouth and then the hook got detached from it. Wang Zhang immediately took the fish as soon as it landed in front of him and was amazed at how big it was. But before he could inspect it carefully, some wriggling creatures came out of the fish's body. Out of shock, Wang Zhang immediately dropped the fish and fell on his butt. He watched the wriggling creatures wriggle around the fish. After a bit of time, the wriggling creatures burrowed into the ground, leaving the fish in a withered state. Wang Zhang moved closer to Wang Jun's side, his eyes still fixed on the fish when he shook and asked Wang Jun if he saw what just happened. Wang Zhang found it strange that the fish immediately withered even though it was still alive when he caught it. When Wang Jun still didn't respond, Wang Zhang asked him if he was still thinking about his wife. Finally, he noticed that something was strange about Wang Jun, so he turned to look at him. What Wang Zhang saw almost made his soul leave his body. Wang Jun's body had already withered, and the wriggling creatures slithered their way from Wang Jun's feet to the river. Wang Zhang immediately ran away, leaving all the things he brought with him. Meanwhile, teacher Tang Hang's group was still on their way towards their destination. Fang Nianrong asked her teacher, Tang Hang, what type of sample they were going to collect. Tang Hang told her that they were going to collect a common plant. He said that not long ago, a hunter sent him some strange samples, and he conducted some research on them. He found out that those plants were aggressive. Fang Nianron wondered what Tang Hang meant, thinking that the plant kingdom was naturally aggressive. Many of those sky-reaching trees expand their crowns by instinct in order to improve their growth, shading the little trees from the sun and letting them die. That way, they can exclusively enjoy the nutrients of the soil. Tang Hang told Fang Nianron that she was right, there was also aggression between plants. But he clarified that his sample was not about the aggressiveness of competing for sunlight and soil. Rather, his sample was extremely aggressive towards the animal kingdom, similar to a carnivorous plant. Except it doesn't catch flies, butterflies, or moths, but rather catches large animals, including humans. After Tang Hang's explanation, a deer suddenly crossed the road. The driver was shocked and was not able to stop the bus in time. The deer was inevitably hit by the car, and the impact caused the windshield to break, scattering bits of it around. Xia Na stood up immediately and asked the driver if a beast had attacked the bus. The driver informed Xia Na that it was just a wild deer that had suddenly rushed out from the side of the road. 
Tang Ming instructed Zia Na to go out and check the situation and told everyone else to stay on the bus. The driver assured them that it was just a deer and there was no need to investigate. Lu Feng reminded the driver that they were not far from the battle ruins, so incidents like that should not be taken lightly. When Zia Na got out of the bus, she saw a broken antler, shards of glass, and a blood trail. She was shocked that the deer was still able to run away. She followed the blood trail but did not go too deep into the woods. Zia Na thought that the deer would not survive for long, so she stopped looking for it and quickly returned to the bus. She told everyone on the bus that it was just a deer and not a big threat. Tang Ning asked her what happened to the corpse. Zia Na informed Tang Ning that the deer did not die but ran into the woods. Tang Ning then asked the driver if the bus could still take them to their destination. The driver told her that the bus was fine and the collision was on the other side, so it would not affect them. He said that there were too many deer in that mountain, so those kinds of accidents often happened on that road. After checking that everything was alright, they went on their way. As soon as the bus started running, a deer with a broken antler peeked out of the road. It stared at the bus, clearly showing its hatred towards it and the people inside. Teacher Tang Hang's group arrived at Fu Rong Town. Their bus passed by some police gathering outside a hall. Liang Dong looked out the window and wondered what had happened. Tang Linghui thought that a murder must have occurred. The bus did not stop and continued its way to their hotel. Teacher Tang Hang informed the students that they would check in first before having lunch. During lunch, Tang Hang decided to start assigning tasks. He told the students that he had received some information from the Hunters Association that there were samples in several towns around there, and they would start with the town they were currently in, Fu Rong. Everyone would be assigned to groups to do some research and collect samples. They would split up into five groups, each led by an upperclassman. Liang Dong and Peng Linghui told Tang Ning that they wanted to be in her group. Then almost all of the freshmen raised their hands, and they wanted to be in Tang Ning's group too. Tang Ning had a headache, and she told the freshmen that the leaders would be the ones who would be picking people. Tang Ning chose Fang Nianrong, another female freshman, Lin Hui, an energetic male freshman, Hu Guangyi, and Ming He to be part of her group. Teacher Tang Hang told Tang Ning that it would be their task to investigate why there were so many people gathered around the hall they had seen when they entered the town. He pointed out that it was just a typical murder case and they should leave it to the police. However, if they found something wrong, they could take care of it. Tang Ning reminded her uncle that she was only responsible for taking care of her underclassmen's safety. Teacher Tang Hang told Tang Ning that the task itself was for the freshmen, so it was up to them to further investigate the situation. The rest of the upperclassmen also started selecting their group members. Teacher Tang Hang gave each group a field signal handbook, which would definitely be useful in case of emergencies. After confirming that everyone already had their groups, Tang Hang briefed the students about their responsibilities. Kang Ning's group was responsible for the area around the town, while Zia Na's group was told to go to the lumber mill. After assigning each group their responsibilities and ensuring that there were no more questions, Teacher Tang Hang let everyone go their way. Meanwhile, in the hall where the police had gathered, after inspecting the victim's corpse, the police were puzzled about how such a thing could happen. They couldn't tell if the crime was done by a human or a beast. Jiang Wai, one of the police officers, said that they should just wait for the superhumans from the Hunters Association. But Fu Rong was far from the city and another police officer was concerned that it might take a long time before the Hunters Association could send someone over. When Ming He's group arrived, Fang Nianrong immediately greeted the police. Zheng Wai glanced at Ming He's group. Fang Nianrong told him that they were from Nandu Superhuman Institute and had come to do some research. Then she politely asked why there were so many people around. A police officer told Zheng Wai that students from Nandu Superhuman Institute might be able to tell if there was a problem with the victim's corpse. Zheng Wai decided to let the students check the situation. Zheng Wai's colleague asked the students if they were capable of seeing a human corpse. Everyone except Ming He and Tang Ning was shocked. Fang Nianrong glanced at Tang Ning, while Tang Ning was observing everyone's expressions. Tang Ning told Fang Nianrong that they should decide for themselves because she was not involved in the research they were doing. After all, it was tied to their credits. Ming He volunteered to go and take a look. The police led Ming He into the hall, where Zheng Wai told him that they needed his help in identifying whether there were any traces of a beast attack or not. Fang Nianrong reluctantly accompanied Ming He. Inside the hall, there was an elder and other Fu Rong residents gathered around a table covered with a cloth. Zheng Wai informed the elder that Ming He and Fang Nianrong were from the Nandu Superhuman Institute and were doing research there. The Fu Rong residents were skeptical about letting students deal with that kind of thing and were worried that the experience might negatively affect them. They insisted that they should just wait for people from the Hunters Association to come. The elder told the police that they were not deliberately making things difficult and that they attached great importance to the matter so they couldn't be sloppy with it. 
the elder said that in order to please everyone, they should wait for the Hunter's Association. Zheng Wei informed the elder that they had already contacted the Hunter's Association, and they had told them that there were no obvious signs of a beast attack. So, they were more inclined to believe that it was just poisoning or the accidental consumption of a mutant. Since there were no obvious traces of a beast, it was difficult for them to send someone over. Zheng Wei reminded the elder that the battle on the front lines was very tense, so there would never be enough manpower. The elder just said that they were willing to wait for a few more days. The elder explained that Wang Jun was of great seniority and Fu Rong Town attached the most importance to it. So, there was no room for sloppiness. Zheng Wei's comrade agreed with the elder and said they would continue to communicate with their superiors. Zheng Wei apologized to Minghe and Fang Nianrong, and he hoped they would understand that they were just trying to find out the truth. Fang Nianrong insisted on wanting to investigate. Minghe asked Zheng Wei what hunter level would be enough to convince them. The elder said that it must be at least a Moon Glow ranked hunter. Minghe took out his emblem from his pocket and showed it to everyone. The police and Fang Nianrong were shocked, but the elder was puzzled and he didn't know what he was seeing. A resident recognized the Sun Blaze emblem and told everyone that Ming He was a Sun Blaze ranked hunter. The Fu Rong residents were amazed as they only had a Moon Glow ranked hunter, and he went to the big city and never came back. The police immediately saluted Ming He and apologized for being disrespectful. Zhen Wei and his comrade offered Ming He their cooperation and said they would have the people of the town help him in whatever way needed. Ming He told them he wanted to take a look at the corpse first. While the police were uncovering the corpse for Ming He, the residents covered their children's eyes. Some looked away, and some closed their eyes. Ming He and Fang Nianrong were both shocked when they saw Wang Jun's withered corpse. Ming He looked at Wang Jun's withered corpse from head to toe. Zhang Wei informed Ming He that they had already performed an autopsy and found the cause of death to be unusual. Wang Jun's internal organs had withered, and his muscles behaved as if they had been exposed to the sun for months. There was overall dehydration, and his blood appeared to have been drained. Zhang Wei told Ming He that according to the testimony of the only witness, Wang Zhang, he was just conversing normally with Wang Jun when Wang Jun turned into that withered state after a few minutes. Zhang Wei's companion said that there was a camera on the main street, which captured the victim, although it was quite a distance away from the incident. They saw that Wang Jun had been fishing all night and was still full of energy during the day. Yet the footage didn't capture any signs of calamity creatures, so they ruled out the possibility of Wang Jun being attacked and eaten. Zhang Wei wanted Ming He to confirm whether it was an act of a calamity beast or not. Ming He found it strange and frightening to reduce someone who was full of vigor to that state within minutes. He was thinking about the possibility of someone or something using their stealth or camouflage ability to commit the crime. A Fu Rong resident speculated that it must be the doing of a bat mutant that they saw up on the Black Mountain. The residents said the bats bear their fangs at people and drain them dry, and they wanted to immediately contact the officials to exterminate the bats. An old man raised his hands and told everyone that the vampire bat up the mountain could cover the entire town with a spread of its wings. The old man thought that the vampire bat's bite was capable of reducing a person to such a state. A middle-aged man said that people had seen the vampire bat before, and that's why nobody wants to live in the mountains anymore. After hearing the residents' speculations, Zheng Wei's comrade determined that the residents were getting in the way of Ming He's investigation. Zheng Wei asked the residents to head back for the time being, assuring them that since they had an official hunter with them, they would be able to solve the mystery in no time. Zheng Wei told the residents that if they found any clues, they should just leave it up to them to pass them on. Fang Nianrong asked Ming He if there was a possibility of Wang Jun being attacked at night while the venom lay hidden, and exposure to sunlight caused it to react violently, severely damaging him. Ming He told her that if Wang Jun was attacked, he would have attempted to escape. Instead, he chose to stay there and fish overnight. Zhang Wei's comrade confirmed that based on Wang Zhang's report, everything seemed normal the morning he saw Wang Jun. Ming He wanted to focus on the assumption that Wang Jun was attacked. He said that there was a possibility that Wang Jun was attacked by something hidden or hardly noticeable, like the calamity creatures shaped like tiny insects. Ming He suggested they go back to the scene and look for details they might have missed. Zhang Wei's comrade informed Ming He that they had locked down the place and welcomed the two of them to investigate. When they exited the hall, Hu Guangyi immediately asked about the situation. Ming He informed the group that it was possibly done by a beast, so they should head to the scene and search for traces to confirm their suspicions. Lin Hui agreed with Ming He, knowing that there are so many types of calamity beasts, and their attacks had become more varied over time, catching even superhumans on the front lines off guard. 
Hu Guangyi shared with the group that he had overheard people talking about a blood-sucking bat mutant in the mountains, dwelling inside the caves. He asked if they should go to the mountains first. Ming He shook his head and said that if the rumors were true, they knew nothing about that beast, so charging in blindly was very risky. Hu Guangyi told Ming He that they were all superhumans, so there was nothing to be afraid of. Lin Hui also thought so and assured everyone that they would be fine because Tang Ning was with them. Tang Ning told them that it was their decision to make. Ming He said that if it was the work of a blood-sucking vampire bat, then they should report it to the Hunters Association. Then they would naturally send over a squad of superhumans of the appropriate level to take care of it. He pointed out that they came there with Professor Tang to gather samples, so they shouldn't spend too much time on things that had little to do with them. Hu Guangyi got angry that Ming He could say such a thing. He said that as students of Nandu Institute, it was their responsibility to strike down evil for the safety of the people. Lin Hui told Ming He that he was thinking too much about his own interests, ignoring the villagers just so he could get good academic credits. Fang Nianrong stopped them from yelling at each other. She explained that Ming He was just saying that they should investigate properly first. When everyone calmed down, they headed to the place where Wang Jun died. When Ming He's group and the police arrived at Guan Yun Reservoir, Zheng Wai informed the police guarding the place that the two people behind him were the hunters they had asked for help to solve the case. Ming He looked around while being led by Zheng Wai towards the area where Wang Jun died. While they were walking, Hu Guangyi realized that he had stepped on something. When he looked down, he immediately jumped away when he saw the withered fish. A police officer laughed and told Hu Guangyi that people often fished there, and when they did, they just roasted the fish on the spot. Hu Guangyi sighed as he shook his foot to remove anything that might have stuck to his shoe. Ming Yi kneeled and took a closer look at the fish. Zheng Wai pointed to an area with a drawing and told the group that it was the place where the corpse was found. Ming He asked Zheng Wai if they had already checked the water. Zheng Wai said that they lacked the necessary tools to do so and hadn't checked the water yet. Ming He then asked him if the fish bone was already there when they first arrived. Zheng Wai told Ming He that he hadn't paid attention to it because it was just a dead fish. Lin Hui asked Ming He why he was asking such questions instead of confirming the exact location. Ming He explained that those who cook fish know that the skin is the most delicious part and he didn't see any traces of fire being started. He said that he just asked to confirm if the fish had something to do with the victim. Zheng Wai suddenly remembered that when they were investigating, the witness would often tell them about how a fish jumped up and scared him. Ming He asked Zheng Wai what was so scary about a fish. Zheng Wai said that he was wondering about it too and thought Wang Zhang was just too freaked out and was spouting nonsense. He informed Ming He that Wang Zhang was still bedridden from the shock, so pressing him for further details might be difficult. Ming He pointed at the highway camera and asked if they wanted to check it out. Zheng Wai said he definitely wanted to and admitted that they hadn't really thought about watching it. Ming He decided to look around for more clues while Zheng Wai's colleagues were booting up the camera footage. Ming He walked towards the dandelions and inspected them closely. Tang Ning followed Ming He and asked why he seemed to be quite interested in those wild grasses. Ming He said that he had been paying attention to Professor Tang's lectures, especially when the existence of calamitous plants was mentioned. Teacher Tang Hang might have brought them there to collect samples, but something like that happened at the same time. Ming He said that he was curious to see if there was a relationship between those two factors. Tang Ning told Ming He that such a coincidence was hard to come by. Ming He then asked Tang Ning for her opinion. Tang Ning just said that those dandelions looked like regular weeds to her. Ming He agreed and didn't find anything remarkable. Just as they finished their conversation, Zheng Wai came up to them and informed them that the video was ready. In the video, they saw that after Wang Zhang tossed the fish, it landed at the exact spot where they had discovered it earlier, and the fish looked exactly the same as the one they found with the skin still intact. They went back to the area where they found the fish. Zheng Wai couldn't believe that the fish withered like that in just a single day. Ming He asked Zheng Wai if he had noticed that the fish was quite similar to their victim, Wang Jun. Zheng Wai immediately took out a photo of Wang Jun's withered corpse. When he compared Wang Jun's corpse to the fish, Zheng Wai exclaimed that despite the difference between a man and a fish's anatomy, it was clear to him that Wang Jun and the fish had died in the exact same manner. Ming He, Tang Ning, and Zheng Wai looked at the water. Ming He speculated that their problem might just be lurking under the water. Zheng Wai said he would contact a professional diver right away. Later that day, two professional divers arrived, one male and one female. They immediately prepared to dive underwater. The divers gave Ming He and Zheng Wai a tablet that was connected to their underwater camera so they could see what they were seeing. Zheng Wai asked Ming He how sure he was that something was lurking beneath the water. Ming He told him that he had to do some sampling first. He asked Zheng Wai to tell the divers to collect some samples of the underwater plants. Zheng Wai quickly took out his communication device to inform the divers. Lin Hui and Hu Guangyi overheard Ming He and Zheng Wai's conversation. Lin Hui wondered why the cops were listening to Ming He, but Hu Guangyi told her that Ming He was probably using their teacher Tang Hang's name. 
Hu Guangyi said that they could investigate in whatever direction they felt was right. They intended to go to the mountains and forests, thinking that there must be some beast footprints. When they were about to walk away, Tang Ning stopped them. She told them that their four-person team should all work in the same location because she couldn't guarantee their safety if they split up. Hu Guangyi and Lin Hui said that they felt like they were wasting their time there, and they didn't want to listen to Minghe because he wasn't the leader of their group. Minghe overheard the conversation and told Tang Ning to accompany the two in the mountains since the police also wanted them to conduct a general investigation of the surrounding mountains and forests to make sure that there were no beasts hiding. Tang Ning wanted to reason that if something happened to Minghe, she wouldn't be able to help, but Minghe assured her that he wouldn't leave the town and said that it was more efficient if they split up. Minghe reminded Tang Ning of his strength and claimed that he was at least capable of defending himself. Tang Ning gave in and told Minghe to immediately contact Tang Hang if there was anything unusual. Minghe focused on the divers when Tang Ning, Hu Guangye, and Lin Hui went on their way. The female diver brushed aside some seaweed to have a clear view of what lay behind those thick seaweeds. Moments later, the female diver exclaimed when she saw a pile of bones hidden behind the seaweed. When her companion moved to her side, she signaled the man to take a look at what she had discovered. The divers, Minghe, Fang Nianrong, and Zheng Wai stared at the pile of bones in disbelief. Fang Nianrong just hoped that the majority of those were animal bones. When the divers got out of the water, they reported that they saw bones of cows, sheep, pigs, and wild deer, but no human bones yet. Zheng Wai remembered that there were previous recorded cases where people had reported that their livestock had disappeared. The female diver said she got goosebumps all over her body and was so scared that she didn't want to do it anymore. She advised Zheng Wai to find someone else, but Zheng Wai didn't want to let the divers go. He wanted to figure out the cause first. The male diver gave Ming He some bones he had picked up, as well as some underwater plants Ming He wanted. Ming He expressed his gratitude. The male diver told Ming He that they were just ordinary people, and given the situation, there was definitely something in the water. He wanted to leave the rest to the police and superhumans. Ming He assured the diver that they would investigate the matter. As it was getting dark, there was no way they could conduct a more in-depth investigation at night. Therefore, they decided to return and analyze the evidence they had collected. Zheng Wai told Ming He that he could take the samples they had to their professor, Tang Heng, who could analyze them. Ming He noticed that people in Fu Rong Town were panicking and going through emotional troubles. He asked Zheng Wai to keep the discovery of the bones in the reservoir confidential until they found out what was going on. Zheng Wai assured Minghe that they would keep things confidential and promised to appease the people of Fu Rong Town as well. Minghe gave the samples to Fang Nianrong and instructed her to bring them, including the fragmented samples he had taken, to their teacher Tang Hang for analysis. Minghe said he wanted to investigate other situations with Zheng Wai. Fang Nianrong agreed and went on her way to their teacher Tang Hang. Minghe and Zheng Wai went back to a hall in Fu Rong. When they entered the hall, they saw a woman sitting on the floor crying. Zhang Wai whispered to Minghe that the woman was Zhu Tao, the wife of Wang Jun. Zhu Tao noticed their arrival and overheard them discussing not making it in time for dinner. When Minghe suggested looking for a noodle restaurant to eat at, Zhu Tao stood up and invited them to eat at her house if they didn't mind. She explained that she had been busy with family affairs all day, so she hadn't been able to prepare anything for them and felt impolite. Minghe accepted her offer since he had something he wanted to ask her. Zhu Tao told Minghe that her house wasn't far from there and led Minghe and Zhang Wai to her house to wait at the table outside while she started cooking. While Zhu Tao was away, Minghe told Zhang Wai that he was almost certain that there was a dangerous beast in Fu Rong Town, based on the bones they had found, which had an enormous appetite. Zhang Wai asked Minghe what they should do. Minghe said that it would be best to evacuate, but Zhang Wai explained that it would be difficult as he had just received news that the area of the frontline battlefield had grown larger and now covered the mountain road. The evacuation route of Fu Rong Town had been blocked by the new battlefield, so they could only evacuate people into the uninhabited mountains. Minghe expressed concern that it might not be safe in the mountains as it was getting dark, and there was still no help coming. Zhang Wai said that they had been notified that reinforcements were affected by the frontline battle, so it was difficult for Nandu to send people over. Therefore, everything was up to them. Minghe decided to investigate the reservoir himself the next morning. Zhang Wai was shocked and told Minghe that it was too dangerous. But Minghe insisted, saying he would do his best to get rid of the beast. Zhang Wai could only thank Minghe for his hard work. Zhu Tao came out of the house carrying a tray of food and told Minghe and Zhang Wai to eat while the food was hot before going back inside to get some soup. The moment Minghe and Zhang Wai ate the food, they looked as if they had been struck by lightning. Their eyes widened, and they stopped chewing the food. They couldn't help but vomit while crying. 
Ming He regretted accepting Zhu Tao's offer as they couldn't describe her cooking skills at all. At dawn, Calamity Beasts can be seen everywhere in the ruined city, the city that became the breeding grounds for the Calamity Beasts. Some stand on top of the buildings, some roam the streets, and some winged Calamity Beasts fly around the ruined city. Ten kilometers away from the border, superhumans don their diving equipment and immediately swim in the river leading to the ruined city. By the river, Louis, Liu Kian's older brother, zips up his suit as he mentions that the ruined city, which has become a birthing ground for Calamity Beasts, must be destroyed before it mutates into a horrifying hive. Liu Kian expresses doubt that her brother and his team could simply sneak into the ruined city like that. Louis informs Liu Kian that their team received intel stating that the beasts in the ruins appear to be extremely hydrophobic. The river is their only way to enter the ruined city without attracting the Calamity Beast's attention. Louis and his team are literally tasked with diving into a very dangerous mission. Liu Kian is afraid that if her brother and his team are discovered by the Calamity Beasts, they will lack the manpower to fight back. Louis reminds Liu Kian that he and his team are all elite superhumans and he is confident that they can still put up a fight even if they are discovered by the Calamity Beasts. He tells Liu Kian not to worry about them and to focus on the missions she has accepted outside with her team. Liu Kian still wants to argue, but her words are cut off when Louis touches her face and tells her that the main forces are planning their assault, so someone has to go ahead. Louis says that the Calamity Beasts only know how to kill and multiply, they know nothing about regrouping or calling for reinforcements. If they are able to get into the ruined city and manage to report back to the outside, they will greatly increase humanity's chances of victory in the upcoming battle. Louis thinks that if they are unable to destroy the Calamity Beasts hideout in the ruined city, Nandu will be affected, and the death toll could reach hundreds hundreds, even thousands. Liu Kian offers her help so that her brother and his team will have some form of backup. Louis tells Liu Kian that she is not yet strong enough, even the lowest ranked members of his team are heaven flare ranked. He promises Liu Kian that he will hear her out once she becomes strong enough. Before leaving, Louis comforted Liu Kian by mentioning to her that she could provide plenty of help just by doing her job. When Louis was heading towards the river, Liu Kian reminded him of his promise to be at Liu Kian's 20th birthday. Louis turned and told Liu Kian not to worry since he had never missed attending her birthdays. After finishing his words, he directed his focus on his mission and dove into the river. Seeing the famous special forces, the War Hawks, in person, Liu Kian's teammates could immediately tell that each one of them was quite capable. The pink-haired woman said that the War Hawks would bring them news of victory, so whether they lived or died, they would be hailed as heroes of Nandu. Liu Kian's teammate with the wolf head was in awe after learning that the lowest ranked among the War Hawks was at the Heaven Flare rank. Fan Kai proudly informed the Wolfman that Liu Kian's brother was not just at Heaven Flare rank. The Wolfman was surprised, realizing that Liu Kian's brother was at the White Swan rank. The ranks are as follows, Starlight, Moon Glow, Sun Blaze, Heaven Flare, White Swan, and Galaxy Spot. The Wolfman was Moon Glow ranked and couldn't believe that he was three ranks away from Liu Kian's brother. Meanwhile, in Fu Rongan, Ming He immediately stretched his body as he stepped out of his room. When he noticed that the light in Professor Tang Hang's room was still on, he wondered if he was still awake. Ming He knocked on Tang Hang's door. Tang Hang instructed Ming He to come in, saying that the door was not locked. When Ming He entered the room, papers scattered all over the floor greeted him. Professor Tang Hang was busy inspecting the samples that Fang Nianrong had delivered. Ming He asked Professor Tang if he had stayed up all night studying the samples. Professor Tang told Ming He that he couldn't sleep on a soft bed, so he decided to use his time to advance his theory. He then informed Ming He that the wild grass, weed, and dandelion he had brought back were quite varied, so it took him quite a while to inspect the samples. Ming He scratched the back of his head and explained that he wasn't familiar with those samples and was afraid of leaving an important clue behind, so he brought them all back. Professor Tang understood that Ming He was just being cautious and told him that there were smarter ways to handle it. Ming He changed the topic and informed Professor Tang that he intended to collect more bone samples soon. Professor Tang said that there was no need for Ming He to collect more samples since what they had was already enough to present a case. Ming He was shocked and asked Professor Tang if he had made any breakthroughs. Professor Tang began discussing his lectures regarding his theory on the evolution of Calamity Beasts. But before Professor Tang could explain, Ming He interrupted him, informing him that the Calamity Beasts he had encountered had grown at a horrifyingly alarming rate. Professor Tang exclaimed upon hearing Ming He's sudden confession. Ming He then described his encounter with the Azure Moon Demonic Matriarch to Professor Tang, from its initial easy repulsion during their first encounter to their second encounter when it disguised itself as instructor Fang Kin. Professor Tang took some notes and told Ming He to recount the details slowly. Ming He explained to Professor Tang that after merging with instructor Fang Kin, the Azure Moon Demonic Matriarch's strength multiplied, allowing it to utilize Fang Kin's techniques. Ming He shared everything up until the demise of the Azure Moon Demonic Matriarch. 
Professor Tang believed that the Azure Moon demonic matriarch held significant research value and expressed regret over Minghe killing it inside the fog. Minghe asked Professor Tang about his findings from the remains discovered at the reservoir. Professor Tang informed Minghe that it seemed to be a similar case with the Azure Moon creature, and advised Minghe to examine the samples. The samples included the remains of ducks, household pets, and common cattle, arranged from left to right. Professor Tang asked Minghe if he noticed anything specific. Minghe scrutinized the samples, attempting to understand Professor Tang's intended message. He observed that the duck bones exhibited varying degrees of decay, suggesting they were thrown into the water at an earlier time. In contrast, the cats and dogs seemed to have been discarded more recently due to the presence of mold on their teeth. The sheep and cow bones showed no signs of mold or decay, indicating they were the most recent additions to the reservoir. Impressed by Minghe's deduction, Professor Tang asked him what information the bone samples from the reservoir provided. He had already given Minghe the necessary hints. After pondering for a while, Minghe suddenly exclaimed that based on the gathered bones, if the creature was a natural predator, it had undergone several stages of growth. Initially, it could only consume ducks, birds, and other easily accessible animals. Over time, it evolved, becoming capable of hunting cats, dogs, and other common household pets, while displaying a significant increase in appetite. Eventually, it reached a stage where it could prey upon larger household livestock, such as cows and sheep. Professor Tang held Minghe's shoulder and told him that his deduction is correct. Minghe was horrified by how quickly it was able to evolve. Professor Tang told Minghe that the most concerning factor lies in what the Calamity Beast would do after it's done with the residents of Furong Town. Thinking about the clueless people living in Furong Town, Minghe's eyes widened in horror. Professor Tang said that since the Calamity Beast tossed that many remains in the reservoir, it means that it has been lurking around the town's borders for a long time perhaps finding a way to infiltrate the town. Minghe panicked, the people of Fu Rong Town are in danger, but the evacuation routes had already been affected by the battle on the front lines. Professor Tang instructed Minghe to gather more samples. He wanted to see if he could find something more concrete about the monster they're facing. Minghe didn't waste any more time and immediately ran out of the room. Professor Tang reminded Minghe to be careful because it's possible that the unknown monster is still lurking in the water. As soon as Minghe came out of the Fu Rong Inn, he immediately called Officer Zheng. He informed Zheng Wei that he was going to the reservoir and would need their assistance. After the call, Lin Hui, Hu Guangyi, and Tang Ning returned from the mountains. They looked dirty and tired, with dark bags under their eyes. Hu Guangyi even had some leaves in his hair and was holding a bag full of plants and leaves. When Fang Nianrong noticed the three, she immediately asked them if they had found something. Hu Guangyi said they had, and then he lifted the bag he had been holding. Lin Hui told Fang Nianrong that if she was referring to stones and trees, then they certainly had found something. Hu Guangyi felt offended and reminded Lin Hui that they had agreed to check out the forest together. Lin Hui yawned and walked towards the inn's entrance. She said that she didn't have the energy to argue with Hu Guangyi and just wanted to sleep. Hu Guangyi insisted that there must be something useful among the things he had brought and he wanted to analyze them. Lin Hui sarcastically wished him good luck. Ming He ignored them and quickly went on his way. Tang Ning asked Fang Nianrong what Ming He was trying to do. Fang Nianrong informed Tang Ning that Ming He was going down to check the reservoir. Tang Ning wanted to go with Ming He, but Fang Nianrong stopped her. She assured Tang Ning that Ming He was powerful enough to protect himself. On the other hand, Tang Ning had stayed up all night and had dark circles under her eyes. Fang Nianrong asked her to go to bed and rest. Before Tang Ning could argue, Fang Nianrong told her not to worry because they would be fine on their own. Tang Ning gave in to Fang Nianrong's insistence and asked Fang Nianrong to inform her as soon as possible if anything happened. Fang Nianrong agreed and immediately left for the reservoir. When she arrived at the reservoir, Minghe had just gotten ready and was about to go underwater. Minghe boarded a boat and they stopped at the area where the bones were found. He sat on the boat's gunwale, then leaned backward and let himself fall into the water. Minghe dove deeper to reach the bottom of the reservoir. When he reached the bottom, he had to move the rocks and seaweed aside before he found the pile of bones. Minghe started collecting some bone samples, placing them in the net he had brought with him. While Minghe was doing what he had to do, something was moving around and eyeing him. Ming seemed to have caught the attention of a monster with big eyes. As Ming he was placing a small skull in the net, he noticed something behind him. He immediately turned around, activated his mystic fist, and punched forward. But he stopped his attack when he realized that it was just a big fish swimming around. 
Ning he just let the big fish swim past him. Then he continued to collect more bones. When the fish was far from Minghe, something wriggled beneath its skin. Moments later, blood spurted out of the big fish as tentacles pierced through its entire body. It didn't take long for the fish to turn into nothing but bones. The wriggling tentacles then started consuming the blood that spurted out of the fish. The tentacled creature exclaimed after consuming the big fish's blood. Minghe went back to the boat to put the net full of bones into it. Zheng Wai shouted at Minghe, saying that the bones he had collected should already be enough. Minghe told Zheng Wai that the more materials they have, the more accurate the data is. He said he would go down again to collect another bag of bones. When he came back to the pile of bones, he noticed a bone that was perfectly round sticking out of the sand. Ning he moved closer and pulled the bone out. While he was inspecting the bone, a tentacled creature moved behind him. Ming he was shocked when he realized that the bone he was holding was actually a human skull. Through it, he was able to confirm that the beast had evolved to the point where it could already consume people. It meant that the fisherman, Wang Jun, wasn't the first to die. Ming he wondered when it had happened. He remembered that Professor Tang had mentioned to him that the beast's appetite would only keep increasing, and that they were lurking near Fu Rong town. Ming he became even more worried about the townspeople. The goddess immediately warned Ming he when the tentacled creature appeared behind him. Ming he reacted quickly and punched the creature behind him. But the creature dispersed to evade Ming he's punch. It was actually a group of wriggling creatures. Ming he was confused. He didn't know what he was fighting. The goddess told Ming he to stay on guard because the creatures weren't dead yet. The wriggling creatures circled around Ming he and gathered on his face as if trying to suffocate him. Moments later, Ming he's upper body was fully covered by the wriggling creatures. His hands were restricted, and he couldn't free himself from the wriggling creatures. The goddess instructed Ming he not to use brute force and to calm down. Ming he realized that he could move his legs. He spread his legs and rotated his body, causing the water around him to swirl. The current gave Ming he the opportunity to release his left arm. As soon as his arm was released, the sand below him started to show signs of movement. The sand took the bones along with it and formed into a gigantic fist. Ming he aimed the punch towards his face, and the sand fist moved towards them with great momentum. Ming he was confident that he could withstand the punch, but the same couldn't be said for the wriggling creatures. Afraid of getting hit by the sand fist, the wriggling creatures quickly moved away from Ming he. Ming he stared confidently at the fist hurtling toward him, ready to take it head on. However, the onslaught of wriggling creatures had barely begun to scatter when the fist loomed right in front of him. Undeterred, Ming-Hi swiftly clenched his hands into fists, despite the majority of the wriggling creatures having already made their escape. By the reservoir, the police and Fang Nianrong were waiting patiently for Ming-Hi to resurface, until a massive wave formed near the area where the boat was. The cops and Fang Nianrong exclaimed and immediately formed a defensive formation, preparing to counterattack. Fang Nianrong activated her superpowers, while the cops readied their guns. Zheng Wai used his radio and repeatedly called ming He's name, asking him to respond if he could hear them. ming He responded, telling them that he was fine. Fang Nianrong and the police released a sigh of relief, glad that nothing bad had happened to ming He. Zheng Wai asked ming He to go ashore and assured him that they had him covered. ming He replied, saying that he would. Underwater, ming He easily stopped the punch with his left hand. Moments later, the sand fist started to crumble. Ming-He stayed in the area, seemingly waiting for something. When he saw a wriggling creature that had gotten stuck in the sand, he immediately grabbed it with his left hand. He tightened his grip on the wriggling creature, which had been hit by the sand fist and must have stuck around, thinking that Ming-He wouldn't be able to handle it. Ming-He then swam towards the boat to go ashore. Later that day, by the river, while Ming-He was sealing the wriggling creature in a jar, Zhang Wai told him that they had sent all the skeletal samples Ming-He had collected to the Fu Rong in and that Professor Tang had already started analyzing those samples. ming he intended to take the wriggling creature to Professor Tang so he could immediately analyze what it was. Zhang Wai stared at the jar and said that the creature looked a bit like a worm. ming he guessed that the worm-like creature he had caught was probably related to Wang Jun's death. The creatures were carnivorous, and there were a lot of them in the reservoir. ming he instructed Zhang Wai to block off the reservoir and keep their distance from the water. Zhang Wai agreed. Ming he then asked Zheng Wai if the witness Wang Zhang was already awake, as he wanted to ask him about the whole situation. Zheng Wai told Ming he that Wang Zhang must already be awake and said he would inquire when he got back. Ming he thanked Zheng Wai for his efforts. Zheng Wai said that it's the best they could do for the superhumans who are risking their lives to help them. As soon as Ming he arrived at the Fu Rong Inn, he immediately asked Professor Tang to take a look at the creature he had caught. He told Professor Tang that the creature seemed to be very dependent on water because, on his way back, he saw the creature shrivel up. But once he added some water, it went back to normal. Professor Tang expressed his amazement while inspecting the creature. He thinks that many of his questions and doubts can be resolved through the creature Ming he caught. Ming he wondered if the bags of bones had become unnecessary. Professor Tang said that the bones are still very useful and that they might provide some more information. 
Professor Tang informed Minghe that he doesn't have to wait for him to finish because it'll take some time for him to analyze everything. Minghe said that he'll try to catch all of those creatures in the reservoir and gather more information. Professor Tang told Minghe to do what he needs to do and that he'll just inform him when he's done analyzing the samples. At the same time, ten miles away from Fu Rong Town, in Shanxi Lumber Mill, Xia Na, Liang Dong, Zhang Lai, and Huang Fan were walking around the area to investigate. The people in Fu Rong Town informed their team that Wang Jiangnong, who was working there, hadn't been home for two days already. They were told that Wang Jiangnong likes to drink and often drinks alone in the lumber mill. Zhang Lai thinks that coming there to look for the drunkard old man is not worth their time. Wang Fan agrees with Zhang Lai, they had to walk to go there since there are no roads that lead to the lumber mill. Zhang Lai and Wang Fan both think that they came there for nothing. Xia Na, who was walking in front of them, suddenly stopped. She signaled the people behind her to hush. She looked back and pointed somewhere in front of her. Liang Dong, Zhang Lai, and Wang Fan looked serious, strictly following Xia Na's instructions without raising any questions. Xia Na hid behind a tree, prepared her weapon, and slowly peeked to look at something. From her angle, what she saw was a deer that was innocently drinking water from a puddle. Liang Dong asked Xia Na if there was a beast. Xia Na informed Liang Dong that she had only seen a wild deer, so there was nothing to worry about. Xia Na's actions scared them to death. They were stranded in such a desolate area, and they knew that whatever beast they encountered, they would have to take care of it themselves. They decided to check the building where the trees were being milled. They thought that maybe Wang Jiangnong was just sleeping inside. When they left, the deer turned in their direction. It looked like it was full of hatred. One side of its face and body were missing a layer of flesh, and a shard of glass was stuck in its neck. It was actually the deer that had been hit by their bus when they were on their way to Fu Rong. When Xia Na's group entered the building, the machines hadn't been turned off, so Liang Dong expected Wang Jiangnong to be awake. They went straight to the lounge to see if Wang Jiangnong was inside. Before they could even enter the lounge, Xia Na could already smell a strong scent of alcohol. When Liang Dong, Zhang Lai, and Wang Fan caught the smell, they couldn't help but pinch their noses. They wondered how much alcohol the old drunkard had drunk. Zhang Lei said she couldn't understand why there were a lot of people who liked to drink alcohol. When they entered the lounge, they saw a man lying down on his bed. Wang Jiangnong was facing the wall, so all they could see was his back. Zhang Lai suggested to the group that they should just go back and tell the people that Wang Jiangnong couldn't go home because he was drunk. Huang Fan moved closer to Wang Jiangnong. He shook the old drunkard while asking him to wake up. Zhang Lai couldn't believe that Wang Jiangnong was able to sleep so soundly even though the room smelled so bad. When Wang Jiangnong didn't move, Huang Fan tried even harder to wake him up. After all his efforts, there was still no response from Wang Jiangnong. So Wang Fan decided to turn Wang Jiangnong around. But when he saw that half of Wang Jiangnong's face seemed to have started to rot, he panicked. He quickly moved away and fell on his ass. Wang Jiangnong suddenly woke up. His mouth suddenly distorted, opening so wide that he looked like a beast, and his teeth were abnormally sharp and pointy. Dark fluid was leaking from his mouth. He grabbed Wang Fan's head, pinned him to the ground, and bit his neck. Xia Na was the only one who was able to react immediately. She sent Wang Jiangnong away by kicking him in the face. Liang Dong took the opportunity to help Wang Fan, who was holding his neck desperately, trying to stop the bleeding. Liang Dong hurriedly carried Wang Fan away from the fight. As soon as Wang Jiangnong stood up, he immediately charged at Xia Na. Xia Na used her bow to block Wang Jiangnong's deadly bite. A distance away from the fight, Liang Dong couldn't help but wonder if rabies was the reason why Wang Jiangnong was acting that way. While Wang Jiangnong was biting Xia Na's bow, Xia Na used the chance to land a kick on Wang Jiangnong's body, and her kick sent him away. While Wang Jiangnong was still struggling to regain his balance, Xia Na quickly took an arrow from her quiver and fired a powerful shot at him. The arrow pierced through Wang Jiangnong's head, between his eyebrows, pinning him to the wall behind him. The clueless Zhang Lai asked Xia Na why she killed Wang Jiangnong. Xia Na told Zhang Lai to take a closer look so she would know whether Wang Jiangnong was still a living person or not. When she took a closer look at Wang Jiangnong, she realized that he looked like a zombie. Xia Na told the group that they should leave the area first. Liang Dong informed Xia Na that Huang Fan had passed out. His neck kept bleeding. After all, Wang Jiangnong's bite had severed his vessels. Xia Na wanted to immediately go back to town so Wang Fan could get some treatment. Liang Dong said he would carry Wang Fan and then he asked Zhang Lai to apply pressure to Huang Fan's wound. When they were about to exit the building, they faced another problem. The vengeful deer had entered the building. Xia Na instantly prepared to attack the deer, and when she noticed the shard of glass stuck on the deer's neck, she was dumbfounded. She realized that it might be the deer that their bus had hit when they were on their way to Fu Rong Town. Zhang Lai, who was carrying Liang Dong's bag, applied pressure to Huang Fan's wound while eyeing the deer. Xia Na fired another powerful attack, but the deer effortlessly dodged the arrow by simply moving to the side. 
the deer's speed surprised Xianna. Xianna instructed Liang Dong and Zhang Lai to stay behind her. She intended to deal with the deer by herself. The deer agilely charged at Xianna, changing its direction every other time, seemingly trying to be unpredictable. Xianna's eyes darted around the building as she looked for things that she could use to fight against the agile deer. When she saw a running electric saw, she fired an arrow at the deer and immediately moved away. While running, the deer ducked to dodge the arrow. Xianna took the opportunity to run in front of the electric saw. She got there and managed to cover the electric saw with her body without letting the deer realize her plan. When the deer got close enough to Xianna, it increased its speed. Xianna quickly jumped away, letting the deer charge through the electric saw behind her. The deer couldn't react in time, and its left antler hit the electric saw. But instead of its antlers getting cut, the electric saw got destroyed instead. Witnessing what just happened, both Liang Dong and Zhang Lai broke into a cold sweat. As soon as Xianna regained her balance, she immediately took an arrow and aimed at the deer. She gathered more of her energy in the arrow, making it more powerful. When she released the arrow, it looked impossible to block, with an aura that threatened to pierce through anything that hindered its way. The deer was momentarily shocked by Xianna's attack, then it quickly looked confident. It ducked its head, stood up, and used its antler to parry Xianna's arrow. The deer didn't even budge when the arrow destroyed the floor behind it. To easily handle one of Xianna's powerful attacks, Xianna determined that the deer was definitely a high-level monster. Zhang Lei told Liang Dong that they should move back further. Wang Fan has been bleeding the whole time, but there's nothing they could do because the deer doesn't seem to have the intention of letting them go. Meanwhile, inside the lounge, Wang Jiangnan, who was pinned against a wall, suddenly moved and opened his eyes. Moments later, the arrow was the only thing left on the wall. Wang Jiangnan was gone. At the same time, at Guanyun Reservoir, Minghe and the cops had already started draining the water out of the reservoir. The water level has dropped significantly, but the wriggling creatures were still out of their sight. Minghe doesn't like to take chances, he wants to patiently wait until the reservoir is fully drained. Later that day, the reservoir was completely drained, and townspeople started to gather around the area. The cops used a drone to survey the reservoir, but all they could find were bones. Zheng Wai informed Minghe that they weren't able to locate where the wriggling creatures are hiding. They searched the reservoir, but they couldn't find a trace of it. Minghe wondered if the wriggling creatures had fled upstream. Zhang Wai told Minghe that if that's the case, it'll be too difficult for them to search for it. Minghe said it's fine because when the reservoir dries up, the wriggling creatures' area of activity will be reduced, making it safer for the townspeople. The police officer holding the tablet connected to the drone couldn't help but scream in surprise after seeing the numerous bones in the reservoir. The townspeople were enlightened as to why all their livestock had inexplicably disappeared. Cleaning up all those skeletons would be a lot of work for the police, so Zhang Wai decided to assign someone to guard the place. Lin Hui, Hu Guangyi, and Tang Ning arrived at the reservoir. They came after hearing that Ming He had found something in the water. Tang Ning asked Ming He if the bones were related to the creature they're looking for. Ming He simply said yes. A Fu Rong town resident mentioned that it was getting late, so everyone must be tired. She asked everyone to go to the ancestral hall for dinner because the chief had prepared food to thank them for their hard work. Tang Ning had already had her dinner, so Professor Tang told her to watch over that area for the night. She said that they've already lost so much of their time because of Lin Hui and Hu Guangyi. She asked Ming He to have some rest and leave everything to her. Ming He told Tang Ning that with her guarding that area, the people in the town are much safer. After settling everything they could settle, everyone went to the ancestral hall. While having their dinner, Ming He asked Zheng Wai if Wang Zhang is already awake. Zheng Wai informed Ming He that he heard from his colleagues that Wang Zhang seems to have woken up already. Ming He intends to meet Wang Zhang after his dinner to ask him a few questions. Zheng Wai said he wanted to go with Ming He, but Ming He told him that he's been working all day, so there's no need for him to come along. At night, Wang Zhang was sneaking his way into Zhu Tao's house. He knocked on the door and asked if Zhu Tao's inside. Zhu Tao answered, saying that she's at the back of the house taking a shower. She asked Wang Zhang what's the purpose of his sudden visit. Wang Zhang said that he came just to see her. While he's talking to Zhu Tao, he moved closer to the nearest window and tried to peek inside. While peeking, he told Zhu Tao that Wang Jun left them so abruptly. He got worried that she wouldn't be able to handle things alone, so he wanted to see if he could help her in any way. Zhu Tao smiled. She told Wang Zhang to go inside and sit down first. She said she'll come to him after taking a bath. Moments later, Zhu Tao walked in and approached Wang Zhang. Once again, she asked Wang Zhang why he came to her house late at night. Wang Zhang couldn't help but blush after seeing Zhu Tao. He told Zhu Tao that he heard her screaming on the night Wang Jun was fishing at the reservoir. Zhu Tao said she doesn't know what he's talking about. Wang Zhang didn't pursue the matter. He told Zhu Tao that since they're neighbors, he'll take care of her in Wang Jun's stead. 
Ju Tao asked Wang Zhang to stop talking about it because it scares her, especially since she's living alone in that house. She claimed that she couldn't sleep even if she wanted to. Wang Zhang immediately offered to accompany Zhu Tao in her room so she wouldn't be scared. Zhu Tao told Wang Zhang that doing that kind of thing is very inappropriate. Wang Zhang was quick to comfort Zhu Tao, saying that it's fine because she just needs to pretend that he's Wang Jun. Moments later, the two entered Zhu Tao's room. As soon as they entered the room, Wang Zhang immediately grabbed Zhu Tao's waist. Wang Zhang embraced Zhu Tao and once again told her that he heard her screaming the night before Wang Jun's death. Zhu Tao asked Wang Zhang to stop spouting nonsense. Instead of listening to Zhu Tao's pleas, Wang Zhang whispered in her ear that it would be bad for her if the people in the ancestral hall heard that she was with someone else the night before Wang Jun died. He asked Zhu Tao to stop pretending like she didn't know what he was talking about. He claimed that he couldn't sleep all night after hearing her scream. Wang Zhang told Zhu Tao that it should be fine if they did it since she was fine being with other people. While undressing Zhu Tao, Wang Zhang confessed that he had liked her for a long time. Zhu Tao seemed to have given in to Wang Zhang and asked him not to be impatient. Wang Zhang asked her how he should act so that she would feel comfortable. Zhu Tao told Wang Zhang to lie down and she would go on top. Wang Zhang willingly complied, and after doing so, Zhu Tao asked him to close his eyes. With his eyes closed, Wang Zhang praised how experienced Zhu Tao was. Zhu Tao told him that she liked capturing men to eat. Moments later, Wang Zhang screamed at the top of his lungs. Zhu Tao got up from her bed, picked up her dress, and put it on. After getting dressed, she licked her lips and wondered if Wang Zhang had enjoyed it. She sat on a chair and appreciated how beautifully Wang Zhang screamed. Meanwhile, Ming He was on his way to Wang Zhang's house when he passed by a restaurant. He was shocked when he saw what was written on the signboard. He approached an old man sitting in front of the restaurant and asked who owned it and who Miss Tao was. The old man told Ming He that Miss Tao was Zhu Tao, Wang Jun's wife. He mentioned that Zhu Tao was quite capable and cooked very well. Everyone in Fu Rong Town loved the food she made. That's why she had opened a restaurant there, attracting people from other towns. Ming He was dumbfounded upon hearing that Zhu Tao cooked well. The old man also informed him that Wang Jun took Zhu Tao for granted. While Wang Jun went fishing all day, Zhu Tao was busy with chores and making money. However, recently Zhu Tao had been staying home more often, and the restaurant wasn't open as frequently. When it was open, the dishes were unpalatable, as one of the guests had complained. Ming He asked the old man when this had happened and how frequently Zhu Tao used to open the restaurant in the past. The old man told him that the incident had occurred 10 days ago and that Zhu Tao used to open the restaurant regularly, even on New Year's Eve. The old man added that he had never seen Zhu Tao take a day off. Realizing that the old man seemed knowledgeable about what was happening in Fu Rong Town, Ming He took the opportunity to ask if anything strange had been occurring recently. The old man informed him that there was a one-eyed man in the forest who wasted a lot of money by not picking fresh fruits. The girl at the clothing shop in front always gave the wrong change, and the old gamblers would still play cards outside, even in the snow. The old man concluded by grumbling about his own bad luck in gambling. Ming He felt awkward. He thought that what the old man told him was unrelated to his investigation. Before leaving, Ming He told the old man that he would let him continue cooling off there. When Ming He arrived at Wang Zhang's house, he couldn't find him. He wondered where Wang Zhang had gone when he was supposed to be delirious and recuperating at home. Ming He remembered that Zhu Tao's house was nearby, so he decided to ask her. Ming He entered Zhu Tao's courtyard and looked for her. Zhu Tao came out of her house, leaned on the door, and asked Ming He why he was looking for her. Ming He told Zhu Tao that he just wanted to ask her if she knew where Wang Zhang was because he wanted to ask Wang Zhang some questions. Zhu Tao informed Ming He that Wang Zhang was in her house. Ming He was confused about how Wang Zhang ended up in Zhu Tao's house. Zhu Tao told Ming He that Wang Zhang was scared to be alone and couldn't sleep, so he came to her house. Zhu Tao explained that Wang Jun and Wang Zhang were like brothers, and Wang Zhang used to come there to eat and sleep all the time. Ming He said he understood and asked Zhu Tao if she could wake up Wang Zhang for him. Zhu Tao said she was still cooking some meat, so she needed to take care of it, or else the whole pot would be burnt. She informed Ming He that Wang Zhang was in the back room and he could wake him up himself. Ming He agreed. When he was about to enter Zhu Tao's house, Zhu Tao invited him to eat since she couldn't finish a whole pot of meat by herself. Ming He immediately told Zhu Tao that he had already had dinner with everyone else at the ancestral hall. Zhu Tao claimed that the big pot of rice at the ancestral hall couldn't compare to her craftsmanship. Once again, she asked Ming He to try a little bit. Ming He reluctantly agreed and said he would go take a look at Wang Zhang first. Ming He entered the house while Zhu Tao went to the kitchen. She picked up a butcher knife, lifted it abnormally high, and menacingly chopped something. Ming He opened the door of the back room and saw Wang Zhang sleeping, covered with a blanket. He immediately called out to Wang Zhang and introduced himself. 
but Wang Zhang remained lying on the bed, not moving an inch. Ming He moved closer to Wang Zhang and told him that he wanted to ask him some questions. Still, Wang Zhang didn't reply, so Ming He became curious. Ming He was about to uncover Wang Zhang when a hand with long nails grabbed his hand. After seizing Ming He, the zombie-looking Wang Zhang smiled, revealing his sharp fangs. Although shocked and confused, Ming He quickly stepped back and broke free from Wang Zhang's grip. After gaining some distance, he asked Wang Zhang what he was. Wang Zhang leisurely sat on the bed, and wriggling tentacles started to emerge from his mouth. He told Ming He that they had already met at the reservoir. Ming He asked Wang Zhang if he was the beast that was in the water. Upon being called a beast, Wang Zhang got so angry that he destroyed the bed with a punch. Wang Zhang claimed that they were higher beings, and in front of them, humans were the beasts. Zhu Tao entered the room carrying a pot of food. She reminded Ming He about their agreement that he would eat first before leaving. Ming He became even more cautious, moved to the side, and asked Wang Zhang and Zhu Tao what kind of creatures they were. Zhu Tao claimed that they were human beings, just like Ming He. Ming He secretly took out his mutated crystal while telling Zhu Tao that she made him sick. He then called her a blood-sucking beast. Zhu Tao seemed not to care, she just told Ming He that he could think whatever he wanted. Wang Zhang asked Zhu Tao to let him eat Ming He's guts first, and he promised her that she could have all of Ming He's meat and bones. Zhu Tao told Wang Zhang not to be anxious and assured him that Ming He was already on her chopping block. She happened to have some questions for Ming He. Zhu Tao placed the food she cooked on a table, assuring Ming He that it was just a chicken stew, not human meat. When Ming He saw what was inside the bowl, he decided not to taste it, no matter what. It looked like the chicken had been boiled to death. The craftsmanship Zhu Tao claimed was nowhere to be seen. Zhu Tao asked Ming He what he thought about the food she served him and Zhang Wai. Ming He didn't say a word, he looked serious. Remembering how Zhu Tao's food tasted made him break into a cold sweat. Zhu Tao claimed to have perfected being the real Zhu Tao. She said that even if the real Zhu Tao's closest acquaintances talked to her, she could handle everything perfectly and no one would ever doubt her. However, there was something she was very dissatisfied with, so she wanted to ask Ming He something. Ming He asked Zhu Tao what she wanted to know. He exclaimed when Zhu Tao suddenly dipped her fingers in the chicken stew. Zhu Tao asked Ming He why the cooking skills of humans are so different and complicated. Ming He was startled. He didn't think that Zhu Tao would ask about cooking skills. Zhu Tao licked the fingers she dipped in the chicken stew. She said that the taste was not right. It tasted entirely different from what Zhu Tao used to cook. She followed the recipe, but she still couldn't get the taste right. She copied, studied, and practiced so earnestly, also she could open the restaurant. The results were not what she wanted, and it annoyed her, so she broke the precept. She killed the guest and threw him in the reservoir. Ming He asked her why she was talking about breaking the precept when they were supposed to be born to kill. Zhu Tao told Ming He that he was right, but before she fully understood the various behaviors of human nature, she would rather not expose herself. Ming He told Zhu Tao that she was a savage beast, so no matter how much she tried to imitate humans, it was impossible for her to become a real person. Zhu Tao left. She told Ming He that humans to scale the fish and throw it in a pan full of hot oil while it's still alive, just to make sure that the meat is tender and delicious. They feed the cattle and sheep until they get fat, then pick a nice day to slaughter them. She asked Ming He if humans realized that those animals viewed them as family. Even wild flowers and plants that can neither be eaten nor used eventually get picked, cut, and trampled by humans. Zhu Tao speculates that the reason why she couldn't cook food that humans consider delicious is because she's kinder than humans. She kills living things without fooling around and mistreating them. Ming He showed a disdainful smile. He asked Zhu Tao why she was pretending to be virtuous despite leaving all those bones in the reservoir. Ming He said that even if those were just a pile of twisted and rotten bones, it still showed the fear they encountered while they were alive. Humans aren't perfect, there's good and evil. He told Sang Zhang and Zhu Tao that they looked like humans, but deep inside, they were only parasites. Ming He said that he could honestly say that they had never done a single thing that could be considered true, kind, or beautiful. But they had fully learned about the evil that resides in humans, which strongly suggests that there's no need for any instruction and no need for environmental influences. Ming He told Wang Zhang and Zhu Tao that they would naturally be evil their whole lives. Wang Zhang changed his mind. He said that instead of eating Ming He's guts, they should cut his tongue first and eat it with Zhu Tao's chicken soup. Tentacles came out of Zhu Tao's hand and arm. She said she wanted to make a dish called boiled live fish, but she would boil Ming He instead of a fish. The tentacles that came out of Wang Zhang's mouth spiraled towards Ming He. Ming He ducked to dodge the tentacles, they passed above him and cracked the part of the wall they had hit. Seeing that his surprise attack failed, Wang Zhang retracted the tentacles. Wang Zhang praised Ming He for being agile. Then his forehead suddenly cracked open, and tentacles slowly emerged from the gap between his eyebrows. Wang Zhang's head was replaced with tentacles, and he was confident that Ming He would no longer be able to dodge. Seeing that Wang Zhang had gotten serious, Ming He clenched his right fist. 
the mutated crystal that he was secretly holding broke. Minghi's right fist immediately absorbed the mutated crystal's essence. Zhu Tao exclaimed when she noticed that Minghi's arm was slowly getting covered with ice. Wang Zhang leaned back and swung forward, sending his tentacles towards Minghi. Minghi swung his right arm in front of him to block Wang Zhang's tentacles and then transitioned it into a punch. Zhu Tao sent her tentacles towards Minghi, and when she noticed the increase in Minghi's soul power, she quickly warned Wang Zhang to be careful. The essence of the crystal started to gather at Minghi's fist as he prepared to use his ultimate violet soul art, Hail Fist. As soon as he punched forward, numerous gigantic ice fists formed and fell from the sky. The fists rained down on Zhu Tao's house. Zhu Tao looked up to see the roof of her house get destroyed by the Hail Fists. Wang Zhang wasn't able to react fast enough, he immediately got hit by the Hail Fists. More Hail Fists fell towards Wang Zhang's location. He was defenseless and couldn't move away, so he didn't have a choice but to take the Hail Fists head on. Zhu Tao couldn't help but look back, she got worried about Wang Zhang. That moment of distraction caused her to get bombarded with Hail Fists too. When the Hail Fists stopped, everything around Minghi froze in place. Zhu Tao got contained inside a pillar of ice. The remaining essence of the mutated crystal slowly dissipated from Minghi's right arm. Suddenly, the goddess told Minghi to quickly run away. She informed Minghi that his ultimate soul art wasn't able to kill Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang. Minghi paid heed to the goddess' advice and ran away without asking any questions. The goddess manifested beside Minghi and said that the punch Minghi unleashed with the ice crystals, combined with his soul power, is powerful enough to harm a lord rank being. She told Minghi that Zhu Tao is probably a lord rank calamity beast. Minghi's instincts were right. He most likely wouldn't have been able to survive if he hadn't used the frost crystal first. While running, Minghi asked the goddess what species Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang are and why they're almost indistinguishable from the humans they took over. The goddess admitted that she doesn't know either. She informed Minghi that all intelligent species have the ability to evolve. They evolve and adapt according to their environment, which is very similar to humans' natural selection. The only difference is that their evolution process doesn't require thousands or even tens of thousands of years. It only takes them a few months, or even shorter. Mingyi thinks it's too unfair. In other stories, the enemies behave like animals, but his enemies all have high IQ and evolutionary abilities. He wondered how they reached that level. The goddess told Minghi that the stories he knew were all created by human arrogance, and that he should be glad that they haven't been on Earth for too long, so they're still in their primary forms. Otherwise, humans would probably have been extinct already. Minghi realized that Professor Tang Hang's analysis is correct. The goddess reminded Minghi that his attack just temporarily restricted Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang's movement. They'll definitely find a way out soon, so he better focus on thinking about how to escape the situation he's in. Ming he realized that he was too arrogant. He couldn't handle Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang, but he didn't call for reinforcements. Ming he said that his four seniors from the student council might have greatly helped him. The goddess agreed. She thinks that Tang Ming is capable enough to take on Zhu Tao. Meanwhile, in Fu Rong In, Professor Tang Hang slapped his desk. He was done inspecting the wriggling creature Ming he sent. He got too excited after finally finding the answers to his questions. Professor Tang seems to have felt that the wriggling creature's subject had started to hurt people again. He carefully placed the wriggling creatures in a cabinet for safekeeping. After closing the cabinet, he immediately called Minghi. When the call connected, he asked Minghi where he was. Minghi informed Professor Tang Hang that he was running wildly in the field near Wang Jun and Wang Zhang's house. Professor Tang told Minghi that he shouldn't rush to find Wang Jun's wife and Wang Zhang. Professor Tang said that, according to his analysis, there's a very high possibility that those two have been parasitized. They thought that there was something hiding in the reservoir or in Fu Rong town, when, in fact, the beast they were looking for possessed parasitic properties similar to those of guinea worms and iron worms. It would go through five stages, dormant, parasitic, trogocytosis, phagocytosis, and assimilation. Minghi sarcastically thanked Professor Tang. He said that the warning would have been more helpful if Professor Tang had told him about it half an hour ago. Professor Tang noticed that Minghi was out of breath. He thought it was caused by the information he had given him, so to sympathize, he told Minghi that he himself hadn't thought that would be the case either. Minghi told Professor Tang that he had just left Wang Jun's house and that he was running for his life. He asked Professor Tang to help him contact the Hunters Association. He confirmed that both Wang Zhang and Zhu Tao had been parasitized by the beast. Minghi pointed out that it was extremely dangerous because Zhu Tao might be a lord rank parasitic beast. Professor Tang stuttered when he told Mingyi that he would contact the Hunters Association. When Mingyi didn't respond, Professor Tang panicked. He loudly asked Mingyi why he wasn't responding. On Mingyi's end, he was asking Professor Tang to gather the members of the student council when their call got cut. 
When Professor Tang looked at his phone, he saw that his phone had no service. He wondered why there was no signal in his location. Ming he couldn't help but curse when he realized that there was no signal. He was certain that it was not a mere coincidence. The goddess said that Zhu Tao dared to expose herself. That probably means she has countermeasures, such as destroying the cell towers. She wouldn't let them spread the information they have on her. Ming he remembered that the only cell tower Fu Rong Town has is the one near the lumber mill. The goddess wondered if Ming He's classmates who went to the lumber mill noticed what happened to the cell tower. Meanwhile, in the lumber mill, Xia Na, Liang Dong, and Zhang Lai were running away. Huang Fan was nowhere to be seen. Liang Dong was complaining that the head is supposed to be a zombie's weak spot when Xia Na suddenly stopped running. The broken cell tower was in front of them, and near it was a parasitized man holding an axe. The parasitized man noticed Zhang Lai, Liang Dong, and Xia Na's arrival. Xia Na tried to warn the parasitized man not to come anywhere near them. Behind Liang Dong, Zhang Lai kept shaking. Another foe had appeared before them, she had had enough of it already. Zhang Lai couldn't take it anymore. She cried and screamed at the top of her lungs. Moments before they got out of the lumber mill, when Wang Jiangnang broke free from Xia Na's arrow, he sluggishly walked towards Liang Dong. The deer charged at Xia Na, then Xia Na backflipped to dodge the charge. She baited the deer to go straight into a pile of lumber. Liang Dong said that it should be able to temporarily trap the deer. On Liang Dong's back, Huang Fan struggled to open his eyes. When he came to, the first thing he saw was Wang Jiangnong. He saw Wang Jiangnong bend his knees, seemingly preparing to leap at them. Huang Fan's eyes widened in horror, he tried to scream and warn the others, but nothing came out of his mouth. When Wang Jiangnong was already near them, Huang Fan had a determined look in his eyes. He pushed Liang Dong and let himself fall towards Wang Jiangnong. He used his own body to stop Wang Jiangnong's attack. When Liang Dong saw Wang Jiangnong, he was confused about how Wang Jiangnong was still able to move after getting punctured in the head. As soon as Wang Jiangnong regained his balance, he moved toward the defenseless Huang Fan. Wang Jiangnong opened his mouth, revealing his sharp teeth. Huang Fan didn't have a choice but to bravely face what was about to happen to him. Wang Jiangnong held Huang Fan's right arm while biting his neck. Liang Dong called out to Huang Fan, wanting to go and try to save him. But Xia Na stopped him from going, pointing out to Liang Dong that Huang Fan wouldn't be able to survive. All they could do was watch Huang Fan get dragged by Wang Jiangnong back to the lounge. Zhang Lai started to show signs of a mental breakdown. To wake her up from her despair, Xia Na told her that she would die if she didn't start running. Xia Na took the lead, followed by Liang Dong and Zhang Lai. They didn't get far when the deer was finally able to force its way out of the pile of lumber. Liang Dong and Zhang Lai protected themselves from the small pieces of lumber that were sent flying. The deer immediately looked for Xia Na's group. Xia Na only had two more arrows to use. She took out a special kind of arrow and aimed it at the deer. She ordered Liang Dong and Zhang Lai to keep running. Xia Na released the string of her bow, firing the special arrow at the deer. When the arrow got closer to the deer, it spread out, releasing some kind of wide cloth. The deer was caught off guard and got trapped inside Xia Na's special tool. The three quickly ran for their lives. They ran for a while before they came across the parasitized man who was holding an axe. Zhang Lai despaired. She was only a freshman but was already experiencing a life and death situation. Xia Na couldn't help but curse when she realized that she had already run out of arrows. The parasitized man slowly lifted the axe he was holding. Xia Na noticed that the man didn't seem to be as agile as the deer. She thought that maybe she would be able to defeat the parasitized man. The man swung his axe vertically towards Xia Na. Xia Na sidestepped to dodge the axe, but the ground burst when the axe landed. Xia Na sustained some injuries before she was able to bounce back. Liang Dong immediately checked if Xia Na was alright. Xia Na said that the man wasn't fast but surprisingly powerful. Her quiver was empty, and she was afraid that she wouldn't be able to fight against the parasitized man. Their situation got even more complicated as the mutant deer would break free soon, and Wang Jiangnong was also a threat. Since the cell tower got destroyed, they couldn't seek help. They had to do things on their own. Xia Na and Liang Dong looked at the cowering Zhang Lai. Considering Xia Na's injuries, Liang Dong told her that he would draw the parasitized man's attention so she could take Zhang Lai back to town first. Xia Na disagreed, she wanted to be the one to deal with the parasitized man, and Liang Dong would take Zhang Lai away. But Liang Dong insisted. While rummaging through his bag, he assured Xia Na that he was flexible despite his size. Liang Dong took out a boomerang and told Xia Na that they were out of time, so they shouldn't talk too much. He wanted to show Xia Na how awesome he was. With all his might, Liang Dong threw the boomerang towards the parasitized man. With great momentum, the boomerang quickly got closer to the parasitized man. The parasitized man was too slow to react and dodged the boomerang. When the boomerang connected with its stomach, it got knocked away, causing it to smash into the huge rock behind it. After hitting the parasitized man, the boomerang curved and returned to Liang Dong's grasp. 
Liang Dong proved to Xianna that he wasn't a weakling. Xianna couldn't help but be cheerful after seeing what Liang Dong could do. In the midst of their desperate situation, she saw a glimmer of hope. But when Xianna heard a familiar noise, frustration leaked out of her expression. Liang Dong told Xianna that he would lead the parasitized beings to the valley and asked her to run away with Zhang Lai. Xianna realized that it was the best choice they could make. Before running away with Zhang Lai, she told Liang Dong to be careful. The parasitized man got up and roared at the top of its lungs. Liang Dong's attack seemed to have enraged it. He had a bitter smile after seeing that his attack didn't do much damage to the parasitized man. Once again, he threw the boomerang towards the parasitized man. But this time, the parasitized man was prepared. It opened its arms and embraced the boomerang. Although it got pushed back, it was able to hold on to the boomerang. Liang Dong was shocked. He didn't expect that the parasitized man could do that. He didn't have a choice but to abandon his weapon and run away. Suddenly, something leaped over the parasitized man. The parasitized deer appeared and chased after Liang Dong. He desperately ran towards the valley. When he arrived at the edge of the cliff, although he had already planned it, he still couldn't help but curse. Crossing the valley seemed impossible, but Liang Dong didn't stop. He jumped off the cliff while taking a small boomerang out of his bag. While in midair, Liang Dong quickly attached a rope to the small boomerang. After securing the rope to the boomerang, Liang Dong swung his left hand. With all his might, he threw the boomerang towards a tree. Behind Liang Dong, the parasitized deer barely managed to stop itself from falling into the cliff. Liang Dong's boomerang circled around a branch, wrapping the rope around it. The parasitized deer could do nothing but watch as Liang Dong swung his way to the other side of the valley. Liang Dong safely landed on the ground without injuring himself. He even had the luxury of turning around and mocking the parasitized deer, challenging it to come to his side. Seemingly frustrated, the parasitized deer roared loudly. Meanwhile, Minghe was running in the bright but deserted streets of Fu Rong Town. When he noticed that the electrical power had been cut off, an old man with a dangerous aura suddenly appeared in front of Minghe. Minghe immediately stopped running and clenched his hand into a fist. After taking a careful look, he realized that it was actually the old man he had met at Zhu Tao's restaurant. The old man asked Minghe why he was in such a hurry. Minghe asked the old man to quickly tell his neighbors to hide in a safe place as soon as possible. The old man asked Minghe what they were hiding from. Minghe then informed the old man that everyone was eating at the ancestral hall. They had a tradition in their town that no matter what happened, all of them would gather for a banquet on Wednesdays. So most of the Fu Rong townspeople were in the ancestral hall. Minghe informed the old man that there was a beast in their town and asked if their town had a shelter. The old man told Minghe that there was a big underground air raid shelter behind the ancestral hall. Minghe respectfully asked the old man if he could go there and instruct the townspeople to hide in the shelter. However, he realized that the old man's legs were not in good shape, so he decided to run over there on his own. The old man said that although his legs were not in good condition, he could still drive. He then pointed at a nearby vehicle, saying that it was his car. Minghe said that it would help them a lot. He then told the old man that he needed to drive fast because it was an urgent matter. The old man quickly sat in the driver's seat and bragged that when he was younger, he was the perfect messenger. The old man drove away, leaving dust behind. Minghe was amazed by the old man's character. Moments later, while Minghe was walking in the street, he heard a noise coming from one of the buildings. When Minghe opened the door, he saw a woman eating something alone in the dark. Minghe wondered why the woman didn't go to the ancestral hall to eat. Minghe walked inside the building and told the woman that Fu Rong Town wasn't safe, so she needed to come with him. As Minghe got closer, he was shocked by what he saw. The woman was actually eating an unprocessed chicken while repeatedly saying that she was very hungry. Minghe backed off and told the woman to enjoy her meal and that he wouldn't bother her. The woman said that it was already her fifth time, but she wasn't full yet. When the woman turned to look at Minghe, it was revealed that her features looked the same as those who were parasitized. She told Minghe that his scent was very fragrant and that it thought it would only be full after eating him. The parasitized woman leaped towards Minghe, saying that it needed to eat him. It tried to claw at Minghe, but he was able to narrowly dodge. Minghe was astonished. He didn't expect the woman to be as fast as a cheetah. He quickly pounced back, but his back hit the doors. Luckily, the doors detached from the frame, so he was able to successfully get out of the building. Minghe slid backwards and struggled to regain his balance, falling on his knees. When he looked up, he was dumbfounded. The parasitized woman was crawling on the ceiling, still repeatedly saying how hungry it was. The goddess warned Minghe not to stay in that area because there were more than one of those things around. Sure enough, two men holding sickles appeared on both of Minghe's sides. The parasitized man on his right side had an eye patch on his left eye. Minghe observed the two men and wondered if both of them were also infected by the parasites. The goddess urged Minghe to leave, informing him that the female parasite was already on her way. 
She advised him not to waste his time on the parasitized townspeople. From the ceiling, the parasitized woman leapt towards Ming He and once again tried to claw at him. When the parasitized woman got closer, Ming He stepped on her back and immediately jumped onto a building's roof. The two men, holding sickles, chased after Ming He. Suddenly, Ming He heard a loud sound, as if something had broken. Then, a loud cry followed. The goddess gritted her teeth and informed Ming He that Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang had broken free from his ice. Ming He couldn't believe it. A punch that cost him 300,000 yuan had only given him a short amount of time to flee. The goddess explained that the cry they had heard sounded like an ability that many of the beasts have, an ability used to call something. Ming He asked the goddess what the cry was trying to call. The goddess told Ming He that he wouldn't like what she was going to say. She revealed that quite a few people in Fu Rong town had been devoured by the parasitic beasts. While they were conversing, the men holding sickles had already caught up with Ming He. They appeared on both sides of him and immediately slashed their sickles toward him. Before Ming He could deal with the men holding sickles, another parasitized man, holding a saw, appeared. The one-eyed parasitized man threatened to chop off Ming He's head. Ming He kicked the handle of the one-eyed parasitized man's sickle. The one-eyed parasitized man growled at Ming He while holding the handle, which was the only thing left of his sickle. Seeing that the one-eyed parasitized man was distracted, Ming He took the opportunity to punch him in the chest. The one-eyed parasitized man smashed into a wall after being thrown away by Ming He's punch. But even after all that, the parasitized men still stood up as if nothing had happened. Ming He couldn't believe that they hadn't died from his attack. The parasitized man, holding a saw, got closer to Ming He. Ming He quickly bent backward to evade the parasitized man's horizontal slash. However, before he could stand up, the parasitized man immediately followed up with a vertical slash. The parasitized man grinned as he swung the saw with all his might. The saw had already hit the roof, but a drop of Ming He's blood was nowhere to be seen. It turned out that the saw had only hit the gap between Ming He's legs. Out of frustration, the parasitized man gritted his teeth and swung the saw towards Ming He. In order to avoid being cut in half, Ming He desperately crawled backward. He raised his legs and backflipped to gain some distance from the parasitized man. As soon as he landed on the roof, he immediately dashed towards the parasitized man with his left hand stretched out. The parasitized man swung his saw, but Ming He narrowly evaded it. Ming He then used his right fist to punch the parasitized man's face. Ming He's punch removed some of the parasitized man's teeth. The parasitized man smashed through the roof and fell heavily to the ground. Ming He moved closer to the hole and looked at the parasitized man, feeling contemptuous of him for daring to use his saw on him. He stood there for some time to see if the parasitized man was dead or alive. However, he was so focused that he didn't notice that the parasitized woman was already crawling behind him. The parasitized woman opened her mouth to bite Ming He's neck. As soon as Ming He noticed that something was behind him, he immediately looked back. He exclaimed when he saw a tongue sticking out of an open mouth getting closer to his neck. Ming He swung his right arm backward and quickly raised his right shoulder. The parasitized woman was able to latch herself onto Ming He, but her tongue got cut after Ming He shut her mouth by hitting her chin with his shoulder. Tears flowed from the parasitized woman's eyes as blood spurted out of her mouth. The parasitized woman let go of Ming He to cover her mouth. She fell on her back and then rolled around in pain. Moments later, the parasitized woman released some steam and stopped moving. Ming He wondered if she was dead. When he confirmed that the parasitized woman was indeed dead, he pondered why she died. Ming He didn't do much to kill the parasitized woman, she only lost her tongue. As soon as he saw and thought about the tongue, he realized something. Suddenly, the goddess screamed at Ming He, demanding that he think about it later because he needs to get out of there first. Ming He came back to his senses and immediately ran and jumped from one roof to another. Meanwhile, in the ancestral hall, Fang Nianrong and Professor Tang led the evacuation of the Fu Rong townspeople. The elder was telling the townspeople to quickly enter the shelter when a woman suddenly asked what was happening. People started to gather around the elder, seemingly looking for an answer. The elder informed the townspeople that there were beasts in their town. The woman moved closer to the elder and told everyone that she had heard a lot of terrible screams. She then urged the elder to close the stone gate so the beasts wouldn't be able to enter. When the townspeople around the elder expressed their support for the woman's idea, the elder said that they shouldn't close the stone gate yet because there were still some people outside. He then ordered the woman to move inside the shelter. Outside the ancestral hall, Ming He jumped down in front of the ancestral hall's front door. Fang Nianrong, Professor Tang, a police officer, and a few more townspeople were the only people outside the shelter. When Professor Tang saw Ming He, he waved at him and urged him to quickly enter the shelter. Before entering the shelter, Ming He informed Professor Tang that it's not just Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang who were taken over by parasites. He told Professor Tang that on his way there, many townspeople attacked him. Ming He pointed out that they were all fine before, but they suddenly changed at some point. 
Professor Tang told Mingyi that the parasites they're facing have some latency. They need to fully take over the host's organs to be able to completely dominate the host. Minghe wanted to say something but didn't continue. Instead, he asked Professor Tang if someone in the ancestral hall had been taken over by a parasite. Fang Nianrong and the old man he met at the restaurant overheard their conversation. Minghe informed Professor Tang that the parasites are capable of imitating human speech and behavior. Without careful inspection, it's difficult to determine who's been taken over. The old man joined the conversation and told Minghe that the people there are probably all normal, and that most of the monsters are outside. Minghe asked him how he could say so. The old man said that the parasites are like foxes who've only learned halfway about human behavior. They behave weirdly, so they're afraid to appear in crowded spaces. Now that so many people in their town had passed, there's bound to be a feast during the first three nights. It is one of their dark old customs. Their elders used to say that for the first three nights, the dead will come back to visit everyone. Everyone has to pretend as if nothing happened and quietly go to the ancestral hall. Everyone eats up the feast, it is the only way the souls of the dead will leave in peace. Professor Tang realized that what the old man is trying to say is that those who have been taken over by parasites don't know about the custom, so they didn't come to the ancestral hall for dinner. The old man said that he didn't have a choice but to stand guard all night because people didn't believe him when he told them that strange things were happening in the town. Professor Tang asked Mingyi if the mutants he met were all the same. Ming he told Professor Tang that except for Zhu Tao and Wang Zheng, the other beasts are weaker and have lower IQ. Professor Tang said that it matches up with what he studied. He shared with Ming He that the parasites can be split into the first and second generation. He said that they can think of Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang as the first generation because their strength is so powerful that they're able to perfectly imitate humans' language, knowledge, and habits. Ming He remembered that Zhu Tao had appeared at the ancestral hall and invited him and Zheng Wei to her house for dinner. Professor Tang was able to confirm that the first generation had reached the point where they could integrate themselves into the community. The second generation was more like zombies seen in movies, primitive, brutal, and not fully evolved. Professor Tang said that based on the data he had collected and analyzed before, there should be three first-generation parasites. As for the second generation, Professor Tang believed there should be 30 of them. Ming Yi still had questions for Professor Tang, but the professor stopped the conversation, saying that they could discuss it later. Since it had been confirmed that the second generation of parasites were not among the townspeople, the only thing they could do to protect the rest of the townspeople was to close the shelter and wait for support. The second generation parasites were roaming the entire town, extremely hungry and willing to eat whatever they saw. Professor Tang said that they should start going inside the shelter as well. But before they could enter, Fang Nianrong felt that something was not right. She said that there weren't any second generation parasites among the people in the ancestral hall, but that didn't mean there weren't any first generation ones. Fang Nianrong reminded Professor Tang that he himself had said there were three first generation parasites. They knew that Zhu Tao and Wang Zhang were first generation parasites, but the identity of the third one remained unknown. Fang Nianrong speculated that perhaps the third first-generation parasite was among the townspeople inside the shelter. Suddenly, second-generation parasites started to enter the ancestral hall. They immediately charged towards Fang Nianrong the moment they laid eyes on her. Professor Tang grabbed Fang Nianrong's right arm and pulled down the switch to close the stone wall. As the stone wall started to close, Professor Tang pulled Fang Nianrong towards the shelter. While pulling Fang Nianrong towards the shelter, he told her that she was right but they didn't have a choice. The stone wall was closing halfway, but some of the second generation parasites were already near the shelter's entrance. In order to enter, the one-eyed parasitized man dove towards the shelter. His head had just entered the shelter when the stone wall completely closed. Minghi, Fang Nianrong, Professor Tang, and the townspeople watched as the one-eyed parasitized man's head was severed by the stone wall. The elders and townspeople's eyes widened. They were confused about what had just happened. But the elder quickly realized that it was the beast hiding in their town and that they were hiding among the townspeople. Outside the shelter, it could be seen that more second-generation parasites had arrived at the ancestral hall. With the stone wall successfully closed, the immediate external threat had been temporarily resolved. However, they still had to remain cautious about potential dangers within the shelter. Minghi, Professor Tang, and Fang Nianrong gazed at the townspeople, who were still in shock. Everything had happened suddenly, causing the townspeople's emotions to be in disarray. Most of them couldn't help but cry. Moments after the stone wall closed, the alarm system in Fu Rong Town sounded. Somewhere outside Fu Rong Town, Lu Feng, the senior eagle sniper of the fourth group, heard the alarm. He then informed his groupmates, a woman and a man, that Fu Rong Town was facing a level 7 disaster. The man stated that resolving a level 7 disaster required the presence of a superhuman of heavenly flare rank. 
The woman asked Liu Feng what they should do. Liu Feng told them that they would meet up with their other group members, evacuate immediately, and seek external support. The man questioned Liu Feng's plan, as he believed it was wrong since Tang Ning and Ming He's group were still in Fu Rong town. Liu Feng pointed out that the purpose of the alarm was to alert them, not to prompt them to go back and die. His words silenced the man and the woman. They hadn't expected Liu Feng to be that cold-hearted. Meanwhile, in Fu Rong town, the second-generation parasites were irritated by the noise from the alarm. A man and a woman landed on top of a roof, after which the man jumped towards the public address system and smashed it to pieces. The man was actually Wang Zheng. He was relieved that he finally got the silence he wanted. He mentioned that his head was about to explode from all the noise. Zhu Tao informed Wang Zhang that most of the townspeople had already hidden underground. Wang Zhang cursed, wondering if the townspeople would get hungry soon. Zhu Tao smirked, thinking that the townspeople were holding on to false hope believing they would be safe by hiding. Wang Zhang asked Zhu Tao if she had made any arrangements. Zhu Tao reminded Wang Zhang that they had another partner. Finally, Wang Zhang remembered that back then, it was just the three of them who came to that place, which they saw as strange and dirty. When they encountered a cockroach, they would stay away from it. But they had come a long way, and they already had many descendants. Wang Zhang stated that humans always talked about family and clans as if they were superior, but they never considered how inferior their reproductive methods were. Wang Zhang believed that compared to them, humans were like cockroaches, maggots, and rats. Wang Zhang raised his left hand and declared that they were the superior species. As if to show their agreement with Wang Zhang's statement, the second-generation parasites roared and raised their hands as well. Zhu Tao told Wang Zhang that there's no point in making such a distinction. She said that the people of Fu Rong Town have helped them a great deal. Zhu Tao thinks that the townspeople can be called their placenta. Wang Zhang repeated the word placenta. Then the second-generation parasites also repeated the word placenta. Later that night, the waning crescent moon could be seen dominating the sky. Inside the shelter, most of the Fu Rong townspeople had already recovered from their initial shock. They believed that Minghi would find a way out of their predicament, that everything would be alright. Professor Tang gave Minghi a paper, telling him to take a look at it. While receiving the paper, Minghi wondered what was on it. Professor Tang told Minghi that they were the dandelion seeds he collected from the reservoir. Minghi asked Professor Tang how those dandelion seeds were related to the parasites. Professor Tang told Minghi that those weren't real dandelions but a clever disguise that the parasites use. Dandelions spread their seeds with the wind. That method of reproduction is imitated by the parasite. So it has evolved into a dandelion parasite species. The parasitic spores spread to some people and animals, forming a stronger and more terrifying parasitic beast. Minghi wondered if Wang Jun, who often went fishing, had died because of it. Professor Tang told Minghi that Wang Jun probably carried the first generation of parasitic spores. The first generation spores got to his wife, Zhu Tao, through his body. In the end, the parasite devoured Zhu Tao and replaced her, and Wang Jun is also Zhu Tao's pullet. Professor Tang thinks that one of the reasons why Wang Jun would go fishing every night is to dispose of the corpses that were consumed by Zhu Tao. Another reason is to feed Zhu Tao's other companions. Minghi immediately thought that the other two first-generation parasites were actually raised by Zhu Tao. Professor Tang showed Minghi a rectangular container containing the wriggling creature he caught in the reservoir. He told Minghi that one of the first-generation parasites is the wriggling creature contained in the rectangular container. Minghi was shocked. Professor Tang explained that it's just a small piece and that the rest of the parasite's body should be in Wang Zhang. Remembering his encounter with Wang Zhang, Minghi noticed that Wang Zhang was very irritable. Professor Tang told Minghi that he had created codenames for the first-generation parasites. The dandelion parasite is the queen, and the sea anemone parasite is the tyrant. Minghi took note of the codenames. Professor Tang told Minghi that the reason why he came there to collect samples and investigate was that the hunters had collected a very strange sample. It was a sample from the third first-generation parasite, which he referred to as Ghost. Professor Tang said that the ghost was actually the first to enter Fu Rong town, acting as the pioneer of the parasitic species. After familiarizing itself with the surroundings, it led the queen and tyrant to the town. Mingyi asked Professor Tang if he was saying that the final first-generation parasite, Ghost, was hiding among their group. Professor Tang told Mingyi that Ghost was the first one to evolve, and he was already well aware of human habits, so it was possible that he already knew about Fu Rong Town's customs. Mingyi pondered how they could find Ghost in such a large group without having enough information. Professor Tang asked Mingyi if he had noticed something while fighting the second-generation parasites. Mingyi suddenly remembered his suspicion. He informed Professor Tang that when he fought the second-generation parasites, he noticed that their tongue seemed to be their most important organ. Professor Tang thought for a moment and then told Minghi that if what he said was true, 
he had a solution. However, he was afraid that Ming he might have to take a huge risk. Professor Tang mentioned that he had come in a hurry and only brought some items from the ancestral hall. He believed that the rations wouldn't last long. In the corner of the shelter, Ming he and Professor Tang discussed the plan. Moments later, Ming he agreed to follow Professor Tang's plan. It was their only way to get out of their predicament. The townspeople started to feel the difficulties of being in an evacuation shelter. Children started crying, and others were having difficulties figuring out how to satisfy their needs. The elder told the townspeople not to be afraid and asked them to listen to what Professor Tang had to say. Professor Tang revealed to the townspeople that they were facing a beast who knew how to disguise itself and could even assume their form. From their investigation, they found out that there was a beast hiding among them that had taken their form. Knowing that there was a beast among them, the townspeople panicked once again. Professor Tang immediately asked the townspeople not to panic. He assured them that he was an expert and had already figured out what they needed to do. Professor Tang told them that he had developed a medicine that coats the tongue. They just needed to hold it on their tongue for three minutes, and then they would find out who the parasitic monster was. Zhang Wei told the townspeople that each one of them would have one tongue coating medicine, and a group inspection would be conducted later. When Professor Tang started giving out the medicine, he asked everyone not to eat it right away upon receiving it because it would be better if they ate it at the same time. By the time he was done giving out the medicine, Professor Tang made sure that everyone had received one. After confirming that everyone had been given the medicine, Professor Tang instructed everyone to put it on their tongue. He pointed out that they shouldn't let anyone see their tongue before the inspectors took a look. Minghi, Professor Tang, and Fang Nianrong also applied the medicine to their tongues. The townspeople grew worried, wondering if there were any side effects, but they still followed the instructions, knowing that everything was already out of their hands. Professor Tang looked at his watch and announced that three minutes had already passed. He reminded everyone to keep their mouths shut and not let anyone see their tongue except the inspector. Professor Tang asked them to come one by one in an orderly manner to be inspected by Minghi. Everyone willingly did what Professor Tang asked them to do. Zhang Wei stood beside the line to ensure that the townspeople would line up properly and not push each other. Fang Nianrong guarded the gate that led to Minghi. She made sure that people went to Minghi one at a time. After letting a blonde woman pass through, she immediately closed the gate. Inside the inspection area, Minghi asked the blonde woman to stick out her tongue so he could inspect it. The woman willingly obliged, moving closer to Minghi and sticking out her tongue. After Minghi inspected the woman's tongue, he thanked her for her cooperation. Then he called for the next person to be inspected. Fang Nianrong told the blonde woman to go to the other side after being inspected. While she was on her way to the other side, the blonde woman assured the townspeople that she was fine. The second person Minghi checked wasn't the parasitized person either, so he proceeded to check the next person. After a few minutes, Professor Tang got worried. They were more than halfway through, but they still hadn't found the parasitized person. The next person Ming he was about to inspect was a man wearing an apron. After being called, the man walked inside the inspection space. The man glanced at the gate when Fang Nianrong was closing it. Ming he asked the man to come to him and not to be nervous. When the man got close enough, Ming he asked him to open his mouth so that his tongue could be inspected. After inspecting the tongue, Ming he told the man that his tongue was normal. He then thanked the man for his cooperation. The man asked Ming he if the medicine was actually useful, saying that it just tasted like candy. Ming he laughed and told the man that maybe it was just candy in the first place. The man turned his back to Ming he as he was about to exit the inspection space. But to his surprise, Fang Nianrong didn't open the gate. They looked at the man warily. The man asked Fang Nianrong why she was looking at him like that. He demanded her to quickly open the gate. The man got confused as to why they weren't letting him out. He tried to persuade everyone that there was nothing wrong with him. Behind the man, Ming he used his arms to tell Fang Nianrong that the man was not normal. The elder pointed at the man and called him Wang Desheng. The elder and the townspeople couldn't believe that Wang Desheng was a beast. Wang Desheng got furious and insisted that there was nothing wrong with him. To prove that he was normal, he told everyone to take a look at his tongue. Wang Desheng opened his mouth and stuck his tongue out. When everyone looked at his tongue, it was clear that his tongue was normal. Once again, he demanded that Fang Nianrong let him out, claiming that he wasn't a parasitic beast. Professor Tang told Wang Desheng that he should stop pretending because they already knew that he was the third first-generation beast, Ghost. But Wang Desheng still kept insisting that he was human. Ming he called Wang Desheng a self-righteous beast. He then told him to keep his eyes open and take a look at what a real human tongue looks like. Professor Tang asked everyone to open their mouths, stick out their tongues, and take a look at each other's tongues. After following Professor Tang's instructions, it was revealed that the color of their tongues varied. The children realized that the medicine was the color-changing candy that they often eat. The candy caused their tongues to change color after eating it. A man from the crowd revealed that he had bought a big bag of it because children love it. 
he planned to distribute it to those who came to eat at the ancestral hall, so he was wondering how it became a medicine for eliminating beasts. Realizing that he had been fooled, Wang Desheng gritted his teeth. When Professor Tang instructed everyone to put the medicine on their tongues, Wang Desheng did put the medicine in his mouth, but he secretly swallowed it. After swallowing the medicine, Wang Desheng couldn't help but smile. He thought that Professor Tang and Minghe were idiots for using a ridiculous plan to get rid of him. A kid near the gate exclaimed. He pointed at Wang Desheng and said that Wang Desheng hadn't followed the rules, so he must be the beast because he was afraid that the medicine would expose him. Wang Desheng became enraged and hated everyone for using such despicable, ridiculous, and childish methods. Ming he was telling Wang Desheng that it was the first lesson they would teach him. Almost immediately, Wang Desheng's aura changed. Ming he was alarmed and immediately raised his guard. As if he were in great pain, Wang Desheng held his head tightly while his body shook vigorously. Moments later, tentacles started to come out of every part of his body. Wang Desheng raised his head, spread his arms, and roared, seemingly releasing the pain that he had been feeling. While his tentacles were starting to cover his features, Wang Desheng said that when he came down to human's land, he saw a creature just as despicable as humans. Everyone behind the gate took a step back as they watched Wang Desheng's features change. Wang Desheng's face had already turned into a monster's when he asked everyone if they knew what creature he was referring to. Wang Desheng revealed that what he saw was an inconspicuous little banyan seedling. He said that he had seen it sprout on the cycads with his own eyes and that he saw its tentacle-like vines grow around the tree. As the banyan tree thrived, its vines grew thicker and thicker. All of a sudden, the whole cycad tree was already wrapped by it. The cycad tree that nurtured it couldn't even get a ray of sunshine. The nutrients that were absorbed were all taken by the banyan vines. Wang Desheng said that the tree would have never expected that the little banyan seedling would turn into an insatiable being. In the end, it would die after being tortured and trapped in a depressive state. Wang Desheng thinks that it's ridiculous that when humans see a tall banyan tree and discover the beautiful scene created by its hollow spots leading to the blue sky, they can't help but praise it. But they never thought that there was a desperate mother worrying. Wang Desheng said that humans have been treating the banyan tree as a god and that they instinctively feel sorry for its despicable, and cruel life. Humans reproduce endlessly. The greed of human space colonies. Humans so-called wisdom and civilization. Wang Desheng thinks that all of it is strangling the mother universe. He then declared that he will never let humans grow into towering trees and that he will completely wipe them out while they're just seedlings. When Wang Desheng swung his right arm, it extended and threatened to whip Ming He. Ming He immediately leaped backward to dodge the attack. Wang Desheng's attack broke the floor. Seeing that Wang Desheng's casual blow was already so powerful, Ming He gritted his teeth. Wang Desheng realized that Ming He seemed to be everyone's only hope of survival. Ming He exclaimed when Wang Desheng suddenly disappeared from where he stood. Almost immediately, Ming He desperately moved from side to side to evade Wang Desheng's pointy arms. Even though Ming He was moving fast, Wang Desheng still managed to wound his right shoulder. Finally, the barrage of attacks stopped when he managed to move back and gain some distance. Wang Desheng is not just strong he's also fast. Ming He thinks that if he doesn't use his spirit powers, there won't be any hope of retaliation. But he only has one chance to use the frost crystal, and there's still an emperor level beast outside the shelter. Ming He decided not to use the only leverage he had. Without touching it, he absorbed the cement below him. He believed that he could eliminate Wang Desheng without using the frost crystal. Ming He clenched his left fist and then used a charged punch. In response, Wang Desheng turned his right arm into a shield. Wang Desheng used his shield to block Ming He's charged punch. Ming He was in disbelief after seeing that his attack was easily blocked by Wang Desheng. While hiding behind his shield, Wang Desheng prepared to puncture Ming He's head with his left arm. Ming He's eyes widened when Wang Desheng's pointy arm suddenly came out of the shield. He managed to lean backwards, but the arm was so fast that it still managed to scratch his forehead. Fang Nianrong and Professor Tang became worried about Ming He. To prevent Wang Desheng from having another opportunity to attack, Ming He immediately moved back. After doing so, he assured Fang Nianrong and Professor Tang that he's fine. Knowing the extent of Wang Desheng's abilities, Ming He realized that he wouldn't be able to beat Wang Desheng with just his regular skills. The elder asked Professor Tang why the Superhuman Institute sent such a doll to deal with Wang Desheng. Professor Tang told the elder that he had no idea and that he was only a professor who conducted scientific research. Fang Nianrong asked Professor Tang to let her join in too, but Professor Tang didn't agree, saying that she shouldn't bother Ming He. Professor Tang told everyone that they just have to believe in Ming He because if he can't deal with Wang Desheng, they'll all die. The child near the gate wished Ming He good luck. Then he asked Ming He to beat Wang Desheng for them. Wang Desheng got irritated after hearing the kid and demanded the kid to shut up. He threatened the children that after he's done dealing with Ming He, he'll eat their parents one by one and tell them how their parents tasted. 
Hearing Wang Dishang's threats, the kids couldn't help but cry. Wang Dishang asked Ming-Hi how he wanted to die, but Ming-Hi just stood still and didn't answer. Wang Dishang reformed his arms into blades and immediately dashed towards Ming-Hi. Ming-Hi blocked, stepped back, and jumped away to avoid getting cut by Wang Dishang's sharp blades. When Ming-Hi jumped away, Wang Dishang took the opportunity to change his arm into a thorny whip and immediately whipped Ming-Hi's back. Ming-Hi's body slightly bent the moment the whip landed on his back. Ming-Hi endured the pain as he grabbed the whip and landed a punch on Wang Desheng's chest, but he wasn't strong enough to push Wang Desheng away. Wang Desheng told Ming-Hi that his strength was not enough and, by human standards, he was nothing more than a mid-level corona-grade hunter. Ming-Hi moved away from Wang Desheng. Wang Desheng bragged that he was a Heaven Flare rank, and among the people present, no one was even close to his rank. He claimed that he could see in Ming-Hi's eyes that he had no intention of giving up. He then told Ming-Hi that he would show him just what despair was. Once again, Wang Dishang reformed his body. His spine separated from his upper body and repositioned itself vertically behind him. The spine grew a pair of bone legs and some ribs. Then the bones became fully covered with flesh. Wang Dishang transformed into something like a centaur, with his left arm turning into a shield and his right arm turning into a pointed weapon. He told Ming-Hi that it was an honor for him to die by his new form. Wang Dishang revealed that Ming-Hi had tricked him into coming there, thinking that he could be trapped. In reality, Ming-Hi had just created a death arena. Wang Dishang stated that no matter who entered, there would only be one result. With his pointed arm stretched out, Wang Dishang charged at Ming-Hi, who didn't have time to evade and was forced to use his arms to block Wang Dishang's pointed arm. Ming-Hi was pushed away by Wang Dishang's attack. His back then smashed into a wall, causing it to crack. Wang Desheng asked Ming Yi if he had ever thought about why he had never noticed their existence before. Before Ming Yi could answer, Wang Desheng revealed that Ming Yi's group had only discovered them because they allowed it. They were confident that Ming Yi's group had nothing on them. Covered in wounds and bruises, Ming Yi gritted his teeth and aggressively stared at Wang Desheng. While threatening to annihilate him, Wang Desheng ran towards Ming Yi. After closing the distance, Wang Desheng jumped, swung his pointy arm, and aimed it towards Ming Yi's head. Everyone behind the gate got scared and closed their eyes. Suddenly, they heard something dripping. Ming He bent his right knee and used both of his hands to hold Wang Desheng's pointy arm. He was able to stop the fatal attack, but his hands got heavily injured. Wang Desheng told Ming He that he was basically dead, thinking that Ming He couldn't fight him without using his hands. Ming He said that he could still use his hands, he just needed the medium he needed the most to win the battle. Wang Desheng laughed and told Ming He that he had seen humans' ridiculous hot blooded cartoons where the protagonist had to be beaten and bruised before reaching their full potential. Ming He told Wang Desheng that he misunderstood. He said that he didn't rely on desperate fighting spirit but relied on the blood that flowed through his own body. Ming He revealed that his blood was his strongest fighting medium. He began absorbing his blood, which was actually considered a brilliant rank medium. Wang Desheng stood still and stared at Ming He. Ming He said that Wang Desheng wasn't that fast and strong. But in order to preserve his strength, he chose to take on some injuries. Wang Desheng couldn't believe that Ming He could have dodged his attacks but chose not to. Ming He explained that constantly moving around would only make him tired. So he decided to take on an injury. Ming He's aura increased dramatically. He pushed Wang Desheng away and threatened to blast him to pieces. Wang Desheng smashed into a wall, then onto the ground. Blood was dripping from his mouth as he sluggishly stood up. When he looked at his back, he was shocked to see that his hind legs were smashed. Wang Desheng exclaimed when Ming He, who was prepared to punch him, suddenly appeared in front of him. He immediately raised his shield to block Ming He's punch. However, Ming He quickly changed his direction using second stage acceleration. He appeared behind Wang Desheng, leaving him gravely undefended. It was already too late when Wang Desheng realized that Ming He was behind him. When he turned his head around, his lower jaw received Ming He's uppercut. The punch was so strong that it distorted Wang Desheng's features and threw him upward. After punching Wang Desheng, Ming He bent his knees and jumped. Wang Desheng was alarmed when he saw Ming He land his feet on the ceiling. While clenching his left fist, Ming He bent his knees. The ceiling broke when Ming He kicked it to propel himself towards Wang Desheng. With great momentum, Ming He punched Wang Desheng's stomach. The floor broke the moment Wang Desheng smashed onto it, and the debris was sent flying. Dust covered the area, so everyone outside the gate couldn't see what the situation was. When the dust settled, it was revealed that Wang Desheng, who partially reverted to his human form, lay flat on the floor while Ming He stood straight, staring at him. Wang Desheng was thinking that he needed to do something. As a first-generation parasitic beast, he wanted to fight back, but he couldn't. Wang Desheng was convinced that Ming He was not just a Sunblaze-ranked hunter. Since he was gravely injured, he decided to focus on protecting himself and wait for his two companions outside the shelter. Bone spikes grew on Wang Desheng's side, and flesh covered him, immediately starting to rotate. Ming He was forced to jump away. Ming He wondered how Wang Desheng managed to imitate the skills of a hedgehog and tortoise, but he thought it was useless. 
he clenched his fist, dashed towards Wang Desheng, and showered his cover with punches. The flesh and spikes that protected Wang Desheng started to crumble. Inside the rotating flesh and bones, Wang Desheng started to panic. He couldn't comprehend how Minghe managed to damage his cover. Lin Hui and Hu Guangyi were amazed by Minghe's greatness. They decided to be more careful in how they treated Minghe after realizing that they had been rude to him at the reservoir. Despite knowing Minghe's strength, Fang Nianrong and Professor Tang still couldn't believe that Minghe could take on a Heaven Flare rank. The kids started cheering for Minghe. They asked Minghe to hit and kill Wang Desheng. Minghe continued punching Wang Desheng's cover until it completely broke. Wang Desheng was thrown away by the fist that shattered the rotating flesh and bones. He then smashed into the wall near the gate. Thinking that Wang Desheng might counterattack, Fang Nianrong immediately activated her superpowers, while Professor Tang instructed everyone to move back. Wang Desheng stopped moving. His body released some steam, and he looked skinny. While walking towards Wang Desheng, Minghe ripped his shirt and threw it away. He stood right in front of Wang Desheng and stared at him menacingly. Wang Desheng remained motionless. But moments later, he started talking. Wang Desheng grinned, then he asked Minghe if he thought they had already won. Minghe sarcastically asked Wang Desheng if parasitic beasts also say their last words before they die. Wang Desheng ignored Minghe's mockery and said that his task had been completed. He then reminded Minghe that he had taken over a chef's body. After saying his last words, a parasite came out of his mouth. The parasite jumped out of Wang Desheng's mouth and immediately attempted to sneak out through the gate. When they noticed the parasite, everyone outside the inspection space exclaimed and became wary. However, before it could escape through the gate, Minghe stepped on it. Minghe stated that troubles must be solved one by one. Wang Desheng's body was still releasing steam, it was actually disintegrating. Suddenly, the goddess informed Minghe that there was something good inside Wang Desheng's body. She asked him to search for it. Minghe bent down and began searching through what remained of Wang Desheng's body and clothes. As soon as he lifted up Wang Desheng's apron, he immediately saw something. Professor Tang exclaimed, he recognized the object that Minghe found. He said that it was the liquid of the stars. Minghe asked Professor Tang if it was the liquid that could improve someone's cultivation. Professor Tang confirmed that it was. He informed Minghe that the liquid of the stars was special, probably because it came from the body that the parasitic beast occupied. Professor Tang said that it was like natural honey, it was almost completely pure. There was no processing required, so anyone could just drink it straight. Not only could it improve cultivation, but it could also quickly restore bodily functions. Minghe stared at the special liquid of the stars. Professor Tang asked Minghe to trust him and urged him to drink it while it was fresh. Minghe stopped hesitating, he quickly put the liquid of the stars in his mouth and swallowed it. Almost immediately, some sort of green flame started to cover his whole body. He then sat down, crossed his legs, closed his eyes, and started meditating. Professor Tang asked everyone not to disturb Minghe. Moments later, Minghe's wounds and bruises began to heal. His shoulder, hands, and his whole body started to look as if they hadn't been injured. After some time, Professor Tang asked Hu Guangyi to bring some water. Hu Guangyi immediately brought a bucket of water and handed it to Professor Tang while looking at Minghe. Suddenly, Minghe opened his eyes, which were emanating a violet glow. The glow disappeared the moment Professor Tang poured water on top of Minghe's head. Minghe stood up and immediately inspected his body. He was amazed to see that all of his injuries were gone. Professor Tang asked Minghe how he was feeling. Minghe had an evil smile as he answered Professor Tang's question, stating that he felt great. He released a dark aura while saying that, according to human standards, he should be a high-ranking Sunblaze rank hunter. Fang Nianrong and Professor Tang were shocked, suspecting that Minghe might have been parasitized. However, when Minghe scratched the back of his head and cheekily said that he was just kidding, they became infuriated. They couldn't believe that Minghe would joke around in such a situation. Fang Nianrong was convinced that Minghe had been influenced by something negative. After putting on some clothes, Minghe told Professor Tang that something was bothering him. Professor Tang replied, stating that he knew what Minghe was about to say. He then pointed to a corner where they could talk privately. Once they moved to a less crowded corner, Minghe informed Professor Tang that he found Wang Jun's death to be suspicious. He believed that Wang Jun shouldn't have died. If Wang Jun was serving the queen, Zhu Tao, then he would have been a valuable resource for the parasites. However, he died right in front of Wang Zheng. Minghe told Professor Tang that the three first-generation parasites were intelligent, so if they wanted Wang Jun to die, they could have done so without anyone noticing, unless they wanted people to discover Wang Jun's dead body. Realizing that the parasites had killed Wang Jun for a reason, Professor Tang asked Minghe why the parasites would purposely expose Wang Jun's death. Instead of answering the question, Minghe asked Professor Tang what humans do when someone dies. Professor Tang responded that, apart from attracting attention and initiating an investigation, humans mourn the deceased. 
His eyes widened as he thought of something. Professor Tang realized that the parasites were targeting a feast. Ning he explained that they were all gathered in one place, and when one person dies, everyone feasts, especially if they belong to the same clan. Professor Tang remained confused about why the parasitic beasts deliberately killed Wang Jun. Ming he then explained that the parasites did it to gather everyone for the banquet. He pointed out that Wang Jun was a member of the Wang clan, and in Fu Rong town, most men have the surname Wang. This meant that the parasites wanted to lure the entire town to the feast. Professor Tang and Ming he pondered why the parasite would want to gather the townspeople there. Ming he exclaimed when he realized that the parasites were trying to turn everyone into parasites. Ming he told Professor Tang that a ghost had taken over Wang Desheng's body. He's the chef of the banquet. That means he could have dropped parasitic eggs into every bowl he served. Professor Tang was saying that parasitic eggs can't survive high temperature cooking. When he remembered that there was dessert soup, he realized that a cold dessert soup was served to the townspeople. Ming Yi and Professor Tang found themselves in a difficult situation. Everyone inside the shelter had eaten a third generation parasite egg. If nothing changes, none of the townspeople will be able to survive. Professor Tang informed Ming Yi that they only have two days. After two days, the townspeople will all be taken over by the parasite and become second generation parasitic beasts. By then, the townspeople will follow the queen's orders like a bunch of zombies. The speed at which the parasites take over a body surprised Ming Yi. Professor Tang explained to Ming Yi that the parasites are always evolving which means their parasitic capabilities are also evolving. Ming-Hi looked worried and said that the parasites are aiming for the whole town, planning to turn the entire town into their parasite army. Upon hearing Ming-Hi's words, Professor Tang's eyes widened. He repeatedly said that their situation is not good. Ming-Hi was at a loss and told Professor Tang that they've already talked about it. Professor Tang told Ming-Hi that they're thinking too superficially. After being reminded by Professor Tang that they're in a war zone, Ming-Hi realized that Fu Rong Town might inevitably become a battlefield. Professor Tang told Ming-Hi that the result of the battle would decide the fate of the entire southern capital. Tens of thousands of superhumans are stationed at the main battlefield. Fu Rong Town lies across the evacuation route. Ming-Hi asked Professor Tang which evacuation route he was referring to. Professor Tang explained that the battle on the front line was not yet over. Once the main battle concludes, the surviving superhumans can evacuate in that direction. Ming he realized what Professor Tang was thinking. He asked Professor Tang if he was worried that the parasitic beasts in Fu Rong Town might suddenly attack the evacuation route during the survivors' evacuation. He also expressed concern that if the beasts trapped them, no one on the battlefield would be able to leave. Professor Tang admitted that he was indeed worried about it. He looked depressed and mentioned that the insects didn't even have to be strong, they just needed to hold them back like dead men. As Ming he was expressing the high likelihood of complete annihilation in the battle, he suddenly remembered that Liu Kian had gone to the front line. Professor Tang noticed Ming He's concern about the front line battlefield and asked if there was someone important to him there. Ming He admitted that there was. Trying not to lose hope, Ming He asked Professor Tang if he genuinely believed they would lose the battle. Professor Tang affirmed his certainty. He informed Ming He that although it was not written in textbooks, humans had already failed countless times against the disaster group. The presence of a huge demon lair in the outskirts of the southern capital served as proof. Professor Tang told Ming-Hi that he needed to understand that the ruined city was once their city, and that it was still his hometown. Ming-Hi clenched his fists and gritted his teeth, refusing to stand by and watch events unfold. Professor Tang held Ming-Hi's arms and acknowledged his outstanding abilities, mentioning that miracles had happened to him more than once. However, Professor Tang still believed that, given Ming-Hi's current condition, rushing into the ruined city would be a death wish and wouldn't make any sense. Ming-Hi calmed down a bit and admitted that he had gotten too worked up. Professor Tang told Ming-Hi that all he could do at that moment was to focus on the present. Professor Tang said that they must not allow those dirty and cruel parasites to go any further, so that if those in the main battlefield are defeated, they can still retreat. Professor Tang told Ming-Hi that protecting Fu Rong Town is not their only goal. They also need to ensure that everyone in the frontline battlefield can safely evacuate. Professor Tang then asked Ming-Hi to call Fang Nianrong and the others so they could discuss their next steps. After grouping up, they immediately started discussing their plan. Professor Tang informed everyone that from the samples they have collected, he was able to roughly estimate that there are 40 to 50 second generation beasts. Ming-Hi said that after fighting against a second generation parasite, he could say that most of them have the same strength as a high ranking general or low ranking master. He pointed out that the second generation parasite won't die unless their tongues are cut off. Hu Guangyi said that Lin Hui and he are only Moonglow rank. 
They're worried that they'll become dead weight. Professor Tang told the two that when the time comes, they shouldn't show off, and that they only need to deal with two to three second generation parasites. Fang Nianrong said that she's confident that she can handle three second generation parasites. Professor Tang told everyone that if they can gather the rest of their group members, they still have hope of destroying the group of parasites. Fang Nianrong reminded Professor Tang that they sounded the alarm, she's afraid that the rest have already evacuated. Professor Tang told her that the rest of their group couldn't have gone too far, and that if the frontline battlefield was defeated, they'll come there eventually. Professor Tang said that they need to bring them back first. Lin Hui and Hu Guangyi looked at their phones, then they told Professor Tang that they don't have any signal. Professor Tang opened a box and said that it's okay if there's no signal because they can use fireworks. He explained that the student council took a basic field signaling course. It was also included in the brochure they distributed in the beginning. 112 means emergency assembly. Mingyi asked Professor Tang if all they have to do is release the fireworks three times to tell the members in the forest to regroup. Professor Tang told Mingyi that he's right. Hu Guangyi was being skeptical. He expected the rest to have fled far, far away. He thinks that no one wouldn't cherish their life. Professor Tang told Hu Guangyi that they can't control what others think. But as long as they can assemble their group, their chances of winning will be higher. Fang Nianrong agreed and pointed out that Mingyi had already defeated a first-generation parasitic beast. Lin Yui asked Professor Tang how they set off the fireworks. Professor Tang didn't say a word and simply pointed at the shelter's ventilation system. Moments later, the kid who bravely spoke against Wang Desheng crawled inside the ventilation system while carrying the fireworks on his back. Fang Nianrong said that if the passage wasn't so narrow, they would be the ones to go instead. The elder asked Fang Nianrong not to worry and assured her that the exit is very hidden, so the child won't be found. The elder informed everyone that the shelter has multiple vents, so it's okay if one of them is blocked. Outside the shelter, the kid successfully fired the first firework. When the firework exploded in the night sky, its beautiful light revealed the figures of the second generation parasites. The kid fired another firework as soon as the first one lost its light. On the streets of Fu Rong Town, while the second firework illuminated the night sky, a second-generation parasitized man's tongue got punctured by ice. After the second firework, the kid fired two fireworks consecutively. When the last two fireworks illuminated the night sky, Tang Ning remembered the 112 code, which is the emergency assembly signal. She wondered if they were forced to go all out because there was no way to evacuate. While she was walking in the street, a lot of wriggling creatures slithered on top of a house. The wriggling creatures sneaked up behind Tang Ning and tried to attack her, but she was able to jump forward, dodging the attack. Then she immediately turned around and formed an ice sword in her right hand. The wriggling creatures grouped up and slowly formed into something. While it was morphing, it said that Tang Ning had killed seven of its children when it wasn't looking. When its upper body formed, it was revealed that it was actually Wang Zhang. Wang Zhang smiled and praised Tang Ning's tactics. Tang Ning told Wang Zhang that he would be the eighth beast to die by her hands. Wang Zhang laughed, spread his arms, and said that they were never alone. Suddenly, a lot of second-generation parasites crawled onto the roofs on both sides of Tang Ning. Wang Zhang ordered the second-generation parasites to give him Tang Ning's flesh and tear her apart piece by piece. After hearing Wang Zhang's orders, the second-generation parasites simultaneously jumped towards Tang Ning. There were so many of them that they almost covered the entire area above Tang Ning. Tang Ning's eyes shone as she used a Soul Virtue Ice Crystal to protect herself from the descending second-generation parasites. An ice pillar enclosed Tang Ning, sending the second-generation parasites flying away. The second-generation parasites surrounding Tang Ning looked like flies as the majestic and domineering ice pillar sent them flying. Despite this, some of them still stood up as if nothing had happened and started climbing the ice pillar. Wang Zhang became angry upon realizing that the second-generation parasites couldn't do anything to the ice pillar. While preparing to attack the ice pillar himself, Wang Zhang ordered the second-generation parasites to move away. Once the second-generation parasites descended from the ice pillar, Wang Zhang immediately jumped and relentlessly whipped the ice pillar with his tentacles. Wang Zhang stopped when he realized that his attacks did nothing but scratch the ice pillar. He remarked that Tang Ning had some skills but was merely waiting to die. He wanted to see how long Tang Ning's ice crystal could last. Wang Zhang turned around when he suddenly heard a noise, wondering if those he referred to as mice hiding underground had finally emerged. He ordered some of the second-generation parasites to guard Tang Ning until she died, while the rest were ordered to follow him. Meanwhile, in the ancestral hall, Ming He had just emerged when he saw someone he knew. Ming He mentioned his curiosity about the absence of beasts inside and asked if they had gone to their leader because they couldn't open the stone gate. 
it was revealed that Minghi was actually talking to the group of second-generation parasites gathered around a woman. The woman sat leisurely on the back of a kowtowing parasitized man. The woman told Minghi that since he had killed her companion, she would make him her new companion. She then revealed that she hadn't liked her previous companion. The woman was actually Zhu Tao. She mentioned that before turning Minghi into her companion, she would first have to extract the meat from under his skin. After their short exchange of words, Zhu Tao gave Minghi a serious look. Simultaneously, she slashed her knife vertically towards Minghi, producing a light blade that threatened to cut anything that came its way. Fang Nianrong, who was behind Minghi, quickly ran towards the townspeople while telling everyone to be careful. Minghi jumped away to dodge the light blade. As if she was having fun, Zhu Tao smiled when she consecutively released three more light blades. While Minghi ducked and jumped to dodge the light blades, the townspeople behind him quickly moved away so as not to get caught up in the fight. Seeing that Minghi was focused on dodging the second and third light blades, a second generation parasitized man, who was holding a scythe, wanted to land a fatal blow while Minghi was busy. When Minghi turned to focus on the fourth light blade, he was momentarily startled by the second generation parasitized man's surprise attack. Minghi immediately grabbed the parasitized man's right arm and pulled it in front of the fourth light blade. A horrendous sound echoed in the area as the light blade cut through the parasitized man's flesh and bones. Gritting his teeth, Minghi then activated his blood fist before the blood medium completely dispersed. He wanted to deliver a heavy blow to Zhu Tao. As soon as the light blade dissipated, Minghi immediately dashed towards Zhu Tao. While playing with her hair, Zhu Tao looked at Minghi just like a child looking at a very sweet and delicious candy. Then, she wordlessly ordered the second generation parasites around her to attack Minghi. Minghi realized how cunning Zhu Tao was. She knew that Minghi's combat strength was really high at that moment, so she didn't fight Minghi head on. With his blood fist activated, Mingyi easily sent the closest second-generation parasitized man flying with his left fist. He then used his right fist to punch the parasitized man in front of him in the chest. Mingyi had just dealt with the first two parasitized men when a pair of parasitized men jumped and slashed their weapons towards him. Mingyi ducked to dodge the parasitized men's attack. After dodging the attack, he immediately stood up, quickly grabbed the parasitized men's throats, and lifted them. The parasitized men's mouths started foaming as Minghi tightened his grip on their throats. But Minghi was caught off guard when the parasitized men suddenly opened their mouths and used their tongues to attack him. Out of nowhere, a bullet cut off the parasitized men's tongues, killing them and saving Minghi at the same time. Fang Nianrong immediately realized that her senior, Lu Feng, saw the signal they sent. She immediately informed Lu Feng that the weak point of the parasitized individuals is their tongue. Meanwhile, the parasitized man that Minghi punched started to move again. After seeing that even his blood fist wasn't able to kill the parasitized men, Minghi was able to confirm that the parasitized men wouldn't die unless their tongues were destroyed. Lu Feng positioned himself somewhere up the mountain. He told Minghi to break through the second generation parasitized men, saying that he'd cover him. Minghi trusts Lu Feng. He didn't think twice and immediately charged towards the group of second generation parasitized men. Meanwhile, on the streets of Fu Rong Town, Tang Ning was still inside the ice pillar, surrounded by second generation parasitized men. Moments later, the second generation parasitized men were alarmed when cracks started to form on the ice pillar. With no one to order them what to do, once again, they mindlessly tried to forcefully break it. Inside the ice pillar, Tang Ning seemed to be gathering her strength to break free from her own soul art. After gathering enough strength, she exerted it, and the seemingly indestructible ice pillar shattered. Its shards were sent flying, along with the second-generation parasitized humans around and on top of it. Despite all that, they still stood up and slowly walked towards Tang Ning. After seeing how tenacious the second-generation parasitized humans are, Tang Ning couldn't help but curse. Her mobility has been temporarily affected after using her soul art. The parasitized humans growled as they got closer to where Tang Ning is. Tang Ning was determined to just suck it up and fight hard as she watched two parasitized men point their weapons and leap towards her. But before the parasitized men could harm Tang Ning, a fiery figure flew past Tang Ning's shoulder and bulldozed the two parasitized men. Tang Ning protected herself from the heat and dust as the figure and the parasitized men exploded just a few meters in front of her. Moments later, the fiery figure stepped out of the explosion area. Jiang Wenwen, who was wearing her fireproof combat uniform, expressed her surprise upon seeing Tang Ning's state. Tang Ning asked Jiang Wenwen why she hadn't evacuated. Jiang Wenwen told Tang Ning that she wanted to evacuate but the main battlefield wasn't looking too good. So, if one person messed up, every single one of them would die there. Jiang Wenwen couldn't help but curse when she saw that the second generation parasitized men weren't burning to death. Tang Ning informed her that the weakness of the parasitized humans was their tongues, so her flames would only temporarily stop them. 
Jiang Wenwen expressed her contempt towards the second generation parasitized humans. While forming a fireball, she told Tang Ning that dealing with them shouldn't be so troublesome. She then released the energy contained in the fireball towards the parasitized humans, saying that she would just have to burn them to ashes. The parasitized humans couldn't do anything but stand and take Jiang Wenwen's attack head on. When Jiang Wenwen's attack, which looked like a dragon's fire breath, stopped, Jiang Wenwen observed what was in front of her. Seemingly content with what she saw, she confidently turned towards Tang Ning. She told Tang Ning that those parasitized humans were just a bunch of soldiers. She didn't realize that something was eyeing her. It was already too late for her to react when she realized that a parasitized dog was about to bite her head. But before the parasitized dog could bite Jiang Wenwen, an ice spear pierced its tongue and killed it. Jiang Wenwen stared at the parasitized dog, still seemingly in shock. Tang Ning warned Jiang Wenwen not to be so careless because the second generation parasites were harder to deal with than she thought. While having a cold sweat, Jiang Wenwen claimed that she could have handled the parasitized dog herself. Tang Ning didn't argue with her and just agreed with what Jiang Wenwen said. Tang Ning said that she agreed that the second generation parasites were just soldiers, so they needed to take care of them as soon as possible. She told Jiang Wenwen that after dealing with the soldiers, they had to go to the ancestral hall. She informed Jiang Wenwen that there were probably two stronger ones in the ancestral hall, the masters of the second generation parasites. They turned their backs to each other and agreed to deal with the second generation parasites in front of them while protecting each other's blind spots. After reaching an agreement, they immediately started attacking the parasitized men. The parasitized men didn't just stand idly by and do nothing. They ran and leapt towards Tang Ning and Jiang Wenwen, mindlessly trying to get close enough to land an attack. The parasitized humans in the streets of Fu Rong town were swept by a blast of Tang Ning and Jiang Wenwen's superpowers. Meanwhile, in a mountain where the ancestral hall is in plain view, Lu Feng used his superpowers to lock onto a target and fired another bullet. Although Lu Feng wasn't able to hit the parasitized men's tongues, the bullet was able to pierce through the parasitized men who bothered Ming He, giving Ming He the space to run towards Zhu Tao. Ming He even had the luxury of giving Lu Feng a thumbs up. Lu Feng wondered why Ming He was suddenly giving him a thumbs up. He then warned Minghe that he had enemies coming for him. In front of Minghe, a group of piled parasitized humans simultaneously swung their weapons towards him. It looked like Minghe was facing an inescapable wall. But Minghe just covered his head and jumped over the pile of parasitized humans. Minghe's jump had so much force that he was able to push away the parasitized men who bumped into him. Minghe landed on the parasitized man's face, then he immediately ran towards the unguarded Zhu Tao. For failing to slow Mingyi down, Zhu Tao deemed the second generation parasitized humans as a bunch of useless trash. Seeing that Mingyi was getting closer to her, she positioned her knife a level above her head and swung it vertically towards Mingyi. Mingyi ducked to dodge the knife, simultaneously swinging his right arm and activating his blood fiend skill. Mingyi managed to get closer to Zhu Tao, and while her arm was still extended, Mingyi took the opportunity to counterattack. Ming He was able to successfully connect a clean hit on Zhu Tao's jaw using his leaping dragon shadow. Zhu Tao got thrown away by Ming He's punch, then landed headfirst into the ground. Ming He didn't follow up with an attack, he cautiously kept a distance away from Zhu Tao while thinking how thankful he was that he was able to deal a blow before the blood medium dispersed. Before she could even stand straight, Zhu Tao told Ming He that she was impressed that it had only been a while, but his strength had greatly improved. After managing to stand straight, she wore a smile on her bloody face and asked Minghe why she felt like his energy was dissipating. Minghe mocked Zhu Tao, saying that she was still so arrogant even after getting beaten up. Then he told Zhu Tao that her ability to resist attacks wasn't that great. Zhu Tao admitted that her body is still too weak, but she's confident that she can replace it with a better one soon. Minghe told Zhu Tao that there's only one ending in store for her, one where he'll smash her to pieces. While they were talking, the second generation parasitized humans started to gather around Minghe. Once again, Minghe charged at Zhu Tao, but a parasitized man immediately blocked his way. Minghe punched the parasitized man's side while telling him to get out of his way. Out of nowhere, a muscular parasitized man appeared in front of Zhu Tao. Despite how tough the parasitized man looked, Minghe still jumped and swung his right fist. As he was descending, Minghe aimed to punch the parasitized man's chest. Minghe's punch connected, but it seems that it wasn't able to hurt the muscular parasitized man. Minghe gritted his teeth the moment he looked up and saw the muscular parasitized man's face. Tentacles were coming out of the muscular parasitized man's mouth, it was actually tyrant Wang Zhang. Minghe quickly jumped backwards to dodge Wang Zhang's punch, which was so strong that it managed to break the floor. Minghe stared at Wang Zhang's spiked round fist. 
he couldn't help but curse, Wang Zhang had also gotten stronger. The parasites evolve very quickly, so he's thankful that it is already the decisive battle. Ming he thinks that if the fight dragged on for too long, there might not even be room for him to struggle. Zhu Tao ordered Wang Zhang to kill Ming he without letting him bleed. Wang Zhang got curious as to why, so he asked Zhu Tao if it's for her new method of cooking. Zhu Tao was scowling when she informed Wang Zhang that Ming he can use the blood on his body to multiply his power. Wang Zhang was enlightened about how Ming he managed to kill a ghost. Zhu Tao urged Wang Zhang to not play around and quickly get rid of Ming He, saying that they have more important things to do. While turning his right arm into a warhammer, Wang Zhang laughed, saying that he couldn't let Ming He bleed, so he'll take every inch of Ming He's body and ground it up. After forming his hand into a warhammer, Wang Zhang quickly dashed towards Ming He. Then, when he got close enough, he swung his warhammer limb towards Ming He. Ming He managed to cross his arms and block Wang Zhang's warhammer, but he got pushed away. Ming He crashed onto the tables behind him and finally stopped when his back hit a solid platform. Wang Zhang seems to enjoy seeing Ming He struggle. He took his time staring at Ming He while grinning. Then, when he noticed something, he suddenly raised his left hand to catch a bullet that was aimed at his head. Lu Feng exclaimed, he couldn't believe that Wang Zhang was able to stop his bullet. Wang Zhang turned to look in Lu Feng's direction and then said that he'll deal with Lu Feng later because he has to get rid of Ming He first. As if he's about to pitch, Wang Zhang bent his left knee and used his left hand to hold his right arm tightly. Then he swung his right arm and rotated his body. By doing this, Wang Zhang was able to quickly build momentum. Ming He exclaimed after seeing Wang Zhang turn like a top. Wang Zhang's rotation was so fast that it felt like Ming He wouldn't be able to do anything about it. To get away from Wang Zhang's range, Ming He immediately jumped on top of a building. But Wang Zhang didn't stop rotating so he could jump and chase after Ming He. He just continued rotating while moving towards the building. Ming He was surprised when Wang Zhang easily destroyed the building he jumped onto. Ming He inevitably fell after losing his foothold. To avoid getting serious injuries, he was forced to bend down to reduce the impact of his fall. Seeing an opportunity to strike, Wang Zhang put his warhammer limb behind him and immediately jumped towards Ming He. When Ming He got up, Wang Zhang was already above him. Ming He desperately moved to the side and actually managed to dodge Wang Zhang's attack. But because of it, his back got easily hit by Wang Zhang's follow-up attack. The attack was so strong that it slightly bent Ming He's body backward. When Ming He crashed onto the floor near the ancestral hall, the floor around him cracked, and then the area started to get covered with dust. Moments later, the dust started to settle. While Ming He was saying that Wang Zhang was stronger than a ghost, he slowly stood up. Wang Zhang angrily stepped on the floor. He ordered Ming He not to compare him with the old guy he killed. Wang Zhang claimed that he was younger, stronger, and evolved more quickly than a ghost. Wang Zhang looked behind him when he noticed a wriggling creature slithering towards him. He wondered if it had managed to escape on its own. But he didn't dwell on that thought. He believed that the wriggling creature had arrived on time so they could witness Ming He's death together. After all, Ming He was the one who had put the wriggling creature in a glass bottle for research. The wriggling creature, which was a part of Wang Zhang, delved into Wang Zhang's chest. Wang Zhang willingly accepted the return of the wriggling creature, his so-called child. Wang Zhang's body started to convulse with the wriggling creature's return he would become even stronger. After successfully combining with the wriggling creature, violet tattoos appeared all over his body, and he grew a lot bigger. Wang Zhang stood in front of Ming He, laughed, and then asked him why he still had the will to fight. Wang Zhang spread his arms and, in a loud voice, bragged to Ming He that the current him was the perfect version of himself, the invincible version. Zhu Tao felt that something was not right, so he asked Wang Zhang how the wriggling creature had managed to escape. Before Wang Zhang could respond, green liquid suddenly spurted out of his mouth and chest. He fell on his knees, steam started to come out of his body, and he couldn't stop himself from shaking. He was confused about what was happening to his body. Moments later, Wang Zhang became thinner, and he lost the ability to maintain the form of his warhammer. Zhu Tao couldn't help but call Wang Zhang an idiot for not double-checking the wriggling creature before accepting it. Just outside the ancestral hall, while holding the wriggling creature's glass container, Professor Tang told Ming He that it was the only thing he could do for him. Wang Zhang started to sweat when dark smoke began to escape from his chest. Wang Zhang frantically asked Professor Tang what he had done to his body and the wriggling creature. Professor Tang told Wang Zhang that he hadn't done much, just added an alpha decaying crystal. Wang Zhang didn't reply, he remained silent while doing something in the hole on his chest. Moments later, Wang Zhang successfully removed the wriggling creature from his chest. He cursed at it and threw it on the ground. Wang Zhang stepped on the wriggling creature, telling it to die alone if it was going to self-destruct and not to think about dragging them. While stretching his right arm, Ming He said that a few seconds ago, Wang Zhang treasured the wriggling creature dearly and even called it his child. 
but now he was killing it mercilessly. Ming He said he didn't understand how Wang Zhang had the audacity to call himself a being of higher intellect. While jumping on the debris to reach where Wang Zhang stood, Ming He said that he could only see Wang Zhang's selfishness, ruthlessness, and wickedness, so they were the ones who should go extinct. After closing the distance, Ming He punched Wang Zhang's chest. But it did nothing. Wang Zhang told Ming He that he may have played a dirty trick but his strength was far from enough to cause damage. Wang Zhang tried to hug Minghe, but Minghe managed to quickly move behind him. Minghe punched Wang Zhang's unguarded back, but it still did nothing. When Wang Zhang turned around, Minghe was already far away from him, but he managed to catch up. Minghe was caught off guard, so he had no choice but to use his arms as a shield to block Wang Zhang's punch. Minghe struggled to maintain his balance as he was pushed back by Wang Zhang's powerful punch. Wang Zhang grinned and told Minghe that his attacks could only tickle him. Suddenly, three bullets hit Wang Zhang's back and the back of his head. But even Lu Feng's bullets couldn't do much damage. Wang Zhang cursed and turned his head toward Lu Feng's position. He got irritated by Lu Feng's meddling, but his expression quickly changed. Wang Zhang grinned while staring at Lu Feng's location. Lu Feng was distraught, thinking about how he had managed to land a clean strike, but his firepower was lacking. He was so focused on what was happening on Ming He's side that he didn't notice Zhu Tao was already above him. When he realized that something was behind him, he quickly moved away. But he reacted too late, his right arm got cut by Zhu Tao's knife. Zhu Tao praised Lu Feng for managing to avoid getting a fatal injury. Inside Lu Feng's head, he couldn't help but curse after realizing how careless he was. After feeling that Zhu Tao was probably a lord rank monster, Lu Feng quickly fled towards the woods. While her left hand was morphing, Zhu Tao asked Lu Feng why he was still trying to escape when it was already evident that it was too late for him to do so. Zhu Tao's hand turned into three tentacles, she used them to wrap around Lu Feng and stop him from running. She lifted Lu Feng towards her while she was telling him that little sheep like him was tasty. Zhu Tao was about to eat Lu Feng when Jiang Wenwen arrived. She was still in the sky when she ordered Zhu Tao to release Lu Feng. As soon as she landed near Zhu Tao, Jiang Wenwen immediately expanded the flame that surrounded her body, causing everything around her to begin burning. Moments later, Tang Ning had already saved Lu Feng. While Tang Ning was sealing Lu Feng's wound with ice, Lu Feng informed her that Zhu Tao was a lord rank monster. Among them, Tang Ning was the only Heaven Flare rank. Lu Feng was afraid that aside from Tang Ning, no one else could face Zhu Tao head on. Tang Ning instructed Zhang Wenwen to maintain her distance from Zhu Tao. Instead of acknowledging Tang Ning's instruction, Zhang Wenwen just told Tang Ning that Zhu Tao was afraid of fire, so she was their natural enemy. Tang Ning exclaimed when she suddenly saw something. When the smoke cleared up, they saw Zhu Tao casually fixing her hair. Zhu Tao told them that she was glad that they were all there because it would save her the trouble of sending her children to search for them. Zhu Tao noticed Zhang Wenwen and told her that her flesh looked tender and would certainly taste incredible. Zhang Wenwen glanced at Tang Ning, then she asked her to take Lu Feng away. While she was saying that she would deal with Zhu Tao, Zhang Wenwen conjured three fireballs and fired them towards Zhu Tao. Zhu Tao looked bored while walking towards Zhang Wenwen, she effortlessly blocked the fireballs with her tentacles. When Zhu Tao got closer to Zhang Wenwen, Zhang Wenwen quickly jumped away, but while she was still in mid-air, Zhu Tao managed to land a hit. Despite being whipped, Zhang Wenwen was able to regain her balance by using her fire. She called Zhu Tao a monster as soon as she landed on the ground. Jiang Wenwen positioned her open hands in front of her. Fire started to gather on her palms, and then she told Zhu Tao to die. She fired her skill, Flame Blast, towards Zhu Tao. Surprisingly, her skill managed to directly hit Zhu Tao's chest, but Zhu Tao didn't seem to be hurt at all. Zhu Tao didn't bother doing anything about Jiang Wenwen's attack. Instead, she raised her tentacles and whirled them until they formed a tornado. Inside the tornado, black liquid started to gather. Jiang Wenwen exclaimed when she saw that the tornado was getting bigger. Still, she didn't cancel her attack. She seemed to be hoping that her attack would eventually inflict damage on Zhu Tao, but it proved to be her fatal mistake. Zhu Tao splashed Jiang Wenwen with the black liquid she had gathered using the tornado. Jiang Wenwen couldn't dodge, so she was easily swept by the black liquid. Soaked with the black liquid, Jiang Wenwen struggled to get up. Zhu Tao told her that after some marinating, she would certainly taste even better. Zhu Tao licked her tentacle while saying that she was getting hungry. She planned to cut off Jiang Wenwen's limbs and marinate them all in a large tank. Suddenly, Tang Ning appeared in front of Jiang Wenwen. Zhu Tao asked Tang Ning if she was the one who had been dashing around town, killing many of her children like a cat chasing mice. Tang Ning told Zhu Tao that she was just clearing away trash. Zhu Tao stared at Tang Ning's body, then she said that she was pleased to see Tang Ning's ideal figure. Confused, Tang Ning asked Zhu Tao what she was talking about. 
Zhu Tao told Tang Ming that she was referring to her body and that she was tired of being in Zhu Tao's body. Tang Ming couldn't help but express her disgust towards Zhu Tao. Zhu Tao said that it was strange. She claimed that even though it was her first time being a person, she could already differentiate between the beauty and ugliness of human bodies. And she yearned to become more beautiful, saying that it increased her appetite. Zhu Tao told Tang Ming that she shouldn't worry. She promised Tang Ming that she would make sure to feed on her friends elegantly after taking over her body. While Zhu Tao attacked Tang Ning using her tentacles, she said, the stronger the bond, the tastier. Tang Ning somersaulted to dodge and keep her distance from Zhu Tao. After doing so, she immediately touched the ground and employed her skill, Frost Crystal. From Tang Ning's position, ice started to crawl towards Zhu Tao. Zhu Tao barely managed to avoid being pierced by the ice spikes that rose from the ground she was standing on but ended up getting trapped between them. Zhu Tao was surprised when she noticed that her left cheek was starting to freeze prompting her to regard Tang Ning more seriously. While Zhu Tao was still trapped, Tang Ning swiftly employed her spirit art, Ice Spear. Almost immediately, Ice Spears started to form and hover around Tang Ning. As soon as she's done forming the Ice Spears, Tang Ning immediately sends the Ice Spears towards the still-restrained Zhu Tao. Zhu Tao couldn't help but moan in pain as Tang Ning's Ice Spears pierced through her body. Moments later, all of the Ice Spears had already pierced through Zhu Tao's body. Zhu Tao had stopped moving, her head and hair drooping. Jiang Wenwen asks Tang Ning if her attack worked. While she's forming more ice spears, Tang Ning tells Jiang Wenwen that killing Zhu Tao shouldn't be as easy as that. Suddenly, Zhu Tao raises her head, her eyes glowing, and a dark aura covers her body. For some reason, Tang Ning's ice spikes and spears start to melt. Not long after, Zhu Tao's energy seems to have burst, causing the area to be covered in dust. Tang Ning and Jiang Wenwen focus on protecting themselves from the dust and ice shards that get blown away. When the dust starts to settle, multiple second-generation beasts are already in the area. Zhu Tao has summoned all of the surrounding second-generation beasts. Behind a layer of dust, Zhu Tao says that she admits that Tang Ning is strong. When the dust clears up, it is revealed that Zhu Tao has changed her form. Her upper body still retaining its human-like form, but her lower body looking like a pitcher plant with teeth on its opening. Zhu Tao challenges Tang Ning, then she says that she'll keep Tang Ning's appearance and melt everything else. Zhu Tao excitedly looks at the tentacles that come out from the opening of her lower body. The tentacles then connect themselves to the necks of the second-generation parasitized humans in the vicinity. After Zhu Tao bestows power upon them, the second-generation parasitized humans, which still retain their human features, turn into real beasts. Zhu Tao stays behind the second-generation beasts, she spreads her arms, laughs, and then orders the second-generation beasts to bring her Tang Ning. Meanwhile, Ming He and Wang Zhang are still fighting near the ancestral hall. Ming He dashes then punches Wang Zhang. Wang Zhang manages to quickly raise his arms to block the punch, but still, blood spurts out of his mouth. Ming He isn't using a medium, but his punch still manages to push Wang Zhang away. Ming He wants to land a follow-up attack. While he's chasing after Wang Zhang, he swings his right arm and gathers lightning on his fist. But when he punched down, Wang Zhang managed to slip away. Wang Zhang's nose started to bleed too, and he couldn't help but curse after realizing that the Alpha Decay is still doing work on his body. Wang Zhang ran away, he decided not to fight and look for Zhu Tao first. Ming He was shocked by Wang Zhang's sudden change of actions. Ming He chased after Wang Zhang, trying to mock him by reminding him how arrogant he was moments ago. While climbing up the mountain, Wang Zhang reasoned that if it weren't for the Alpha Decay, Ming He wouldn't even be worth calling an opponent. When he reached where Zhu Tao is, Wang Zhang immediately kneeled and asked Zhu Tao to lend him her strength. Zhu Tao sent a tentacle towards Wang Zhang and attached it to his neck. Wang Zhang grew bigger and his warhammer limbs started to reform. Bone armor formed on his chest, shoulders, arms, legs, and head. Wang Zhang stood up and raised his head. While his tentacles were wriggling out of his mouth, he expressed delight that he was finally able to recover. Moments later, Ming He arrived. While holding his newly formed warhammer with his left hand, Wang Zhang cursed at Ming He. Then he threatened him that he was going to mince him to pieces. Wang Zhang attacked first, he swung his warhammer towards Ming He. Luckily, Ming He was able to react and managed to quickly move away. Ming He gritted his teeth, he had already landed 49 punch marks on Wang Zhang. But Wang Zhang just gained armor. Ming He was afraid that at that point, using his soul wouldn't be enough to kill Wang Zhang. Ming He determined that his punches wouldn't be enough and wished that his punches were faster. Zhu Tao ordered Wang Zhang to stop fighting Ming He and to finish off Tang Ming first. Wang Zhang doesn't seem willing to let go of Ming He, he told Zhu Tao that Ming He's a threat too. Zhu Tao explained to Wang Zhang that Tang Ning is the only superhuman at the Heaven Flare rank there, so without her, everyone else wouldn't be able to survive. After realizing Zhu Tao's point, Wang Zhang immediately jumped towards Tang Ning. With Zhu Tao's tentacles still attached to their necks, Wang Zhang and the second generation beasts attacked Tang Ning. 
Jiang Wenwen moved in front of Tang Ning and told her that she would stall Wang Zhang and the second generation beasts. She used her ultimate soul art, the Scorching Tower. Fine lines of flame formed into a tower and its scorching heat prevented Wang Zhang and the second generation beasts from approaching Tang Ning, Jiang Wenwen, and Ming He. Inside the tower, while maintaining her ultimate soul art, Jiang Wenwen told Tang Ning that without a red sovereign art, all of them would die. Tang Ning disagreed and told Jiang Wenwen that even a red sovereign art wouldn't be enough to kill Zhu Tao. Ming He ran towards Tang Ning and asked if she could use a red sovereign art. Tang Ning said she could, but she expressed concern that Zhu Tao was highly intelligent and had been wary of her the entire time. Tang Ning feared that once Zhu Tao detected a large amount of power accumulating within her, she would sacrifice the second generation beast to protect herself. Ming He asked Tang Ning if it was possible for her to kill Zhu Tao if he eliminated all of the second generation beasts, including Wang Zhang. Tang Ning said she still couldn't guarantee 100% success and worried that in Ming He's state, it would be difficult for him to handle Wang Zhang. Ming He showed Tang Ning the crystal and told her that it could boost his strength, enabling him to kill Wang Zhang with his soul art, but not Zhu Tao. Tang Ning realized that Ming He had been planning to kill the tyrant on his own and use the crystal to defeat Zhu Tao. Ming He told Tang Ning that with the crystal's boost, he would open a path to Zhu Tao, and then she could use her red sovereign art to kill him. Tang Ning still believed it wouldn't work and told Ming He that her ability stood out too much, giving Zhu Tao more than enough time to retaliate. Ming He insisted, saying that there was no better way. Jiang Wenwen, already struggling to maintain her ultimate soul art, urged Tang Ning and Ming He to decide quickly. Ming He asked Tang Ning if she would have more confidence if he provided more of the ice crystal for her to absorb and strengthen her power. Tang Ning said that if the medium was Heaven Flare rank, she would be able to do it. They were running out of time, Jiang Wenwen's ultimate soul art had already been broken. The second generation beasts and Wang Zhang immediately ran towards Ming He, Tang Ning, and Jiang Wenwen. Tang Ming stopped hesitating and positioned her right hand on her chest. At first, there was only a radiating blue light, but shortly after, she pulled out an intricate ice sword from her chest. Tang Ning unleashed her ultimate form, the Wing Supreme of Ice. A pair of black wings grew out of her back. Ice armor formed on her arms and shoulders, and a crown hovered just above her head. Tang Ning looked much more domineering, she swung her sword slightly, and the second generation beasts below her froze. She flapped her wings and immediately flew towards Zhu Tao, stating that she would open a path. Everything she passed through froze to death. Every single one of the second generation beasts died instantly. Unfortunately, Wang Zhang was quick on his feet, he managed to immediately get back to Zhu Tao's side. Since there are only two of them left, Wang Zhang couldn't help but ask Zhu Tao what to do. Zhu Tao didn't reply. She grinned, but Wang Zhang didn't notice. Tang Ning swung her sword towards Zhu Tao, she wanted her to die. Suddenly, Zhu Tao pulled Wang Zhang through the tentacle connected to his neck. Wang Zhang didn't want to die, he pleaded, but to no avail. He was mercilessly used as a meat shield by Zhu Tao. Wang Zhang's frozen corpse fell to the ground. Zhu Tao said to Wang Zhang's corpse that his dying is better than her dying. Tang Ning was already having a hard time catching her breath, she had used too much of her stamina. After seeing that Tang Ning was weakened, Zhu Tao immediately sent her tentacles towards Tang Ning. She said that she predicted that Tang Ning had one strike left. Tang Ning cursed. Her wings were easily broken by Zhu Tao's tentacles. Tang Ning couldn't help but let go of her sword, close her eyes, and grit her teeth. After breaking her wings, Zhu Tao pulled Tang Ning towards her. She lifted Tang Ning in front of her, then took her time praising Tang Ning's body. She said it was so beautiful that she almost couldn't bear to destroy it. But because Tang Ning didn't listen to her, Zhu Tao wanted Tang Ning to suffer a little. While Jiang Wenwen was calling Tang Ning, Ming He's right fist started absorbing the crystal he had. Zhu Tao also started swallowing Tang Ning so they could combine. Zhu Tao put Tang Ning on her stomach. Tang Ning was helpless, she could no longer move. But she was able to fling two of her fingers, sending her crown towards Ming He. She didn't have a choice but to leave the rest to Ming He. The moment the crown positioned itself on Ming He's head, ice shards immediately gathered on Ming He's back. Ming He bent his left knee then jumped. While in midair, the ice shards completely formed into wings. Ming He flew a bit higher. By that time, Zhu Tao had already finished putting Tang Ning on her stomach, she just stared nervously at Ming He. Ming He took a deep breath, then he swung his right arm, with his left hand stretched out in front of him. When Ming He threw a punch towards Zhu Tao, a gigantic ice fist formed and fell towards Zhu Tao. Ming He enclosed Zhu Tao with ice walls to ensure she couldn't escape. Zhu Tao was forced to receive Ming He's attack, she then froze, and her upper body broke in half. Ming He's attack didn't dissipate immediately, it continued to freeze anything and everything from Zhu Tao's position up to the base of the mountain. 
It formed an ice wall that looked like an ice dragon descending the mountain. Meanwhile, below the mountain, Hu Guangyi wondered what was happening on the mountain. Fang Nianrong told him that they should go and check things out. When they saw the huge ice wall, they were shocked. When Zhang Wenmen saw Fang Nianrong and Hu Guangyi, she immediately informed them that Minghe is the one who caused the ice wall. While they were peeking inside the ice wall, Fang Nianrong asked Zhang Wenwen where Minghe was. Hu Guangyi was the first one to see Minghe. He couldn't help but wonder if Minghe was still human. It was revealed that Minghe was tearing into Zhu Tao's stomach while calling for Tang Ming. After some time, Minghe was finally able to tear through Zhu Tao's thick flesh and saw Tang Ming. While repeatedly calling her name, Minghe immediately raised Tang Ning's head. The goddess informed Minghe that Tang Ning's airway had been obstructed by sticky fluids. Without hesitation, Minghe quickly sucked the sticky fluids out of Tang Ning's airways using his mouth. The goddess was appalled. She told Minghe that the liquid was corrosive, so his mouth and throat would be corroded as well. Minghe immediately spat out the sticky fluids he had sucked out of Tang Ning's airways. The goddess said that she wasn't sure if they would be able to save Tang Ning. She warned Minghe that if he continued to suck the sticky fluids, he would end up burning through his own throat, esophagus, and trachea. Minghe stopped for a moment and glanced at the sticky fluid that he spat out. Although the goddess had already warned him, Minghe still continued sucking out the sticky fluids. He didn't want Tang Ning to die. He wouldn't allow anyone else to die right before his eyes. Jiang Wenwen, Fang Nianrong, and Hu Guangyi finally reached where Minghe was. Suddenly, Tang Ning coughed up some of the sticky fluids that had blocked her airways. Minghe and Tang Ning tried to talk to each other, but they couldn't say a word because both of their lips and throats had been burnt. Jiang Wenwen teased the two, saying that they had both been poisoned mute. Professor Tang also arrived. He told Minghe and Tang Ning to quickly drink the liquid that he carried with him. He said they would be fine after drinking it. Later that night, all of them returned to the ancestral hall. While staring at Zhu Tao's frozen severed head, Hu Guangyi said that he still couldn't believe that Ming He managed to kill a lord rank calamity beast. Professor Tang informed Ming He that the other second generation beasts had already been eliminated by the returning students. Ming He tried to say something, but to no avail. Professor Tang told Ming He that the medicine wouldn't work that quickly on him. Fang Nianrong informed Ming He that Tang Ning was already being treated for her injuries. Despite her injuries being more serious, she wouldn't be in any life threatening danger. Ming He stared at Professor Tang. Professor Tang told Ming He that he knows what he's still worried about. He told Ming He that he has already done everything to the best of his abilities. He'll just have to believe that those on the front lines would be able to safely retreat. Meanwhile, by the river 10 kilometers from the border, after seeing that the entire river was filled with blood, Fan Kai immediately instructed everyone to get ready to fight. When a dorsal fin suddenly popped out of the river, everyone was alarmed. The aquatic beast splashed in the water near the floodplain. To their surprise, it was actually Louis, he had wounds and bruises all over his body. He was using a dead beast to escape out of the ruined city. Lu Kayan quickly ran towards her brother. Louis informed Lu Kayan's group that their plan had been thwarted by the Demon King, and none of his group members had managed to survive. Since their main battlefront had also been defeated, Louis said that they should retreat and take the humiliation back with them. Louis suddenly cried. Lu Kayan asked Louis to rest, assuring him that they would bring him back safely. Fan Kai told Louis that he had already completed his mission, so he could leave the rest to them. Louis said that he would rather have died together with the rest of his group members. However, they refused to let him die because he had important news to tell their commander. Louis then took a deep breath. After regaining his composure, Louis said that it was time for them to go. He hoped that they would be able to make their retreat smoothly. Fan Kai told Louis that he shouldn't worry because they had formed this team with the rescue mission in mind. Fan Kai said that although they couldn't enter the demon's nest like Louis, they were still capable enough to protect experts like him and that they were honored to do so. A few days later, seven calamity meters heading towards Minghe's planet could be seen. On the sand desert where the headquarters of the astronomy team was situated, the moment the seven calamity meteors entered the planet's atmosphere, a purple light glowed on top of a building. Somewhere in the sands, multiple machines started gathering purple energy. The calamity meteors were nearing the surface. Based on their trajectory and position, the calamity meteors were expected to crash into the astronomy team's buildings in just a few more seconds. But before it could happen, the machines were done gathering enough purple energy. The machines condensed the purple energy and fired it towards the calamity meteors. The purple beams progressed to collide with the calamity meteors, appearing as though they could destroy anything that came their way. The people in the astronomy team headquarters stared at the collision happening in the night sky. They couldn't help but cheer after witnessing the purple beams destroy the calamity meteors. Meanwhile, at the Nandu Superhuman Institute, students were getting out of their respective buses. Minghe had just gotten off the bus when he heard a student in a blue shirt say that although humanity had been forced to retreat temporarily, 
Humanity had succeeded in the interception plan to stop the Calamity Meteors. A student in a hoodie asked the student in the blue shirt if he's talking about the interception plan that Professor Wu made. The student in the blue shirt confirmed that he is. He thinks that it is a definitive victory for humanity. With the interception plan, the Calamity Meteors that are invading their world will be largely intercepted and destroyed by the astronomy team which means the calamities won't be able to descend into their world endlessly. The man in the blue shirt said that as long as they persevere and clear out the monster nest inside the ruined city, they'll definitely be able to bring forth a new glorious era for mankind. They were amazed by the astronomy team. They cheered, saying that the interception plan made by Professor Wu Long caused humanity to win against the calamities completely. While Ming-He was listening to the student's conversation, someone called his name. When he turned his head, he was shocked. It was actually Liu Kian who called him. After confirming that it is Ming-He, Liu Kian immediately ran towards him. They both smiled, extended their arms, and ran towards each other. They were happy to see that they're both fine. As soon as they hugged each other, Liu Kian said to Ming-He that she's glad to see that he's fine. Ming-He told Liu Kian that seeing her safe and sound makes him very happy. Professor Tang and Tang Ning saw Ming-He, and Tang Ning waved at Ming-He to get his attention. Professor Tang stopped Tang Ning. He told her that the reason why Ming-He nearly killed himself was probably all for Liu Kian. He asked Tang Ning to let Ming-He enjoy his moment a little longer. Tang Ning felt offended. She pointed out that Ming-He is not the only contributor. Professor Tang told Tang Ning that she and Ming-He are the reason why those few cars of people could safely make it back there. Tang Ning suddenly remembered that Professor Tang is one of the creators of the interception plan. But Professor Tang didn't think that it would be feasible, so he gave up on the idea halfway through. He missed out on the opportunity to become one of the greatest contributors of mankind. Professor Tang had a sad face when he said that Professor Wu Long proved that he's right, and he'll become a hero to many from that day onwards. While he nearly messed up a small issue, he's starting to think that he should really just be a regular teacher instead. Later that night, in the sandy desert, the elite team's leader, General Lai, the commander of South Metropolis, the principal of Nandu Superhuman Institute, and the guild master of the Hunter Association clapped their hands to congratulate Professor Wu Long for his achievements. Professor Wu Long told everyone that it was all because of their support that they were able to win. He then bowed and thanked everyone. The leaders simultaneously told Professor Wu Long that they're just fulfilling their responsibilities. Professor Wu Long said that he finally finished his mission after staying up for a few nights, so he wouldn't be attending the celebration feast to have a good rest at home. The leaders laughed, bid their goodbyes before Professor Wu Long left. Professor Wu Long rode a helicopter to his home. A few minutes later, they arrived at a tall tower. Inside the tower, while carrying some papers, Ming-He's big sister was walking near the entrance when the door suddenly opened, and a strong wind blew in. Some of the papers that she was holding got blown away. The papers landed near someone's feet. While picking up the papers, the person said that he thought he was the only one on the astronomy team who would work that late. Ming-He's big sister was shocked to see Professor Wu Long in front of her. Wu Long gave the papers to Ming-He's big sister and told her that she had worked hard. Ming-He's big sister could only tell Wu Long that he had been working hard. Wu Long passed by Ming-He's big sister, telling her to rest early. Ming-He's big sister bowed and thanked Wu Long for protecting the city. Without looking back, Wu Long raised his arm and waved his hand. Meanwhile, in Nandu City, Ming-He walked Liu Kian home. When they arrived, Liu Kian thanked Ming-He for walking her home. Then she told Ming-He that the house is her brother's. She said that she would be staying there for the next few days to take care of her brother because he's injured. Ming-He was shocked, he didn't know that Liu Kian had an older brother. Ming-He and Liu Kian were so focused on their conversation that they didn't notice Liu Yi come out of his house. Liu Yi was wearing a sling to support his injured left shoulder. Their conversation got interrupted when Liu Yi greeted Ming-He. Liu Kian immediately took the opportunity to introduce her older brother. Ming-He was wondering why Liu Yi knew him, so Liu Yi revealed to Ming-He that Liu Kian had been talking to him about Ming-He. Liu Kian blushed and asked her brother not to put words in her mouth, claiming that she hadn't talked to him about Ming-He. Liu Yi suddenly became serious. He said that he had heard from the top brass that the reason why they managed to safely retreat was that a team in Fu Rong Town had managed to take down a dangerous enemy. Liu Yi patted Ming-He's shoulder. He then thanked Ming-He, saying that his hard work was the reason why he and Liu Kian were able to make it back safely. Ming-He told Liu Yi that it was just a coincidence and that he was happy that he was able to help him on the front lines. Liu Yi suddenly looked like he was in pain. Then he started coughing. He told Ming-He that he wanted to invite him inside to thank him but couldn't because he was still injured. Ming-He told Liu Yi not to worry about it because he was just there to walk Liu Kian home. 
Ming He excused himself, saying that it was getting late and that he needed to return home to let his sister know that he was safe. Lu Kayan told Ming He to take care on his way home, then she asked him to remember that the day after tomorrow was her birthday. Ming He told Lu Kayan that he would and then he said goodnight to her. Ming He walked on the silent streets of Nandu City, people seemed to have gone to sleep already. While walking, Ming He realized that he was mistaken, thinking that Lu Yi was Lu Kayan's boyfriend. Then he wondered if everything that had happened in Nandu City over the past few days was Lu Kayan's attempt to go on a date with him. Ming He couldn't help but blush when he thought about the time when they were walking on the street, watching a movie together, and when Lu Kayan kissed him on the cheek. But then, Ming He remembered the letter. He wondered why Lu Kayan didn't respond to him directly. A few minutes later, when Ming He arrived, his sister had just come out of the shower. While drying her hair, Ming He's sister told him that a girl called, asking if he was home already. Ming He checked his phone. He then realized that it was actually dead. He quickly ran towards the house's telephone, saying that he would call her back. When the call connected, Ming He immediately informed the person that he had arrived home safely, and that his phone had died. It was already time to sleep, so they didn't talk for too long. But before he ended the call, Ming He didn't forget to say goodnight. His sister leaned forward and asked Ming He if it was his girlfriend from school. Ming He said that the person wasn't his girlfriend. He told his sister that the person was just his classmate from junior college. For the person to purposely call so she could check if Ming He got home, Ming He's sister thinks that the two have a unique relationship. She asked Ming He who the person was and if she had seen her before. Ming He told his sister that it was Lu Kayan and that she had met her before. Ming He's sister remembered Lu Kayan. She told Ming He that Lu Kayan visited him often when he was unconscious and even left him a well-wishing letter. Upon hearing about the letter, Ming He exclaimed. He asked his sister if Lu Kayan had replied to him. His sister revealed that Lu Kayan had. She told Ming He that she was busy with work at that time, so she didn't keep the letter for him. His sister said that the letter may have been thrown away by the cleaners or nurses in the hospital. Ming He picked up the telephone, but he stopped himself from calling Lu Kayan. It was already late at night, so Ming He decided to ask Lu Kayan on her birthday. Noticing the change in Ming He's mood, Ming He's sister asked him if the letter was important. Ming He just told his sister that it was nothing. Since Ming He didn't want to talk about it, his sister changed the topic. She asked Ming He to guess who the person she met on her way home was. Ming He didn't bother guessing. He directly asked his sister who the person she met was. His sister didn't mind revealing that she met Professor Wu Long. Ming He's sister said that she had never known that Professor Wu Long would be so young and that seeing a living hero for the first time gave her quite a shock. Ming He told his sister that he had seen Wu Long when he accompanied her for her interview and even gave him a magazine. Ming He's sister didn't believe Ming He. She said that Wu Long is a hero, so he would never read those kinds of magazines. She ordered Ming He to stop slandering her idol. Ming He sighed and told his sister that it was true that Wu Long is an amazing person. Remembering what happened on the front lines, Ming He said that although they had all tried their best, they still failed. The failure of their battle was originally a shame and blemish that was supposed to be borne by every superhuman. But Wu Long's success made their failures seem small in comparison. Ming He's sister told Ming He that he shouldn't put himself down like that because they're still young, and he'll be able to help out more in the future. Later that night, instead of sleeping, Ming He went to the gymnasium. The sound of someone punching the punching bag echoed inside the training room. To further polish his punching skills, Ming He focused on punching the punching bag. Suddenly, the goddess who was holding some kind of liquid materialized behind Ming He, asking him if he was ready. The goddess told Ming He that she had never thought that the parasites living on the Calamity Beast could produce such pure liquid stardust. She said that the reason should be linked to them having to adjust to the human body. Ming He asked the goddess if he could consume the liquid stardust without holding himself back. The goddess told Ming He that he could, as long as his body constitution was able to keep up and adapt to the collision of powers in his body, he would be able to break free from his limitations and increase his strength without any consequences. The liquid stardust they had was actually gathered from Zhu Tao. While Ming He was saving Tang Ming, the goddess found the liquid stardust on Zhu Tao's frozen severed head, so she took it. The goddess informed Ming He that after a year's worth of nourishing, his body's constitution had become much more incredible than before. Ming He was excited to finally become a Heaven Flare rank. Without further ado, Ming He drank the liquid stardust. While Ming He was meditating, the goddess told him that after reaching the Heaven Flare rank, he would be able to understand the essence of the Red Sovereign superhuman talent. Ming He closed his eyes and focused on meditating. Moments later, Ming He was momentarily shocked when he saw Zhu Tao inside his spiritual world. He thought that the goddess was just giving him extra simulation training. But the goddess told him that it wasn't a simulation that she had created for him. The goddess informed Ming He that it was Zhu Tao's remaining grudge. Confused, Ming He asked the goddess what she meant. 
While Zhu Tao was coming towards Ming He, the goddess explained that Zhu Tao's liquid stardust was refusing to recognize Ming He as its master and was trying to reject being absorbed by him. As he jumped towards Zhu Tao, Ming He said that it was simple for him because he liked to use his fists to have a conversation. While laughing, the goddess told Ming He to beat Zhu Tao. Ming He caught Zhu Tao's right arm, and while swinging his right arm, he told Zhu Tao that it was his territory, so she wouldn't be able to stop him from advancing in rank. Then he ordered Zhu Tao to obey him. Simultaneously, in a tall building which was a secret laboratory, Tang Ning was walking with Lin Qingyu in the hallway. She asked Lin Qingyu what had happened to her uncle. Lin Qingyu told Tang Ning that they didn't know what had happened to Professor Tang either. Professor Tang had just shut himself inside the room and disallowed them from entering. Lin Qingyu said that if he hadn't heard the snarling and growling from Professor Tang, he would have never asked Tang Ning to come over. Tang Ning asked him what her uncle's job was there. Lin Qingyu said that he wasn't allowed to tell her that. He informed Tang Ning that Professor Tang was probably on the brink of a mental breakdown. Professor Tang had been fine the last time Tang Ning saw him, so she couldn't help but wonder why he was in such a state. They stopped in front of a door. Lin Qingyu told Tang Ning that Professor Tang had been rejecting all of them and refusing to let them get near him. Tang Ning asked Lin Qingyu to let her handle the situation. While Tang Ning was calling her uncle and knocking on the door, Lin Qingyu walked away. Inside the room, everything was in a mess. The room was dark, but it could be seen that there were wine bottles, plant samples, and a lot of papers scattered inside the room. Professor Tang was cowering in the middle of the mess with a wine bottle by his side. He opened his eyes when he heard Tang Ning's call. From the way Professor Tang looked, it was evident that he was under extreme mental pressure. Tang Ning was about to call Professor Tang, but she was cut off when the door suddenly opened slightly. Professor Tang peeked and observed the surroundings, making sure that no one else was around. After making sure that no one else was around, he invited Tang Ning to come inside. Tang Ning didn't say a word and silently entered the room. After seeing the mess in her uncle's room, Tang Ning couldn't help but ask Professor Tang what he was doing. She told him that even if there was no progress in his research, there was no need for him to do that. Professor Tang picked up a wine bottle and told Tang Ning that he had hoped there would be no progress in his research at all. Professor Tang silently walked towards the balcony of his room. For some reason, his balcony didn't have glass or safety railings. Professor Tang stepped onto the ledge and sat down. While Professor Tang was drinking his wine, Tang Ning moved closer to him and asked him why he was so upset. Professor Tang said that he had lost. He pointed out that he had completely lost. Tang Ning asked Professor Tang why he was still unable to get over what happened back then. Professor Tang put both of his hands on his head. Then he screamed, saying that they had completely lost, and repeatedly screamed that he was a criminal. Tang Ning comforted Professor Tang and asked him not to get upset, and to tell her what happened. Suddenly, shadows sneaked inside the room. When Tang Ning noticed that someone was behind them, she immediately turned around. She exclaimed when she saw people she didn't know standing inside the room. She asked them who they were, but they just ignored her. It was then revealed that they were actually the Dragon Tooth Group. The Dragon Tooth Group leader informed Professor Tang that the remedy plan is already in action. Then the Dragon Tooth Group's leader reported to Professor Tang that all of the Dragon Tooth members are awaiting his command. Professor Tang seemed to have come back to his senses. He had a determined look when he told everyone that what they are about to do is a suicide mission that has to be done in order to kindle the flames. The Dragon Tooth group members and leaders saluted Professor Tang. Then the Dragon Tooth leader told Professor Tang that although they are merely acquaintances, they still share the same goal. So even if they were to die for the mission, none of them would regret it. Professor Tang expressed his approval of what the Dragon Tooth leader said. Professor Tang stood up, then in a loud voice, he told everyone that they may fail, but they must never live a life of regret. On the day of Liu Kian's birthday, it was getting foggy in the area where Ming He's sister lives. Inside his sister's apartment, Ming He remained still while his sister helped him wear his necktie. Ming He stood in front of a mirror, wearing formal attire. His sister told him that he looked really handsome, so he'd better bring his girl home that day. Ming He reminded his big sister that he was just going to attend a class reunion. His sister suddenly had a teary eye. She told Ming He that it was wonderful that he had grown up so fast to the point where he could finally take care of himself. She felt so happy for Ming He. Ming He told his sister that she was the one who had it hard, since she had been taking good care of him all the time. Ming He's sister accepted Ming He's words and then walked towards the door. She told Ming He that she needed to go to work, so he'd have to pick out a present for Liu Kian himself. Later that day, in the bustling city of Nandu, Ming He was crossing a pedestrian lane while carrying two gift bags. He was smiling while looking at his gift for Liu Kian and for his sister. Suddenly, he heard a squeal of a tire. Moments later, two cars collided in front of Ming He. The collision was so strong that the other car's bumper got blown away because of the impact. Ming He stared at the cars wide-eyed. 
After witnessing the accident, Minghee's memory from many years ago resurfaced. Images flashed in his head. A violet car crashed into another car. Both cars were in a horrendous state, their windows and windshields were all broken, and the car's tanks were leaking. Inside the violet car was a family of three. The parents seemed to be heavily injured and unconscious, and the boy in the back seat was crying while looking at his parents. Ming-he came back to his senses when he heard a young man and a middle-aged man shouting at each other. The middle-aged man cursed at the young man, and with a loud voice, he asked him why he was driving so recklessly. The young man blamed the middle-aged man for not turning on his headlights despite how foggy it was that day. Ming-he just minded his own business and walked away, ignoring the drivers who were still arguing about who was responsible for the collision. A few minutes after walking away from the accident, Ming-he arrived at Louis's mansion. Ming-he didn't idle around and immediately rang the doorbell. Lu Kian greeted Ming-he as soon as she opened the door. While he was giving his gift to Lu Kian, Ming-he wished her a happy birthday. Lu Kian thanked Ming-he and then informed him that she had also invited some of their old classmates. Lu Kian wanted Ming-he to follow her to the second floor where their old classmates were, but Ming-he asked her to wait. Ming-he told Lu Kian that there was something he had been waiting a long time to tell her, and he felt like he needed to hear her thoughts about it. When Lu Kian said they would talk about it after going up to the second floor, Ming-he insisted that it would be better if they talked about it privately. Lu Kian reluctantly agreed, she looked bothered and uncomfortable, but Ming-he didn't notice. Ming-he was fidgeting while he asked Lu Kian if she had given him a letter before he lost consciousness. Lu Kian weakly told Ming-he that she had. Ming-he noticed that Lu Kian looked pale, so he asked her if she was sick. Lu Kian told Ming-he that she wasn't sick, and then he asked Ming-he if he had read the letter after waking up. Ming-he informed Lu Kian that the letter had disappeared, so he never knew what was written inside it. Lu Kian was shocked, she had always thought that Ming-he had read her letter. Ming-he held Lu Kian's arms and told her that he had been thinking about it for the past few days, and that he had been trying to guess what her answer was in that letter, whether she rejected him, agreed to go out with him, or simply wished for him to get well soon. Ming-he closed his eyes and said that it wasn't that important anymore because what was important to him was what was currently happening. He told Lu Kian that just like when they were still in high school, when his heart raced in his chest after looking at her, and when he became really conscious of everything related to her, he would also dream of a future with both of them in it. Ming-he stopped beating around the bush and asked Lu Kian if she would go out with him. Lu Kian blushed and then hugged Ming-he. While she was in Ming-he's arms, she told Ming-he that she had already agreed to go out with him. As if remembering something important, Lu Kian suddenly opened her eyes. Lu Kian pushed Ming-he out of the mansion and told him that he needed to leave quickly. Ming-he was puzzled as to why Lu Kian was suddenly acting that way. He became even more confused when Lu Kian informed him that they wanted to capture him. When Ming-he turned around, there were already soldiers behind him. The soldiers raised their weapons and shields, making it evident that they were all wary of Ming-he. More armed soldiers arrived and surrounded Ming-he. Ming-he couldn't help but ask why they were surrounding him. Louis came out of the mansion and asked Ming-he to stop resisting. Louis informed Ming-he that their investigation had revealed that he was a member of Dragon Tooth, and that orders had been given by the superiors to capture him. Ming-he said he didn't understand and asked Lu Kian what was happening. Lu Kian told Louis that he must have been mistaken, that Ming-he was not a traitor to humanity. Louis said that was why they needed to check. Ming-he was confused as to why he was being branded as a traitor and told Louis that even if they were to capture him, they still needed to give him a proper reason. Louis asked Ming-he if he, as a Dragon Tooth member, was truly ignorant of what had happened. Ming-he said that he had no idea and that he had never heard of Dragon Tooth before. Louis pointed at the television inside the mansion and told Ming-he to see for himself. On the television, the reporter was saying that the Dragon Tooth group belonging to the North City had suddenly turned their backs on humanity. With the North City's Professor Tang Hang and Dragon Tooth's Lai Huang as the heads of the rebel group, they had started to capture the Heavenly Scripture Mountain. The reporter said that, according to official reports, those Dragon Tooth members were most likely traitors who had been hiding among them. They were referred to as the Heavenly Sovereignty Organization by experts. Professor Tang Hang was the brain of the Heavenly Sovereignty and was referred to as their teacher. The reporter informed the viewers that the Heavenly Sovereignty's target is the person who finished the Calamity Interception Plan, Professor Wu Long. The Heavenly Scripture Mountain has been placed in lockdown by the North City's Superhuman Special Forces, and it has been reported that the situation inside has become extremely complicated. Most of the Heavenly Sovereignty members have been captured, and the Superhuman Special Forces have suffered immense losses while trying to rescue others. Ming-he was at a loss. He couldn't understand how things turned out that way. How Professor Tang became the leader of the Heavenly Sovereignty. 
He denied everything he heard and saw, believing that it's not possible, that things aren't like that. Louis told Minghee that the fact that he appeared in his mansion shows that he didn't join in with the plan to betray humanity. But according to their investigations, Minghee joined the Dragon Tooth group a year ago and was secretly carrying out missions for them. Louis asked Minghee not to resist, then he ordered the soldiers to capture Minghee. Louis pointed out to Minghee that the group he belongs to has completely turned traitor and that they're standing on the opposite end of humanity. Louis said that he believed Minghee was enticed by the Dragon Tooth and inducted into the organization without knowing anything. But that doesn't mean that Minghee is part of the Heavenly Sovereignty Organization. While exuding a dangerous aura, Minghee asked Louis if they're accusing him of being part of the Heavenly Sovereignty Organization. Louis told Minghee that things have become much more complicated than he can imagine. He begged Minghee to cooperate with their investigation. Louis promised that their superior would ensure that justice is served to Minghee. Louis said that if Minghee would resist, he'll just be admitting that he's a traitor. When Minghee expressed that he can't trust any of them, Louis said that that's why they need his cooperation. Louis told Minghee that he's unique, and both Liu Kian and he believe that he hasn't been influenced or controlled by the Dragon Tooth group, and that he may also be the key to the entirety of that case because he has connections with the Dragon Tooth group and Tang He, who have all attacked the Heavenly Scripture Mountain becoming traitors of humanity. Louis asked Minghe if he still didn't understand the gravity of the situation. While he was pointing at Liu Kian, who was crying, Louis begged Minghe not to resist. On behalf of Liu Kian, as her brother, and as the Special Forces Vice Captain, Louis promised Minghe that he'd be safe. Minghe calmed down and retracted his aura. He decided to listen to Louis. After seeing Minghe's willingness to cooperate, a soldier immediately handcuffed Minghe. Liu Kian asked Louis why Minghe was being cuffed even though he was just going to cooperate with their investigation. Louis explained to Liu Kian that they were in a sensitive period, so they had to be cautious. Even though Louis told her not to worry, Liu Kian still wanted to go and accompany Minghe. Louis decided to take Liu Kian along since there were some things she had to provide statements for as well. Meanwhile, at the main gate of the astronomy team, drones were flying around the building. Soldiers were hiding behind a pile of sandbags, preparing something. A machine was firing a beam towards the astronomy team's building, and a soldier called Lu Lin a traitor. He threatened Lu Lin that if she dared to harm Professor Wu Long, they would definitely destroy all of them. Meanwhile, inside the astronomy team's building, Lu Kian asked the Dragon Tooth members to hold on because they needed more time. The Dragon Tooth group members blocked lives depended on it. At the same time, in the Special Forces Command Center, in the building's underground interrogation room, Minghe was left alone in the interrogation room. His hands were still handcuffed, and his legs were fixed to the chair on which he was sitting. He just waited there silently. One Goddess asked Minghe if there could be and the group he had joined wasn't Dragon Tooth. Through his thoughts, Minghe told the Goddess that he is not the kind of person who would struggle with thoughts like that. Whether it's Dragon Tooth or the Justice Team, he knows that he has done nothing wrong. The Goddess agrees with Minghe. She thinks that the problem probably lies with Dragon Tooth's upper echelons or that there has been some sort of conflict among humans. The door of the interrogation room suddenly opened. With a pile of documents in hand, the Vice Captain of the Special Forces, Hong Xiao, entered the interrogation room. Louis was following behind her. As soon as Louis sat down, Minghe immediately asked him where Liu Kian is. Louis pointed to his side, saying that Liu Kian is over there. Hong Xiao didn't beat around the bush. She told Minghe that they have some questions for him. Minghe asked them if they could bring Liu Kian in because she's the only person Minghe trusted at that time. Hong Xiao asked for Louis's consent by simply giving him an inquiring look. Knowing what Hong Xiao meant, Louis nodded in response. When Liu Kian entered the interrogation room, she immediately went to Minghe's side and sat beside him. While Minghe was being interrogated by Hong Xiao, Louis was giving them a death stare. Liu Kian couldn't help but look away out of embarrassment. Meanwhile, Hong Xiao was telling Minghe that after understanding and analyzing what happened to him, the conclusions they have drawn are still considered rather favorable to him. Minghe told Hong Xiao that he has yet to understand what has happened. Hong Xiao admitted to Minghe that they're still not very sure why themselves because they've always believed that the Dragon Tooth team was humanity's most loyal strength. However, the truth was displayed before their very eyes. Hong Xiao informed Minghe that the Dragon Tooth team has not just occupied the astronomy team, but they've also tried to kill the hero of humanity, Professor Wu Long. 
Hong Xiao's words left Ming He speechless. While flipping through some documents, Hong Xiao told Ming He that his records are very clean, so they believe that he was manipulated by the Dragon Tooth group and that they hope Ming He can be aware enough to recognize what's happening. Ming He insisted that he wasn't deceived. He told Hong Xiao that his mind isn't muddled, but he's confused as to what's actually happening. Hong Xiao said that all of them are confused. She informed Ming He that all five teams of the Dragon Tooth have taken up arms to guard the Astronomy Mountain. They aren't communicating with the outside world, and the negotiators they've sent out were unable to communicate with them. Ming He asked Hong Xiao if she's sure that it was the Dragon Tooth's Professor Tang Hang. Hong Xiao told Ming He that they're very sure. She said that Ming He should be very familiar with their current commander, Luo Lin, the one who gave him his missions. Ming He was surprised to know that Luo Lin was there too. Hong Xiao said that in order to understand what's happening there, they need someone who isn't influenced to communicate with them. She told Ming He that they also believe that within those traitors, there are people like him who have been deceived. And if Ming He can become their connection to the Dragon Tooth group, perhaps he'd be able to make those familiar with him finally understand the mistakes they're making. Then maybe the chaos can be resolved properly. Ming He asked Hong Xiao why they had chosen him to be the connection between all of them. Hong Xiao explained to Ming He that they knew that in the year and a half following his awakening from the hospital, he had had no involvement with those people. While flipping through the documents, Hong Xiao told Ming He that during that year and a half, everything he had done was not against his will. He even had an extreme sense of responsibility towards humanity. Lui told Ming He that they believed in him. Hong Xiao said that was the reason why they needed him to infiltrate the Dragon Tooth Mountain as part of the Dragon Tooth group, to secretly rescue Professor Wu Long. Lui took out a map. He pointed to an area on the map and told Ming He that before all communication was cut off, the last thing they had received was a distress call originating from there. Lui said that Professor Wu Long had already taken his subordinates with him and they were hiding out in the Six Star venue. Lui then informed Ming He that within the venue, there were multiple hidden shelters, so it would only be a matter of time before they were found. Ming He got worried about his sister, so he asked Hong Xiao what had happened to the workers of the astronomy team. Hong Xiao informed Ming He that most of the workers were also hidden inside the venue's shelters. Ming He was relieved. Hong Xiao said that there wasn't enough time. She told Ming He that the special forces would launch a frontal assault and attempt to break through their front lines at the gate. While they were engaged in the fight, Ming He had to find Professor Wu Long and bring him to safety. A soldier suddenly entered the interrogation room. The soldier came to Hong Xiao's side and whispered something to her. Hong Xiao and Lu Yi stood up simultaneously. Hong Xiao informed Ming He that he had five minutes to decide whether he would agree to proceed with their plan. She wanted Ming He to decide for himself whether he would cooperate with them for the bigger picture, and be free from their suspicions or sit there and wait for an official trial. Before leaving, Lu Yi advised Ming He to carefully think things through. Ming He and Lu Kian were the only ones left in the interrogation room but a CCTV camera was installed to observe them. Liu Kian apologized to Ming He for not warning him in advance. Ming He seemed not to care, he just told Liu Kian that it's fine. Liu Kian asked Ming He what he's planning to do. Ming He told her that he'll enter the astronomy mountain. He said that he must know the reason as to why all of it had happened. Ming He suddenly thought about his older sister, but he didn't tell Liu Kian about it. Out of nowhere, Ming He asked Liu Kian if she believes in him. Liu Kian told Ming He that she does, especially since he was the one who rescued her. Then she told Ming He that she has no idea why he's not willing to admit things. Ming He moved closer to Liu Kian. He told her that he has a question to ask that she must answer honestly. Liu Kian hummed in agreement. Liu Kian exclaimed when Ming He suddenly moved closer to her ear. She couldn't help but blush while listening to what Ming He was saying. Moments later, they both looked at something. Then Liu Kian moved closer to Ming He's ear and whispered something. A person watching them from outside the interrogation room wondered what they were talking about. The person next to him asked if he really wants to hear what couples whisper to each other. The man realized that he doesn't want to, so he just let it go. After five minutes, Hong Xiao entered the interrogation room. She immediately asked Ming He if he has decided on what he'll do. Ming He told her that he had already thought it through and that he had decided to cooperate with them. After hearing Ming He's decision, Hong Xiao expressed her satisfaction. She then told Ming He that they'll send someone to escort him to the back of the mountain. Hong Xiao said that Ming He can go in from there. 
While Hong Zhao was unlocking Minghe's handcuffs, she told Minghe that if the Dragon Tooth group somehow finds him, he can say that he's a member, and they probably won't make things difficult for him. After getting freed, Minghe stood up, then he told Hong Zhao that he understands. Hong Zhao informed Minghe that a tracker had been placed on him so they could understand the situation better and monitor each and every move he made. She then told Minghe that in order to prevent him from betraying them, Lu Yu would be following him pointing out that Lu Yi was allowed to judge for himself whether to execute him if Lu Yi thought that he was acting strangely. Ming He asked Hong Xiao if she was sure that she wanted to do it, since it was a preventive measure that they had to take. Hong Xiao could only apologize to Ming He. Lu Yi reassured Ming He that as long as both of their goals were to rescue Wu Long, he would help him. Hong Xiao was pleased when Ming He finally agreed. After saying that she believed that neither of them would disappoint her, Hong Xiao ordered Ming He and Lui to prepare to move out. Suddenly, Lu Kian said that she wanted to join too. Ming He and Lui immediately told Lu Kian that she should just stay there because the mission was dangerous. But Lu Kian insisted. She told Hong Xiao that she would like to apply to join Ming He's team. Lu Kian expressed that Ming He still couldn't fully trust everything that Hong Xiao had said had happened, and that Lu Lai couldn't trust Ming He due to his identity either, so they would have differences of opinion while carrying out the mission. She wanted Hong Xiao to understand that the two could never complete the task of rescuing Wu Long when they were suspicious of each other. Seeing that Hong Xiao was starting to consider Lu Kian's application, Ming He and Lu Yi said that Lu Kian shouldn't go no matter what. To prove her point, Lu Kian told Hong Xiao that, Considering how the two reacted, it was apparent that, at least with regard to her, Ming He and Lu Yi's opinions still remained the same. Hong Xiao finally agreed to let Lu Kian be the third member of the special unit that would rescue Wu Long. Lu Kian, Ming He, and Lu Yi simultaneously acknowledged Hong Xiao's words. Lu Kian looked at Lu Yi and playfully stuck her tongue out. Later that day, while the Dragon Tooth members were busy confronting the special forces, the special unit ran towards the Astronomy Mountain's dorms using the small path behind the mountain. When they had successfully entered the astronomy team's premises, Lu Yi informed the two that they needed to pass through those dorms first, then proceed through the mountain's tunnel and reach the square before entering the venue where Wu Long was hiding. While they passed through the dorms, Ming He noticed that the astronomy team had retreated rather hastily. Suddenly, he saw someone going down the stairs. Unfamiliar with the faces of the three, the Dragon Tooth member asked Ming He to reveal his identity. Lu Kian and Lui eyed the Dragon Tooth member warily. After introducing himself, Ming He told the Dragon Tooth member that he was part of their group. When Ming He showed his Dragon Tooth identification plaque, the Dragon Tooth member apologized to Ming He for not recognizing that they were on the same team. Ming He told the Dragon Tooth member that their group of three had been following orders from Liu Lin to check through the back of the mountain to prevent people from sneaking in. Convinced by Ming He's words, the Dragon Tooth member said that Ming He had worked hard so that they could proceed with their mission without making the Dragon Tooth member suspicious. Lu Yi told Ming He that they should go and check the tunnel. When they entered the tunnel, Lu Kian appreciated Ming He's acting. Ming He expressed that he still felt a little guilty about lying to the Dragon Tooth members. Ming He suddenly exclaimed when he saw three Dragon Tooth members at the end of the tunnel. The Dragon Tooth member stopped Ming He and asked him who he was. Ming He calmly revealed his identity and then showed his identity plaque, confirming that Ming He was indeed part of their group. The Dragon Tooth member asked Lu Yi and Lu Kian to reveal their identities too. Unsure of what to say, Ming He told the Dragon Tooth member that Lu Kian and Lu Yi were his team members. Since Ming He claimed that they were his team members, the Dragon Tooth member asked Lu Kian and Lu Yi to show their identity plaques or their team plaques. Ming He was about to make an excuse when Lu Yi suddenly told the Dragon Tooth member that he would show him the team plaque. Lu Yi moved closer to the Dragon Tooth member, and when he got close enough, his eyes emitted a dangerous light. The Dragon Tooth member didn't even have the chance to react as Lu Yi was mercilessly punched in the abdomen. Lu Yi then swiftly moved forward and chopped the bald man's neck with his palm, making the bald man lose consciousness. Knowing that she didn't stand a chance against Lu Yi, the woman quickly ran away. Lu Yi activated his soul art while focusing his attention on the woman. The woman asked someone to inform their leader that they had found invaders inside the tunnel when, out of nowhere, a hand formed above her. The woman was already in the hand's grip when the person on the other end of the call asked her what she had found. Louis took the woman's phone and crushed it with his hand. Louis urged them to proceed with their mission, anticipating that the Dragon Tooth group had already found out about their infiltration. Ming He was shocked, while Lu Kian was glad to see that her brother seemed to have completely recovered. Lu Kian and Ming He stepped over the unconscious Dragon Tooth members and immediately followed behind Louis. 
While running, Ming He and the goddess discussed how strong Lu Yi was. The dragon tooth members they had just encountered were around Corona rank, but Lu Yi was able to completely stop their movements in a split second. The goddess told Ming He that if he were to do something, Lu Yi might be able to stop him. Ming He said that they should see how things went first. He expressed that it was at least better than having to stay in the interrogation room. When Lu Kayan asked him who he had been talking to, Ming He just told Lu Kayan that he had been thinking about their next route. He said that he had been there before and that if they headed towards the astronomy center's square, there was a high chance that they would be surrounded. Hearing what Ming He said, Lu Yi informed the two that the Dragon Tooth's first and second groups were incredibly strong and that he was certain that if they came across their leader or instructor, he wouldn't be able to get past them. Ming He told Lu Yi that they had to go around the workers' canteen, saying that he remembered his sister telling him before that the workers' canteen had an express route to quickly send food to each astronomy team's department. Lu Kayan asked him how his sister had known about all that information, so Ming He explained that his sister worked there as a cataloger, and that when she had been an intern there, she used to make tea and transport food there. After Lu Kayan expressed that it would definitely help them, Ming He immediately led the way toward the workers' canteen. Moments later, the Dragon Tooth members who had been looking around the area at the end of the tunnel grouped up after failing to find anyone. Through a call, a man who had seemed to be in a higher position scolded the surveillance members and those on duty for letting someone infiltrate the mountain. When the man had asked the surveillance leader who the infiltrators were, the surveillance leader had reported that the identities of the people who had put down the fifth team's three members were unclear. The man had then ordered the surveillance leader to strengthen their defenses, pointing out that the infiltrators could not be allowed to ruin their plan. Meanwhile, the whole area of Shaoling had been covered by thick mist. The people had wondered why the mist was not dissipating. Not understanding what kind of weather it was, they had gotten so irritated that they had started to think that it was purposely trying to prevent them from going out. On television, the reporter had informed the citizens that the huge mist that had fallen on their city was estimated to be present for the entire day. She had asked them to be careful, to remain at their homes, and to not exit their homes carelessly. Some people had ridden a helicopter and flown around the area of Shaoling City to get a better look at the strange phenomena. After having had an aerial view of the whole city, they had still failed to understand what was happening. All they had been able to tell was that their city seemed to have been completely enveloped by the strange mist. On the Heavenly Scripture Mountain, a group of Dragon Tooth members rode a car and roamed around the area to look for the infiltrators. Out of nowhere, they suddenly lost their communications. The fifth Dragon Tooth team leader, Feng Hai, asked one of her members if she had not found out where the intruders were going. The woman just informed Feng Hai that the members who had fought the intruders at the back of the mountain had told them that the first groups Ming He had brought two people with him into that area. Feng Hai didn't remember Ming He from when they were working together. Feng Hai suddenly cursed, realizing that Ming He must have turned his back on their organization. Feng Hai ordered the woman to let the other teams know that if they saw Ming He, they should take him down immediately. She then instructed the rest of her group to follow her. At the same time, Ming He, Lu Kayan, and Lu Yi, who had just kept on running without stopping, got closer to their destination in no time. They just needed to cross the square, and they would reach the place where they needed to go. Feng Hai, who was waiting in the square, expressed that she was right. Waiting for the infiltrators to come to them was much easier than trying to find them. Ming He was surprised. He asked Feng Hai if she was also a member of Dragon Tooth. After introducing herself, Feng Hai told Ming He that she had heard of him and that she never thought that he would betray them. Ming He felt offended after being called a traitor. He asked Feng Hai why she seemed unaware of what she was doing. Feng Hai told Ming He that he should know what their reason was since the Dragon Tooth group had taught him before inducting him into the group that the Dragon Tooth is the last line of defense for humanity. Lu Yi expressed that he couldn't believe that a member of the Dragon Tooth organization, an organization that had been infiltrated by the Heavenly Sovereignty, still had the guts to say something as self-righteous as that. He told Feng Hai that she was a lost cause. Lu Yi then instructed Ming He and Lu Kayan to go ahead and wait for him in front. He wanted to handle the fifth Dragon Tooth team alone. When Feng Hai asked him if he was Lu Yi, the vice captain of the special forces that she had long heard about, Lu Yi confirmed that it was indeed him. Despite knowing Lu Yi's achievements, she still told him that he might not have had the strength to fight against the Dragon Tooth. Lu Yi suddenly appeared beside Feng Hai. He told her that there was no need for them to talk any longer. After witnessing Lu Yi's blank skill firsthand, Feng Hai's team members couldn't help but exclaim. Lu Yi attempted to chop Feng Hai's neck, but Feng Hai moved her head to the side, dodging Lu Yi's chop. While Feng Hai was supporting herself so she wouldn't fall, Lu Yi stretched his right leg. 
When Feng Hai stood up, Lu Yi's foot was what greeted her face. A loud bang was heard as Feng Hai failed to dodge Lu Yi's kick. But when Lu Yi saw Feng Hai's face, his eyes widened in surprise. Feng Hai actually managed to block Lu Yi's kick with her hand. She told Lu Yi that his instant attack was incredible, but it couldn't escape her mutated eyes. Lu Yi just snorted. He continued to attack Feng Hai despite Feng Hai managing to dodge and block all of his attacks. Feng Hai ordered her team to take down Ming He and Lu Kian, saying that she'd handle Lu Yi alone. The woman on Feng Hai's team immediately aimed a punch at Ming He. In response, Ming He also aimed a punch at the woman. The impact of the collision of their fists was so strong that it sent shockwaves around them. One of Feng Hai's team members couldn't help glancing at the woman as she got pushed back by Ming He's punch. Seemingly preparing to attack, Liu Kian crouched and covered her left palm with lightning. Surprised by Ming He's strength, the woman wondered if it was the reason why he was drafted into the group. Liu Yi suddenly appeared behind the woman who was still trying to figure out how Ming Yi had become so strong even though he hadn't joined the Dragon Tooth for long. The floor broke as Lu Yi's punch smashed the woman's head into it. Before she could figure out how Lu Yi had managed to quickly get behind her without her noticing, the woman's eyes widened, feeling the danger that was coming towards her. Feng Hai screamed at the woman, telling her to watch out. Out of nowhere, one of Feng Hai's team members appeared in front of the woman. He managed to block Lu Kian's kick but was hit by Lu Yi's punch. After rescuing the woman, Feng Hai called Lu Yi a despicable bastard. Lu Yi ignored Feng Hai's insults and just instructed Lu Kian and Ming He to go ahead, saying that he would follow them from behind. Believing in her brother's decision, Lu Kian agreed. She told Lu Yi to be careful before she ran away. Ming He and Lu Kian ran so fast that they were able to instantly cover a distance in the blink of an eye. The goddess informed Ming He that Feng Hai seemed to have some type of eye power that was akin to that of the eyes of flies, making everything she saw be perceived extremely slowly by her. Ming He told the goddess that Lu Yi should have realized it as well since he changed his strategy and decided to take care of the other members instead. The goddess said that with Lu Yi's unfathomable strength and incredible intelligence, it would be difficult for Ming He to get rid of Lu Yi. Having had enough of her opinions, Ming He asked the goddess to get off him. Once again, Lu Kian asked Ming He who he was talking to. Ming He just told Lu Kian that he was talking to himself and that the Star Stadium is right in front of them. He reminded her that the leader had told them that the majority of the astronomy team had retreated into that arena. Moments later, when the square where Lu Yi and the fifth team had fought was already silent, another group of Dragon Tooth members arrived. After finding out that everyone from the fifth team had been killed, they realized that the infiltrator was extremely strong. The leader of the group that had just arrived promised that he would kill the infiltrator with his own two hands. At the same time, Ming He and Lu Kian had entered the Star Stadium. They couldn't believe that that structure was made of aluminum. Everything in there was almost akin to being cut off from the outside, and there were a total of five levels and no basement. The interior was almost maze-like and extremely complicated to figure out, so Ming He was afraid that it was going to be difficult for them to find Wu Long. They didn't even know if Wu Long knew if they were allies or enemies. Lu Kian then added that ever since they came there, she had been having the feeling of being watched, which was making her uncomfortable. When Ming He asked her if she was just mistaken, Lu Kian explained that she gained a stealth power, the sixth sense, after reaching the Heaven Flare rank. Hearing Lu Kian say that she was certain that there was something watching them, Ming He expressed that they should be more careful. A woman who had been hiding in the darkness couldn't help but appreciate how observant Lu Kian was. Ming He and Lu Kian stopped below a hanging giant skeleton to look around and observe their surroundings. A dagger suddenly cut the rope that had hung the skeleton. Lu Kian and Ming He exclaimed, noticing that the skeleton was falling. Knowing that it was already too late for them to run away, Ming He quickly used his body to protect Lu Kian. The skeleton crashed to the ground. It was so heavy that the floor broke, sending dust all over the place. The woman walked toward the skeleton. She expressed that, as superhumans, Ming He and Lu Kian wouldn't be crushed by something as simple as that, saying that she'd be sad if it were to happen. The woman was actually the second Dragon Tooth team leader, Chu Ying. Although she had been expecting that they would not be crushed, Chu Ying was still shocked by what she had seen. Ming He and Lu Kian were lucky enough to have been sheltered by the skeleton's ribcage. Lu Kian said that she had almost forgotten that Ming He had a stealth talent too. Not liking the stealth attack, Ming He told Chu Ying that there was no need for her to play such tricks since they were all superheroes. Chu Ying laughed. It was the first time that she had seen someone bring their family along while doing a critical mission. She couldn't help but ask Ming He and Lu Kian if they hadn't been afraid that they would both end up dying there. 
Ming He asked Chu Ying who she was. Chu Ying nonchalantly introduced herself, after which she asked Ming He who he was and whose dog he was. After hearing Ming He's name, Chu Ying realized that Ming He was her nomadic junior brother who had just been promoted. She revealed to Ming He that instructor Luo had mentioned him before. When Ming He asked her if instructor Luo was there too, Chu Ying confirmed that instructor Luo had indeed been there as well. Ming He remembered the first time that instructor Luo had contacted him. He asked Chu Ying why the Dragon Tooth organization was doing it. Chu Ying just told the two that there was no reason for them to ask, so Lu Kian pointed out to Chu Ying that since they had attacked the astronomy team and kidnapped Wu Long, their motives should be questioned. Chu Ying said that Ming He should know that the Dragon Tooth organization had always operated in the dark. Since Chu Ying still wasn't answering their question, Lu Kian asked her if she knew that they had become traitors to the whole of humanity. Chu Ying finally revealed that the orders they had received were to have absolute obedience and not to ask if their decisions were right or wrong. She then said that the reason Ming He hadn't been brought along for the mission might be because he had spent too little time with the Dragon Tooth organization. Ming He asked Chu Ying where instructor Luo and Tang Hang were. Chu Ying was kind enough to inform Ming He that they were upstairs, but she told them that she had received orders to kill anyone who attempted to go upstairs. As she recovered the dagger that she had used to cut the rope, Chu Ying apologized to Ming He. Chu Ying suddenly threw the dagger at Ming He. Ming He quickly moved to the side to dodge the dagger. While she was controlling multiple daggers, Chu Ying commented that Ming He's skills weren't too bad. She then sent the daggers flying towards Ming He, telling him that she had wanted to see if he could still hide from them. Ming He moved away from the dagger's trajectory, but the daggers followed him. Realizing that Chu Ying's skill locked onto the seven vital points of his body, Ming He became certain that he couldn't dodge the daggers. Liu Kian screamed at Ming He, telling him to get down. Liu Kian's hands exuded lightning, striking all the daggers that had been flying towards Ming He. The daggers got sent away and got stuck to the wall as they were overpowered by Liu Kian's lightning. One of the daggers narrowly missed Ming He. If his luck hadn't activated, it would have wounded him. Seeing that Chu Ying had no weapons left, Ming He quickly ran towards her. Chu Ying crossed her arms to block Ming He's punch. She managed to prevent a direct hit, but the punch was so strong that she got pushed away and only stopped when she had hit the wall. When she opened her eyes, Ming He was already in front of her, aiming to punch her face. Chu Ying moved her head to the side, making Ming He hit nothing but the wall. Desperate to land a clean hit, Ming He used Winding Wind Fist as he chased after Chu Ying. But despite his efforts, all of his punches were narrowly dodged by Chu Ying. Ming He continued his barrage of punches until he punched through a wall. He had lost track of where Chu Ying went. Suddenly, both Ming He and the goddess eyes widened when they felt something. Like a cobra, Chu Ying clung to Ming He's waist, preparing to stab him with her daggers. Liu Kian quickly acted to help Ming He. She formed a thunderbird and aimed it at Ming He's back. Noticing Liu Kian's decisive move, Chu Ying immediately jumped away, leaving Ming He to get electrocuted alone. Moments later, despite taking Liu Kian's attack directly, Ming He didn't fall. Chu Ying praised Liu Kian for being decisive. She said that if Liu Kian had hesitated a split second later, her little boyfriend would have been dead. Liu Kian immediately ran towards Ming He's side to check if he's alright. After telling her that he's fine, Ming He thanked Liu Kian for saving his life. Liu Kian remembered hearing Liu Lin say that everyone in the Dragon Tooth organization was all battle loving monsters. Seeing how Chu Ying fought, she started believing Liu Lin's words. Ming He was confident that they could win against Chu Ying. However, he was afraid that if they used all their strength there, they wouldn't be able to rescue the astronomy team. Liu Kian suggested that Ming He should go on ahead while she stayed there to keep Chu Ying busy, but Ming He didn't agree, saying that he had a plan. Chu Ying awkwardly waited for Ming He and Liu Kian to finish discussing amongst themselves. Liu Kian and Ming He stared at Chu Ying with determination in their eyes. They then dashed towards Chu Ying, flanking her. While she was dodging and blocking their attacks, Chu Ying commented that Ming He had adequate strength, but was slow and that Liu Kian was fast but lacked strength. Seeing an opening, Chu Ying hit Liu Kian's abdomen with her palm, simultaneously kicking Ming He in the chest. She then took the opportunity to grab two of her daggers. Anticipating the next thing that Chu Ying would do, Liu Kian and Ming He, who still hadn't regained their balance, couldn't help but be alarmed. Predicting where Chu Ying would aim, Ming He and Liu Kian quickly shifted their positions to narrowly evade the daggers that Chu Ying threw at them. Knowing how close he was to seeing his parents, Ming He stared at the dagger beside his head. He then screamed at Liu Kian, telling her to initiate their plan. Liu Kian's eyes turned white as her palm started exuding lightning. 
She used her lightning to cut the ropes that held a huge effigy above Chu Ying's position. As the effigy fell, Chu Ying quickly took control of all her daggers. Before it could crush her, she used her daggers to shred the effigy into pieces. Chu Ying emerged unscathed. She ridiculed both Lu Kayan and Minghi, saying that it seemed that both of them had no worthy skills left up their sleeves. Realizing what the two were doing, Chu Ying couldn't help but curse. Minghi and Lu Kayan desperately ran towards the elevator, not even daring to look back. Minghi quickly pushed the button to close the elevator's door. Chu Ying tried to chase after the two, but after seeing that the door had already closed, she immediately took control of her daggers and threw them towards the two. Most of the daggers managed to pass through the closing door, leaving only a single dagger stuck outside. Chu Ying punched the door. She couldn't accept that Ming He and Lu Kian had outsmarted her. She couldn't help but wonder who had let a sly guy like Ming He into their group. Chu Ying was so angry that she repeatedly slashed the elevator door pointlessly. Suddenly, the glass window near Chu Ying broke. She stared at the window to see what had happened, but it was too dark for her to figure out what was on the other side. Knowing that there should be someone there, she asked the person to come out. Moments later, a figure whose eyes were emitting dangerous red light slowly approached the window. Meanwhile, inside the elevator, Ming He and Lu Kian cautiously stared at something above them. Chu Ying's daggers that had managed to pass through the door hovered above them while rotating at a dangerous speed. When they reached the second level, the elevator door opened. Ming He and Lu Kian immediately went out of the elevator to get away from Chu Ying's dangerous daggers. Terrified by Chu Ying, they felt glad that they had decided not to engage in battle with her. There was only one button on the lift, and they had reached the second level already. Ming He speculated that the third level's lift should be directly opposite. Lu Kian told Ming He that the building must have been designed in such a way to prevent infiltrators. Learning from their previous experiences, Ming He checked if there were more strong individuals guarding that level as well. After looking around, Lu Kian found someone guarding that level in front of them. She asked Ming He if they should engage them in battle. Thinking that the guard could be another group leader or an instructor, Ming He decided to take another path. Lu Kian agreed, realizing that was the only way. While they were walking inside the forest, Ming He suddenly exclaimed. He saw two Dragon Tooth members on the balcony of a building ahead of them. One of the Dragon Tooth members suddenly twitched. He told the woman who was with him that he had heard something from the forest. The woman asked the man if they should check it out. But before the man could answer, a bird came into their view. The man thought that that bird was what he had heard. He told the woman that since their communications had been cut off, they should just stand guard where they were supposed to be. Knowing that their brothers on the outside couldn't hold the fort down any longer, the man couldn't help but wonder if the first group had already found the professor. The woman informed the man that the first group had been on the third floor searching for the astronomy team. She said that there must be someone among them who knew where the professor was hiding. The man hoped that everything would end soon. Afraid that they'd get noticed, Lu Kian told Ming He that they should go. Ming He asked Lu Kian to wait, saying that there was something above the two Dragon Tooth members. When Lu Kian looked up and saw what Ming He was referring to, she covered her mouth and started trembling. Just above the two Dragon Tooth members, an unknown individual with sharp claws was eyeing them dangerously. Ignorant of the danger above her, the woman expressed that it was strange that, with how strong the first group was, they had taken so much time just to capture an astronomy team that did research. While his arms were transforming into something sharp, the unknown individual slowly moved closer to the Dragon Tooth members. The man told the woman that she should stop asking questions, saying that they should just do their parts. In a blink of an eye, the two Dragon Tooth members were decapitated by the unknown individual. The unknown individual's pointed limb and abnormal-looking arms slowly shrank and transformed into ordinary arms. As if nothing had happened, the unknown individual nonchalantly walked away while wiping his hands. He simply threw the bloodied cloth away, seemingly not caring about leaving some evidence behind. Ming He and Lu Kian's eyes widened as they stared at the bloodied cloth that fell in front of them. Ming He asked Lu Kian if the unknown man was a superhuman. Lu Kian told Ming He that it didn't look like it, saying that the man looked too strange to be a superhuman. When Ming He asked her why the man had killed someone from the Dragon Tooth organization, Lu Kian thought of the possibility that there could be another organization apart from them that had infiltrated the mountain. She expressed that she thought things weren't as simple as what had been officially broadcast. Moments later, Lu Kian suddenly grabbed Ming He's arm while pointing at something. Ming He carefully took a closer look at what was behind the bush. A trembling, horrified man exclaimed the moment he laid his eyes on Ming He. As if Ming He was going to kill him, the man screamed and ran desperately. Ming He asked the man if he was Brother Zhao. Brother Zhao calmed down slightly. He asked Ming He if he was Qin Yu's younger brother. Ming He confirmed that it was indeed him. Brother Zhao then asked Ming He how he had managed to get in there. 
Minghee explained that he had come to look for his sister after hearing that something had happened. When he asked Zhao where Qin Yu had been, Zhao informed him that Qin Yu should be in the third floor safety room. Through Zhao, Minghee wanted to know what had happened there, but all Zhao told him was that he didn't know and that so many people had died, so he had hidden there. Noticing that there was something wrong with Zhao's mental state, Liu Kayan advised Minghee not to provoke him any further. Zhao was so scared that he had peed in his pants as he led Minghee to the place where he had hidden. Minghee asked Zhao if he could bring him to meet his sister, but to his disappointment, Zhao just told him that they shouldn't go out because it wasn't safe. Zhao strongly believed that all of them would die if they went out and that the place where he was hiding was the safest place. Minghee then asked Zhao if he could tell him where the third floor safety room was located. Zhao asked Minghee to come closer, saying that he only believed in him, so he would only tell him. Minghee listened carefully as brother Zhao whispered to him where the third floor safety room was located. Minghee wanted Zhao to come with them, but Zhao still insisted on not leaving the safe place he had found. While Zhao was repeatedly warning Minghee not to trust anyone, Liu Kayan told Minghee that they should go, saying that Zhao had probably suffered from a severe amount of shock, so he wouldn't come out. Minghee stopped forcing Zhao to come with them. Before he left, he asked Zhao to take care of himself. After some time, Minghee and Liu Kayan arrived at the edge of the forest. Minghee informed Liu Kayan that the lift should be right in front of them. When Minghe expressed that it was strange that no one was guarding the lift, Liu Kayan said that the strange man had probably gone up already. Thinking that Liu Kayan could be right, Minghe decided to wait a while longer so they could avoid the strange man. The goddess suddenly told Minghe to look up. Minghe's eyes widened in surprise when he saw what was above them. Minghe immediately ran towards Liu Kayan and pushed her down. He glanced behind him and saw the trees being cut down by the blade that should have taken their lives. Minghe and Liu Kayan stared at the individual who had almost taken their lives with a strangely looking sickle. When the individual jumped down the tree, it was revealed that it was actually the strange man they had seen. The strange man expressed that he was a little curious about how Minghe had sensed him. Instead of answering, Minghe asked the strange man who he was. The strange man tried to intimidate Minghe, saying that he had never once failed to kill his enemies, so he should answer him. But Minghe didn't falter, he ordered the strange man to reveal his identity first. The strange man grinned. He decided to just kill Minghe. Noticing that the strange man used a skill to lock his attack into his body, Minghe was certain that he couldn't dodge. He absorbed the earth element as he clenched his fist. Minghe punched the strange man's limb, forcing it to stop. Having less power than the strange man, Minghe got pushed away. He realized that the strange man was at the White Swan rank, so he thought of using his hidden power so both he and Liu Kayan could survive. Liu Kayan ordered the strange man to leave Minghe alone. Liu Kayan then whipped the strange man with her lightning. The strange man smiled and said that Liu Kayan seemed to have gotten a little anxious. As he raised his limb that looked like a stinger, the strange man also released his aura, making Liu Kayan lose control of her body. Liu Kayan could only curse as she watched the strange man aim for her head. Liu Kayan closed her eyes, and when she opened them again, Liu Yi was already in front of her. The strange man exclaimed, then backed away and complimented Liu Yi's strength. Liu Yi told the strange man that no matter who he was working for, he would kill him if he hurt Liu Kayan. The strange man laughed. He said that Louis was just cannon fodder and that he had other things to do, so he would make a move first. Louis stared at the man's back, seemingly making sure that he would really leave. Minghe informed Louis that the strange man wasn't from the Dragon Tooth organization, and that he seemed to have also infiltrated that place just like them. Louis wasn't shocked. He told Minghe that a lot of organizations had been trying to save Wulong, including organizations that had been working in the dark. Minghe said that the strange guy who was like a killing machine gave him both strange and familiar vibes. Louis expressed that they should not dwell on it any longer. He asked the two if they had gathered any information. When Minghe told Louis that his sister was trapped in the third floor's safety shelter, Louis reminded Minghe that their main goal was to find Wulong. Minghe reasoned that finding his sister didn't clash with the objective of looking for Wulong since they needed someone who knew their way around so they wouldn't have difficulties moving forward. Liu Kayan also added that the presence of Dragon Tooth Guards and other organizations made it more difficult to move around. Realizing that what the two said made sense, Louis agreed to look for Qin Yu first. He told the two that they had to follow him closely. The three then jumped up on the balcony and went straight for the lift. When they had entered the lift, Louis said that the safety lock that used to be there seemed to have been destroyed by the Dragon Tooth organization. Left without a choice, the three decided to climb their way up to the third level. And since there was a possibility that the strange man would ambush them, Louis said he'd go first. Louis informed the two that, according to the information from those above their organization, 
The third floor was an entire set of secret rooms. He said that if they wanted to get to the fourth floor, they had to find the secret metal room that had a lift going to the fourth floor, which was going to be almost akin to breaking into a national bank safe to find. When they got to the third level, Minghi and Liu Kain were alarmed by what they saw. Seeing the corpses that were scattered all over the place, they couldn't help but express their disbelief that so many people had died there. After recovering from his initial shock, Minghi told Liu that he knew how to get to the secret room. He then pointed in a certain direction, saying that it should be there. The three went on their way, following the path that Zhao had told Minghi. Moments later, the goddess suddenly asked Minghi to wait. She told Minghi that behind the wall in front of them was a secret room with something good inside. While he was checking the wall, Minghi told Liu Kian and Liu Yi to hold on for a minute. After some time, Minghi finally unlocked the secret door. When Liu Kian asked him how he knew that there was a door there, Minghi didn't respond. Minghi opened the door and more corpses greeted them. Minghi asked the two to wait for him, saying that there was something inside that he needed. The goddess was amazed by what they found. Knowing that all of those isomorphic crystals were of brilliant rank, the goddess was certain that Minghi would be able to level up by a great amount. Louis asked Minghi why he had used that opportunity to steal from the astronomy team. Minghi explained that he needed those crystals for urgent matters. He informed Louis that those crystals could help him increase his strength and abilities. As they went out of the room, Louis asked Minghi how he knew that there was a secret room there. Minghi told Louis that he had a unique sense of smell that made him especially sensitive to all those isomorphic crystals. Having encountered multiple paths, Minghi thought for a moment before figuring out which way to go. And after walking for quite some time, they ended up at a dead end. Louis started to doubt the credibility of the information that Minghi had obtained. While he was trying to remember Zhao's instructions, Minghi asked Louis to patiently wait. Minghi started knocking on the wall. After some time, Minghi expressed that he seemed to have found the mechanism. Minghi entered the password, and once he finished, the entire wall suddenly collapsed inward, leaving Liu Kian surprised. When they got closer to the vault, the three covered their noses as gas suddenly filled the room to disinfect them. When the disinfection was done, Minghi turned the handle. He said that the safe room should be right behind it. As soon as the vault opened, Minghi immediately took a look inside. He was surprised by how spacious the room was. The people inside the room were alarmed. While most of them were cowering in fear, some of them immediately took their weapons and stayed on guard. Zhu Zhu mustered the courage to glance at the door. When she realized it was Minghi, she informed everyone that Minghi was Qin Yu's younger brother. Minghi immediately asked Kai Ting and Zhu Zhu if they had seen his sister. But before the two could answer, a woman suddenly ran towards Minghi. Liu Kian wanted to stop Qin Yu from hugging Minghi, but she was far too late to do so. She could only pout as she stared at Minghi and Qin Yu, her jealousy clearly showing in her expression. In the past, in the middle of a city, a car crashed into another car. The impact was so strong that the windows broke and the cars started releasing some smoke. The people in the street pitied the two small children left behind by both of their parents, who died on the spot. They said that there would always be many roads, but safety always had to come first. In the hospital, a police officer who was on a call said that the preliminary results of the investigation were finally out. After hearing that it had been found out that his father was the one who had sped through the red light and caused the accident, the little boy was stunned. He stared blankly at the floor, wide-eyed. While he was clenching his fist, someone approached him. The girl said to the boy that his family was gone, and so was hers. Lost for words, the boy just apologized to the girl. The girl then told the boy that he should pay for what his father did. Going back to the time when the special unit entered the safe room, Minghi smiled as he embraced his sister affectionately. Kin Yu asked Minghi why he had come there despite knowing how dangerous it was. Minghi told Kin Yu that he had come because she was the only family he had and that he was glad that she was alright. To stop Kin Yu from worrying, Minghi told her that he was already strong. Kin Yu suddenly asked Minghi if he had run into anything strange on his way there. Minghi didn't know what she was referring to, so he asked her what she meant by strange. Kin Yu said that although she couldn't say exactly what they were, she could tell that they seemed to be some type of monster. She then informed Minghi that some of the people in their team had become strange as well, saying that it was almost as though they were bewitched and controlled. Louis butted into the siblings' conversation. He urged Kin Yu to take them to Wulong. Shrugging off their discussion about the strange monsters, Mingyi asked Kin Yu if she knew where Wu Long was. A man suddenly asked Lui to reveal his identity. Lui simply showed the man his badge while saying that they were there to save Wu Long. The man was actually expecting Lui to come. His comrade reported to Lui that the evil bastards would have probably used other ways to get to the fourth floor by that time. 
When Louis asked him if it was possible that Wulong had fallen into their enemy's hands already, the man said that it was a possibility. Kai Ting told Zhu Zhu that she should have just revealed what she knew since things had already escalated to that point. Zhu Zhu had second thoughts, but when Kai Ting said that the vice leader of the special forces could be trusted, Zhu Zhu could only reluctantly agree. Zhu Zhu approached Louis. She told him that she knew how to get to the fourth floor because she was one of the members in charge of safety precautions on the astronomy team. After revealing that there was a bionic helicopter on the fifth floor of that building, Zhu Zhu informed Liu Yi that it was in their protocol that if something were to happen to the astronomy team, the relevant personnel would carry all important documents to the helicopter and leave. Liu Yi realized that Wu Long and the others were all trapped on the fourth floor because they wanted to use the helicopter on the fifth floor to escape. Zhu Zhu disclosed that the fourth floor was the location of the astronomy team's most secure and secret information library, saying that a lot of research from the past 10 years regarding calamities had all been stored there. She then shared with everyone that, according to their speculations, the group attacking them wasn't just aiming to capture Wu Long but also to destroy the library of information that was incredibly important for humanity's survival. Louis asked Zhu Zhu why they didn't have any backups for it. Zhu Zhu told Louis that there was no way of backing all of those up since they weren't just essays and pictures. She said that the calamity samples hidden in the library, all those samples that had been retrieved from calamities over the years, were the most valuable. Louis was starting to believe that it must be the reason why the Heavenly Sovereignty Organization's people were fighting so hard to get inside. Liu Kayan expressed that regardless of what happened to the library, finding Wu Long was their utmost priority. Zhu Zhu recalled that when they were attacked, Wu Long and his team were the first to arrive there. She said that they wanted to take those precious samples with them, but they underestimated the determination of the enemy who wished to annihilate everything. And because they wanted to take more samples with them, they were trapped by the enemy. When Mingyi asked her if she could lead them to the fourth floor, Zhu Zhu told Mingyi to come with her. Zhu Zhu stood in front of a wall with a peculiar design. She knocked on the wall multiple times. A portion of the wall suddenly opened, and a machine poked out of it. Zhu Zhu moved closer to the machine. The machine confirmed Zhu Zhu's identity through an iris scan. She then entered a password, after which her fingerprint was scanned. When everything was confirmed, the machine announced that the tunnel would soon open. Everyone expressed their amazement after noticing some lines suddenly form on the ceiling. Everyone was taken aback when the ceiling unfolded and revealed a tunnel. Realizing that it was the tunnel that led to the secret room on the fourth floor, Kai Ting got excited. The floor then started rising. Zhu Zhu said that if they really wanted to leave that place, the best thing they could do was to take the helicopter on the fifth floor and leave. When they got closer to the fourth floor, they heard an alarm saying that the shield was under attack. After seeing what was on the fourth floor, they couldn't help but frown. They saw broken things and some dead calamitous beasts around the protective shield. Zhu Zhu said that since the protective shield had yet to be broken, Wu Long should still have been inside. As soon as he told her they must rescue Wu Long, Ming He saw a spike come out of Zhu Zhu's chest. Zhu Zhu could only stare at the thing that punctured her chest, wide-eyed. Kai Ting told Zhu Zhu that she was sad. She said that even though they had been as close as sisters for so many years, Zhu Zhu wouldn't tell her how to enter the fourth floor, no matter how many times she asked her. And yet all it took was a few sentences for her to believe Ming He and his group. Qin Yu yelled at Kai Ting. She demanded that she explain what she had been doing. Kai Ting didn't respond and just tried to rip her skin off her face. After ripping her skin apart, she declared that she was going to kill everyone. Kai Ting expressed her excitement, saying that she could finally kill to her heart's content. A man couldn't help but move back after seeing Kai Ting's original form. He asked Kai Ting what she was. The man behind the panicking man said that there was no need for him to know what they were. As he strangled him with his tongue, the man told the panicking man that he just needed to die quietly. A few seconds later, the panicking man's lifeless body fell heavily on the floor. Most of the people who came with Ming He's group started panicking as well. A man ordered everyone not to come near him, saying that he wouldn't trust anyone there. Both Kai Ting and the man looked at the people around them contemptuously. Kin Yu trembled as she asked Kai Ting what was wrong with her. Ming He told Kin Yu that the thing in front of her was no longer Kai Ting. Kai Ting grew curious about why Ming He had been so calm and composed. The mutated man told Kai Ting that before eating Ming He and his group, she should come and help him first. The mutated man began whipping the floor with his tongue. Moments later, the floor started to break. When a hole was made in the floor, Kai Ting lowered her tail into the hole. When she pulled her tail up, the strange man was already hanging from it. The strange man laughed as he greeted Ming He and his group. Liu Yi was surprised, realizing that the strange man had actually been following them. 
The strange man expressed that, with his two subordinates beside him, he had hoped that Luyu would talk to him a little nicer that time. He told Luyu that if he hadn't done so, he wouldn't have minded killing him before doing something else. The atmosphere became even tenser as the strange man and his subordinates faced off against Luyu's unit. It was clear from Luyu's expression that he was trying to make a difficult decision. Suddenly, the alarm sounded once again, indicating that the red shield had been destroyed. After telling Louis's unit that they were lucky, the strange man quickly pounced towards the place where the red shield had been. Louis released a sigh of relief. He said that if only the strange man had been alone, he would have been confident in taking him on by himself. Lu Kayan asked Louis what exactly the strange man and his subordinates were. Becoming certain of his suspicions, Ming-He told Lu Kayan that the strange man and his subordinates were parasitic demon beasts. He informed her that he had seen them in Furong Town and that they had the ability to attach themselves to a human like a parasite, an evolved calamity that was able to replace the original host and absorb it. Lu Kayan wondered how there could be such a terrifying calamity that existed like that, something she had never heard of before. Louis said that it wasn't the time to be discussing those things since they had three strong opponents while Wu Long was in danger. Ming He asked Louis if they should go and help. Louis told Ming He that his mission was complete and that what was left for him to do was secure his safety. He then handed over Lu Kayan's safety to Ming He, telling Ming He that no matter what had happened, he had to take good care of her. Lu Kayan reminded Lu Yi that they were supposed to rescue Wu Long together. Lu Yi scolded Lu Kayan. He told her that she had been overestimating herself by thinking that she was the hero who could save humanity from danger. He pointed out that the strange man was definitely at the White Swan rank, so it would have been easy for him to kill Lu Kayan. Lu Kayan still insisted. She said that, given how dire the situation was, they should try fighting instead. Ming He suddenly grabbed Lu Kayan's arm. He told her that Lu Yu was right, saying that fighting the strange man and his subordinates would be seeking death, so they should ensure their survival first before everything else. Lu Kayan still wanted to argue, but she stopped talking when Lu Yi told them that they must remember that their only mission was to survive, and that, whether it was Wu Long or the parasitic calamities, they didn't need to care about them. He wanted them to understand that they had to survive no matter what. Lu Yi immediately left after saying what he had wanted to say. Ming He turned his head when he heard someone cry out Zhu Zhu's name. Zhu Zhu told Kin Yu to go to the fifth floor and start up the procedures to escape from there. She then gave Kin Yu the access card, thinking that there was a first aid kit on the helicopter. Kin Yu asked Zhu Zhu to hold on, but knowing that she didn't have enough time, Zhu Zhu just advised Kin Yu not to trust anyone. Ming He realized that Zhao must have gone through a similar situation as well. Kin Yu cried out Zhu Zhu's name once again but Zhu Zhu had already lost her life. Kin Yu stopped grieving and asked Ming He what they should do next. She let Ming He decide if they were going to go to Wu Long or to the helicopter on the fifth floor and escape from there. When Ming He said that they should leave, they immediately went on their way towards the fifth floor along with those who survived. Moments later, Ming He and his group arrived on the fifth floor without encountering any issues. As they wondered why the helicopter still had shields, the system announced that the helicopter didn't require piloting and that the destination had already been set. The system then asked all personnel to proceed to the helicopter within 15 minutes, saying that the helicopter would leave in 15 minutes. Ming He asked Kin Yu to give him the access card. After receiving the card, he swiped it into the card swipe machine. When the identity was confirmed, the shield's door opened. Kin Yu and Liu Kayan immediately entered the shield. Kin Yu said that the helicopter should have information and samples of calamities, and that Zhu Zhu probably wished for them to ensure those things were kept safe. Noticing that he was using the machine, Liu Kayan asked Ming He why he wasn't coming up. The door of the shield suddenly closed. Liu Kayan ran towards the door, asking Ming He to open up. Ignoring Liu Kayan and Kin Yu, Ming He faced the survivors and blocked their way. The survivors got angry. One of them told Ming He that if he wanted to stay and be a hero, he should have just done it alone and shouldn't have stopped them from leaving. Liu Kayan and Kin Yu asked Ming He not to do something stupid, saying that they should leave together. Ming He told the two that although he wanted to leave with them too, the circumstances didn't allow him to. Liu Kayan asked Ming He why. Ming He explained that he couldn't trust anyone else apart from the two of them. After saying that he was the chief of the astronomy observation team, one of the survivors told Ming He that superhumans like him were supposed to protect them and help them leave that place. Another survivor asked Ming He who gave him permission to decide who got to leave or stay. Ming He simply told the survivor that his decision was based on his assessment of the situation and his fists. The survivor said that Ming He had gone completely mad. He told him that he really was a traitor to humanity. 
meaning he was surprised by the man's remarks. He asked him who had told him that he was a traitor to humanity. Trying his best to feign ignorance, the survivor asked Ming-He what his question meant. Ming-He explained that the astronomy team had been isolated from the rest of the world, and even fewer people knew about what had happened to him. When the man aggressively asked Ming-He if he had been suspicious of him, Ming-He just told the man that he knew what he was. Ming-He clenched his fist. He then suddenly punched the man as he ordered him to stop pretending. The punch was so strong that the wall broke when the man crashed into it. The rest of the survivors questioned Ming-He's actions. They started doubting his identity, thinking that he could be one of the monsters too. When the dust settled, it was revealed that the man whom Ming-He had punched was lying limply on the floor, seemingly dead, or had lost consciousness. Ming-He took a deep breath. He yelled at the survivors, telling them to see for themselves whether the man he punched was human or not. The survivors looked at the man and saw that his skin was starting to tear apart. After seeing what had come out of the man's skin, the survivors couldn't help but exclaim. The parasitic beast expressed that he couldn't believe Ming he would still have his guard up. He then admitted that he had planned to wait for the helicopter to take off before going on a killing spree. He said that seeing those people move around in front of him, especially when they had been all alone, really made it so difficult for him to control himself. The parasitic beast told everyone that fighting against the urge to bite down on their succulent meat was way too hard, and that he was too hungry so he wouldn't wait anymore. The survivors couldn't understand what was happening and why everyone was turning into monsters. Ming-He told the survivors that they should all back away from there. Taking Ming-He's words as a challenge, the parasitic beast declared that he would eat Ming-He first. The goddess told Ming-He that he needed to be careful because his enemy was at the peak of Corona rank, which was equivalent to the tyrant. Although he was getting pushed back, Ming-He calmly blocked and dodged the snake's bites, toxins, and fire breath. And as soon as he saw an opening, he immediately grabbed one of the snake heads. Ming-He then punched the main body, pushing it away and tearing the snake head off of it at the same time. A puddle of blood started to form below Ming-He. Realizing that Ming-He was of the Heaven Flare rank, the parasitic beast was surprised. It admitted that it had underestimated Ming-He, saying that it hadn't expected Ming-He to have such strength despite his young age. Ming-He expressed that, thanks to the parasitic beast's comrades, he had been able to raise his rank quickly. Ming-He dropped the snake head on the floor and crushed it with his foot. The parasitic beast just laughed. It said that when Ming-He had faced Hui Zhao, he hadn't even had the guts to be that arrogant. Ming-He asked the parasitic beast if it was referring to the guy who looked like a spider calamity. The parasitic beast confirmed that the guy was indeed Hui Zhao. It said that Hui Zhao had purposely left Ming-He alive so he could practice killing people like him. Ming-He mocked the parasitic beast. He asked it how it had felt to have its teeth crushed to nothing by those it had wanted to kill. He then said that since the parasitic beast had five heads that were capable of speaking, it would allow him to obtain five sets of pure liquid stardust after killing it. He told the parasitic beast that it was great that it had shown up since he had needed to increase his strength. The parasitic beast was enraged. After calling him an arrogant bastard, one of the snakeheads breathed fire towards Ming-He, forcing Ming-He to jump away. Telling the others to let him do it, the snakehead that had been accumulating toxin in its mouth spat the toxin at Ming-He before he could land. Ming-He immediately gathered wind on his fist. Before the toxin could make contact with his body, he quickly used wind fist to blow it away. The parasitic beast chased after Ming-He and fought him head on. With incredible speed, Ming-He punched the snakeheads that attempted to bite him. Moments later, Ming-He managed to immobilize the three snakeheads. The parasitic beast said that it wanted to see if Ming-He had enough hands to block its next attack. With its mouth open wide, a snakehead quickly moved towards Ming-He, attempting to bite his head off. The ground broke as Ming-He lowered his body to dodge the snakehead and simultaneously gathered power in his feet. He kicked the parasitic beast's stomach, forcing the air out of it. Then he watched the parasitic beast as it crashed on the floor. While it was trying to stand up, the parasitic beast swore at Ming-He for kicking its stomach. The goddess informed Ming-He that the parasitic beast's lower half hadn't finished evolving. She told him that it was where he should attack. Ming-He acknowledged the goddess' words. When Ming-He used his spirit art, Swift Shadow Fist, the parasitic beast couldn't help but exclaim. Ming-He showered the parasitic beast with his fists, and when he had landed enough blows, he tripped the parasitic beast, letting it fall onto the floor. While the parasitic beast was struggling to get up, Ming-He suddenly raised his fist. The parasitic beast stopped squirming and just stared at Ming-He as he used his soul art, Star Mark Galactic. Ming-He punched the parasitic beast's lower half, dropping the huge fist in the sky onto it. The impact broke the floor, covering the area with dust. When the dust had settled, Ming-He had already taken a fang off a snakehead. He then approached the snakehead, who was still alive, 
and called him stupid. He stabbed the snakehead with the fan, saying that he had no interest in listening to what it had to say. After proving that she was right, the goddess explained that in order for the parasitic beasts to assimilate among humans, they had to change their essence composition to be similar to that of humans. This way, there wouldn't be any recoil from consuming it. She told Minghi to stop hesitating and to just treat the five sets of liquid stardust like water and drink them, telling him that in that way, he could raise his strength quickly. Minghi swallowed the five sets of liquid stardust simultaneously. His body then started to get covered in flames as he absorbed the essence of the liquid stardust. When Mingyi had absorbed the essence of the liquid stardust, the goddess asked him how he felt. Mingyi informed the goddess that he felt good and that he felt as though his strength had risen by an entire rank. The goddess told Mingyi that his body had been far too weak before. She explained to him that while he had been in a coma for an entire year, he had been cultivating as well. So his software had been upgrading itself, but his hardware had remained stagnant. The essence of those parasitic beasts helped Minghi strengthen his body and allowed his body's software and hardware to be more compatible with each other. Hence, his strength rose immediately to the middle rank of the Heaven Flare rank. The goddess then said that when Minghi had been in Fu Rong Town, he had struggled to fight against the tyrant. But with his increase in strength, even if he had fought those who had been the same rank as him, it would have been far too easy for him. The goddess informed Minghi that his reaching the Heaven Flare rank meant that he could use his purple art freely, and that his red sovereign talent would be their trump card since he would probably only be able to use it once before his body collapsed at the Heaven Flare rank. She then told Minghi that it had been the right choice for him to hide earlier, preventing anyone from knowing that he had that red sovereign ability. The system announced that there had been 10 minutes left before the helicopter would leave. Liu Kian and Kin Yu asked Minghi to just get inside the shield. Minghi told them that there would still be some who would want to board the helicopter. He declared that they had to get through him to be able to open the shield and get into the helicopter. Liu Kian expressed that she didn't understand what was happening. She and Kin Yu thought that it was strange that those calamity beasts had emerged from the astronomy team. Minghi said that it seemed that things were more complicated than they had first realized and that what the news had told them might not have been the most accurate information. When Liu Kian asked him who they were supposed to believe, Minghi told her that there was no one they could trust, saying that that was why he could only trust himself. Minghi exclaimed when the floor suddenly burst out. Behind the thick layer of dust, he saw a figure walking towards him. Moments later, Liu Yi and Wu Long emerged. Liu Yi expressed that it was wonderful that Ming Yi was still there. Seeing that Liu Yi had managed to rescue Wu Long, Liu Kian and Qin Yu started to feel cheerful. Ming Yi, who had been on guard, asked Liu Yi if the man beside him was Wu Long. Wu Long himself confirmed his identity. He then asked Ming Yi if they had already met, stating that Ming Yi seemed quite familiar to him. When Ming Yi said that he was Qin Yu's younger brother, Wu Long claimed to have remembered Ming Yi. Liu Yi urged Ming Yi to help Wu Long board the helicopter, pointing out that Wu Long was humanity's last hope and that they could not allow him to fall into their enemy's hands. Liu Kian and Qin Yu told Ming Yi to help Wu Long and open up the shield, but no matter how many times they tried to get his attention, Ming Yi didn't respond. Seeing that Ming Yi was not showing any intention of helping them, Liu Yi informed him that their enemies hadn't died yet, and that they were just right behind them. He asked Ming Yi why he was still hesitant despite knowing that their time was tight. Wu Long told Liu Yi that their enemies would probably catch up to them even if they boarded the helicopter immediately since it would still take 10 minutes before the helicopter would start to fly. Ming Yi apologized to Wu Long, telling him that he couldn't let him board the helicopter. Liu Kian and Qin Yu were shocked, they couldn't understand what was wrong with Ming Yi. Liu Yi questioned Ming Yi if he knew what he was saying. He pointed out to him that their special forces team was risking their lives fighting the heavenly sovereignty so that they could save Wu Long. He then asked Ming Yi if he knew what Wu Long meant to humanity, and if he had really been brainwashed by the Dragon Tooth organization that he was wishing to betray humanity to. Ming Yi told Liu Yi that he was sure about what he was doing. He said that since he was the one standing there, he was the one who got to decide who would be able to leave that place. Liu Yi was running out of patience. He reminded Ming Yi that he didn't have the authority to decide things, telling him that he shouldn't forget that he had the authority to discipline him. Ming Yi told Liu Yi that he could discipline him however he wanted, as long as he had the capability to do so. When Liu Yi asked Ming Yi if he was challenging him, Ming Yi said that he could no longer trust anyone, including Liu Yi. As he told Ming Yi that he had been being ridiculous, Liu Yi suddenly used his blink skill. Liu Yi determined that Ming Yi was beyond saving, so he tried to choke him. But before he could lock his arms, Ming Yi managed to slip his hand in. Ming Yi grabbed Liu Yi's arm and smashed him into the ground. Before Liu Yi could react, Ming Yi immediately used his mystic fist. He then pounced at Liu Yi and punched him, 
When the dust had settled, Luyi appeared behind Minghee, aiming to kick his head. Minghee raised his arm to block the kick and then quickly moved away to dodge Luyi's follow-up kick. The goddess let Minghee know that his left arm would have been completely ruined if Luyi hadn't been injured. Minghee took out a pair of gloves. The goddess asked him if it was what Professor Fang had given him. Minghee told the goddess that the gloves were indeed what Professor Fang had given him but had been modified. The goddess informed Minghee that it wouldn't be enough since all it did was elevate his ability to use various elements. When Minghee took out a pair of mutated ice gloves, the goddess looked excited. She said that if it were combined with what Professor Fang had given, it wouldn't be too bad. After combining the gloves, Minghee told Louis to come at him again. Louis ground his teeth as he told Minghee that he didn't know what he was doing. While he was staring at Minghee dangerously, Louis suddenly multiplied. Minghee was surprised. He didn't expect that Louis was almost able to move fast enough to produce afterimages. Seeing that the two Louis were approaching him from different angles, Minghee immediately took a step back. He jumped backwards to dodge the kick, and immediately looked behind him to prepare for the other Louis' attack. Minghee punched the ground, sending spikes of ice crawling towards Louis. Louis desperately blocked the ice, but Minghee's attack was too powerful for him to stop, so he got pushed away. Louis multiplied once again. He charged at Minghee, desperation clear in his eye. The goddess told Minghee not to let Louis get near him. Minghee twisted his fist. He then turned as he punched up and used his curling dragon fist. A giant curling dragon formed and protected Minghee. The dragon looked so imposing that the four Louis looked like they could only dream of getting past it. Minghee crossed his arms. By swiftly spreading his arms, he sent a powerful and cold gust of wind around him. Louis' afterimages couldn't persist through Minghee's attack. The moment his real body was revealed, Louis got struck by the dragon's tail and was sent flying. Lu Kain couldn't help but cry out in horror. When Minghee told Louis not to come closer if he wanted him to believe in him, Louis reminded Minghee that he was the one who rescued Wu Long from the dragon tooth traders. He said that Minghee should still have some remaining feelings of comradeship for his dragon tooth comrades. After saying that he could understand why Minghee was suspecting him, Louis asked Minghee why he didn't believe in Wu Long either. Minghee didn't say a word and just looked at Wu Long. The people agreed with Lui. They told Minghee that even if he thinks that there are still monsters among them, he should at least believe in the person who has done nothing but contribute to humanity. The woman demanded that Minghee let Wu Long onto the helicopter first. She pointed out that the main purpose of Minghee's mission was to rescue Wu Long. Wu Long expressed that although it was good that Minghee had his own judgment, the situation was quite urgent, so he needed to take the important notes on the calamity beasts and leave. Qin Yu told Minghee that with the effort that Wu Long put in for humanity, there was no way that he was part of the monsters who hid themselves within the astronomy team. Lu Kian and Lui simultaneously tried to convince Minghee to let Wu Long board the helicopter. Lui promised Minghee that as long as he allowed Wu Long to board the helicopter, he would let him do whatever he wanted to do to him. Minghee suddenly told everyone that not long ago, when Tang Hang and him visited a town on the southwest that calamities had completely destroyed. They had found a calamity beast that deeply surprised them. Minghee informed everyone that the beasts were a bunch of parasitic beasts with high intelligence that had latched onto human bodies. He knew that Tang Hang knew that the existence of those parasitic creatures was something that they ought to tell the world about, so he couldn't understand why Tang Hang never announced it to the world. He was confused as to why Tang Hang quickly led the Dragon Tooth organization to attack the Astronomy Tower and start to slaughter all the parasitic beasts that were masking themselves as people. Minghee admitted that. At first, he thought that the Dragon Tooth organization had really betrayed humanity. But when he saw the parasitic beasts burst out from inside many of the astronomy personnel, he finally understood that those parasitic beasts were not existences that only recently appeared. Minghee told everyone that those parasitic beasts should have existed for 10 or 20 years already, and that they had already hidden themselves among humans and infiltrated the ranks of the decision makers. Before, Ming He couldn't understand why a group like the Heavenly Sovereignty Organization would exist and fight against humanity. But because of what he had seen during that mission, he learned that there had been parasitic beings living amongst them. He realized that those parasites always stayed close by their sides, wore the skins of those close to them and monitored their every move. From being unable to perfectly emulate humans to integrating themselves to the point that humans were unable to detect them, Ming He couldn't believe that their enemies were actually living next to them. Laughing behind their backs at their foolishness, his comrades were kept like livestock for them and were killed when the time was right. Ming He became certain that the Dragon Tooth organization never betrayed humanity, and that they simply bet upon their reputation. 
and their lives, committing themselves to the cause of eliminating each and every parasitic beast that hid themselves among humans. Ningyi strongly believed that the Dragon Tooth organization was always humanity's last protection. He said that as a member of the Dragon Tooth organization, his heart never wavered, and he would follow them and fight till the day he died. Suddenly, someone started clapping. The person expressed that Minghee was truly amazing and that he couldn't believe that he managed to guess the truth. The person told Minghee that, at that point, knowing everything was pointless. He said that by the time Minghee realized their existence, they no longer needed to hide themselves. The man revealed that the person that he was dragging behind him was actually the Dragon Tooth Organization's first group's instructor. Minghee screamed and called Instructor Lu, seemingly hoping that he would respond. The man was pleased that Minghee recognized Instructor Lu. Suddenly, while grinning, the man ran through Instructor Lu's chest with his sharp limb. Minghee stared at the man, his deep anger clear in his eyes. The man expressed that it disgusts him to have to pretend to be human. He had always looked forward to that day when he could rip apart the disgusting and lowly skin that he had been using. While he was stretching his arms, the spider expressed that he felt more comfortable that way. After telling him that he really disappoints him, the spider asked Lui why he hadn't killed Minghee yet. He told Lui that it was already too late for him to try to be considerate of Lu Kian's feelings. He pointed out to Lui that although seniors like him who infiltrated humanity earlier looked very human, he didn't need to have feelings for humans. Desperate not to let his secrets be revealed, Lui attacked the spider to force it to shut up. However, the spider easily managed to grab Lui's wrist and take a hold of his head. The spider expressed that he couldn't believe that Lui dared to ask him to shut up despite having such a heavily injured body. He said that it was about time for Louis to tell Lu Kian the truth. He told Louis that, since he didn't want to show his true self, he would help him do it. Lu Kian got furious, she ordered the spider to let go of Louis. However, to Lu Kian's surprise, the spider really tore Louis apart. The spider laughed as he told Lu Kian to take a good look at her precious brother. Lu Kian couldn't help but glance at the human skin as the spider threw it away. While the spider was telling him that he looked much better that way, Louis apologized to Lu Kian. He assured her that he had never done anything to harm her. Lu Kian didn't know what to say. Finding out that her brother was actually a parasitic calamity beast all along was too much for her to take. She was so shocked that she lost consciousness. Louis screamed and out his little sister. His concern for her conveyed clearly by his tone. After telling him that superior species like them also took in pets, the spider assured Louis that, since he was a huge contributor to the success of their clan, there was no reason why their master wouldn't allow him to keep Lu Kian as his pet. Louis ordered the spider to shut up. He told him that he didn't have the right to talk because he was just a bastard who didn't know anything. Louis attacked the spider. However, same as before, using his multiple legs, the spider easily stopped Louis. Suddenly, one of the survivors called the spider Huey Zhao. The man stepped forward to stop Huey Zhao and to tell Louis to calm down. He reminded the two that it was not the time for them to be in conflict with each other. The survivors were utterly shocked. Minghee was also taken aback. Meanwhile, Kin Yu was so shocked that she subconsciously covered his mouth. Wu Long apologized to everyone for keeping them all in the dark for so long. He revealed to them that he was a parasitic beast as well. Wu Long expressed that he didn't agree with Huey Zhao either. He told everyone that working with them was not torture but an honor for him. He said that it was sad that whether it be humans or parasitic beasts, no matter how much intelligence they obtained upon evolving, they were still animalistic at their cores and would always feel the need to hunt or be hunted. Kin Yu couldn't help but cry. She screamed that Wu Long was the one who sacrificed so much for humanity, the one who found out about the life drop in the meteorite, predicted the descent of the calamitous beasts, completed the plan to stop the calamities, and helped to destroy half of the descending calamities. Kin Yu couldn't accept the fact that Wu Long was actually one of their enemies. Out of nowhere, someone said that 20 years ago, Wu Long told humanity a huge lie. Minghe was surprised and was glad to see that Tang Hang and Luo Lin were alive. Tang Hang revealed to everyone that the calamitous beasts didn't originate from space. He said that since ancient times, humanity had always looked at space, tried their best to find signs of extraterrestrial life without knowing that an intelligent civilization had always lived beneath their feet, right within the depths of the earth. Tang Hang disclosed that the calamitous beasts were all creatures that came from deep within the earth. Everyone's eyes widened in surprise, they couldn't believe Tang Hang's words. The survivors told Tang Hang that what he said should be impossible because Wu Long was also a member of the astronomy team. Tang Hang explained that when Wu Long found the life drop, he lied about it being the life source of the calamities. The life drop was actually called a wormhole stone. 
there are all kinds of wormhole stones like those deep beneath the earth. When two wormholes clash within close proximity of each other, those stones will be activated, and a wormhole portal will be formed between the two. Meteorites carrying wormhole stones that manage to fall on earth are rare, while the wormhole stones deep inside the earth's core have literally little chance of being exposed to the earth's surface. There's even less chance for another wormhole stone to directly clash with another wormhole stone when the meteorite falls to the earth. Tang Hang said that only twice has that phenomenon occurred on Earth. The first was at the end of the Cretaceous period when all the dinosaurs went extinct. The other time was 40 years ago. From that point on, humanity entered a period where calamities would frequently descend. This meant that before that, every single wormhole stone they brought was evaluated beforehand. A hole was dug to place the other wormhole stone into the pit where the meteorite would land. So, they managed to create one wormhole after another, and countless calamities started coming from beneath the earth. Tang Hang pointed out that the beasts claimed to be civilization beyond the stars, as a superior race from space, so that they could kill humanity, and make them understand who truly owns the earth. Qin Yu fell down as she got overwhelmed by the information that Tang Hang revealed. The survivors realized that all the research they did before was all wrong, and they were stupid to try and find the calamitous beast's nest amidst space. Ming He expressed that the calamity prevention plan must have been a lie that was planned for a very long time, since humanity's precious research, weapons, and resources for war were exhausted for nothing. Ming He couldn't help but admit that they lost. Tang Hang was also convinced that they completely lost. However, he still believed that they must not lose the last bit of honor they have. Ming He nodded in agreement. He said out loud that the Dragon Tooth Organization is humanity's last defense. Luo Lin expressed that even if the Dragon Organization ends up completely beaten, they would never let the parasitic beasts go. After informing him that Wo Long is the leader of the parasitic beasts, and the director of the astronomy team they had been trying so hard to look for, Luo Lin told Ming He that they could not afford to let Wu Long escape. Huey Zhao laughed. He said that the Dragon Tooth organization had almost been completely wiped out and that there was no need for them to leave using the helicopter. Huey Zhao suggested to Wu Long that they should just kill everyone there and release the calamitous Miss Wormhole and take over that entire city. Wu Long informed Huey Zhao that there are still human experts in the South City. He told him that it would be better for them to just leave because that place was the largest city in the South for humanity. Since it was his master's decision, Huey Zhao didn't insist. He said that he would just kill the cannon fodder who had been blocking their way. Lu Yi told Wu Long that, considering that the helicopter could only fly after five minutes, Ming He was clearly trying to delay them. Wu Long expressed that Ming He was probably trying to keep Qin Yu and Lu Kayan alive while leaving himself behind to fight them. He revealed that he had already shut down the function that forces the helicopter to leave when Ming He was fighting Lu Yi. Ming He was taken aback. He had actually been wondering as to why the timer disappeared. After instructing Lu Yi to protect Wu Long well, Huey Zhao said that he would play with Ming He. He told Ming He that if it weren't for Lu Yi, he would have already been a corpse. Remembering that Ming He was so afraid of him before, Huey Zhao couldn't help but ask Ming He how he got the courage to stand before him like that. Ming He wasn't responding. He just listened to Huey Zhao say that humans are disgustingly strange. He secretly crushed the isomorphic crystal in his hand. Purple fire suddenly erupted from Ming He's fist, catching Huey Zhao off guard. Huey Zhao quickly backed away and immediately tried to put out the fire that latched onto him. The fire around Ming He vanished as it was absorbed by his fists. The moment he finished absorbing, he took a step forward and stared at Huey Zhao straight into his eyes. Seeing that Ming He was making a move, Huey Zhao was alarmed. Like a beast, Ming He unhesitatingly pounced towards Huey Zhao while using his roaring tiger spirit fist. Although Huey Zhao managed to block with his arms, he was sent flying by Ming He's punch. Moments later, when the dust settled, Huey Zhao's figure was revealed. Seemingly amused, Huey Zhao expressed that things were getting fun. He braggedly said that he was bored because Instructor Lu didn't even give him a good fight. The elemental energies in Ming He's fists suddenly flared up. While swinging his fist, Ming He furiously leapt towards Huey Zhao. Using his flame dragon spirit fist, he locked Huey Zhao into place. Ming He jumped. After positioning himself behind Huey Zhao, Ming He swung his fist, which absorbed the essence of the snow steel isomorphic crystal. Ming He's ice meteor fist easily hit Huey Zhao, who was busy dealing with the flame dragon spirit fist. Dust and ice particles were sent flying as the ice meteor fist crashed into the floor. Tang Hang and Luo Lin quickly took cover to protect themselves. Meanwhile, the survivors who reacted too late were forced to hold on to those heavier than them so they wouldn't get blown away. 
Realizing that Minghe was hiding the true extent of his abilities, Wu Long understood why a few of his students died at his hands. Minghe told the parasitic beasts that they were nothing but insects that had crawled their way up to the surface. He warned them that they would eliminate them all if they didn't go back to where they came from. Hui Zhao responded to Minghe. After admitting that humans and the Dragon Tooth organization were pretty capable, Hui Zhao said that the battle from before must have exhausted some of his abilities, so he had a little bit of trouble fighting Minghe. He told Minghe that the species he treats as insects or worms have abilities that humans could never possibly imagine. Luo Lin informed Minghe that he needed to kill Hui Zhao with a single shot because his regeneration ability was extremely strong. Minghe ran towards Hui Zhao while he acknowledged Luo Lin's words. When Minghe swung a fist towards him, Hui Zhao immediately bent backward to dodge. However, to his surprise, Minghe was actually ready to do a follow-up attack. Ice spikes and smoke filled the area as Minghe desperately tried to land a blow at Hui Zhao, who was crawling nimbly. Minghe planted his fist on the ground. He let the purple fire explode and let it spread out with the hope of catching Hui Zhao off guard. But because Hui Zhao's speed had increased in that form, he managed to get away. Without knowing that Hui Zhao was already behind him, Minghe cautiously looked around him. Hui Zhao immediately took the opportunity to attack Minghe, but Minghe was able to quickly dodge. Hui Zhao jumped away to avoid getting hit by Minghe's counterattack. Seemingly afraid that he'd get caught by a counterattack, Hui Zhao didn't attack carelessly and decided to observe Minghe first. He told Minghe that he couldn't believe he managed to dodge his stealth attack. Seeing that most of his injuries were already healed, Minghe and the goddess couldn't help but be amazed by Hui Zhao's regenerative ability. Minghe thought to himself that he might have to use the other crystal as well. Suddenly, Hui Zhao's cheeks bulged. The moment she noticed it, Luo Lin immediately instructed Minghe to dodge. She informed Minghe that Hui Zhao's spider webs could not be burned, and if it touched him, it would rip his skin from his flesh if he removed it. Hui Zhao expressed that. Although Luo Lin's advice was not bad, there was still nothing that Minghe could do about it. He spat his spider web towards Minghe. Seeing that the web Hui Zhao spat was able to cover a large area, Luo Lin got afraid that it was too big for Minghe to dodge. At the same time, Minghe broke another crystal and quickly absorbed its essence. He immediately used consecutive acidic punches. The acidic punches melted the web like butter, and Hui Zhao, who was confident with his web, was caught off guard. Hui Zhao got hit in the face and was hit a couple more times before falling while screaming in pain. Hui Zhao fell heavily to the ground. While he was dealing with the excruciating pain, he asked Minghe what he used on him. Minghe contemptuously told Hui Zhao that what he used on him was nothing but insecticide. Hui Zhao couldn't help but groan in pain as Minghe mercilessly punched his chest. Moments later, when Hui Zhao's body started melting, Minghe approached the head. He kicked the head away. The head bounced a couple of times. The moment it stopped, Minghe told Wu Long and Lui to go back to their home in the underground. Minghe suddenly remembered the tragedies that happened in the past. When he asked Wu Long if Zhao Shuhua was his student, Wu Long immediately confirmed that he was. When he asked him if Professor Feng was his scapegoat, Wu Long confirmed it as well. Minghe couldn't help but recall the desperate look on Professor Feng's face. Wu Long also admitted that the guy who planned the tragedy of the Calamitous Mist was his disciple as well. He told Minghe that the monsters he met and killed in Fu Rong Town were his subordinates that were in the midst of growing. While he tried his best to control his anger, Minghe asked Wu Long how many monsters were in the astronomy team. Wu Long informed Minghe that almost half of the astronomy team were monsters and that almost all of them were killed by the Dragon Tooth organization. Minghe got furious. It pained him to know that the team his sister had worked so hard to get into was actually the biggest nest of monsters hidden amongst humanity. As if it were a trivial thing. Wu Long nonchalantly admitted to Ming He that they were planning on letting the female parasite in Fu Rong Town replace Kin Yu. Kin Yu was inevitably surprised. Ming He couldn't help but ask Wu Long why they couldn't just stay where they originally belonged. Wu Long told Ming He that since he interacted with Zhao Xuhua before, he should know what the true motive of the heavenly sovereignty was. He said that what Zhao Shuhua told Ming He was not just a bunch of nonsense. Wu Long revealed that the reason they suddenly appeared was because Mother Earth begged them for help. He said that Mother Earth was sick and was almost dying. He pointed out that even if humanity were Mother Earth's children as well, none of them pitied her sacred body. 
When Minghe asked Wu Long why they would use such an extreme method to kill humanity, Wu Long informed Minghe that it was just the result of humanity ignoring their warnings and the failure of their negotiations. Minghe was so shocked that he was lost for words. Wu Long told Minghe that rather than humans killing each other and instigating a third or fourth world war, they should just let the calamitous beasts be the villains and let them help resolve the problem of overpopulation and humanity an endless overuse of resources. Minghe asked Wu Long to leave. He confidently said that humanity could solve their own problems. Wu Long told Minghe that if there were more individuals like him amongst the leaders of humanity, they might not have ended up meeting in that way. He informed Minghe that the calamitous beasts were not the ones who attacked first. Minghe was taken aback. He reminded Wu Long that they were the ones who used the name of the universe's heavenly sovereignty to kill humanity. After saying that the truth was in the hands of humanity's world leaders, Wu Long told Minghe that if he wanted to learn the truth, he should keep on climbing those ranks. He expressed that he hoped that Minghe would be able to become a true leader and be able to talk to their underground civilization properly. Wu Long nonchalantly put something on Louis's shoulder. Louis suddenly fell on his knees and started groaning in pain. Moments later, the spikes in his back grew bigger. A pair of horns emerged out of the side of his head. Louis's groans turned into screams. When the pain subsided, Louis immediately checked the changes in his body and strength. The moment Ming he tried to stop Wu Long, he quickly stepped in to stop him. Louis's attack was so strong that Ming he was forced to plant his hand on the ground. Ming he scolded Louis. He told him that if he let Wu Long go, Wu Long would hurt Lu Kian. Louis said that Wu Long, the person he trusted the most, would never hurt Lu Kian. Wu Long informed Lu Yi and Ming He that the special forces were about to enter that place. He told them that the one that survived between them would have the chance to redirect the narrative of that story. Ming He screamed to Wu Long that he wouldn't let him leave, nor let him get close to Qin Yu and Lu Kian. Without hesitation, Ming He punched Lu Yi in the chest. But, to his surprise, his acid was not able to corrode Lu Yi. Lu Yi told Ming He that he was not just any insect that he could corrode with his acid. He informed him that, in accordance with what humanity had titled them, he was an underground draconian. Ming he clenched his right fist. He used the flame dragon spirit fist to try and get Louis out of his way. Louis told Ming he that he wouldn't be able to beat him since he relied on isomorphic crystals to help him in his battle. Suddenly, Louis jerked his head backward and breathed fire towards Ming he. Ming he quickly crossed his arms to block. Although he was thrown away and smashed into the ice, Ming he immediately stood up. At the same time, Wu Long was already putting Lu Kian and Qin Yu into the helicopter. Ming He decided to just ignore Lu Yi. He used the second stage speed burst to quickly get to where Wu Long was. However, Lu Yi was still able to grab his arm. Ming He didn't give up. He put all his strength to his feet and desperately walked towards the helicopter. Moments later, Ming He finally managed to free himself from Lu Yi's clutches. He screamed at Wu Long, ordering him to let go of Lu Kian and Qin Yu. Wu Long told Ming He that he was taking his sister with him. He asked him to take good care of the saintess of their clan. He informed Ming He that Xing Ling was not just the goddess of their people but also his daughter. Ming He was inevitably taken aback by what Wu Long revealed to him. He was so shocked that Wu Long easily sent him flying with a slap. Ming He despaired, and his mind went blank. He didn't even try to keep himself from falling headfirst into the ground. While he stared at the helicopter, Ming He asked Xing Ling what was happening. Xing Ling told Ming He that she didn't have any prior memories, so she was not sure either. And when she assured Ming He that she would never lie to him, Ming He immediately apologized to her for doubting her. Xing Ling told Ming He that regardless of whether the truth of that world was more complicated than they originally thought or not, if he didn't move, Lu Yi would kill him. Ming He couldn't help but exclaim the moment he realized that a foot was already in front of his face. Luckily, he was able to react fast enough and get out of harm's way. But before Ming He could regain his balance, Lu Yi quickly ran towards him. Seeing that Ming He was having a hard time, Luo Lin immediately stepped in to help. Lu Yi effortlessly grabbed Luo Lin's foot. He threw her away, like she was just some kind of garbage. Lu Yi expressed that, since whoever lives would be the one to drive the narrative, everyone from the Dragon Tooth organization would still be considered traitors of humanity. Xing Ling told Ming He that he shouldn't use his trump card. She wanted him to understand that Lu Yi was way stronger than Hui Zhao, and that he would die if the fight went on. But Ming He still insisted. Ming He reasoned to Xing Ling that he didn't have a choice but to use his trump card because he was in a desperate situation. Xing Ling decided to trust Ming He's decision. She told Ming He that they should make everyone realize the extent of his strength at the Red Sovereign rank. Moments later, Lu Yi couldn't help but exclaim when a red aura suddenly emanated from Ming He's body. He couldn't believe that Ming He actually dared to use his blood to increase his strength to the highest rank. Lu Yi expressed that, with Ming He's meager strength, 
he wouldn't be able to protect Liu Kian. Ming He started to rise into the air. Seeing that Ming He was being surrounded by a thick layer of aura, Liu Yi thought that he was using a Red Sovereign Dominion. He told Ming He that even if he had Red Sovereign ability, it was still not enough to defeat him. He said that Liu Kian would only be safe by his side and that even if humanity were eradicated from Earth, he would still be able to ensure that no hair on Liu Kian's head would be harmed. Out of nowhere, Tang Hang suddenly screamed. He expressed that what Ming He was using was not a Red Sovereign talent but a Divine Descent. An ability of the Black Saint rank. The moment Ming He opened his eyes, Xing Ling's emblem emerged on his forehead. When Xing Ling's image appeared behind Ming He, Tang Hang couldn't help but be in awe. He immediately realized that Xing Ling was the divine soul that had descended. Liu Yi was at a loss. He couldn't believe that Ming He was able to increase his strength by two ranks. Ming He crushed another isomorphic crystal. His fist immediately absorbed the essence. The essences merged and flowed towards his chest. While the essences were flaring up and forming into something, Ming He stared at Liu Yi aggressively. He expressed that, although he was grateful to Liu Yi for not harming Liu Kian, humans would never be the calamitous beast's pets, and neither would be livestock for them to kill. Ming He told Liu Yi that humanity would decide their own fates. All of the calamitous beasts should just go back underground. As if he really wanted to send Liu Yi back to the underground, Ming He smashed through the building floor by floor. The people outside were alarmed. They immediately gathered in the area to see what was going on. Moments later, Xing Ling's image slowly dissipated. Ming He and Liu Yi continued fighting. They were moving so fast that the people around them weren't able to keep up with them. The special forces desperately tried to protect themselves as embers and dragon scales rained down on them. After a couple of exchanges, Ming He managed to land a heavy blow on Liu Yi. Liu Yi started groaning in pain. Wings suddenly grew out of his back. Liu Yi immediately flew towards Ming He, leaving the special forces wondering if he was a calamity beast. After feeling the extraordinary aura that Liu Yi was giving off, Hong Xiao told her men that Liu Yi's power was not one that could be wielded by humans. Meanwhile, Ming He reacted too late and was hit by Liu Yi with his head. Liu Yi's blow was so strong that it sent Ming He crashing into the ground. Knowing that it was not a battle that they could join in, the special forces decided to go and rescue Wu Long first. At the same time, Liu Yi sucked in a lungful of air. Without waiting for the dust to settle, Liu Yi breathed fire at the place where Ming He crashed. Liu Yi was so busy burning the area that he didn't notice the streaks of golden energy that suddenly emerged from the sea of fire. Caught off guard, Liu Yi was helplessly stepped on and electrocuted by Ming He. Ming He unclenched his fist. As much as he could handle, he began to gather the lightning element present in the area, and from a great distance away, Ming He unleashed the lightning towards Liu Yi. His desire to send him back underground was relayed so clearly. Overwhelmed by Ming He's attack, blood spurted out of Liu Yi's eyes and mouth. Although Liu Yi bore the brunt of the attack, the surrounding areas still could not escape the calamity. Finding out that there was actually a Black Saint rank strength hidden in his body, Liu Lin couldn't help but say that Ming He was the true last defense of humanity. The survivors expressed that they were certain that the entire special forces wouldn't even be able to help with that kind of battle. Moments later, Ming He finally stopped, and it was revealed that the area that was once full of buildings had turned into an open space. Ming He tried asking Liu Yi to confirm if he was the reason why the battle in the battle ruins ended in defeat. But Liu Yi just said that asking those things was pointless. Ming He told Liu Yi that after cleaning out each and every one of the parasitic beasts from humanity's ranks, humanity would never lose out to all of them ever again and that everyone and Liu Kian would only be safe once he killed him and his comrades. When Ming He ordered Liu Yi to tell him where Wu Long brought Liu Kian and Qin Yu, Liu Yi laughed and asked Ming He why he still bothered asking when he knew damn well where Wu Long was going. After confirming his speculation that Wu Long went to the battle ruins, Liu Yi challenged Ming He to try and save Qin Yu and Liu Kian if he could. Ming He responded without hesitation. He confidently told Liu Yi that he would. A while later, Hong Xiao arrived. She immediately asked if the beast on the ground was Liu Yi. Ming He informed Hong Xiao that Liu Yi was a parasitic beast, and that monsters like him had already been planted within humanity ten years ago. He told her that the Dragon Tooth Organization was really humanity's last line of defense, and that the Dragon Tooth Organization was just carrying out a plan to kill the parasitic beasts masquerading as humans in the astronomy team. Hong Xiao couldn't help but express her disappointment upon realizing that the people they killed were the true heroes of humanity. Ming He said that for those who died, it was more worth it to exchange their lives for that outcome. Hong Xiao immediately ordered her men to tell everyone to be on guard and to kill all parasitic beasts, 
that were hiding in their midst. One of Hong Xiao's men immediately went to the superhuman guards and informed them about her orders. The superhuman guards relayed Hong Xiao's orders to the city guards. The superhuman association was informed as well. From that moment on, the news regarding the parasitic beasts masquerading as humans was shared with the world. After what happened to the astronomy team, all of the Dragon Tooth organization's best men, as well as all 87 members of the five attack teams, ended up sacrificing themselves. It meant that the entirety of the Dragon Tooth organization was almost erased from existence. The people of the Dragon Tooth organization were almost wiped out because they stood firm on their own beliefs. Other than Ming He and Liu Lin, the South City Head Guard, the South City School's Governor, the Hunters Association's Guildmaster, and the South City's Governor also attended the burial ceremony. The burial ceremony of humanity's last line of defense. The special forces took the lead in paying respect to the heroes of the Dragon Tooth Organization. The Superhuman Team, the Hunters Association, and the Superhuman School simultaneously paid their respects to the heroes of the Dragon Tooth Organization. Liu Lin promised her comrades that she would inherit their will and pass on the spirit of the Dragon Tooth Organization, to kill all the calamitous beasts, and to protect the South City and humanity. Some time later, after the burial ceremony, Liu Lin let Minghe know that she knew what he was thinking. She told him that if he tried to rescue Liu Kian and Qin Yu without having enough strength, it wouldn't be different from him running to the battlefield to die. Ming He reasoned to Luo Lin that he just couldn't stand still, knowing that Liu Kang and Qin Yu were in danger. Luo Lin explained that although she doesn't know what Wu Long was planning, since he decided to capture Qin Yu and Liu Kian, they wouldn't be in any immediate danger. She pointed out to Ming He that he needed to protect himself because they're the only two left of the Dragon Tooth organization. When Ming He asked Luo Lin at what point he could be considered strong enough, Luo Lin told him that he had to be at the White Swan rank to even have a minimal chance of being able to enter the ruins and rescue Qin Yu and Liu Kian. Ming He's strength was in the middle of the Heaven Flare rank. He knew that he still had a long way to go and that he couldn't delay things for too long. After telling Ming He that he looked like he was about to faint, Luo Lin expressed that they should stop thinking about those things. She instructed Ming He to go home and rest. She informed him that she still needed to instruct and watch over some of the battles since there were still quite a lot of parasitic beasts hiding amongst humans in the city. Later that day, in Ming He's dorm, the moment Ming He entered his room, his roommates immediately told him that they saw him on television. Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia simultaneously expressed that they were shocked to know that Ming He was part of the Dragon Tooth organization. Zhang Yuan told Ming He that he was amazing and that it must have been hard for him to hide things from them. Wai Jin suddenly stood up. He walked towards Ming He. Wai Jin sincerely apologized to Ming He. After telling him that he shouldn't have tried to target him out of jealousy, Lai Jin told Ming He that he was the hero of their city. Ming He accepted Lai Jin's apology. He said to him that they're all brothers living in the same dorm. All of a sudden, someone entered the room. With a wide smile on his face, Peng Linghui dove straight towards Ming He. Calling him his dearest brother, Peng Linghui told Ming He that he rushed there immediately after hearing that he had returned to the school. He said that a lot of people are surely admiring Ming He and that it must feel great to be a hero. Ming He expressed that he didn't feel any different, mentioning that he was just tired and wanted to have some good sleep. Peng Linghui let go of Ming He to allow him to get some rest. He told him that he wanted to ask about the Black Saint expert who helped out and caused the battle to end well. Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia were utterly shocked. After mentioning that it was a pity that the expert's information wasn't broadcast on the news, Peng Linghui asked Ming He if he knew who the expert was. Ming He told Peng Linghui that he would never be acquainted with someone as amazing as the expert. He claimed that he only managed to see the expert from afar and that those things are probably military-grade secrets that shouldn't be shared with them. Peng Linghui expressed that he just couldn't help but ask. He said that it would be cool if he knew someone who was an expert in the Black Saint rank. Moments later, inside his room, Ming He clenched his fists. When Ming He suddenly started cultivating, Xing Ling immediately told him to stop. She reminded him that he needed to heal up and rest properly. Xing Ling scolded Ming He for powering through a burial ceremony despite knowing that his body was about to break down. Ming He reasoned that it was the burial of the heroes of humanity, so it was necessary for him to see them off on their last journey. Xing Ling stopped arguing with Ming He, she just told him that if he didn't rest, he would end up dying next. Ming He insisted that he was fine. However, it didn't take long before his head started wobbling. Xing Ling couldn't help but stare at Ming He sympathetically. Some time later, Ming He could be seen sleeping on his bed. Ming He slowly opened his eyes. When Xing Ling asked him how he was feeling, he said that he felt so comfortable. Xing Ling informed Ming He that he had been completely knocked out for around 40 hours, and Ming He's stomach suddenly growled. 
The room suddenly became silent. Ming He told Zing Ling that they should go get some food, saying that he was going to die of hunger already. Later that day, in the cafeteria, the students were dumbfounded. They couldn't help but stare at Ming He, who was eating bowls of food one after the other. Moments later, Ming He was done eating. He opened his mouth. He burped so loudly that it echoed throughout the entire cafeteria. After saying that he feels as though he is finally alive, Ming He asked Zing Ling if there was any way for him to raise his strength quickly. Zing Ling told Ming He that what he needed to do was strengthen his foundation. She warned him that if he increased his strength more, he'd end up losing himself as he wouldn't be able to control the amount of power that he has. Ming He reminded Zing Ling that he needed to quickly attain the White Swan rank to save his loved ones. Knowing that Ming He was desperate, Zing Ling decided to just reveal to him that the most effective way for him to quickly raise his strength was to consume a plant-type parasitic beast liquid stardust. Ming He expressed that it would be difficult. He said that it wouldn't be easy to find those parasitic beasts. Zing Ling showed Ming He a drop of her blood. She informed him that he could use her blood to make a sensor for the parasitic beasts, and that unless they had used some kind of special ability to mask themselves, parasitic beasts that had a lower level than him wouldn't be able to hide from him. Ming He asked Zing Ling if she had ever thought that by helping him like that, she'd be bringing destruction to the calamitous beasts, who are probably her kind. Zing Ling expressed that although the calamitous beasts might truly have been her kin, she still wanted Ming He to show her the beauty of humanity's world. She told Ming He that she could sense from him and the members of the Dragon Tooth organization who sacrificed themselves that they all had a certain belief they advocated for, which might be the reason why human civilization became great as well. Zing Ling said that, although she didn't understand Wu Long, there was something in her that instinctively disliked him. After Wu Long's evil scheme was exposed, Tang Hang took over the authority of Nandu's Calamity Research. Ming He immediately went to Nandu Academy's Calamity Research Lab. He believed that if he wanted to make a sensor for calamitous beasts, Tang Hang would be the best person to work on it. Ming He went straight to Tang Hang's lab. As soon as he entered the room, Tang Hang asked him if there was anything he could help him with. Tang Hang told Ming He that he still needed a little while for his experiment, so Ming He decided to just sit and wait for Tang Hang to finish. A while later, Tang Hang suddenly exclaimed. Ming He quickly pulled Tang Hang away as he protected himself from the explosion. Tang Hang expressed that he was lucky that Ming He was there and that it was unfortunate that his experiment still failed. Noticing that he seemed to be in a rush, Ming He couldn't help but ask Tang Hang what kind of experiment he was working on. Tang Hang told Ming He that although they already put the entire Nandu under martial law to find the despicable parasitic beasts, things were still not going well. He said that the parasitic beasts were hiding themselves quite well, and that if they didn't expose themselves, it would be impossible to differentiate them. Tang Hang informed Ming He that the special forces and Luo Lin had asked him to make devices that could differentiate parasitic beasts. He tried using some of the blood and flesh of the parasitic beasts from before to work on some experiments and see if he could find some solutions, but he still failed. Suddenly, Tang Hang remembered to ask Ming He why he was looking for him. Ming He immediately showed Zing Ling's blood to Tang Hang. He asked him if he could make a calamity sensor with it. Tang Hang was shocked. After feeling the energy that was pumping from within it, he asked Ming He if it was the blood of a high-grade calamity. Ming He told Tang Hang that it was the essence that he extracted from his own blood. He said that since he had the power of a Black Saint rank, he thought that it would definitely be helpful to track calamities. Tang Hang told Ming He that he would give it a try. He said that it should only take him a while to finish it since all the other ingredients were already prepared. After observing the blood quite for some time, Tang Hang found out that the blood essence actually fulfilled the need of his experiment. He expressed that it would definitely work. An hour later, Tang Hang informed Ming He that the device was ready. He told him that he could give it a try. He explained that it would have a reading as long as there is a calamitous beast within a hundred meters radius. When Ming He asked how he was supposed to use the device, Tang Hang told him that he just needed to infuse his superpower into it. Ming He immediately tried using the device. The moment the device started working, a red arrow showed up. Knowing that it should be pointing in the direction of the calamity, Ming He found out that there really are parasitic beasts that are still hiding within their academy. Suddenly, the arrow disappeared. Tang Hang said that the parasitic beast must have left the 100 meter detection. He immediately instructed Ming He to quickly run in the direction where the arrow was pointing and catch the parasitic beast. Based on the direction of the arrow, Ming He speculated that the target must have been at the dormitory. As soon as he landed, he immediately ran in the direction the arrow pointed. Meanwhile, inside the research lab, Tang Hang couldn't help but stare blankly at his broken window. 
At the same time, while Minghe was on his way to the dormitory, the red arrow appeared again. It made him wonder if the parasitic beast was not a teacher, but a student. A while later, Minghe saw a woman chasing after a winged individual. The woman threatened the winged individual so he would stop, but the winged individual didn't even look back at her. The woman was actually Feng Ling. After closing the distance, Minghe stretched his arm and lengthened the vines that he had conjured. He controlled the vines so they would wrap themselves around the winged individual. The moment the winged individual was completely bound, Minghe immediately jerked at the vine. He pulled the vine so hard that the winged individual crashed onto the ground. Minghe's eyes widened in shock. The winged individual was actually Lai Jin. Lai Jin begged Minghe to take into consideration their being roommates and let him go. Lai Jin claimed that he was just forced into it and that he never did anything that would bring harm to humanity, even though he was a parasitic beast. Feng Ling told Minghe that Lai Jin was just trying to talk his way out of it. She informed him that when they tracked Lai Jin, they saw him try to bomb the Academy's territory. When he was in the standby forces, he leaked a lot of information, which caused countless innocent lives to die. Feng Ling expressed that if they only had a way to find Lai Jin, they would have killed him long ago. Minghe told Feng Ling that what she said was enough. Rocks immediately started gathering on top of Minghe the moment he raised his fist. When the rock was gigantic enough, he let it drop onto Lai Jin who managed to break free from the vine's binding. Dust and dirt were blasted away the moment the rock fell to the ground. When the dust had settled, Minghe slightly lifted the rock to check Lai Jin's condition. Feng Ling couldn't help but be surprised. She was confident that she could bring down Lai Jin, but she was sure that she couldn't do it as easily as Minghe. She told Minghe that, after not seeing each other for a long time, she didn't expect that he would be that strong already. Minghe told Feng Ling that he didn't expect her to reach Heaven Flare rank as well. Feng Ling just snorted in response. She thought that after reaching Heaven Flare rank, she could find the chance to win back the pride that she had lost to Minghe before. When Minghe asked Feng Ling why she was there, Feng Ling informed Minghe that since the entire Nandu was under martial law, the teachers in the academy were all being summoned back, and the academy's student council was tasked with looking for and cleaning up the parasitic beasts within the academy. She said that they were split into two groups, with her and Tang Ning leading each one. Minghe asked Feng Ling how things were going. Feng expressed that things weren't going well, saying the parasitic beasts were pretty good at keeping themselves hidden. She let Minghe know that Lai Jin was the first parasitic beast that was found by her group, which they only managed to find because of the little clues from before. Minghe told Feng Ling that she didn't need to worry. After telling her that she could leave things to him, Minghe assured Feng Ling that the parasitic beasts would not be able to run away. Some time later, in one of Nandu Academy's rooms, a professor announced to the students that they were starting their lecture already. Professor Lin told everyone that they would continue their lecture from before. One of the students expressed that he loved Professor Lin's lecture the most. He said that Professor Lin was not only young and gorgeous, but also simple and humorous. Another student added that Professor Lin was quite responsible as well. He shared with his seatmate that he heard that Professor Lin helped to tutor two students until 2 a.m. The student's seatmate expressed that he wondered if Professor Lin would tutor him on something that he couldn't understand as well. Moments later, Professor Lin exclaimed when Ming He and Feng Ling suddenly entered the room. The students got excited the moment they saw Feng Ling. They speculated that Ming He was the mysterious newbie that defeated Feng Ling. Since it was not announced that the two would be there, the students wondered if they were there for Professor Lin's lecture as well. While Professor Lin was asking if they came for the lecture, Ming He took a look at the watch. He and Feng Ling nodded at each other. When Ming He confirmed that they were there for the lecture, Professor Lin told them to go and grab a seat for themselves. Ming He suddenly clenched his fists. Professor Lin couldn't help but exclaim the moment Ming He and Feng Ling simultaneously threw a punch at her. She was caught off guard and was easily punched by the two. Ming He and Feng Ling's punch were so strong that it sent Professor Lin hurtling towards the wall. The students were inevitably shocked by the two's sudden actions. Professor Lin was in disbelief. She didn't think that the two were crazy enough to dare to attack a professor. Ming He told Professor Lin to drop the act. He revealed to her that they already knew that she was a parasitic beast. The students didn't believe Ming He. They said that there must be some kind of misunderstanding since Professor Lin had already been in Nandu for five years and should not be a parasitic beast. Two students suddenly ran towards Professor Lin. They told Ming He and Feng Ling that although they had made quite the contribution before, they shouldn't accuse Professor Lin just like that. They declared that they would protect Professor Lin's safety. Feng Ling asked Ming He to check if the two students were parasitic beasts as well. Ming He informed Feng Ling that they were not, saying that the two were just side characters that got affected by the parasitic beast. 
Feng Ling told Minghe that they should capture the two as well and see if they could save them after it. Knowing that they shouldn't show mercy, Feng Ling didn't think twice about using a strong attack. The two students panicked. After saying that Minghe and Feng Ling were parasitic beasts, they asked the other students to help deal with them. Suddenly, Professor Lin stepped in to protect her students. She quickly summoned a shield to block Feng Ling's kick. Minghe told Professor Lin that she was already exposed, so there was no point in keeping up with the act. He used the wood element to bind Professor Lin and smash her into the wall. The fat student tried to react when Feng Ling suddenly attacked his friend. But he was so slow that he was easily kicked in the face. Feng Ling stopped attacking and just let the two fall to the ground. Professor Lin asked Minghe not to kill her. She revealed her true form and claimed that she didn't harm anyone. The students were utterly shocked. They couldn't believe that Professor Lin was really a parasitic beast. One of the students noticed that the two students who stepped in were affected by Professor Lin's aura as well. He said that they must be the ones that Professor Lin tutored the last night. Minghe got furious, realizing that Professor Lin must have parasitized the two students. Professor Lin slashed the branches that bound her. As she leapt towards Minghe, she expressed that all humans were just pests. Minghe immediately raised his fist after absorbing fire. He told Professor Lin that she couldn't just assume who the pest was. Professor Lin couldn't help but scream in pain as she got burned by the fire that suddenly erupted from below her. Seeing that Minghe could kill a lord rank parasitic beast so easily, Feng Ling became certain that Minghe was really strong. However, she refused to admit defeat just like that. She vowed that she would definitely catch up to Minghe. Feng Ling actually didn't expect that Professor Lin was a parasitic beast as well. She told Minghe that if it wasn't for his censor, Professor Lin would have been left doing what she wanted. Minghe pointed out to Feng Ling that parasitic beasts had completely blended in with humans. He said that although he was worried about how everything went on outside, they should prioritize cleaning up the Nandu Academy first. Some time later, Minghe was flustered the moment he opened a door. The women inside the room were inevitably stunned the moment they saw Minghe. They ordered Minghe to immediately get out of the room. They couldn't understand how a boy got into their girl's dormitory. Minghe steeled himself, as he didn't have a choice. He quickly ran towards the woman standing behind the other girls. With the intent to kill, Minghe punched the woman in the face. The parasitic beast couldn't even react before dying to Minghe. Feng Ling couldn't help but wonder if she could even catch up to a maniac like him. After telling them not to panic, Feng Ling asked the women to take a look at the woman that Minghe punched. Minghe expressed that plant-type parasitic beasts really are rare. They had pretty much cleaned up the insides of the Nandu Academy, and they found a total of nine parasitic beasts, but that one was the only plant type. When Feng Ling asked what they were going to do next, Minghe told Feng Ling that he would give Luo Lin a call to see if she needed some help in dealing with the parasitic beasts outside the academy. Without wasting time, Minghe called Luo Lin. He immediately asked her what the situation on their side was. Luo Lin told Minghe that their side wasn't doing well. She informed him that after finding three parasitic beasts, they ran out of clues and got stuck, unsure of what to do. Minghe let Luo Lin know that he and Feng Ling had already gotten rid of all the parasitic beasts in Nandu Academy. He pointed out to her that they found a total of nine parasitic beasts. Luo Lin's eyes widened in shock. She couldn't believe that Minghe had found nine parasitic beasts already. Minghe asked Luo Lin if she needed him to come over and help her. He was eager to help Luo Lin because, based on Xing Ling's estimation, Luo Lin would need at least five liquid stardusts to be able to reach the White Swan rank. Luo Lin agreed to let Minghe help. She informed him that she was at Yan Street. As soon as they could, Minghe and Feng Ling immediately went towards Yan Street. When Minghe asked why she only had one bike despite being rich, Feng Ling sarcastically said that she's only one person, so she didn't need two bikes and that she didn't want to make everyone think that she's a fool with a lot of money. Minghe decided to just let go of Feng Ling's waist. However, Feng Ling unknowingly ran over a rock. Minghe panicked. He hurriedly reached for something to hold so as to prevent himself from falling. Realizing that he had grabbed something that he shouldn't have, Minghe apologized to Feng Ling. Later that day, Minghe and Feng Ling finally reached their destination. Luo Lin immediately notified her men that the people they had been waiting for had arrived. Minghe immediately jumped off the bike the moment it stopped. When Feng Ling greeted her, Luo Lin greeted her back. Luo Lin told her that she knew that she was the princess of Tanfang Biology Corp. and a prodigious student of Nandu Academy. Feng Ling expressed that before she met Minghe, she really thought that she was a prodigy. She told Luo Lin that since Minghe was there, they should just forget about her being a prodigy. Luo Lin said to Feng Ling that she didn't have to compare herself with a maniac like Minghe. Minghe didn't expect Feng Ling to be the princess of Tanfang Biology Corp. 
the largest biomedicine manufacturing company in Nandu City. He heard that there was a lot of medicine that superhumans used, which was all manufactured by Tanfang Biology Corp. After telling him that they had no information at that moment, Luo Lin asked Ming He how they found the parasitic beasts. Ming He showed the watch to Luo Lin. He informed her that it was Tang Hang's latest invention that was able to detect parasitic beasts within a hundred meter radius. He told her that only one had been made and that mass production was difficult because of a shortage of materials. Liu Lin expressed that it was good that they had one. She said that they should begin right away. After walking for quite some time, the three still didn't find anything. The sensor only had a hundred meter detection range, and the streets were too big, so they didn't have a choice but to keep on looking. Three hours later, the three excitedly took a look at the watch the moment a red arrow appeared. Based on the direction, they determined that the parasitic beast was inside the mall. Inside the mall, a saleswoman thanked a customer for purchasing their product. The moment she turned her head, she was greeted by a hand that was reaching for her. Ming He grabbed the woman's head and mercilessly smashed it into the ground. When Ming He was about to finish off the woman, Liu Lin and Feng Ling asked him to let them have their turn. The two immediately punched towards the parasitic beast, which had just transformed into its original form. Liu Lin slashed the parasitic beast with her claws, while Feng Ling blasted it with a kick. Liu Lin couldn't help but smile. Although it was a little inefficient, Luo Lin and Feng Ling were happy to find and kill a parasitic beast. They realized that although the sensor was effective in Nandu Academy, the entire city was just too big for its 100-meter detection range. Luo Lin expressed that it would have been best if the Dragon Tooth organization were still there. Other than the specialized combat Team 1 and Team 2, Team 3 to Team 5 specialized in intel gathering. If they had the Dragon Tooth Organization's intelligence network, along with the sensor's accurate detection, their efficiency would have been much better. Luo Lin found it a shame that even their leader was sacrificed during the battle at the astronomy. When Ming He asked her if she missed the Dragon Tooth Organization again, Luo Lin said that she was not. She pointed out that finding the parasitic beasts was the most important matter at that moment. The three resumed looking around the city, and they soon found the second parasitic beast. The man inside the car that the three stopped slowly transformed into a parasitic beast. The parasitic beast expressed that he recognized them all. He said that he knew that they were the remnants of the Dragon Tooth organization. With her burning hands, Feng Ling countered the parasitic beast's attack. Meanwhile, Ming He noticed that the people were pressuring the special forces to let them pass through. Feng Ling and the parasitic beast's strength seemed to be even, as their attacks did nothing but push each other away. The parasitic beast felt so confident that he threatened Feng Ling that he would tear her apart. However, before he could even attack again, his life was ended by Ming He. Feng Ling couldn't believe that Ming He got rid of the parasitic beast with just one hit. When she scolded Ming He for stealing her kill, Ming He told her that he had to because they were causing a traffic jam. A while later, Luo Lin discussed with the two that, with the help of the sensor, they only found two parasitic beasts in the entire afternoon. She informed them that she also asked for updates from the other teams from the special forces, but they got nothing as well. Feng Ling expressed that getting rid of the parasitic beasts is a complicated job and that they could only take it slowly. Since he only found one liquid stardust the entire day, Ming He couldn't help but wonder how long it would take for him to be able to reach the White Swan rank. When Feng Ling asked him what he was thinking about, he just said that it was nothing and that they should keep looking for parasitic beasts. Feng Ling suggested that they grab something to eat first and keep looking at night. She told them that she would pay for the food. The two immediately agreed. Luo Lin expressed that the fact that they were with Feng Ling truly made a difference. After saying that they should have a French meal, Feng Ling told Luo Lin that she knew a good restaurant just right around there. She asked her what her opinion was. Although she had the impression that the French meal was for dating, Luo Lin still agreed. She said that it might be easier for them to find parasitic beasts there because the restaurant's location was quite crowded and lively. Without further ado, they went to the restaurant that Feng Ling mentioned. The food was served in unique and beautiful presentations, and the decor and architecture of the restaurant building were notable as well. Feng Ling asked Ming He to try the steak, saying that it was quite juicy and tasted really good. Realizing that she was being ignored, Luo Lin couldn't help but wonder if she was third wheeling. While she was looking at them from the side, she noticed that the two were quite suited for each other. Luo Lin thought to herself that it was a shame that the woman that Ming He was into was Lu Kian, who was also another outstanding woman. Moments later, while they were eating, Ming He's phone suddenly rang. The caller was actually Tang Hang. After learning that Ming He and his group found only two parasitic beasts the entire afternoon, 
He told Ming He that they could just take their time. Tang Hang shared with Ming He that the higher ups just told him to attend an emergency meeting that night. He informed him that the subject of the meeting was to come up with an all out assault strategy on the battle ruins. Tang Hang pointed out that by then, they would be able to save both Kin Yu and Liu Kian. Ming He was shocked. He immediately asked Tang Hang when the assault would be. Tang Hang told Ming He that although it was not confirmed yet, it should be happening soon. Ming He thought to himself that Tang Hang was still too naive. He believed that if humans really did an all-out attack, if the plan failed, they could just forget about saving Qin Yu and Liu Kian. And if the plan succeeded, Wu Long would very likely kill the two out of anger. Since it was something he didn't want to happen, Ming He intended to pick up the pace. He was determined to save both Qin Yu and Liu Kian before the all-out attack. Ming He noticed the change in Liu Lin's expression. He couldn't help but ask her if something was on her mind. Liu Lin clenched her fist. She reminded Ming He that after Wu Long revealed himself, Tang Hang became the most well-known specialist on calamity research in the entire Nandu city. Knowing that Tang Hang was going to attend a meeting with the higher-ups, Liu Lin asked Ming He if they could ask Tang Hang to propose in the meeting to rebuild the Dragon Tooth organization. Ming He was startled. He thought to himself that rebuilding the Dragon Tooth organization might be a very good suggestion. He believed that with the help of the Dragon Tooth Organization's intelligence network, finding the parasitic beasts would be hastened, and he would also be able to collect liquid stardust at a much faster rate. Ming He made up his mind. He said that they should go and talk to Tang Hang immediately. As if they had completely forgotten about her, the two left Feng Ling behind. Feng Ling tried telling the two that they should at least finish their food before leaving, but to no avail. Feng Ling hurriedly chased after Ming He and Luo Lin. She told them that if they wanted to ask Tang Hang for help, they should bring Tang Ning as well. She explained to them that with Tang Ning on their side, it would be easier for them to convince Tang Hang. Suddenly, Ming He and Luo Lin turned and stared intently at Feng Ling. Ming He told Feng Ling that what she said was absolutely right. Since she was the one closest to Tang Ning, Ming He asked Feng Ling to ask Tang Ning to go and meet Tang Hang with them. Later that day, outside Tang Hang's office, seeing that they were waiting for her, Tang Ning immediately apologized to everyone. She explained that she was a little late because she was cleaning up the parasitic beasts along with the Hunters Association. Ming He told Tang Ning that she was just right on time and that they should head in and talk to Tang Hang together. Ming He opened the door, and he and Tang Ning simultaneously greeted Tang Hang. Tang Hang was surprised to see everyone. He asked them why they had the spare time to come there despite being busy with the cleanup of the parasitic beasts. Ming He signaled Luo Lin to explain. Luo Lin told Tang Hang that they were there to ask him to help them propose to rebuild the Dragon Tooth organization in the meeting of the higher-ups in Nandu City. She pointed out that the Dragon Tooth organization sacrificed a lot at that time and that since she and Ming He were the only ones left, the organization was pretty much dead already. Ling He expressed that what Liu Lin said was right. He told Tang Hang that they really needed the help of the organization, saying that even though they had the calamity sensor, its effective range was just too small. Ming He explained that if they had the help of the Dragon Tooth Organization's intelligence network, narrowing down the search radius based on the clues they had would definitely increase the efficiency by a huge margin. Tang Hang told Ming He and Luo Lin that he understood what they were saying and that rebuilding the Dragon Tooth Organization was also part of his dream because he was part of the reason why the Dragon Tooth Organization ended up that way. He said that he was just afraid that since the entire city was focusing on fighting back on the battle ruins, rebuilding the organization would not be an easy task. Tang Ning told Tang Hang that he could just propose it at the meeting. She pointed out that if it weren't for him, the Dragon Tooth Organization, and Ming He, there was no way Nandu City would be able to survive until that day. Tang Ning believed that if the people disagreed with the rebuilding of the Dragon Tooth Organization, the sacrifice that they had made would be for nothing. Tang Hang told Tang Ning that there are things that she still doesn't know, but he told her to just ignore what he said. Tang Hang promised everyone that he would help them with it. After saying that he would have to look for the headmaster of the academy first, Tang Hang told everyone that the headmaster has a pretty high status in Nandu and that if they were able to get his help, there might be a chance. Ming He and Luo Lin couldn't help but smile at each other. They immediately thanked Tang Hang for his help. Tang Hang instructed everyone to keep up the pace in finding the parasitic beasts. Later that night, Nandu City's high-level meeting started. Nandu's chief of defense told everyone that the canyon mist incident, the special forces defeat in the front lines, the astronomy incident that had happened recently, are signs that the evil forces of calamity are marching towards them and that the threat that the battle ruins pose cannot be overlooked. 
He said that because of it, he and the South Defense Division, along with the other chiefs of defense in the jurisdiction nearby, had decided that they would use all the methods that they have at their disposal, including the use of large-scale lethal weapons, to conduct an all-out attack against the battle ruins to completely annihilate the core location of calamities. Nandu's chief of defense informed everyone that he had summoned all of them there to come up with a detailed and well-thought-out combat strategy. Two hours later, Nandu's chief of defense told everyone that since all of them had come to an agreement, they would proceed with the combat plan and make an all-out assault one week later. He declared the end of their meeting. Suddenly, a man raised his hand and called everyone's attention. Tang Hang asked everyone to give him a moment to speak. After informing them that parasitic beasts were almost everywhere in Nandu City, Tang Hang pointed out to everyone that if they didn't completely get rid of those parasitic beasts, their combat tactics would be leaked out easily. He proposed that they could rebuild the Dragon Tooth organization to deal with that matter. Nandu's chief of defense expressed that since Tang Hang believed that rebuilding the Dragon Tooth organization was necessary, they should discuss it. An old woman reminded everyone that the astronomy incident was discovered and was stopped in time by the Dragon Tooth organization and Tang Hang. She said that they were the heroes of humanity, so she supported the idea of rebuilding the organization. An old man voiced out that the Dragon Tooth organization's management being overtly independent was a problem. Nandu's chief of defense told the old man that there was no problem with the organization's independent management. He explained that if they wanted a sharp knife, they would have to give some special privileges. A middle-aged man expressed that. Although he agreed with what Nandu's chief of defense had said, their main concern was to put all their resources into destroying the battle ruins. After saying that they didn't have many superpowers there in Nandu City, the middle-aged man asked Nandu's chief of defense if they could leave the matter of the Dragon Tooth organization to the next meeting. Another old man pointed out that based on the analysis of the combat situation, it was true that the Dragon Tooth organization had made a huge contribution to their victory, but they had still acted on their own. He said that the Dragon Tooth organization didn't trust the higher-ups, but they didn't have the ability to handle the war, and that if Ming He hadn't appeared at the very last minute, things would have gotten much worse. An old woman added that even though Ming He was a member of the Dragon Tooth organization, his appearance was not part of their plan. She asked if Luo Lin, who was the commander, had to be responsible for the damage that the Dragon Tooth organization had suffered. Suddenly, Lao Chu expressed that pushing the responsibility to Luo Lin was a little over the top. He reminded everyone that if it weren't for the Dragon Tooth organization, the entire humanity might not even know the true identity of the astronomy group. The two didn't respond, seemingly unconvinced by what Lao Chu said. Lao Chu made it clear to everyone that the sacrificed members of the Dragon Tooth organization were all heroes of humanity, no matter what. He strongly believed that, being the heroes that they were, the Dragon Tooth organization should have the honor and respect they deserved. Nandu's chief of defense asked Lao Chu to calm down, telling him that everyone was just stating their opinion. He expressed that although the parasitic beast problem that Tang Hang brought up was indeed quite serious, they have limited superpowers, so it would be difficult for them to focus on both sides. He told everyone that he believed that as long as they were able to destroy battle ruins and kill the mastermind, the parasitic beasts in Nandu would be like headless chickens and would be dealt with pretty easily. The old woman agreed with Nandu's chief of defense. She said that they would focus on destroying the battle ruins first before considering the rebuilding of the Dragon Tooth organization. After saying that it would be settled if everyone agreed, Nandu's chief of defense asked what Lao Chu and Tang Hang's opinions were. The two simultaneously agreed on following Nandu's chief of defense's plan. Some time later, inside Tang Hang's office, the four waited patiently. Suddenly, someone opened the door. Ming He and Luo Lin immediately asked Tang Hang how the meeting went. Tang Hang informed the two that the rebuilding of the Dragon Tooth organization was put on hold. Ming He was surprised. He asked Tang Hang why it was put on hold. Tang Hang told everyone that he would tell them what happened. He shared with them how the higher-ups arrived at that decision. Tang Hang explained that although Nandu's chief of defense was supportive of it, the others thought that they didn't have the manpower to focus on both sides, especially after the loss they suffered during the astronomy team incident. He said that since they were working on the all-out assault in the battle ruins, they couldn't focus on the Dragon Tooth organization as well. Feng Ling expressed that it was just an excuse that couldn't even fool a child. She understood that what the higher-ups meant was that once the superhumans joined the Dragon Tooth organization, they wouldn't be able to join the assault on the battle ruins. Tang Ning told Tang Hang that Feng Ling had a point and that they could argue with the higher-ups on it. 
Ming he guessed that it was because of the fact that the Dragon Tooth organization acted on its own during the astronomy incident that made the higher-ups have second thoughts. Liu Lin told Feng Ling and Tang Ning to just forget about it for the time being. She explained to them that it was normal for higher-ups to have their concerns. When Liu Lin asked Ming he what his next step was, Ming he told her that he didn't have a better plan than rebuilding the Dragon Tooth organization. Ming he expressed that with the all-out assault on the battle ruins being just around the corner, if they left the parasitic beasts be, there would be a huge problem. The room suddenly fell into silence. They knew that Ming he was right, but they didn't know how to resolve their problem. Ming he told everyone that since the plan to rebuild the Dragon Tooth organization was put on hold, he would go back to cleaning the parasitic beasts. He thought to himself that even though it was a slow process, it was everything he could do. He would be able to lower the danger that the people in Nandu were facing while collecting his liquid stardust. Tang Hang and Luo Lin tried stopping Ming He by telling him that it was already late at night and that he didn't have to work so hard and push himself too much. However, Ming He still insisted on going. He said that he could wait, but Kin Yu and Lu Kian couldn't. Not wanting to be left out, Feng Ling immediately chased after Ming He. Tang Ning couldn't believe how persistent the two were. Three days later, while Feng Ling was fighting a parasitic beast, a man from the special forces kept the people from approaching and informed them that the Dragon Tooth was carrying out their mission. With a blazing kick, Feng Ling managed to land a hit on the parasitic beast's jaw. The parasitic beast inevitably blacked out. When he finally regained his senses, Feng Ling was already behind him, getting ready to kick him yet again. Too late to react, the parasitic beast was sent crashing into the ground. Ming He immediately absorbed Feng Ling's flame the moment he saw that the parasitic beast was trying to run away. With a punch, he released the flame towards the unsuspecting parasitic beast. The parasitic beast desperately tried shielding himself from Ming He's attack, but to no avail. Feng Ling couldn't help but scold Ming He for taking her kill yet again. Ming He explained that his hand just slipped because he got too worried that the parasitic beast would get away. He promised Feng Ling that he would leave the next parasitic beast to her, saying that he just couldn't help at that time since it was a rare plant-type parasitic beast. In three days' time, they did not even manage to find ten parasitic beasts, and the liquid stardust that they managed to find was that one alone. It was almost time for the counterattack on the battle ruins, so Ming He did not have much time left. Suddenly, an explosion occurred in one of the tallest buildings. Ming He and Feng Ling couldn't help but stare at the building, their eyes wide. The other buildings started exploding one after the other, causing Ming He and Feng Ling to get even more confused. When the buildings started to collapse, the people inside panicked and desperately jumped out, hoping they wouldn't get crushed. Feng Ling stared at the people with a troubled look on her face. She told Ming He that it must be the doing of parasitic beasts taking their revenge. Ming He agreed with Feng Ling, saying it would be impossible for an explosion of that scale to be caused by a mere accident. Since the parasitic beasts kept themselves hidden for the past few days, Ming He couldn't help but wonder why they were launching a terrorist attack all of a sudden. Seeing that a lot of people needed immediate help, the two decided to set aside their thoughts and save the victims first. A while later, the two found a woman stuck under a vehicle. Ming He stopped in front of the vehicle. He sent it flying with a punch, making sure the woman wouldn't get hurt during the process. It was revealed that the woman actually had a child between her arms. Noticing that the woman was already unresponsive, Feng Ling decided to just take the child from her. Without saying anything, Feng Ling wiped the tears falling from the child's eyes. She vowed that she would definitely kill all of the parasitic beasts. Moments later, the rescue teams arrived. They immediately ran towards Ming He and Feng Ling. The leader asked the two if they were superhumans. When Ming He informed the leader that they were students of the Nandu Academy, the leader told him that a building had just collapsed not far from there and that there was no way for them to save all the people with the little manpower they had. The leader asked Ming He and Feng Ling to assist them in the operation. He assured them they could let them take care of the child. Ming He immediately agreed. He told Feng Ling that they should go help the people right away. Feng Ling instructed the leader to take good care of the child. She informed him that the child's mother was already gone. Some of the members of the rescue team were helping the survivors when Ming He and Feng Ling arrived at the scene. Ming He directed the rescue team to move aside. He let them know that he was a superhuman. As soon as the rescue team was out of the area, Ming He immediately put his hand on the ground. Suddenly, the building's debris floated in the air and gathered in a single area. Ming He stayed kneeling on the ground and focused on cleaning up the mess. Moments later, the rescue team couldn't help but stare at the gigantic floating mass in front of them. They were amazed by how strong Ming He was. The leader immediately ordered his men to quickly take advantage of that opportunity to save everyone. 
Witnessing how impressive he really was, Feng Ling couldn't help but admire Ming He even more. Ming He threw the gigantic mass into an open area where there were no people. Glad that he did things right, Ming He released a sigh of relief. The survivors expressed that they were saved and that it was the Dragon Tooth organization that saved them. When the leader of the rescue team thanked Ming He for making their rescue operation go so smoothly, Ming He just said that it was their responsibility. He told Feng Ling that they should go to the other area and help. Since there were four buildings that collapsed, Ming He thought that it would be too inefficient if it were him and Feng Ling. He told Feng Ling that he would make a call to Luo Lin to see if she could find someone to help them out. He instructed her to give Tang Ning a call as well so that she could ask Headmaster Chu to send over the students from Nandu Academy. Feng Ling agreed and called Tang Ning right away. After calling Tang Ning, Feng Ling informed Ming He that Headmaster Chu had already sent some people over. Ming He told her that Luo Lin, along with the superhuman troops and the special combat forces, was on their way and should arrive shortly. When Feng Ling asked Ming He what they were going to do next, Ming He said that they should keep assisting in the rescue and decide once everyone arrived. A few minutes later, the superhuman troops and the special combat forces arrived at the scene. Everyone helped with the rescue operation right away and Luo Lin immediately looked for Ming He. After telling him that the superhuman troops and the special combat forces were all there, Luo Lin asked Ming He what the situation on his side was. Ming He told Luo Lin that although he was not hurt, there were a lot of casualties in the explosion. He expressed that the parasitic beasts were just way too much. Feng Ling saw Tang Ning. She immediately called her to let her know where they were. Tang Ning, along with the other students from Nandu Academy, hurriedly ran towards Feng Ling. Feng Ling told them that they should save the people right away. Luo Lin said that she couldn't understand why the parasitic beasts decided to cause an explosion at a time like that despite not having the time to find a place to hide ever since the battle with the astronomy team. Ming He expressed that he found it strange as well. He guessed that they could only know about the truth when they find the person behind the explosion. When Luo Lin asked him how he would find the person behind the explosion, Ming He said that he had been at the scene ever since the explosion happened. He explained that all four buildings exploded at the same time, so there was no way that it was caused by a single parasitic beast. Ming He believed that it was definitely an operation that had been planned by an organization, and that to carry out that plan, at least ten parasitic demons were needed. Confused, Luo Lin asked Ming He what he meant. Ming He told Luo Lin that he had been paying attention to the calamity sensor throughout the rescue operation but didn't find anything. He said that the only possibility was that the parasitic beasts had prepared an escape route, which was not on the surface. Ming He guessed that the parasitic beasts' escape route should be in the sewers. He explained that if the buildings collapsed, the sewers nearby must have been destroyed as well, and that if the parasitic beasts were planning to escape, they would have to find an exit further away from there, so there was a high chance that they were still in the sewers. Ming He told Luo Lin that they would have to form a small team for it because the layout of the sewage system was complicated and there were a number of calamities as well. He said that they would also need a map and an experienced commander. Luo Lin let Ming He know that he was becoming more and more like a commander. When Ming He told her that she was the most experienced commander they had there, Luo Lin told Ming He to stop arguing and said she would go and look for the map for the underground sewer right away. She expressed that if only she and Ming He weren't the only ones left in the Dragon Tooth organization, they wouldn't have to ask the special combat forces to help them capture the calamities. Suddenly, Feng Ling told Luo Lin that she could go with Ming He. Tang Ning said that she could go too. Zhang Yuan, Wang Jia, and Peng Ling Hui simultaneously said that they could go as well. Luo Lin took something from the car and handed it out to everyone. Those were actually communication devices. Luo Lin informed everyone that those were the Dragon Tooth Organization's equipment. She told them that she found a map and that she would be commanding from above. With all things in place, Ming He wasted no time and immediately entered the sewers. The rest of the group quickly followed behind Ming He. Before proceeding, Ming He declared that he, Peng Linghui, and Feng Ling were Group A. He told Tang Ning that she would be leading Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia as Group B. Ning He instructed Tang Ning to remember that if any of them found any traces of calamities, they should just trail them first and wait for them to rendezvous before attacking together. Peng Linghui cheerfully expressed how excited he was to finally be in a Dragon Tooth organization's operation. However, he was instantly told by Feng Ling to keep his voice down. Luo Lin couldn't help but smile after hearing the two's interaction. Some time later, Ming He informed Luo Lin that his sensor had not detected any parasitic beasts yet. When Ming He asked her which path they should take, Luo Lin instructed Ming He to go left. Ten minutes later, the sensor finally detected a parasitic beast. 
After observing the arrow, Minghe determined that the parasitic beasts were in his 11 o'clock direction, around 100 meters away from him. Minghe couldn't help but exclaim when the arrow suddenly disappeared from the sensor. He realized that the parasitic beasts were moving at an extremely high speed. He immediately asked Luo Lin to inform Group B that they found the parasitic beasts. Luo Lin acknowledged Minghe's words. She told him to try not to get too close to the parasitic beasts. After informing Group B to regroup with Minghe through another route, Luo Lin let Minghe know that it would take Group B some time to regroup with them because the sewage on their side got damaged pretty badly. Minghe relayed the information to Feng Ling. He told her that they should catch up with the parasitic beasts first to see where they were planning to retreat to. Feng Ling immediately agreed. She found the parasitic beasts' movement weird. Based on Luo Lin's map, they should be out of the explosion area, and under normal circumstances, they should be getting out of the sewers already. When Feng Ling told Minghe that the parasitic beasts didn't seem like they were planning to leave, Minghe said that he had the same feeling as well. Peng Linghui expressed that if the parasitic beasts were not getting out of the sewers, they might be trying to get somewhere through them. Minghe told Peng Linghui that it was possible. He asked him where he thought the parasitic beasts were heading. Peng Linghui said that the parasitic beasts might be running back to their base. He told Minghe that if they followed them, they might get to capture all the parasitic beasts in Nandu City. Minghe told Peng Linghui that it should be impossible, saying that the astronomy group had already been destroyed and it would be disadvantageous for the parasitic beasts to group up. Peng Linghui said that it's weird because the parasitic beasts have already accomplished their objectives, so they should be running in different directions already. Feng Ling agreed. She expressed that since the parasitic beasts had already bombed four buildings and were out of the explosion area as well, they could have just split up and run in different directions. Ming He suddenly realized something. He told the two that maybe it was possible that the parasitic beasts had yet to complete their mission. Ming He explained that the reason why the parasitic beasts chose to bomb the four buildings and expose themselves at that time must be because they had a greater mission. Peng Linghui asked why the parasitic beasts bombed the buildings first, which just attracted everyone's attention. Ming He told Peng Linghui that there should be a reason why the parasitic beasts were trying to get their attention on purpose. He said that they should catch up with them first. Ming He reported to Luo Lin that the parasitic beasts may not have completed their mission. He asked her if she could predict where the parasitic beasts were heading next based on the direction they were going. Luo Lin immediately studied the map and tried to figure out where the parasitic beasts wanted to go. Moments later, Luo Lin told Minghe that the parasitic beasts had three possible destinations. Minghe immediately asked what the three possible destinations were. Luo Lin informed Minghe that the first one was Yangxing Mall, a place with the most human traffic in all of Nandu City. She believed that it was possible that the parasitic beasts were trying to get to Yangxing Mall. Luo Lin said that the two other possible locations were the clock tower and an abandoned water plant. Ning He wondered if the parasitic beasts were trying to poison the water like last time, thinking that it was better for the parasitic beasts to keep a low profile than poison the water. Ming He asked Luo Lin to try and look into the surroundings of the three locations. Luo Lin acknowledged Ming He's request and checked the map right away. When Feng Ling asked Ming He what his suspicion was, Ming He just said that he had the feeling that things weren't that simple. Peng Linghui suggested intercepting the parasitic beasts up ahead, saying that in that way, no matter what they were trying to do, they would be able to stop them. Ming He told Peng Linghui that there were too many of the parasitic beasts. He explained that if they didn't regroup with Tang Ning, some of the parasitic beasts might leak and may lead to another problem as well. Feng Ling immediately agreed when Ming He said that they would have to keep on following the parasitic beasts before they found out about them. Peng Linghui was surprised. He couldn't help but wonder when Feng Ling became that timid in front of Ming He. Moments later, Luo Lin told Ming He that she had found a very important place. She told him that not far from the water plant was another nuclear power plant. Ming He was inevitably shocked. He was alarmed by what the parasitic beasts might do with the nuclear power plant. Luo Lin told Ming He that it was very unlikely that the parasitic beasts would be heading to the nuclear power plant because the superhuman troops were there, protecting it day and night. Ming He reminded Luo Lin that the superhuman troops were transferred to support the rescue. Luo Lin's eyes widened in shock. She realized that the parasitic beast's main objective was to blow up the nuclear power plant. For the past few days, the superhuman troops had been arranged to prepare for the assault on the battle ruins. They were already lacking in manpower even before the bombing in the city. Ming He expressed that he was afraid that the number of superhuman troops at the nuclear power plant at that moment wouldn't be enough to fend off the parasitic beasts. Luo Lin told Ming He that he would have to stop the parasitic beasts, saying that if they managed to blow the nuclear power plant, 
there wouldn't be enough power supply for the entire Nandu. She believed that if that happened, they would have to just forget about attacking the battle ruins since losing power supply would mean that the entire Nandu's defense system would be pried open, and there would be unimaginable disasters by then. Ming He acknowledged Luo Lin's orders. He assured her that they could definitely stop the parasitic beasts. Luo Lin said that she would inform the superhuman troops right away so that they could head back immediately. Ming He told Luo Lin that there was no time for it. He explained that although the superhuman troops were full of superhumans, since the traffic in the city had been severely damaged, they wouldn't be able to make it before the parasitic beasts because of the traffic jams all around the city. Knowing that what Ming He said was right, Luo Lin didn't insist and just asked what they should do. Ming He told Luo Lin that their only opening was that the parasitic beasts hadn't noticed that their plans had been exposed already. He said that he was worried because of the way the parasitic beasts acted. Ming He suspected that the parasitic beasts might have allies within the nuclear power plant. Luo Lin agreed. She said that the parasitic beasts must have someone leaking information to them from within the nuclear power plant since they were causing such a huge commotion, had a clear objective, and acted quickly. She pointed out that it was obvious that the parasitic beasts were pretty familiar with the situation at the nuclear power plant especially the movements of the superhuman troops that were stationed there, that was why they pulled off something like that. Luo Lin got so desperate that she urged Ming He to think of a solution. When Ming He asked if the abandoned water plant was right in front of the nuclear power plant, Luo Lin quickly confirmed that he was right. Ming He instructed Luo Lin to inform Tang Nang's group that they didn't need to catch up with the parasitic beasts. He said that Tang Nang's group should just head straight to the water plant and blow up the water plant. Luo Lin was extremely shocked. She couldn't understand why Ming He would want to blow up the water plant. Ming He expressed that even though they were at a disadvantage, Nandu was still the human's territory. He explained that since they already knew the parasitic beast's objective, they shouldn't get dragged along by their footsteps. The parasitic beasts had to go through the sewers after transforming, but Ming He and his group didn't have to. The water plant was connected to the river, so there was a lot of water stored within it. Ming He planned on blowing up the water plant, letting the water flood into the underground sewers to stall the parasitic beasts from reaching the nuclear power plant effectively. Liu Lin couldn't help but tell Ming He that his plan was quite aggressive. She asked him what they should do next. Ming He told Liu Lin that he and Feng Ling would get back to the surface and head straight for the nuclear power plant. He was confident that they would definitely be able to reach there before the parasitic beasts. Ming He pointed out that since he had the sensor, he would be able to look for the parasitic beast that was hiding within the nuclear power plant once he reached there, and meet up with Tang Ning. Liu Lin understood Ming He's plan. She told him that he would inform Tang Ning right away. Feng Ling reminded Ming He that there were only three people at Tang Ning's side. She and Peng Linghui were worried that they wouldn't be able to take on a dozen parasitic beasts. Ming He started climbing up the ladder, after saying that they didn't have time to think about it and that he believed that Tang Ning would be able to stall the parasitic beasts. Ming He told the two that they could only head to the nuclear power plant as fast as they could and find the parasitic beast spy in there before heading back to support Tang Ning. Peng Linghui just realized what being a member of the Dragon Tooth organization really meant. Knowing that protecting the nuclear power plant was crucial, Peng Linghui and Feng Ling steeled themselves and agreed with Ming He's plan. Later that day, in the streets of Nandu, a robbery occurred. A middle-aged man asked the three students in front of him to try not to head for the road towards the crime scene. As he jumped over the car, Ming He instructed Feng Ling to drive. He entered the car. Meanwhile, Peng Linghui got into an accident while entering the car. Ming He and Feng Ling couldn't help but feel awkward as they watched Peng Linghui try to ease the pain. Seeing that Feng Ling was driving fast, the middle-aged man got worried that she would crash his car. Some time later, Ming He told Feng Ling to just drive past the abandoned water plant. The moment they drove past it, Peng Linghui saw Tang Ning's group. Both Wang Jia and Tang Ning noticed that Ming He's group were the ones inside the car ahead of them. Tang Ning reminded Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan that their mission was to blow up the water plant and guard that place. Ming He watched Tang Ning unhesitatingly enter the abandoned water plant. He just hoped that she would be able to finish her mission and survive. Feng Ling couldn't help but be worried about Tang Ning. Moments later, Tang Ning started blowing up the water plant using her superpowers. Feng Ling expressed that she hoped that Tang Ning would be able to wait for them. She stepped harder on the gas pedal. Ignoring the explosions happening in the abandoned water plant, Ming He's group sped up towards the nuclear power plant. Without encountering any trouble, the three arrived at the nuclear power plant. Peng Linghui excitedly told Ming He that they were already at their destination. The men guarding the plant were inevitably alarmed by the trio's arrival. 
After telling them to stop, they informed Ming He and his group that they were at the nuclear power plant. Ming He introduced himself to the guards and said he was a member of the Dragon Tooth group. Feng Ling told the guards that they were students from Nandu Academy and that they were on a special mission. Confused, the guards asked why the Dragon Tooth organization and Nandu Academy would send people there. Ming He went straight to the point. He let the guards know that they were suspecting that there was a parasitic beast hiding within the nuclear power plant. The guards were extremely shocked. Hearing about parasitic beasts made them nervous. Peng Linghui ordered the guards to take them to the control center right away, and when the guards said that they didn't have the authority to do it, he urged them to immediately inform the chief. Suddenly, Ming He stopped the guards from informing the chief. He told them that his detection range was only 100 meters and that they were still not sure if the chief of that nuclear power plant was not infected, so they might alert the parasitic beasts. Knowing that that nuclear power plant was massive, Peng Linghui couldn't help but ask Ming Yi how they were going to find the parasitic beasts without the help of the chief. He said that they couldn't afford to look for the parasitic beasts bit by bit because they would at least need one to two hours to do it. Ignoring Peng Linghui, Ming Yi asked the guard which department handled the nuclear power plant's daily maintenance and servicing, and where their office was located. The guard informed Ming He that the team in charge was the engineering department's maintenance team, which was on the west side of the office tower. Peng Linghui couldn't understand why Ming He asked those questions of the guard. He was thinking that they wouldn't get anything from the maintenance team that was not even that high of a status in the nuclear power plant. Ming He explained that after a large portion of the superhuman troops got transferred away from the nuclear power plant, the parasitic beasts there still didn't dare make a move and were waiting for the other parasitic beasts to come and back them up, which meant that there was not much of them there, and their strength wasn't that strong as well. He believed that, in order for the parasitic beasts to ensure that their plan would not fail, they must have blended into positions that were very crucial, and other than the chief of the nuclear power plant, only the people from the maintenance team would be able to make contact with the equipment and set up within the nuclear power plant at any time. Both Peng Linghui and Feng Ling agreed with what Ming He said. They told Ming He that they should head over to the engineering department's maintenance team right away. Peng Linghui asked the guards to lead the way. He told them that the parasitic beasts would blow up the nuclear power plant if they were just going to keep on standing there. The guards looked at one another as if they were looking for a response. The guard decided to bring Ming He and his group to the maintenance team at once. Three minutes later, in the maintenance team's office, the leader of the maintenance team was surprised when someone suddenly entered. After looking at the sensor, Ming He found out that there weren't any parasitic beasts inside. Feng Ling was surprised. She wondered if the parasitic beasts were not on the maintenance team. After introducing himself and saying that he was carrying out a special mission, Ming He asked if everyone from the maintenance team was present in the office. The leader of the maintenance team informed Ming He that half an hour ago, Lea took on into the generator, saying that there was something broken in there, so they went there for maintenance. Ming He was alarmed. He ordered the maintenance team leader to quickly bring him to Lea. When the leader asked if something had happened, Ming He told him that there was no time to explain. The leader stopped asking and just led the way. Shortly after, inside the plant, five people ran swiftly towards where Lea and Anan were. Ming He checked the sensor. He immediately stopped the moment he saw a red arrow. Ming He told everyone that the parasitic beast was right below them. Seeing that people were falling from the upper level, Lea and Anan couldn't help but be alarmed. Lea scolded everyone and ordered them to explain what they were doing. Peng Linghui confronted Lea. He told him that they knew that he was a parasitic beast. Lea was taken aback. Peng Linghui told Ming He that they shouldn't waste more time, saying that they should deal with Lea right away. Ming He hurriedly told Peng Linghui that the parasitic beast was not Lea. It was actually Anan. He immediately made a move as he watched Peng Linghui mercilessly punch Lea in the face. Both the guard and the leader of the maintenance team were shocked. They didn't think that Anan was actually a parasitic beast. Lea was in disbelief. He couldn't help but stare at Anan as he transformed into his original form. While Anan was asking him how he found him, Peng Linghui screamed and asked Feng Ling to help him. Feng Ling attacked Anan with the intent to kill, and Peng Linghui immediately used that opportunity to run away. Anan glared aggressively at Feng Ling. As he was blocking all of her attacks, he told her that there was nothing that she could do. Feng Ling got anxious. She realized that Anan was actually a pinnacle heaven flare rank. Ming He told Feng Ling that he would deal with Anan. He reminded her that Tang Ning's team was fighting for their lives and that they didn't have any time to waste. Ming He prepared himself for battle. A red aura emanated from Ming He's whole body as he nonchalantly strode towards Anan. When Peng Linghui asked what the red aura was, Feng Ling said that it must be a red sovereign talent. 
Anan was alarmed by the sudden change in Minghi's aura. Minghi told Anan that he knew that to blow up the nuclear power plant, they blew up four buildings in the middle of the city, causing the death of countless innocent lives. He pointed out that the people who died were all just normal humans who didn't have any powers and just wanted to survive. Some lost their loved ones, some lost their children, and some lost their mothers. Minghi made it clear to Anan that they were the ones that did all of it and that parasitic beasts like him were the pests on that planet. Minghi unleashed his technique, the absolute territory vacuum realm. Anan inevitably started to get anxious. Minghi took out an isomorphic crystal. He broke it and absorbed its essence. As Minghi threw absolute zero frozen rock punches towards Anan, Anan hurriedly used his vines to desperately block the punches. Anan saw an opening and immediately counterattacked. However, his vines and second head suddenly started freezing the moment they got closer to Minghi. Anan couldn't help but curse. He got nervous as he watched Minghi slowly raise his head. He was both horrified and confused. In Anan's eyes, Minghi suddenly looked enormous. He got so scared that he asked Minghi what kind of monster he was. Anan panically said that he didn't want to die. He tried to flee, but his feet were actually already frozen in place. Minghi expressed his disgust. After hearing him say that he didn't want to die, Minghi couldn't help but remind Anan that the innocent citizens that were killed didn't want to die as well. He told him that he wouldn't let his plan go smoothly. Anan was rendered helpless as Minghi gradually froze him. All he could do was stare at Minghi with a horrified look on his face. Peng Linghui was amazed by Minghi's red sovereign power. He couldn't believe that the strong and immense power from his fists was able to form a vacuum realm. Feng Ling explained that under a vacuum environment, ice could be lowered to a much colder temperature, and it could even reach absolute zero indefinitely. Feng Ling Hui had a hard time believing that a parasitic beast at the Heaven Flare grade was killed just like that. When Feng Ling said that maybe even her Phoenix Flame would not be able to compete against Ming He's absolute zero, Peng Ling Hui commented that it was such a huge gap. Suddenly, Peng Ling Hui remembered that Ming He was not even in the Red Sovereign grade. Ming He seemed to be wondering what Peng Ling Hui and Feng Ling were talking about as he glanced in their direction. Meanwhile, in the middle of the city, the superhuman troops and rescue team were still clearing the rubble. The chief of Nandu's defense expressed that if they didn't get rid of the parasitic beasts, there wouldn't be peace in Nandu City. Hong Jiao told the chief that it was strange that the parasitic beasts chose to cause such a huge commotion in the center of the city. The chief said that it was indeed strange. He wondered what the parasitic beast's objective could be. Suddenly, the chief's phone started ringing. The caller was actually Tang Heng. He informed the chief that Liu Lin had just contacted him. He let him know that Minghi was already headed for the nuclear power plant because he judged that it could be the objective of the parasitic beasts. The chief was extremely shocked. He ended the call while considering Minghi. After telling her that Minghi suspected that the parasitic beasts were actually after the nuclear power plant, the chief informed Hong Zio that the nuclear power plant was the main power source for the entire Nandu city. He said that if the parasitic beasts really managed to destroy it, Nandu City's defense would have a huge issue, and they could just forget about the plan of attacking the battle ruins. When Hong Jiao said that she would bring some men over right away, the chief hoped that she would be able to make it in time. At the same time, in the abandoned water plant, Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia weren't confident that they could hold the parasitic beasts off with just the three of them. They wondered if they were going to die. Suddenly, Tang Ning noticed some movements on the floor. As soon as several parasitic beasts broke through the floor, the three quickly got ready to fight. The parasitic beasts immediately surrounded them. Wang Jia and Zhang Yun could not help but curse when they saw how many parasitic beasts had come after them. Not knowing what he should do, Wang Jia asked Tang Ning for guidance. Tang Ning told Wang Jia that she was the same as him. Deep down, she was scared as well. Tang Ning pointed out to the two that they were the first line of defense. So if they failed there and the parasitic beasts managed to get through, Minghi and Feng Ling might face the danger of getting pinched from both sides. She said that if Minghi and Feng Ling died, the parasitic beasts would blow up the nuclear power plant. Without the power supply, Nandu City's defense system would be rendered useless, and they would be completely exposed to the calamity's threat. After telling them that everything that happened on that day would keep on happening in the future in the city if they failed, Tang Ning asked the two if they would be able to watch their teachers, classmates, friends, and all the other innocent citizens be slaughtered by the calamities. Jiang Yuan told Tang Ning that they definitely could not, saying that if Nandu Academy students like them didn't stand and fight, no one would. He said that everything would be over if they cowered in fear. Wang Jia strongly agreed. He said that superhumans should be responsible for protecting humanity, 
and that it was their first time joining a Dragon Tooth organization's mission, so they couldn't just back off. Tang Ning couldn't help but smile. With Tang Ning taking the lead, they courageously charged towards the parasitic beasts. Tang Ning simultaneously created two ice spikes. She threw the ice spikes at the parasitic beasts, pinning them to the ground. Jiang Yuan expressed that although he was just a first-year newbie, he was a man who would join the Dragon Tooth organization in the future. His superhuman ability was actually super strength punches. Out of nowhere, a huge ice spike formed, skewering a parasitic beast and driving the others away. Wang Jia's superhuman ability was geo manipulation. He told the parasitic beasts that they shouldn't underestimate them, saying that they were humanity's future stars as well. Suddenly, a parasitic beast jumped towards Wang Jia. It opened its mouth widely as it got closer to Wang Jia, who was caught off guard. Luckily, Jiang Yuan was able to react just in time to save his friend. However, the other parasitic beast immediately took the opportunity to whip him. Wang Jia hurriedly used his superhuman ability to get Zhang Yuan out of danger. Knowing that he almost got killed, Zhang Yuan thanked Wang Jia for helping him. Wang Jia told Zhang Yuan to just forget about it because they were already surrounded. Suddenly, there were snowflakes in the air. The parasitic beasts got frozen in place as Tang Ning swiftly ran past them. Shortly after, every parasitic beast in their vicinity got encased in ice. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan were inevitably amazed by Tang Ning's power. However, it didn't take long before the ice started to crack. The ice was blasted, and a parasitic beast quickly flew out of it. The three were alarmed, realizing that there was a fire element parasitic beast. There were around 20 parasitic beasts, and each of them had different abilities. Even Tang Ning's glacial advent couldn't suppress them. After saying that the glacial advent could still hold the parasitic beasts off for a little while, Zhang Yuan told everyone that they could kill the parasitic beasts while they were still being trapped. Without delay, Tang Ning leaped and created numerous ice spikes. She let those ice spikes rain down on the parasitic beasts, who were struggling to get away. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan followed Tang Ning's lead and also started killing the parasitic beasts. Tang Ning expressed that she could definitely stop the parasitic beasts. Moments later, both Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan got overwhelmed by the parasitic beasts. At the same time, Tang Ning exclaimed as she got caught by a parasitic beast's tongue. The parasitic beast excitedly opened its mouth when it pulled Tang Ning's leg. But when it successfully swallowed Tang Ning, it began to exhibit signs of pain. Suddenly, ice spikes emerged from the parasitic beast's skin. It was slashed ruthlessly from the inside. The moment the parasitic beast's flesh split open, Tang Ning leaped out of it. She expressed that Ming He and Feng Ling must find the parasitic beast hiding within the nuclear power plant and put an end to their plan. Tang Ning unleashed all the power she had. She was dead set on stalling the parasitic beasts to buy some time for Ming He and Feng Ling. She decided not to give up. Tang Ning expressed that she could not afford to fall there, not before Ming He and Feng Ling found the parasitic beasts hiding in the nuclear power plant. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan agreed with Tang Ning, saying that they had to buy time even if they used up all their strength. They resolved not to run away. Enraged, one of the parasitic beasts suggested to the others that they should quickly kill the three pests and complete their mission of destroying the nuclear power plant. It got even more enraged when Tang Ning cut one of its arms. Tang Ning made it clear to them that parasitic beasts like them were the pests. Out of nowhere, Zhang Yuan told Wang Jia that there was something he had been meaning to say the entire time. Wang Jia asked Zhang Yuan what it was. Zhang Yuan expressed that he had always thought that Lu Kayan was the prettiest goddess in Nandu Academy. Wang Jia got furious. He told Zhang Yuan that Feng Ling was prettier. Zhang Yuan said that Tang Ning, in his opinion, was the prettiest. Wang Jia told Zhang Yuan that Tang Ning was indeed pretty. They both agreed that being able to die alongside Tang Ning was totally worth it. They immediately ran towards Tang Ning. They planned on protecting Tang Ning, saying that even if they were to die, they would be the ones who would die first. The two exchanged a knowing glance. They simultaneously slammed their hands on the ground. Suddenly, a massive wall formed and prevented the parasitic creatures from getting near. The parasitic beasts wasted no time. They immediately started attacking the wall that blocked their way. Moments later, Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia's combined technique was blown up by the parasitic beasts. Seeing that he was struggling to regain his balance, the parasitic beasts aimed for Wang Jia. Zhang Yuan immediately rushed forward to protect his friend. He punched the parasitic beast with everything he had. Tang Ning was startled when the parasitic beast that Zhang Yuan punched crashed in front of her. The two swiftly moved in front of Tang Ning. 
they told her that if they were to die, they wanted to die before her. Kang Ning told the two that she couldn't afford to fall, saying that she needed to buy time for Ming He and Feng Ling by stopping those parasitic beasts. Knowing that they had grown weaker, the parasitic beasts simultaneously charged towards the three. Wang Jia was caught right away, but he showed no fear. Zhang Yun was also caught, but similar to Wang Jia, he was not afraid and also made a valiant attempt to kill the parasitic beasts. Out of nowhere, Feng Ling jumped, and her aura increased all of a sudden. She unleashed her technique, the Absolute Territory Glacial Winged Form. At that same moment, the parasitic beasts were instantly frozen in place. Both Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia weren't able to escape and got frozen as well. The parasitic beasts immediately tried to break the ice. Before they could escape, Tang Ning swiftly slashed two parasitic beasts. Tang Ning suddenly fell on her knee and started panting heavily. She was worn out down to the bone. A while later, a portion of the ice had already melted. The parasitic beasts finally managed to break free. They immediately jumped towards Tang Ning, who was too exhausted to move even an inch. Suddenly, a truck appeared out of nowhere and began to run over the parasitic beasts. Absolute Zero Frost Fists came flying towards the confused parasitic beasts. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan were glad that Ming He managed to arrive in time to save them. However, they couldn't help but ask him why he was there already. Ming He told the two that after killing the parasitic beast hiding within the nuclear power plant, he rushed over as fast as he could to help. Ming He walked towards Tang Ning and asked her if she was alright. Tang Ning was shocked when she saw that it was actually Ming He who approached her. She immediately asked him what the situation at the nuclear power plant was. Ming He informed Tang Ning that they managed to kill the parasitic beast the moment they got into the nuclear power plant. But they were concerned that more might be lurking inside, so he left Peng Linghui and Feng Ling to watch over the area. Tang Ning was relieved, and she felt even more relieved when Ming He told her that she could leave the rest to him. Ming He said to the parasitic beasts that their plans had already failed. The parasitic beasts were in disbelief, thinking that there was no way that their plans got exposed. They asked Ming He how he managed to find the parasitic beast in the nuclear power plant. Ming He told the parasitic beasts that the reason was simply because they are the Dragon Tooth Organization. The parasitic beasts told Ming He that the Dragon Tooth Organization no longer existed. Ming He expressed that no matter if it was the past or the future, the Dragon Tooth Organization would live on forever. He declared that the Dragon Tooth Organization would always be the sharp blade that would pierce through the calamities. Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia simultaneously said that the Dragon Tooth Organization would live on and that they were part of it. Tang Ning agreed with Ming He, Wang Jia, and Zhang Yuan. She also believed that the Dragon Tooth Organization was there the entire time. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan asked Ming He to get rid of the parasitic beasts for the countless casualties and citizens that got injured in the explosion that day. They told him that they had to avenge those innocent lives. Ming He unhesitatingly jumped towards the parasitic beasts. He expressed that getting rid of all the parasitic beasts that were hiding among humans was the responsibility that the Dragon Tooth Organization bears. With Ming He's strength, it didn't take long for him to get rid of most of the parasitic beasts. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan got excited. They asked Ming He to let them handle the last two parasitic beasts. Ming He stopped the two and said that they should leave the two parasitic beasts alive. He expressed that he had a feeling that there were still some parts of that incident that he couldn't figure out. The parasitic beasts told Ming He that he was too naive to assume that a human like him could capture and get information out of them. The parasitic beasts suddenly jumped towards Ming He. When cracks started forming all over their bodies, they screamed that all of them should die together. Ming He immediately realized that they were going to self-destruct. Shocked, Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan were at a loss for what to do. Ming He hurriedly slammed his hand to the ground as he told Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan to get out of the way. Ming He's ability made the parasitic beasts unable to move, allowing Zhang Yuan and Wang Jia to leap to safety. At that same moment, the two parasitic beasts simultaneously exploded. The explosion was so strong that it caught the attention of the people in the vehicles that were driving quickly towards the scene. In one of the vehicles, Hong Zio urged her men to quickly head over to the abandoned water plant and take a look. Some time later, Hong Zio and her men came to a stop at the site of the explosion. They couldn't help but wonder what exactly had happened in that place. It was hard for them to believe that the couple dozen parasitic beasts lying on the ground were killed by the four people in front of them. Hong Zio asked Ming He to explain what exactly was going on. When she asked Ming He why he was there and what the situation was over at the nuclear power plant, Ming He informed her that the parasitic beast hiding within the nuclear power plant had already been killed. Ming He told Hong Zio that he left Feng Ling and Peng Linghui there just in case. He explained that he was the one that asked Tang Ning, 
Wang Jia, and Zhang Yuan to blow up that place to stop the parasitic beasts. He pointed out that if it weren't for those three, the nuclear power plant would have already been destroyed by the parasitic beasts. Ming He claimed that he just managed to get there as well. When Tang Ning was about to argue, Ming He quickly told her that she should try not to talk because she had suffered serious injuries. Wang Jia and Zhang Yuan tried telling Hong Xiao that it was actually Ming He. However, Ming He interfered. Ming He insisted that it was Zhang Yuan, Wang Jia, and Tang Hang who stopped those nearly 20 parasitic beasts. Hong Xiao understood what Ming He meant. She told them that Lao Chu and Tang Hang would definitely be proud of them all. Hong Xiao immediately instructed her men to send Tang Ning, Wang Jia, and Zhang Yuan to the hospital and to leave two men there to clean up the bodies of those parasitic beasts. She asked Ming He to come over to the nuclear power plant with her. Later that day, Feng Ling, who was guarding outside the nuclear power plant, saw Ming He and Hong Xiao coming. She immediately asked Ming He how Tang Ning and the others were. Ming He informed Feng Ling that the parasitic beasts had all been dealt with and that Tang Ning and others were injured, so they were sent to the hospital. When Feng Ling asked him if he was injured as well, Ming He assured her that he was fine. Hong Xiao asked Ming He to take them to the combat scene to take a look. Moments later, inside the plant, Hong Xiao's men were inevitably surprised by the fact that there really was a parasitic beast with such destructive power hiding there. Hong Xiao told her men that if Ming He didn't realize the parasitic beast's true objective, the nuclear power plant would have been blown into ashes already. She pointed out to Ming He that he had achieved quite the feat yet again. Ming He told Hong Xiao that it was him and Feng Ling that realized it. He said that if it weren't for Feng Ling and Peng Ling Hui's support, he wouldn't have been able to stop the parasitic beasts from blowing up the nuclear power plant. When Hong Xiao asked them if they were students of Nandu Academy, Feng Ling confirmed that they were. Peng Ling Hui was so shy that he added that he was just a first-year rookie. Hong Xiao let everyone know that she would report to Chief Kin about the huge contribution that Nandu Academy had made. She asked Ming He to follow her for a bit. Hong Xiao brought Ming He to a place where the others wouldn't be able to hear their conversation. She told Ming He that he possessed huge potential. After telling him that she wanted him to join them, Hong Xiao asked Ming He if he had ever considered joining the Special Combat Forces. Ming He told Hong Xiao that he had no plans of joining the Special Combat Forces. He expressed that since he had joined the Dragon Tooth organization, he would always be part of it, no matter how many people were left. Ming He told Hong Xiao that he strongly believed that the Dragon Tooth organization would always exist. Hong Xiao acknowledged Ming He's decision. She let Ming He know that she had high hopes for him and for the Dragon Tooth organization as well, and that even though he had rejected her offer, she would still support him. Hong Xiao expressed that, after that incident, she had a good feeling that the day of the Dragon Tooth organization's rebirth wasn't that far away. Fifteen minutes later, Luo Lin called Ming He. She thanked him for proving once again the value of the Dragon Tooth's existence. She informed him that the higher-ups had known about that incident and that she heard that Chief Kin had called for an emergency meeting. When Ming He said that he believed in the higher-ups, Lao Chu and Tang Hang, Liu Lin became confident that rebuilding the Dragoon Tooth organization would definitely be a success that time around. She told Ming He that if the Dragon Tooth organization really managed to rebuild, she hoped that he would be the one leading it. Ming He was utterly shocked. He didn't seem to expect that Luo Lin would ask him to lead the Dragon Tooth organization. Meanwhile, Nandu's high-level meeting immediately started the moment all the higher-ups arrived. Chief Kin informed everyone that this time around, the parasitic beasts caused a huge amount of damage to their city and citizens. Two of the higher-ups expressed that the parasitic beasts were too cruel and that they must get rid of them completely from Nandu City. Chief Kin agreed with them. He said that if they didn't annihilate all the parasitic beasts, there wouldn't be peace in Nandu City. He pointed out that if it weren't for Ming He, the parasitic beasts would have blown up the nuclear power plant, and Nandu City's defense system would have been destroyed already. Chief Kin expressed that he wouldn't even dare to imagine what would happen if the parasitic beasts succeeded. One of the higher-ups admitted that they got careless, saying that they were focusing so much on saving the citizens after the explosion that they didn't even notice what the parasitic beasts were after. Chief Kin told the old man that the superhuman troops excelled in sieges. He said that, as for the special combat forces, their combat strength was their advantage, so they couldn't blame them for it. However, Chief Kin believed that they must reflect on themselves because of that incident. One of the higher-ups asked Chief Kin if he was planning on rebuilding the Dragon Tooth organization. Chief Kin confirmed that he was. He explained that superhuman troops and the special combat forces have their own strengths, and the Dragon Tooth organization's strength was their ability to collect intel and fight strategically. Chief Kin said that if they wanted to completely annihilate the parasitic beasts, 
within the city, they would have to rely on the Dragon Tooth organization's abilities. One of the higher-ups agreed, pointing out that the parasitic beasts did such a great job at blending into their lives and adapting to the human lifestyle that if they never exposed themselves on their own, it would have been difficult for them to be found. Another higher-up expressed that he believed that the Dragon Tooth organization does have the capability to deal with that matter. Chief Kin announced that they would vote for it. He asked everyone to raise their hand if they agreed to rebuild the Dragon Tooth organization. Lao Chu raised his hand right away, and Tang Hang immediately followed behind Lao Chu. The other higher-ups discussed that the Dragon Tooth organization was indeed their eyes, which finds out their enemies' objectives. One of the higher-ups glanced at the others as she slowly raised her hand. Moments later, the rest simultaneously raised their hands. All of the higher-ups agreed to rebuild the Dragon Tooth organization. Chief Kin expressed that since every one of them had agreed to it, he hoped that everyone would provide full support for the arrangement and manpower assignment of superhumans. One of the higher-ups told Chief Kin that, although he doesn't mind supporting it, they should decide first as to who would be the leader of the Dragon Tooth organization. Another higher-up agreed. She added that the leader was the key to whether the Dragon Tooth organization would be able to regain their strength quickly. Another expressed that although Liu Lin was a good choice, she lacked combat strength. Lao Chu told everyone that he had the best person for it. When Chief Kin asked Lao Chu if he was talking about Ming He, Lao Chu confirmed that he was. He explained that Ming He was already one of the two remaining members of the Dragon Tooth organization, and that the recent events were more than enough to prove his skills and intelligence. Lao Chu believed that there wouldn't be a problem if Ming He were the one to lead the organization. While one of the higher-ups was saying that Ming He was indeed suitable, another said that it was a little inappropriate. She expressed that no matter what, Ming He was still a first-year rookie who hadn't even reached the White Swan rank, and so letting him be the leader would be a hasty decision. Chief Kin told everyone that they should stop arguing about it. He said that at that moment, Ming He was indeed the most suitable candidate for that role, so they would have him be the leader of the Dragon Tooth temporarily. Chief Kin added that they would have Ming He clean up the parasitic beasts in Nandu City as a test. He explained that if Ming He was able to annihilate each and every one of the parasitic beasts before the attack in the battle ruins, he would have passed the test and would be the official leader of the Dragon Tooth organization and that if he was not capable of doing it, they would have to find another person for the position. Lao Chu reminded Chief Kin that the attack on the battle ruins was in four days, pointing out that it was not even enough for the Dragon Tooth organization to regain their strength. Thinking that it was an impossible mission, Lao Chu asked Chief Kin to give Ming He a little more time. Chief Kin told Lao Chu that they simply couldn't afford to give more time. He explained that the attack on the battle ruins was something that they must execute and that once they had commenced the attack, the city would become totally defenseless. Chief Kin said that as long as the parasitic beasts were still around, they would be able to wreak havoc throughout the city, and they wouldn't be able to bear the consequences. Meanwhile, at Nandu Academy, Peng Linghui expressed how glad he was to finally be back. After telling Minghe that following him around was exciting, Peng Linghui said that with the huge contribution that he had achieved, his father would definitely stop calling him a useless parasite. When Peng Linghui asked Minghe to let him join in his future missions to capture the parasitic beasts, Minghe told him that they should head back to the dorm and rest already, saying that they wouldn't be able to fight the parasitic beasts if they didn't rest enough. Peng Linghui agreed. He informed Minghe that Feng Ling's father immediately sent Uncle Yuan over to pick up Feng Ling the moment he heard that she was in danger, whereas his dad didn't even bother giving him a call. Peng Linghui expressed that a man would always have to rely on himself. He left to go get some rest. Suddenly, Minghe's phone started ringing. He immediately answered Tang Hang's call. Some time later, Minghe thanked Tang Hang for informing him about the outcome of the meeting. Tang Hang told him that after the approval of the rebuilding of the Dragon Tooth organization, he was assigned as the acting leader, and that he would have to clear out the parasitic beasts in the city before the attack on the battle ruins. Ming He would also have to reserve enough time to save his sister and Lu Kian, so the time that he had left to clear out the parasitic demons was two days at most. He was determined to pick up the pace since he would have to annihilate the parasitic demons and collect enough liquid stardust within the next two days. Meanwhile, somewhere in Nandu City, Feng Ling's phone suddenly started ringing. She answered Ming He's call. And when Ming He asked her if she was at their house already, she informed him that she was still on her way. Ming He informed Feng Ling that after the approval of the rebuilding of the Dragon Tooth organization, he was assigned as the acting leader, and that his first emergency mission was to annihilate the parasitic beasts. Ming He asked Feng Ling to help him. 
he told her that she would be the leader of a combat squad within the Dragon Tooth organization. Feng Ling told Ming He that although she didn't mind joining the Dragon Tooth organization, she doubted if she was even suitable to be a squad leader since she didn't have much experience and hadn't even graduated from the academy yet. Ming He assured Feng Ling that she was more than qualified because the squad leader in the Dragon Tooth organization had to be at least in the Heaven Flare rank and that experience was not a big deal since everyone had to start somewhere. Pointing out that he didn't have much experience himself, Feng Ling told Ming He that she would think about it. The moment Feng Ling ended the call, Uncle Yuan talked to her. He told her that being the squad leader in the Dragon Tooth organization was a good offer, and when he asked her what she was hesitating for, Feng Ling just told him that he didn't understand. Feng Ling was actually afraid that she would mess things up and cause a huge problem in Ming He's plan. Uncle Yuan told Feng Ling that she was just overthinking everything, and that she was not the frank and honest Feng Ling that he used to know, pointing out that if a kid like Ming he could be the leader of the Dragon Tooth, she should not be afraid of becoming a squad leader. Uncle Yuan asked Feng Ling if she wanted to be further and further away from Ming He. Feng Ling told Uncle Yuan that he was right. She said that although she might not be able to win against Ming He, she shouldn't be too far behind him either. Knowing that Feng Ling had regained her confidence, Uncle Yuan couldn't help but smile. The next day, everyone gathered at the Dragon Tooth Organization's operation base. Luo Lin immediately showed Ming He all the recommended members. She informed him that those recommended by the superhuman troops and the special combat forces were all members who contributed to past operations. When Ming He expressed that the superhuman troops and special combat forces seemed to be serious about it because they recommended all kinds of elites, Luo Lin agreed and said that the Nandu Academy had transferred some people over as well. Ming He immediately checked the profiles of those people that the Nandu Academy had transferred to them. Moments later, Feng Ling found two people that she recognized. She informed Ming He that the people named Lin Nan and Song Yi were also part of the student council, and that both of them were quite strong and were at Sunblaze rank already. Feng Ling said that Lin Nan specialized in firearms, while Song Yi had a unique ability when it came to stealth. Feng Ling expressed that it seemed that Lao Chu was giving them his full support as well. Ming He told the two that they should head over to meet their new members. Luo Lin informed Ming He that some of the members were former Dragon Tooth Organization members who had retired and just requested to rejoin when they heard that the Dragon Tooth Organization was about to rebuild. Thinking that it was something they should be glad about, Ming He couldn't help but ask Luo Lin what was wrong with it. Luo Lin told Ming He that although the other members were fine, there was one person who was tricky to handle. She let Ming He know that the person she was referring to was the former leader of Squad 1, Zhang Hu, who retired due to his injury a year ago. When Zhang Hu had completely recovered from his injuries, his strength drastically improved, and he reached White Swan rank. Zhang Hu was quite arrogant and would be quite aggressive when he was on a mission. The squad number one that he led had contributed the most among all the members, but they were also the ones with the most sacrifices. Liu Lin expressed that she was a little worried. She said that if Zhang Hu were to return to the Dragon Tooth organization, he might not listen to Ming He's orders, which would be a huge problem. She suggested that they should just reject Zhang Hu's application. Ming He told Liu Lin that they would not reject Zhang Hu's application. He explained that since the Dragon Tooth organization was in need of manpower, they should just let a strong fighter like Zhang Hu join. Ming He said that if Zhang Hu would not listen to him, he would just beat him up until he did. The three immediately went straight to the Dragon Tooth's main lobby. After seeing Ming He's face, the people from the Special Combat Forces commented that Ming He seemed a little too young to be the leader of the organization. Ming He glanced authoritatively at the new members of the Dragon Tooth organization. Someone from the Superhuman Troops whispered to his friend that he heard that Ming He was just a first-year rookie from Nandu Academy. When one of the former members of the Dragon Tooth asked Zhang Hu what his opinion was, Zhang Hu just snorted. Meanwhile, the people from Nandu Academy were amazed by how Ming He managed to become the leader of the Dragon Tooth at such a young age. They expressed that they should learn from him. Ming He thought to himself that, just as Liu Lin had expected, the new members would still split into their own four groups. He could not see even the slightest teamwork there. Ming He welcomed the new members. He told them that he would save all the small talk because they were in a rush, and that he bet that they already knew about the huge explosion in the middle of the city. After telling them that the parasitic beasts were hiding all around Nandu City, and were always prepared to cause damage, Ming He informed everyone that after the approval of the rebuilding of the Dragon Tooth organization, he was assigned as the acting leader, and that their first emergency mission was to annihilate the parasitic beasts. While Ming He was telling everyone that he was going to put them into groups and would be giving them missions, Zhang Hu thought to himself that Ming He was nothing but a temporary one. 
He told Ming-He that he didn't think that it was appropriate. Jiang Hu expressed that, no matter how little time was left, they couldn't just do things like that. He told Ming-He that he needed time to sharpen his axe before cutting wood, pointing out that he would have to first understand everyone's ability before putting them into groups. Liu Lin informed Jiang Hu that the leader had already discussed with her the groupings and missions before. She asked him if he was unsatisfied with that decision or trying to go against the higher-up's decision. Liu Lin scolded Jiang Hu for not knowing how to listen to orders despite being a veteran of the Dragon Tooth organization. Jiang Hu admitted that he was indeed unsatisfied with the decision. After saying that a young kid like Ming he doesn't even know shit, he questioned who gave Ming he the rights to be the Dragon Tooth's leader. Furious, Liu Lin told Jiang Hu that he could just look at Ming He's strength and accomplishments. Liu Lin pointed out that in the recent events, which were the fight against the astronomy group and the nuclear power plant incident, if Ming He hadn't helped shift things around during those times, Nandu City would have already become a mess. She questioned what right Jiang Hu had to say those things to Ming He. Jiang Hu snorted. He said that the things that Liu Lin said were meaningless because everyone there had been through all kinds of battles as well, pointing out that all of them had accomplishments too. After saying that Ming He's accomplishments could also be just pure luck, Jiang Hu declared that if Ming He wanted to be the leader of Dragon Tooth, he would have to be the strongest one there. Liu Lin was about to respond to Zhang Hu, but Ming He stopped her. Ming He asked Zhang Hu to enlighten him as to what it meant to be the strongest. Zhang Hu told Ming He that he simply had to fight him. He said that if Ming He could win against him, he would have no objections to him being the Dragon Tooth's leader. Ming He stared intently at Zhang Hu as he told him that he would fight him. Without further delay, everyone went to the Dragon Tooth's training ground. Liu Lin asked Ming He to think things through again. She informed him that Jiang Hu was so strong that he might be stronger than the former leader. Ming He told Luo Lin that there was no other choice because they were running out of time. He explained that since there was no teamwork among the Dragon Tooth organization, he would have to use that method to fix it. When Ming He expressed that it was fortunate that Jiang Hu was willing to come out and let him prove himself, Luo Lin asked him if he was confident that he would win against a white swan rank. Ming He assured Luo Lin that he knew what he was doing. Seeing that Ming He was determined to fight, Feng Ling and Luo Lin could only trust his decision and ask him to be careful. Song Yi told everyone that she heard that Jiang Hu was already a white swan rank. Knowing that Ming He was only a heaven flare rank, both Song Yi and Lin Nan believed that Ming He was going to lose that fight. Jiang Hu told Ming He that although he might have some talent in him, he didn't mean anything when it came to pure strength, techniques, and skills. He said that he would make Ming He understand that being the leader of Dragon Tooth was not a role that anyone could assume. Ming He revealed a wide grin. He asked Jiang Hu if the pure strength that he mentioned was the strength of mocking others. Fury flared in Jiang Hu's eyes. As he unleashed his strong, raging aura, he told Ming He that he was the one who asked for it. The increase in Jiang Hu's aura was so sudden that it generated a shockwave. The people around the platform quickly covered their ears and lowered their heads. Without saying more, Jiang Hu pounced towards Ming He. Jiang Hu was actually the descendant of the ancient form of fists and specialized in tiger form. His talent was Blue Spirit Sonic Boom, and he had strong and powerful combat skills. As Jiang Hu swung his hands towards Ming He, Ming He suddenly disappeared. Ming He immediately touched his chest the moment he got some distance from Jiang Hu. Jiang Hu looked at Ming He and grinned. Jiang Hu's attack actually reached Ming He before Ming He could leap away. The people from the superhuman troops expressed that the fight was not fair. They believed that it was not possible for Ming He to win against Jiang Hu, who had the strength of a white swan and a Blue Spirit talent. While building momentum, Jiang Hu told Ming He that they were just getting started. Jiang Hu yelled as he aimed his sonic tiger palm towards Ming He. Out of nowhere, a huge tiger appeared and threatened to eat Ming He whole. Seeing how strong Jiang Hu's attack was, Feng Ling couldn't help but worry about Ming He. In the middle of Jiang Hu's terrifying attack, Ming He could be seen extending his arm. Everyone was inevitably surprised when they saw that Jiang Hu's attack was dissipating. Ming He suddenly disappeared. Ming He quickly absorbed the air around him as soon as he got closer to Zhang Hu. The moment Ming He used his technique, the air blast punch, Zhang Hu hurriedly raised his arms to block. Too late to gather enough strength to block, Zhang Hu was pushed away by Ming He's punch. Zhang Hu stared at Ming He in disbelief. Everyone was unable to comprehend how it was possible for Ming He to block Zhang Hu's attack. When they took a closer look at Ming He, they noticed that he was emitting a red aura. Ming He suddenly yelled, and his aura spread out instantaneously. Moments later, Meng He's vacuum realm formed, and Zhang Hu, who was confused, couldn't keep himself from staring at it. The spectators were taken aback. They didn't expect that Ming He had a red sovereign talent. 
Ming he expressed that it was his turn to make a move. Jiang Hu responded by saying that he would like to see what Ming he was really made of. At that moment, Ming he and Jiang Hu simultaneously made a move. Without the slightest bit of hesitation, Ming he used air blast punch to attack, and Jiang Hu used sonic tiger punch to counter it. Ming he and Jiang Hu's techniques were so strong that their collision caused an explosion which forced the spectators to take a step back. Ming-He emerged from the dust cloud, struggling to regain his balance. Just like Ming-He, Jiang-Hu was also blown away by the impact. Jiang-Hu was in disbelief. He expressed that even though Ming-He had a sovereign talent, there was no way that a Heaven Flare rank like him could fight a Whiteswan rank equally. As he prepared for another attack, Ming-He asked Jiang-Hu why it was taking him too long to realize where the problem was. Jiang-Hu's eyes widened in shock. Although he had realized what Ming-He meant, Jiang-Hu still refused to believe it, so he attacked Ming-He to prove that he was wrong. Jiang-Hu's sonic tiger punch aimed to destroy Ming-He's vacuum realm. However, it unexpectedly dissipated the moment it made contact with the vacuum realm. Jiang-Hu was utterly shocked. Never had he imagined that his fierce sonic tiger punch wouldn't be able to stop Ming-He. Ming-He quickly moved behind Jiang-Hu after noticing that he was lost in thought. Ming-He fiercely swung his leg towards Jiang-Hu who was so distracted that he failed to defend himself in time. The former Dragon Tooth members couldn't believe what they just saw. They couldn't understand why Ming-He was the one who was taking the lead in that fight. Feng Ling informed everyone that Ming-He's Red Sovereign Supreme Realm was an absolute vacuum and that Jiang Hu's Sonic Tiger Punch uses sound to form its blow. She explained that Jiang Hu's attack wouldn't be able to penetrate Ming-He's Vacuum Realm because it was impossible for sound to transmit in a vacuum. Meanwhile, Ming-He let Jiang Hu know that his biggest problem was that he was too confident in himself. He pointed out to him that despite the fact that he doesn't understand his opponent's power, he was always confident that he would be able to win just because he was a Whiteswan rank. Just like when he was leading the former Dragoon Tooth's first squad, Ming-He expressed that, although Jiang Hu had made quite a few accomplishments, the squad members that were under him in the fight at Changliang River shouldn't be disregarded. He told Jiang Hu that his squad member, Lin Pingfeng, who ended up sacrificing himself, could have survived the fight at Changliang River. Jiang Hu accused Ming-He of making things up. He informed him that he killed four calamities by himself at the fight at Changliang River. Jiang Hu said that he was not involved in Lin Pingfeng's death since Lin Pingfeng was ambushed by the calamity in the river. When Ming-He told Jiang Hu that Lin Pingfeng was ambushed and died because he didn't mention in his report that there were still calamities hiding in the river, Jiang Hu reasoned that there would definitely be some accidents since there was a lot going on on the battlefield. He pointed out that those kinds of accidents shouldn't be a surprise to anyone since it was the norm of the Dragon Tooth organization. Ming-He admitted that what Jiang Hu said was right. However, he still believed that Jiang Hu definitely did something wrong in the fight at Changliang River. Ming-He told Jiang Hu that if it wasn't for him rushing to earn some merits and heading straight to Changliang River the moment he got the information without analyzing the situation at the place, Lin Pingfeng wouldn't have died. Ming-He shattered the isomorphic crystal in his hand. He absorbed its essence and used absolute zero frost. As Ming-He jerked his fist forward, ice shards formed and crawled towards Jiang Hu. Jiang Hu ordered Ming-He to shut up. He expressed that there was no way that he would lose and that only strength matters in the Dragon Tooth organization. Just as he was about to counterattack, Jiang Hu noticed that his feet were actually frozen in place. At that moment, Ming-He expressed his agreement with what Jiang Hu said. After stopping the ice shards from piercing Jiang Hu, Ming-He pointed out that only strength matters. When Ming-He announced Jiang Hu's defeat, Jiang Hu didn't respond and just stared at Ming-He, eyes wide. He seemed to be having a hard time understanding how he had lost to a mere Heaven Flare rank. The former members of the Dragon Tooth organization couldn't believe that Jiang Hu had lost. On the other hand, the students from Nandu Academy couldn't contain their excitement after witnessing how Ming-He won against Jiang Hu. Feng Ling was so happy that she was unable to keep herself from jumping for joy. It was so out of Feng Ling's character that the students from Nandu Academy were startled to see her act that way. Ming-He just stared at Jiang Hu as he let the ice shards melt. Moments later, Jiang Hu said to Ming-He that he must have provoked him with those words on purpose. Ming-He told Jiang Hu that he was right. He explained that under normal circumstances, even if his Red Sovereign Supreme Realm could suppress Jiang Hu's sonic tiger punch, it still wouldn't be easy for him to win against Jiang Hu. Ming-He pointed out to Jiang Hu that he was blinded by his eagerness to win, 
telling him that he could have switched to another technique instead of using his strongest sonic tiger punch. Zhang Hu's face darkened while he listened to Ming He point out his mistakes. Ming He expressed that he didn't have to be the leader of the Dragon Tooth organization, and that he was willing to give way if Zhang Hu was really capable of leading the organization to complete the mission. Ming He asked Zhang Hu if he was really up to doing it. He let him know that they had to annihilate all the parasitic beasts in Nandu City within four days. Zhang Hu was in disbelief. He questioned Ming He if he could really lead the Dragon Tooth and complete the mission. Ming He told Zhang Hu that he could and that they wouldn't even need four days to do it. A smile formed on Zhang Hu's face. He burst out laughing as though he heard a joke. Zhang Hu expressed that, from what he could see, Ming He was the one who was eager to make a name for himself. With Nandu City being so big and the parasitic beasts being all spread out, Zhang Hu didn't believe that Ming He would be able to complete the mission within four days. The new recruits also thought that the mission given by the higher-ups was impossible to complete. They couldn't help but wonder if Ming He had some kind of plan. At that moment, Ming He expressed that if the parasitic beasts were all spread out, he really wouldn't be able to annihilate all of them in four days. He added that if the parasitic beasts were all connected to one another, things would be different. Zhang Hu was perplexed. He asked Ming He how it was possible to connect the parasitic beasts. Ming He said that, before the nuclear power plant incident, just like everyone else, he also thought that the parasitic beasts were all separated. Ming He told everyone that they should have figured it out already that the nuclear power plant incident was a well-organized crime carried out by a group of criminals. He explained that if that was an organized operation that was well-planned beforehand. There must be some kind of connection between the parasitic beasts. Ming He expressed that, just like an intelligence network, the parasitic beasts must have a convergence point. The people from the superhuman troops agreed with what Ming He said. One of them pointed out that since the parasitic beasts were able to act in a group, there should be a connection between them. At the same time, Luo Lin and the students of Nandu Academy were filled with pride. They all believed that Ming He was absolutely right. Ming He assured everyone that if they were able to figure out the converging point of the connection between the parasitic beasts, which would be the temporary leader for the remaining parasitic beasts within Nandu City, all parasitic beasts would have nowhere to hide. One of the former Dragon Tooth members asked Ming He how they were supposed to find the parasitic beasts' temporary leader. Ming He informed everyone that they would be analyzing the parasitic beasts that took part in the nuclear power plant operation. He expressed that he believed that they would be able to find some traces if they started with those parasitic beasts' fake identities. A former Dragon Tooth member agreed with Ming He. He said that if those parasitic beasts took part in the operation, there was no way they would be able to wipe off all their traces. Jiang Hu, who was not saying a word, caught the former Dragon Tooth member's attention. Seeing that he didn't look convinced, they tried to persuade him by telling him that they think that Ming He does have some points. Suddenly, Jiang Hu struck the floor with a powerful punch. The former Dragon Tooth member's eyes widened in shock. Surprisingly, Jiang Hu admitted that he lost. After telling him that he would follow his instructions, Jiang Hu warned Ming He that he would not tolerate his judgments if there were any problems with them. With a smile, Ming He assured Jiang Hu that if his judgments were wrong, he was free to do what he wanted. Since the problem with Jiang Hu had already been taken care of, Luo Lin asked Ming He to assign the operation tasks right away. Without further delay, everyone gathered in front of Ming He. They simultaneously shouted, asking Ming He to assign the operation tasks. Ming He informed everyone that before assigning the tasks, he would have to reorganize the squads. He announced that due to their manpower issue, they would be split into Operation Alpha Team, Operation Beta Team, and the Intelligence Team. Ming He assigned Zhang Hu to be the leader of the Operation Alpha Team. Feng Ling was assigned to be the leader of the Operation Beta Team. As the operation commander, Luo Lin was assigned to be the temporary leader of the intelligence team. Ming He instructed the rest to stand behind their respective leaders based on the team that he had assigned them to. A while later, after joining their respective groups, everyone turned to face Ming He and attentively waited for further instructions. Seeing that they were all ready to listen, Ming He began briefing everyone regarding the details of their operation. When Ming He was done with the briefing, Luo Lin was in disbelief that Ming He really managed to find a way to annihilate the parasitic beasts. She thought to herself that with the Dragon Tooth organization under Ming He's leadership, they would definitely be able to strive further. At that moment, Ming He declared the commencement of the operation for the annihilation of parasitic beasts. Lin Nan and Song Yi immediately checked all of the communication records of the parasitic beast named Wu Yu. Simultaneously, former Dragon Tooth members asked some people to tell them in detail about the places that the parasitic beasts 
had been for the past few weeks. In the Dragon Tooth Operation Base, the information gathered was immediately organized and cross-checked to see if there was any common contact person or some common places that the parasitic beasts had all been to. Meanwhile, in a bar somewhere in Nandu City, a fat man couldn't keep himself from trembling as he stared at the woman, who was actually a parasitic beast. Luo Lin told Minghe that that parasitic beast must be the one supplying the explosives for the explosion in the city area. She speculated that that parasitic beast must have used her identity as an advantage to seduce the officers to get past them. Luo Lin said that the fat man in front of them must be one of the officers who let the parasitic beasts get their hands on the materials for the explosives. The moment Minghe approached the fat man, the fat man immediately claimed that he was innocent. Minghe mercilessly kicked the fat man in the face and called him a scum. The fat man couldn't help but groan in pain as he slammed into the wall and fell. He kneeled immediately and desperately begged Minghe not to kill him. Minghe got even more infuriated. He couldn't believe that the fat man still dared to beg for mercy. When Luo Lin told Minghe that there was no point wasting his energy on scum like the fat man, Minghe expressed that the parasitic beasts and those people who surrendered to them all deserved to die. Minghe instructed Luo Lin to send the fat man to Chief Kin, along with all the other materials from the other scums saying that he wanted all of them to pay for what they had done so that the citizens that died would be able to rest in peace. A while later, a Dragon Tooth member entered the bar and took the fat man away. After telling him that she already sent the materials over to Chief Kin, and that she believed Chief Kin would handle the scum for them, Luo Lin reminded Ming He that their main mission was still to annihilate the parasitic beasts. Luo Lin told Ming He not to get upset and to just think of the bright side. They only searched for five hours and managed to find seven parasitic beasts already. Ming He expressed that those results were still not enough. He pointed out that there were still a lot of parasitic beasts hiding and they still didn't have a single clue about the temporary leader. Minghe told Luo Lin that if they didn't pick up the pace, their large movements would definitely alarm the parasitic beasts, and if the parasitic beasts were to hide again, finding them would be extremely difficult. Luo Lin assured Minghe that with the information being gathered every minute, the parasitic beasts would not be able to get away. When Minghe asked how things were going over at Feng Ling and Zhang Hu's side, Luo Lin informed Minghe that with the help of the information that was being gathered, Feng Ling and Zhang Hu were able to locate the target accurately and without any accidents. Minghe was glad to hear that he didn't have to worry about the two. In that instant, Minghe said that they should go. He told Luo Lin that they were heading to the next place. Ten hours later, in front of the awe-inspiring city hall of Nandu City, Minghe and the other members of the Dragon Tooth organization gathered and waited for someone. Shortly after, Chief Ken arrived, and he immediately looked for Minghe and Luo Lin. After asking them if they were sure about it, Chief Kin told Luo Lin and Minghe that if they messed things up, it would be a huge deal, and might even affect their plan for the counterattack. He asked Minghe if he could use the Calamity sensor to confirm their target first. Minghe informed Chief Kin that the sensor could only detect calamities that were at a lower level than him, pointing out that if the calamity was at a higher level than him, the sensor would be useless. Luo Lin let Chief Kin know that all the information that they had gathered was proving that the administrative officer was a parasitic beast and was very likely to be the temporary leader. Minghe assured Chief Kin that he was willing to take full responsibility if they messed things up. He told him that with the administrative officer's status, if they just leave him be, it would definitely pose an even greater danger to the future and that, at times like that, besides the fact that they could basically confirm it already, they had to be cautious even if the possibility was only one out of 10,000. Knowing that what he said was right, Chief Kin gave Minghe the order to commence the operation. Without delay, Feng Ling, Minghe, Zhan Hu, and Luo Lin ran towards the entrance of the city hall. A while later, inside the building, the four abruptly stopped and turned to face a huge door. The administrative officer couldn't help but cry out in shock as Ming He and others stormed into her office. She asked Mai He and Luo Lin what they were attempting to accomplish, whether they were trying to rebel, and if they even knew what kind of place they had just barged into. Ming He told the administrative officer that her identity as a parasitic beast had already been exposed. He asked her if she wanted to surrender herself or get beaten up. In response to the accusation, the administrative officer claimed that she didn't know what Ming He was talking about. At that moment, Zhang Hu swiftly moved towards the administrative officer. He told Ming He that he didn't have to say that much with scum like the administrative officer. The administrative officer groaned in pain as she blocked Zhang Hu's attack. Without the slightest bit of hesitation, Zhang Hu added more strength to his punch, causing the administrative officer to get blown away. 
with the intent to kill, Zhang Hu quickly chased after the administrative officer. In the face of Zhang Hu's relentless punches and kicks, the administrative officer agilely moved her body and blocked desperately. After sarcastically saying that he didn't expect that an admin officer who wasn't used to combat had the strength of a white swan rank, Zhang Hu praised the administrative officer for being quite good at hiding herself. The administrative officer offered Ming He and the others one last chance to stop assaulting her. She assured them that if they stopped immediately, she would pretend that none of it had ever happened. Suddenly, a tiger formed from Zhang Hu's aura. The attack was so abrupt that the administrative officer was caught off guard and was blown away. The administrative officer couldn't help but scream in pain as she tried to stop herself from getting blown away. In that instant, vines mysteriously appeared and quickly planted themselves on the floor. Zhang Hu's eyes widened in shock. He couldn't keep himself from staring at the administrative officer, who had revealed her true form. With a scream, the administrative officer threatened to kill Zhang Hu. Simultaneously, Ming Yi smiled. He was glad that the administrative officer was a plant-type parasitic beast, his last vial of liquid stardust. Ming Yi immediately used his rock punch ultimate technique. As soon as Ming He's absolute zero frostbite struck her, the administrative officer found herself trapped in ice. The administrative officer mocked Ming He's capabilities. She told him that that kind of ice was not even enough to seal her up. Seeing that the ice was starting to crack, Ming He hurriedly asked Feng Ling to let him use her flames for a bit. Without the slightest bit of delay, Feng Ling used her blue spirit ultimate technique, the true flame of Phoenix. Feng Ling's flame swirled as it got sucked into Ming He's fist. Ming He lowered his fist the moment he had completely absorbed Feng Ling's flame. He activated his absolute territory, the vacuum realm, and used his rock punch ultimate technique, flaming Phoenix, but he didn't attack right away. By doing some hand movements, Ming He compressed his vacuum realm and merged it with the flaming Phoenix. He punched forward, sending a ginormous, flaming fist towards the administrative officer. The administrative officer screamed in pain as she was struck by the fist and burned by the flaming Phoenix. At that very moment, the window of the administrative officer's office exploded, sending shards of glass falling into the ground. Shortly after, inside the office, people could be heard coughing vigorously. When the smoke had dissipated, a green liquid was revealed. Ming He wasted no time. He immediately kneeled down and collected the liquid stardust. When Zhang Hu called out Ming He for taking his kill, Ming He told Zhang Hu that he was forced to give him a hand because he was too slow, and they were in a rush. Unable to refute Ming He's words, Zhang Hu could only awkwardly scratch the back of his head. Feng Ling expressed that she was glad that Ming He's plan did work in the end. She said that they should have annihilated the parasitic beasts already since they had managed to kill 37 parasitic beasts. And the temporary leader as well. Luo Lin told Feng Ling that she had a feeling that things were not as simple as she thought they were. She found it suspicious that the administrative officer, who was supposed to be the temporary leader, just got taken down by Ming He in one punch. Ming He expressed that he suspected that the administrative officer was just bait being thrown out to mislead them and that the actual temporary leader must be someone else. Luo Lin was surprised. She promptly asked Ming He if he had found any clues. Ming He told everyone that although the administrative officer had the strength of a white swan rank and seemed capable of being the temporary leader, there were at least two points that made her look suspicious. Ming He said that, based on the nuclear power plant incident, the temporary leader was definitely a smart one. Since they caused such a huge commotion when getting rid of the parasitic beasts, Ming He believed that there was no way the temporary leader would not be alarmed and come up with a counter plan. So he found it suspicious that the administrative officer just waited for them to come and kill her. Ming He pointed out that the parasitic beasts were all selfish and evil beings. He knew that for a parasitic beast to become a temporary leader, it had to have overwhelming strength to be able to make the other parasitic beasts submit. Ming He expressed that although the administrative officer had the strength of a white swan rank, which was basically the same as a lord rank calamity, her strength was just barely at that level. Her power was empty, and it almost felt like her strength was being brought out by force. Ming He and the others already had a number of Heaven Flare ranked parasitic beasts among the ones they fought before, and they were not any weaker than the administrative officer, so there was no way those parasitic beasts would listen to the administrative officer. Ming He declared that he suspected that the real temporary leader was actually still hiding behind all of it. He said that all the parasitic beasts they had killed were just abandoned pawns that the temporary leader threw out to divert their attention. Luo Lin admitted that although she was feeling suspicious as well, she didn't think as far as Ming He did. With them not having a single clue at that moment, Feng Ling couldn't help but ask where the real temporary leader would be. Zhang Hu told everyone that since using the brain really was not his type of thing, 
he would be in charge of the fighting. After hearing Zhang Hu say that he would listen to them, Ming He said that since they managed to notice it, the temporary leader's objective to divert their attention had failed. Ming He assured everyone that there was no way the parasitic beasts would be able to cover up their traces completely. He instructed them to expand their search radius to look for all the parasitic beasts that had shown their faces in Nandu City for the past year, including the period when the instructor was still there, and to cross-check all their information and background. Hearing Ming He confidently say that they would definitely be able to find the temporary leader as long as they looked closely, Luo Lin agreed to follow his plan. Ming He was afraid that it would be quite difficult for them to complete that mission with the manpower they had in the Dragon Tooth organization at that moment, so he asked Feng Ling to go and gather the students from the Nandu Academy Student Council and make use of the students who are capable and cautious. Since the students wouldn't be joining the fight and would just be looking for clues, Feng Ling agreed to let them help. She jumped down the building so she could gather the students right away. Ming He informed Luo Lin that he might need to seclude himself and that he would let her handle the task of looking for the clues. When Ming He told Luo Lin to inform him immediately once she found anything related to the temporary leader, Luo Lin assured him that she would be able to handle things on her side. With him having nothing else to say, Ming He jumped down the building to go and seclude himself. Zhang Hu was confused. He hurriedly asked Ming He what he was supposed to do. Without bothering to look back, Ming He instructed Zhang Hu to help Luo Lin handle all the necessary stuff. Zhang Hu still wanted to say more. However, Ming He was already far away. Later that day, Ming He arrived at his apartment. While she was taking out the liquid stardust, Xing Ling told Ming He that he was still quite far away from White's One Rank. She instructed him that he would have to take it slowly as he ascended and make sure that he would not rush it. After feeding him the liquid stardust, Xing Ling observed Ming He closely. Those liquid stardusts were extremely pure and had a huge amount of energy contained within them, so Ming He immediately felt that his strength was growing at a drastic speed. A while later, Ming He exclaimed, as he was finally at high tier Heaven Flare rank. Xing Ling took another liquid stardust. Seeing this, Ming He opened his mouth and consumed it right away. Ming He closed his eyes a second time and focused on absorbing the liquid stardust. After some time, upon reaching the pinnacle of Heaven Flare rank, Ming He stared at the two liquid stardusts in front of him. It was already time for him to ascend to White's One rank. Ming He ate the two liquid stardusts at the same time, and the aura surrounding him erupted, forcing Xing Ling to move away. Ming He thought to himself that he must reach White's One rank. He was almost there. He just needed a little more. However, no matter how hard he tried, he still couldn't break through. Based on Xing Ling's estimation, he just needed five vials of liquid stardust to reach White's One rank, and the administrative officer. No matter how weak she was, she was still a Lord rank calamity, so the liquid stardust she left behind had a really good quality. Ming He couldn't understand why he couldn't break through. He was stuck at the very last step. Not willing to give up, Ming He continued cultivating. Soon after, Xing Ling decided to stop Ming He. She told him that he had been cultivating for an entire night already, and that he shouldn't try to rush it. Ming He abruptly opened his eyes. He was still not able to break through. He felt so desperate that he couldn't help but ask aloud where exactly things went wrong. When Ming He asked Xing Ling if she estimated things wrong and if he needed more liquid stardust to ascend, Xing Ling said that there was nothing wrong with her calculation. Xing Ling told Ming He that the problem was with him, that he was ascending multiple ranks in such a short time that it made the spirit power in his body unstable. When she informed Ming He that he wouldn't be able to ascend to White's One rank if he didn't fix that issue, Ming He immediately asked her what he should do. Xing Ling pointed out to Ming He that there was no shortcut. She let him know that he would have to enforce his spirit power little by little so that he could have a strong foundation. Ming He couldn't help but be depressed. He decided to just forget about it. He expressed that two days later, even if he didn't manage to break through, he would still go and save Qin Yu and Lu Kaya. Moments later, Ming He noticed that his communication device was vibrating. After seeing that there were 13 missed calls, Xing Ling immediately explained to Ming He that she blocked off the sounds from the communication device because he was cultivating. The moment Ming He answered the call, Luo Lin reported to him right away that they had found something regarding the temporary leader. Ming He excitedly asked Luo Lin where the temporary leader was. Luo Lin instructed Ming He to calm down. She told him that the news might be a little difficult for him to accept and that they had checked through it multiple times and searched all around already. As she looked at the tall building in front of her, Luo Lin revealed to Ming He that the temporary leader could be in Tanfang Biology. Ming He was extremely shocked. He had never thought that Feng Ling's family business would be involved. 
Zhuo Lin informed Ming He that after looking through all the information on all the parasitic beasts, including the traces of Wu Long, they found out that a number of the higher ups among the parasitic beasts have a connection with Tianfeng biology, and that some of them have been buying products from Tianfeng biology, while others will just often pass by. Luo Lin told Minghe that since he hadn't been answering her calls, although it was a bit of a stretch, she took the liberty to investigate the only lead they had. Noticing the reluctance in the tone of her voice, Minghe nervously asked Luo Lin what else they had found. Luo Lin let Minghe know that after they started their silent investigation into Tianfeng biology, the only thing that they had confirmed was that the temporary leader was most likely hiding within Tianfeng biology. Minghe pointed out to Luo Lin the importance of that matter. He asked her where she was so he could come over to find her. 